Chapter One of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Introduction Philosophy misses an advantage enjoyed by the other sciences. It cannot, like them, rest the existence of its objects on the natural admissions of consciousness, nor can it assume that its method of cognition, either for starting or continuing, is one already accepted. The objects of philosophy, it is true, are upon the whole the same as those of religion. In both the object is truth, in that supreme sense in which God, and God only, is the truth. Both in like manner go on to treat the finite worlds of nature and the human mind with their relation to each other and to their truth in God some acquaintance with its objects therefore philosophy may and even must presume that and a certain interest in them to boot were it for no other reason than this that in point of time the mind makes general images of objects long before it makes notions of them and that it is only through these mental images and by recourse to them that thinking mind rises to know and comprehend thinkingly but with the rise of this thinking study of things it soon becomes evident that thought will be satisfied with nothing short of showing the necessity of its facts of demonstrating the existence of its objects as well as their nature and qualities our original acquaintance with them is thus discovered to be inadequate we can assume nothing and assert nothing dogmatically nor can we accept the assertions and assumptions of others and yet we must make a beginning and a beginning as primary and underived makes an assumption or rather is an assumption it seems as if it were impossible to make a beginning at all this thinking study of things may serve in a general way as a description of philosophy but the description is too wide if it be correct to say that thought makes the distinction between man and the lower animals then every human is human for the sole and simple reason that it is due to the operation of thought philosophy on the other hand is a peculiar mode of thinking a mode in which thinking becomes knowledge and knowledge through notions however great therefore may be the identity and essential unity of the two modes of thought the philosophic mode gets to be different from the more general thought which acts in all that is human and in all that gives humanity its distinctive character and this difference connects itself with the fact that strictly human and thought-induced phenomena of consciousness do not originally appear in the form of thought, but as a feeling, a perception, or a mental image, all of which aspects must be distinguished from the form of thought proper. According to an old preconceived idea, which has passed into trivial proposition, it is thought which marks man off from the animals. Yet trivial as this old belief may seem, it must, strangely enough, be recalled to mind in presence of certain preconceived ideas of the present day these ideas would put feeling and thought so far apart as to make them opposites which would represent them as so antagonistic that feeling particularly religious feeling is supposed to be contaminated perverted and even annihilated by thought they also emphatically hold that religion and piety grow out of and rest upon something else and not on thought but those who make this separation forget meanwhile that only man has the capacity for religion and that animals no more have religion than they have law and morality those who insist on the separation of religion from thinking usually have before their mind the sort of thought that may be styled afterthought they mean reflective thinking which has to deal with thoughts as thoughts and brings them into consciousness slackness to perceive and keep in view the distinction which philosophy definitely draws in respect to thinking is the source of the crudest objections and reproaches against philosophy man and that just because it is his nature to think is the only being that possesses law religion and morality in these spheres of human life therefore thinking under the guise of feeling faith or generalized image has not been inactive its action and its production are there present and therein contained but it is one thing to have such feelings and generalized images that have been moulded and permeated by thought and another thing to have thoughts about them the thoughts to which afterthoughts upon those modes of consciousness give rise are what is compromised under reflection general reasoning and the like as well as under philosophy itself the neglect of this distinction between thought in general and the reflective thought of philosophy has also led to another more frequent misunderstanding reflection of this kind has often been maintained to be the condition or even the only way of attaining a consciousness and certitude of the eternal truth the neglect of this distinction between thought in general and reflective thought of philosophy has also led to another more frequent misunderstanding reflection of this kind has been often maintained to be the condition or even the only way of attaining consciousness and certitude of the eternal and true the 
now somewhat antiquated metaphysical proofs of god's existence for example have been treated as if a knowledge of them and a conviction of the truth were the only and essential means of producing a belief and conviction there is a god such a doctrine would find its parallel if we said eating was impossible before we had acquired a knowledge of the chemical botanical and zoological characteristics of our food and then we must delay digestion till we have finished the study of anatomy and physiology were it so these sciences in their field like philosophy in its would gain greatly in point of utility in fact their utility would rise above the height of absolute and universal indispensableness or rather instead of being indispensable they would not exist at all the content of whatever kind it be with which our consciousness is taken up is what constitutes the qualitative character of our feeling perceptions fancies and ideas of our aims and duties and of our thoughts and notions from this point of view feeling perception etc are the forms assumed by these contents the contents remain one and the same whether they are felt seen represented or willed and whether they are merely felt or felt with an admixture of thoughts or merely and simply thought in any one of these forms or in the admixture of several the contents confront consciousness or are its object but when they are thus objects of consciousness the modes of several forms ally themselves with the contents and each form of them appears in consequence to give rise to a special object thus what is the same at bottom may look like a different sort of fact there are several modes of feeling perception desire and will so far as we are aware of them in general called ideas mental representations and it may be roughly said that philosophy puts thoughts categories or in more precise language adequate notions in the place of the generalized images we ordinarily call ideas mental impressions such as these may be regarded as the metaphors of thoughts and notions but to have these figurate conceptions does not imply that we appreciate their intellectual significance and the thoughts and rational notions to which they correspond conversely it is one thing to have thoughts and intelligent notions and another to know what impressions perceptions and feelings correspond to them the difference will to some extent explain what people call the unintelligibility of philosophy their difficulty lies partly in an incapacity which in itself is nothing but a want of habit for abstract thinking i e in an ability to get a hold of pure thoughts and move about in them in our ordinary state of mind the thoughts are clothed upon and made one with the sensuous or spiritual material of the hour and in reflection meditation and general reasoning we introduce a blend of thoughts into feelings percepts and mental images thus in propositions where the subject matter is due to the senses for example this leaf is green we have such categories introduced as being and individuality but it is a very difficult thing to make the thoughts pure and simple our object but their complaint that philosophy is unintelligible is as much due to another reason and that is an impatient wish to have before them a mental picture of that which is in mind as a thought or notion when people are asked to apprehend some notion they often complain that they do not know what they have to think but the fact is that in a notion there is nothing further to be thought than the notion itself what the phrase reveals is a hankering after an image with which we are already familiar the mind denied the use of its familiar ideas feels the ground where once it stood firm and then at home taken away from beneath it and when transported into a region of pure thought cannot tell where in the world it is one consequence of this weakness is that authors preachers and orators are found most intelligible when they speak of things which their readers or hearers already know by rote things which the latter are conversant with and which require no explanation the philosopher then has to reckon with popular modes of thought and with the objects of religion in dealing with ordinary modes of mind he will first of all as we saw have to prove and almost to awaken the need for his peculiar method of knowledge in dealing with objects of religion and with truth as a whole he will have to show that philosophy is capable of apprehending them from its own resources and should a difference from religious conceptions come to light he will have to justify the points in which it diverges to give the reader a preliminary explanation of the distinction thus made and to let him see at the same moment that the real import of our consciousness is retained and even for the first time put in its proper light when translated into the form of thought and the notion of reason it may be well to recall another of these old unreasoned beliefs and that is the conviction that to get at the truth of an object or event even of feeling perceptions opinions and mental ideas we must think it over now in any case to think things over is at least to transform feelings ordinary ideas etc 
into thoughts. Nature has given every one a faculty of thought, but thought is all that philosophy claims as the form proper to her business. And thus the adequate view which ignores the distinction stated leads to a new delusion, the reverse of the complaint previously mentioned about the unintelligibility of philosophy. In other words, this science must often submit to the slight of hearing even people who have never taken any trouble with it talking as if they thoroughly understood all about it. With no preparation beyond an ordinary education, they do not hesitate especially under the influence of religious sentiment, to philosophize and to criticize philosophy. Everybody allows that to know any other science, you must have first studied it, and that you can only claim to express a judgment upon it in virtue of such knowledge. Everybody allows that to make a shoe you must have learned and practised the craft of shoemaker, though every man has a model in his own foot, and possesses in his hands the natural endowment for the operations acquired. For philosophy alone, it seems to be imagined, such study, care, and application are not in the least required. The comfortable view of what is required for a philosopher has recently received corroboration with the theory of immediate or intuitive knowledge so much for the form of philosophical knowledge it is no less desirable on the other hand that philosophy should understand that its content is no other than actuality that core of truth which originally produced and producing itself within the precincts of the mental life has become the world and the inward and outward world of consciousness at first we become aware that these contents in what we call experience but even experience as it surveys the wide range of inward and outward existence has sense enough to distinguish the mere appearance which is transient and meaningless from what in itself really deserves the name of actuality as it is only the form that philosophy is distinguished from other modes of attaining an acquaintance with the same sum of being it must necessarily be in harmony with actuality and experience in fact this harmony may be viewed as at least an extrinsic means of testing the truth of a philosophy similarly it may be held the highest and final aim of philosophical science to bring about through ascertainment of this harmony a reconciliation of the self-conscious reason with the reason which it is in the world in other words with actuality in the preface to my philosophy of law are found the prepositions what is reasonable is actual and what is actual is reasonable these simple statements give rise to expressions of surprise and hostility even quarters where it would be reckoned an insult to presume absence of philosophy and still more religion religion at least need not be brought in evidence its doctrines of divine government of the world affirm these propositions too decidedly for their philosophic sense we must presuppose intelligence enough to know not only that god is actual that he is the supreme actuality that he alone is truly actual but only as regards the logical bearings of the question that existence is in part mere appearance and only in part actuality in common like any freak of fancy any error evil and everything of the nature of evil as well as every degenerate and transitory existence whatever gets in a casual way the name of actuality but even our ordinary feelings are enough to forbid a casual fortuitous existence getting the emphatic name of an actual for by fortuitous we mean an existence which has no greater value than that of something possible which may as well not be as be as for the term actuality these critics would have done well to consider the sense in which i employ it in a detailed logic i have treated amongst other things of actuality and accurately distinguished it not only from the fortuitous which after all has existence but even from the cognate categories of existence and other modifications of being the actuality of the rational stands opposed by the popular fancy that ideas and ideals are nothing but chimeras and philosophy a mere system of such phantasms it is also opposed by the very different fancy that ideas and ideals are something far too excellent to have actuality or something too impotent to procure it for themselves this divorce between idea and reality is especially dear to the analytic understanding which looks upon its own abstractions dreams though they are as something true and real and prides itself on the imperative ought which it takes a special pleasure in prescribing even on the fields of politics as if the world had waited on it to learn what it ought to be and was not for if it were as it ought to be what would come of the precious wisdom of that ought when understanding turns this ought against trivial external and transitory objects against social regulations or conditions which very likely possess a great relative importance for a certain time and special circles it may often be right in such a case the intelligent observer may meet much that fails to satisfy the general requirements of right for who is not acute enough to see a great deal in his own surroundings which is really far from being as it ought to be 
But such acuteness is mistaken in the conceit that, when it examines these objects and pronounces what they ought to be, it is dealing with questions of philosophic science. The object of philosophy is the idea, and the idea is not so impotent as merely to have a right or obligation to exist without actually existing. The object of philosophy is an actuality of which those objects, social regulations, and conditions are only the superficial outside. Thus reflection, thinking things over, in a general way involves the principle, which also means beginning, of philosophy. And when the reflective spirit arose again in its independence in modern times, after the epoch of the Lutheran Reformation, it did not, as in the beginnings among the Greeks, stand merely aloof in a world of its own, but at once turned its energies upon the apparently illimitable material of the phenomenal world. In this way, the name philosophy came to be applied to all those branches of knowledge which are engaged in ascertaining the standard and universal in the ocean of empirical individualities, as well as in ascertaining the necessary element, or laws, to be found in the apparent disorder of the endless masses of the fortuitous. It thus appears that modern philosophy derives its materials from our own personal observations and perceptions of the external and internal world, from nature as well as from the mind and heart of man, when both stand in the immediate presence of the observer. This principle of experience carries with it the unspeakably important condition that, in order to accept and believe any fact, we must be in contact with it, or, in more exact terms, we must find the fact united and combined with the certainty of our own selves. We must be in touch with our subject matter, whether it be by means of our external senses, or else by our profounder mind and our intimate self-consciousness. This principle is the same as that which has in present day been termed faith, immediate knowledge, the revelation in the outward world, and above all, in our own heart. Those sciences, which thus got the name of philosophy, we call empirical sciences, for the reason that they take their departure from experience. Still, the essential results which they aim at and provide are laws, general propositions, a theory, the thoughts of what is found existing. On this ground, the Newtonian physics was called natural philosophy. Hugo Grotius, again, by putting together and comparing the behaviour of states towards each other, as recorded in history, succeeded with the help of ordinary methods of general reasoning in laying down a certain general principles and establishing a theory which may be termed philosophy of international law. In England, it is still the usual signification of the term philosophy. Newton continues to be celebrated as the greatest of philosophers, and the name goes down as far as the priceless of instrument makers all instruments such as thermometer and barometer which do not come under the special head of magnetic or electric apparatus are styled philosophical instruments surely thought and not a mere combination of wood and iron ought to be called the instrument of philosophy the recent science of political economy in particular which in germany is known as rational economy of the state or intelligent national economy has in england especially appropriated the name of philosophy in its own field this empirical knowledge may at first give satisfaction but in two ways it is seen to come short the first place there is another circle of objects which it does not embrace their freedom spirit and god they belong to a different sphere not because it can be said they have nothing to do with experience for though they are certainly not experiences of the senses it is quite an identical proposition to say that whatever is in consciousness is experienced the real ground for assigning them to another field of cognition is that in their scope and content these objects evidently show themselves as infinite there is an old phrase often wrongly attributed to aristotle and supposed to express the general tenor of his philosophy nihil est in intellectu quod non fuerit in sensu there is nothing in thought which has not been in sense and experience if speculative philosophy refused to admit this maxim it can only be done so from a misunderstanding it will however on the converse side no less assert nihil est in sensu quod non fuerit in intellectu and this may be taken in two senses in the general sense it means that spirit is the cause of the world in its special meaning it asserts that the sentiment of right morals and religion is a sentiment and in that way an experience of such scope and such character that it can spring from and rest upon thought alone but in the second place in point of form the subjective reason desires a further satisfaction than empirical knowledge gives and this form is in the widest sense the term necessity 
The method of empirical science exhibits two defects. The first is that the universal or general principle contained in it, the genus of kind, etc., on its own account, indeterminate and vague, and therefore not on its own account, connected to the particulars or the details. Either is external and accidental to the other, and it is the same with the particular facts which are brought into union. Each is external and accidental to the others. The second defect is that the beginnings are in every case data and postulates neither accounted for nor deduced. In both these points, the form of necessity fails to get its due. Hence reflection, whenever it sets to remedy these defects, becomes speculative thinking, the thinking proper to philosophy. As a species of reflection, therefore, which, though it has already a certain community of nature, with the reflection already mentioned, is nevertheless different from it. Philosophic thought thus possesses, in addition to the common forms, some forms of its own, of which the notion may be taken as the type. The relation of speculative science to the other sciences may be stated in the following terms. It does not in the least neglect the empirical facts contained in the several sciences, but recognizes and adopts them. It appreciates and applies towards its own structure structure the universal element in these sciences their laws and classifications but besides all this into the categories of science it introduces and gives currency to other categories the difference looked at in this way is only a change of categories speculative logic contains all previous logic and metaphysics it preserves the same forms of thought and the same laws and objects while at the same time remodelling and expanding them with wider categories from notion in the speculative sense we should distinguish what is ordinarily called a notion the phrase that no notion can ever comprehend the infinite a phrase which has been repeated over and over again till it has grown axiomatic is based upon this narrow estimate of what is meant by notions this thought which is proposed as the instrument of philosophical knowledge itself calls for further explanation we must understand in what way it possesses necessity or cogency and when it claims to be equal to the task of apprehending the absolute objects god spirit freedom that claim must be substantiated such an explanation however is itself a lesson in philosophy and properly falls within the scope of the science itself a preliminary attempt to make matters plain would only be unphilosophical and consist of a tissue of assumptions assertions and inferential pros and cons i e of dogmatism without cogency and again which there would be an equal right of counter dogmatism a main line of argument in the critical philosophy bids us pause before proceeding to inquire into god or into the true being of things and tells us first of all to examine the faculty of cognition and see whether it is equal to such an effort we ought says kant to become acquainted with the instrument before we undertake Take the work for which it is to be employed for if the instrument be insufficient all trouble will be spent in vain the plausibility of this general suggestion has won for it general assent and admiration the result of which has been to withdraw cognition from an interest in its objects and absorption in the study of them and to direct it back upon itself and so turn to a question of form unless we wish to be deceived by words it is easy to see what this amounts to in the case of other instruments we can try and criticise them in other ways than by setting about the special work for which they are destined but the examination of knowledge can only be carried out by an act of knowledge to examine this so-called instrument is the same thing as to know it but to seek to know before we know is as absurd as the wise resolution of scholasticus not to venture into the water until we had learned to swim reinhold saw the confusion with which this style of commencement is chargeable and tried to get out of the difficulty by starting with a hypothetical and problematical stage of philosophizing in this way he supposed that it would be possible nobody can tell how to get along until we found ourselves further on arrived at the primary truths of truths his method when closely looked into will be seen to be identical with a very common practice it starts from a substratum of experimental fact or from a provisional assumption which has to be brought into a definition and then proceeds to analyse this starting point we can detect in reinhold's argument a perception of the truth the usual course which proceeds by assumptions and anticipations is no better than a hypothetical and problematical mode of procedure but his perceiving this does not alter the character of this method it only makes clear its imperfections the special conditions which call for the existence of philosophy may thus be described the mind or spirit when it is sentient or perceptive finds its object in something sensuous when it imagines in a picture or image when it wills in an aim or end but in contrast to or it may be only in distinction from these forms of its existence and of its object the mind has also to gratify the cravings of its highest and most inward life that innermost self is thought thus the mind renders thought its object 
in the best meaning of the phrase, it comes to itself, for thought is its principle and its very unadulterated self. But while thus occupied, thought entangles itself in contradictions, i.e. loses itself in the hard and fast non-identity of its thoughts, and so, instead of reaching itself, is caught and held in its counterpart. This result, to which honest but narrow thinking leads the mere understanding, is resisted by the loftier craving of which we have spoken. That craving expresses the preservance of thought, which continues true to itself, even in the conscious loss of its native rest and independence that it may overcome, and work out in itself the solution of its own contradictions to see that thought in its very nature is dialectical and that as understanding it must fall into contradiction the negative of itself will form one of the main lessons of logic when thought grows hopeless of ever achieving by its own means the solution of the contradiction which it has by its own action brought upon itself it turns back into those solutions of the question with which the mind has learned to pacify itself in some of its other modes and forms Unfortunately, however, the retreat of thought has led it, as Plato noticed even in his time, to a very uncalled-for hatred of reason, misology, and it then takes up against its own endeavours that hostile attitude of which an example is seen in the doctrine that immediate knowledge, as it is called, is the exclusive form in which we become cognizant of truth. The rise of philosophy is due to these cravings of thought. Its point of departure is experience, including under that name both our immediate consciousness and the inductions from it. Awakened, as it were, by this stimulus, thought is vitally characterized by raising itself above the natural state of mind, above the senses and inferences from the sense into its own unadulterated element, and by assuming, accordingly, at first a stand aloof and negative attitude towards the point from which it started through this state of antagonism to the phenomena of sense its first satisfaction is found in itself in the idea of the universal essence of these phenomena an idea the absolute or god which may be more or less abstract meanwhile on the other hand the sciences based on experience exert upon the mind a stimulus to overcome the form in which their very contents are presented and to elevate these contents to the rank of necessary truth for the facts of science have the aspect of a vast conglomerate one thing coming side by side with another as if they were merely given and presented as in short devoid of all essential or necessary connection in consequence of the stimulus thought is dragged out of its unrealized universality and its fancied or merely possible satisfaction and impelled onwards to a development from itself on one hand this development only means that thought incorporates the content of science in all their speciality of detail as submitted on the other it makes these contents imitate the action of the original creative thought and present the aspect of a free evolution determined by the logic of fact alone on the relation between immediacy and mediation in consciousness we shall speak later expressly and with more detail here it may be sufficient to premise that though the two moments or factors present themselves as distinct still neither of them can be absent nor can one exist apart from the other this knowledge of god as of every supersensible reality is in its true character an exaltation above sensations or perceptions it consequently involves a negative attitude to the initial data of sense and to that extent implies mediation for to mediate is to take something as a beginning and to go onward to a second thing so that the existence of this second thing depends on having reached it from something else contradistinguishing from it in spite of this the knowledge of god is no mere sequel dependent on the empirical phase of consciousness in fact independence is essentially secured through this negation and exaltation no doubt if we attach an unfair prominence to the fact of mediation and represent it simply as implying a state of conditionedness it may be said not that the remark would mean much that philosophy is the child of experience and owes its rise to a posteriori fact as a matter of fact thinking is always the negation of what we have immediately before us with as much truth however we may be said to owe eating to the means of nourishment so as long as we can have no eating without them but if we take this view eating is certainly represented as ungrateful it devours that to which it owes itself thinking upon this view of its action is equally ungrateful but there is also an a priori aspect of thought whereby a mediation not made by anything external but by a reflection into self we have that immediacy which 
which is universality, a self complacency of thought which is so much at home with itself that it feels an innate indifference to descend to particulars, and in that way the development of its own nature. It is thus also with religion, which whether it be rude or elaborate, whether it be invested with scientific precision of detail or confined to the simple faith of heart, possesses throughout the same intensive nature of contentment and felicity but if thought never gets further than the universality of ideas as was perforce the case in the first philosophies when the eleatics never got beyond being and heraclitus beyond becoming it is justly open to the charge of formalism even in a more advanced phase of philosophy where we may often find a doctrine which has mastered merely certain abstract propositions or formulae such as in the absolute all is one subject and object are identical and only repeating the same thing when it comes to particulars bearing in mind this first period of thought the period of mere generality we may safely say that experience is the real author of growth and advance in philosophy for firstly the empirical sciences do not stop short at the mere observation of the individual features of a phenomenon by the aid of thought they are able to meet philosophy with materials prepared for it in the shape of general uniformities i e laws and classifications of the phenomena when this is done the particular facts which they contain are ready to be received into philosophy this secondly implies a certain compulsion on thought itself to proceed to these concrete specific truths the reception into philosophy of these scientific materials now that thought has removed their immediacy and made them cease to be mere data forms at the same time a development of thought out of itself philosophy then owes its development to the empirical sciences in return it gives their contents what is so vital to them the freedom of thought gives them in short an a priori character these contents are now warranted necessary and no longer depend on the evidence of facts merely that they were so found and so experienced the fact as experienced thus becomes an illustration and a copy of the original and completely self-supporting activity of thought stated in exact terms such as the origin and development of philosophy but the history of philosophy gives us the same process from an historical and external point of view the stages in the evolution of the idea there seem to follow each other by accident and to present merely a number of different and unconnected principles which the several systems of philosophy carry out in their own way but it is not so for these thousands of years the same architect has directed the work and that architect is one living mind whose nature is to think to bring self-consciousness what it is and with being thus set as object before it to be the same time raised above it and so to reach a higher stage of its own being the different systems which the history of philosophy presents are therefore not irreconcilable with unity we may either say that it is one philosophy at different degrees of maturity or that the particular principle which is the groundwork of each system is but a branch of one and the same universe of thought in philosophy the latest birth of time is the result of all systems that have preceded it and must include their principles and so if on other grounds it deserved the title of philosophy will be the fullest most comprehensive and adequate system of all the spectacle of so many and so various systems of philosophy suggests the necessity of defining more exactly the relation of universal to particular when the universal is made a mere form and coordinated with the particular as if it were on the same level it sinks into a particular itself even common sense in everyday matters is above the absurdity of setting a universal beside the particulars would any one who wished for fruit reject cherries pears and grapes on the ground that they were cherries pears or grapes and not fruit but when philosophy is in question the excuse of many is that the philosophies are so different and none of them is the philosophy that each is only a philosophy such a plea is assumed to justify any amount of contempt for philosophy and yet cherries too are fruit often to a system of which the principle is universal is put on a level which another of which the principle is a particular and with theories which deny the existence of philosophy altogether such systems are said to be only different views of philosophy with equal justice light and darkness might be styled different kinds of light the same evolution of thought which is exhibited in the history of philosophy is presented in the system of philosophy itself here instead of surveying the process as we do in history from the outside we see the movement of thought clearly defined in its native medium the thought which is genuine and self-supporting must be intrinsically concrete it must be an idea and when it is viewed in the whole of its universality it is the idea or the absolute science of this idea must form a system for the truth is concrete that is whilst it gives a bond and principle of unity it also possesses an internal source of development 
truth then is only possible as a universe or totality of thought and the freedom of the whole as well as the necessity of several subdivisions which it implies are only possible when these are discriminated and defined unless it is a system philosophy is not a scientific production unsystematic philosophizing can only be expected to give expression to personal peculiarities of mind and no principle for the regulation of its contents apart from their interdependence and organic union the truths of philosophy are valueless and must be treated as baseless hypotheses or personal convictions yet many philosophical treatises confine themselves to such an exposition of the opinions and sentiments of the author the term system is often misunderstood it does not denote a philosophy the principle of which is narrow and to be distinguished from others on the contrary a genuine philosophy makes its principle to include every particular principle each of the parts of philosophy is a philosophical whole a circle rounded and complete in itself in each of these parts however the philosophical idea is found in a particular specificiality or medium the single circle because it is a real totality bursts through the limits imposed by its special medium and gives rise to a wider circle the whole of philosophy in this way resembles a circle of circles the idea appears in each single circle but at the same time the whole idea is constituted by the system of these peculiar phases and each is a necessary member of the organization in the form of an encyclopedia the science has no room for a detailed exposition of particulars and must be limited to setting forth the commencement of the special sciences and the notions of cardinal importance in them how much of the particular parts is requisite to constitute constitute a particular branch of knowledge is so far indeterminate that the part if it is to be something true must be not an isolated member merely but itself an organic whole the entire field of philosophy therefore really forms a single science but it also may be viewed as a total composed of several particular sciences the encyclopedia of philosophy must not be confounded with ordinary encyclopedias an ordinary encyclopedia does not pretend to be more than an aggregation of sciences regulated by no principle and merely as experience offers them sometimes it even includes what merely bear the name of sciences while they are nothing more than a collection of bits of information in an aggregate like this the several branches of knowledge owe their place in the encyclopedia to extrinsic reason and their unity is therefore artificial they are arranged but we cannot say they form a system for the same reason especially as the materials to be combined also depend upon no one rule or principle the arrangement is at best an experiment and will always exhibit inequalities an encyclopedia of philosophy excludes three kinds of partial science one it excludes mere aggregates of bits of information philology in its prima facie aspect belongs in this class two it rejects quasi sciences which are founded on an act of arbitrary will alone such as heraldry sciences of this class are positive from beginning to end three in another class of sciences also styled positive but which have a rational basis and a rational beginning philosophy claims that constituent as its own the positive features remain the property of the sciences themselves the positive element in the last class of sciences is of different sorts one their commencement though rational at bottom yields to the influence of fortuitousness when they have to bring their universal truth into contact with actual facts and the single phenomena of experience in this region of chance and change the adequate notion of science must yield its place to the reasons or grounds of explanation thus for example in the science of jurisprudence or in the system of direct and indirect taxation it is necessary to have certain points precisely and definitively settled which lie beyond the competence of the absolute lines laid down by the pure notion a certain latitude of settlement accordingly is left and each point may be determined in one way on one principle and in another way on another and emits no definitive certainty similarly the idea of nature when parcelled out in detail is dissipated into contingencies natural history geography and medicine stumble upon descriptions of existence upon kinds and distinctions which are not determined by reason but by sport and adventitious incidents even history comes under the same category the idea is its essence and inner nature but as it appears everything is under contingency and in the field of voluntary action two the sciences are positive also in failing to recognize the finite nature of what they predicate and to point out how these categories and their whole sphere pass into a higher they assume their statements to possess an authority beyond appeal here the fault lies in the finitude of the form as in previous instance it lay in the matter three in close sequel to this sciences are positive in consequence of the inadequate grounds on which their conclusions rest based as these are 
on detached and casual inference, upon feeling, faith and authority, and generally speaking, upon the deliverances of inward and outward perception. Under this head, we may also class the philosophy which proposes to build upon anthropology, facts of consciousness, inward sense, or outward experience. It may happen, however, that empirical is an epithet applicable only to the form of scientific exposition, whilst intuitive sagacity has arranged what are mere phenomena, according to the essential sequence of the notion. In such a case, the contrasts between the varied and numerous phenomena brought together serve to eliminate the external and accidental circumstances of their conditions, and the universal thus comes clearly into view. Guided by such an intuition, experimental physics will present the rational science of nature, as history will present the science of human affairs and actions in an external picture, which mirrors the philosophic notion. It may seem as if philosophy, in order to start on its course, had, like the rest of the sciences, to begin with a subjective presupposition. The sciences postulate their respective objects, such as space, number, or whatever it be, and it might be supposed that philosophy had also to postulate the existence of thought. But the two cases are not exactly parallel. It is by the free act of thought that it occupies a point of view in which it is for its own self, and thus gives itself an object of its own production. Nor is this all. The very point of view, which originally is taken on in its own evidence only, must in the course of the science be converted to a result, the ultimate result in which philosophy returns into itself and reaches the point with which it began. In this manner, philosophy exhibits the appearance of a circle which closes with itself, and has no beginning in the same way as the other sciences have. To speak of a beginning of philosophy has a meaning only in relation to a person who proposes to commence the study, and not in relation to the science as science. The same thing may thus be expressed. Expressed. The notion of science, the notion therefore with which we start, which for the very reason that it is initial, implies a separation between the thought, which is our object, and the subject, philosophizing, which is, as it were, external to the former, must be grasped and comprehended by the science itself. This is, in short, the one single aim, action, and goal of philosophy, to arrive at the notion of its notion, and thus secure its return and its satisfaction. As the whole science, and only the whole, can exhibit what the idea or system of reason is, it is impossible to give, in a preliminary way, a general impression of philosophy philosophy, nor can a division of philosophy into parts be intelligible except in connection with the system. A preliminary division, like the limited conception from which it comes, can only be an anticipation. Here, however, it is premised that the idea turns out to be the thought which is completely identical with itself, not identical simply in the abstract, but also in its action of setting itself over against itself, so as to gain a being of its own, and yet of being in full possession of itself while it is in this other. Thus philosophy is subdivided into three parts. 1. Logic, the science of the idea in and for itself. 2. Philosophy of nature, the science of the idea in its otherness. 3. Philosophy of mind, the science of the idea come back to itself out of that otherness. As observed, the differences between the several philosophical sciences are only aspects or specializations of the one idea or system of reason which and which alone is alike exhibited in these different media. In nature, nothing else would have to be discerned except the idea, but the idea has here divested itself into its proper being. In mind again, the idea has asserted a being of its own and is on the way to become absolute. Every such form in which the idea is expressed it is at the same time a passing or fleeting stage. And hence, each of these subdivisions has not only to know its content as an object which has being for the time, but also in the same act to expand how these contents pass into their higher circle. To represent the relation between them as a division, therefore, leads to misconception. For coordinate several parts or sciences, one beside another, as if they had no innate development, but were like so many species, really and radically distinct. End of chapter one. Introduction. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter two of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter 2. Preliminary Notion. Logic is the science of the pure idea. Pure, that is, because the idea is in the abstract medium of thought. 
This definition, and the others which occur in these introductory outlines, are derived from a survey of the whole system, to which accordingly they are subsequent. The same remark applies to all prefatory notions whatever about philosophy. Logic might have been defined as the science of thought, and of its laws and characteristic forms. But thought, as thought, constitutes the only general medium, or qualifying circumstance, which renders the idea distinctively logical. If we identify the idea with thought, thought must not be taken in the sense of a method or form, but in the sense of a self-developing totality of its laws and peculiar terms. These laws are the work of thought itself, and not a fact which it finds and must submit to. From different points of view, logic is either the hardest or easiest of the sciences. Logic is hard because it has to deal not with perceptions nor, like geometry, with abstract representations of the senses, but with pure abstractions, and because it demands a force and facility of withdrawing into pure thought, of keeping firm hold on it and moving in such an element. Logic is easy because its facts are nothing but our own thought, and its familiar forms or terms. And these are the acme of simplicity, the ABC of everything else. They are also what we are best acquainted with, such as is and is not, quality and magnitude, being potential and being actual, one, many, and so on. But such an acquaintance only adds to the difficulty of the study, for while on the one hand we naturally think it not worth our trouble to occupy ourselves any longer with things so familiar, on the other hand the problem is to become acquainted with them in a new way, quite the opposite to that which we know them already. The utility of logic is a matter which concerns its bearings upon the student and the training it may give for other purposes. This logical training consists in the exercise in thinking, which a student has to go through. This science is the thinking of thinking, and in the fact that he stores his head with thoughts in their native unalloyed character. It is true that logic, being the absolute form of truth and another name for the very truth itself, is something more than merely useful. Yet what is noblest, most liberal, and most independent is also most useful. Logic has some claim to the latter character. Its utility must then be estimated at another rate than exercise in thought for the sake of exercise. The first question is, what is the object of our science? The simplest and most intelligible answer to this question is that truth is the object of logic. Truth is a noble word, and the thing nobler still. So long as man is sound at heart and in spirit, the search for truth must awake all enthusiasm of his nature. But immediately there steps in the objection. Are we able to know truth? There seems to be a disproportion between finite beings like ourselves and the truth which is absolute, and doubts suggest themselves whether there is any bridge between the finite and the infinite. God is truth. How shall we know him? Such an undertaking appears to stand in contradiction with the graces of lowliness and humility. Others who ask whether we can know the truth have a different purpose. They want to justify themselves in living on contented with their petty finite aims, and humility of this stamp is a poor thing. But the time has passed when people asked, How shall I, a poor worm of the dust, be able to know the truth? And instead, we may find vanity and conceit. People claim without any trouble on their part to breathe the very atmosphere of truth. The young have been flattered into the belief that they possess a natural birthright of moral and religious truth, and in the same strain those of riper years are declared to be sunk, petrified, ossified into falsehood. Youth, say these teachers, see the bright light of dawn, but the older generation lies in the sloth and mire of the common day. They admit that the special sciences are something that certainly ought to be cultivated, but merely as the means to satisfy the needs of outer life. In all this, it is not humility which holds back from knowledge and study of the truth, but a conviction that we are already in full possession of it. And no doubt, the youth carry with them the hopes of their elder compeers. On them rests the advance of the world and science. But these hopes are set upon the young only on the condition that, instead of remaining as they are, they undertake the stern labour of mind. This modesty in truth-seeking has still another phase, and that is the genteel indifference to truth as we see it in Pilate's conversation with Christ. Pilate asked, what is truth with the air of a man who had settled accounts with everything long ago included that nothing particularly matters he meant much the same as solomon when he says all is vanity when it comes to this nothing is left but self-conceit the knowledge of the truth meets an additional obstacle in timidity a slothful mind finds it natural to say don't let it be supposed that we mean to be in earnest with our philosophy we shall be glad inter alia to study logic but logic must be sure to leave us as we were before People have a feeling that, if thinking passes the ordinary range of our ideas and impressions, it cannot be but the evil road. 
they seem to be trusting themselves to a sea on which they will be tossed to and fro by the waves of thought till at length they again reach the sandbank of this temporal scene as utterly poor as when they left it what comes of such a view we see in the world it is possible within these limits to gain varied information and many accomplishments to become a master of official routine and to be trained for special purposes but it is quite another thing to educate the spirit for the higher life and to devote our energies to its service in our own day it may be hoped a longing for something better has sprung up among the young so that they will not be contented with the mere straw of outer knowledge it is universally agreed that thought is the object of knowledge but of thought our estimate may be very mean or it may be very high on one hand people say it is only a thought in their view thought is subjective arbitrary and accidental distinguished from the thing itself from the true and the real on the other hand a very high estimate may be formed of thought when thought alone is held adequate to attain the highest of all things the nature of god of which the senses can tell us nothing god is a spirit it is said and must be worshipped in spirit and in truth but the merely felt and sensible we admit is not the spiritual its heart of hearts is in thought and only spirit can know spirit and though it is true that spirit can demean itself as feeling and sense as is the case in religion the mere feeling as mode of consciousness is one thing and its contents another feeling as feeling is the general form of the sensuous nature which we have in common with the brutes this form viz feeling may possibly seize and appropriate the full organic truth but the form has no real congruity with its contents the form of feeling is the lowest in which spiritual truth can be expressed the world of spiritual existences god himself exists in proper truth only in thought and as thought if this be so therefore thought far from being a mere thought is the highest and in strict accuracy the sole mode of apprehending the eternal and absolute as of thought so also of the science of thought a very high or very low opinion may be formed any man it is supposed can think without logic as he can digest without studying physiology if he have studied logic he thinks afterwards as he did before perhaps more methodically but with little alteration if this were all and if logic did no more than make men acquainted with the action of thought as the faculty of comparison and classification it would produce nothing which had not been done quite as well before and in point of fact logic hitherto had no other idea of its duty than this yet to be well informed about thought even as a mere activity of the subject mind is honourable and interesting for man it is in knowing what he is and what he does that man is distinguished from the brutes we may take the higher estimate of thought as what alone can get really in touch with the supreme and true in that case logic as the science of thought occupies a high ground if the science of logic then considers thought in its actions and its productions and thought being no resultless energy produces thoughts and the particular thought required the theme of logic is in general the supersensible world and to deal with that theme is to dwell for a while in that world mathematics is concerned with the abstractions of time and space but these are still the object of sense although the sensible is abstract and idealized thought bids adieu even to this last and abstract sensible it asserts its own native independence renounces the field of external and internal sense and puts away the interests and inclinations of the individual when logic takes this ground it is a higher science than we are in the habit of supposing the necessity of understanding logic in a deeper sense than as science of the mere form of thought is enforced by the interests of religion and politics of law and morality in earlier days men meant no harm by thinking they thought away freely and fearlessly they thought about god about nature and the state and they felt sure that a knowledge of truth was attainable through thought only and not through the senses or any random ideas or opinions but while they so thought the principal ordinances of life began to be seriously affected by their conclusions thought deprived existing institutions of their force constitutions fell a victim to thought religion was assailed by thought firm religious beliefs which had been always looked upon as revelations were undermined and in many minds the old faith was upset the greek philosophers for example became antagonists of the old religion and destroyed its beliefs philosophers were accordingly banished or put to death as revolutionists who had subverted religion and the state two things which were inseparable 
thought in short made itself a power in the real world and exercised enormous influence the matter ended by drawing attention to the influence of thought and its claims were submitted to a more rigorous scrutiny by which the world professed to find that thought arrogated too much and was unable to perform what it had undertaken it had not people said learned the real being of god of nature and mind it had not learned what the truth was what it had done was to overthrow religion and the state it became urgent therefore to justify thought with reference to the results it had produced and it is this examination into nature of thought and this justification which in recent times has constituted one of the main problems of philosophy if we take our prima facie impression of thought we find on examination first a that in its usual subjective acceptation thought is one out of many activities or faculties of the mind coordinate with such others as sensation perception imagination desire volition and the like the product of this activity the form or character peculiar to thought is the universal or in general the abstract thought regarded as an activity may be accordingly described as the active universal and since its deed its product is the universal once more may be called a self-actualizing universal thought conceived as subject agent is a thinker and the subject existing as a thinker is simply denoted by the term i the propositions giving an account of thought in this and the following sections are not offered as assertions or opinions of mine on the matter but in these preliminary chapters any deduction or proof would be impossible and the statements may be taken as matters in evidence in other words every man when he thinks considers his thoughts will discover by the experience of his consciousness that they possess the character of universality as well as the other aspects of thought to be afterwards enumerated we assume of course that his power of attention and abstraction have undergone a previous training enabling him to observe correctly the evidence of his consciousness and his conceptions this introductory exposition has already alluded to the distinction between sense conception and thought as the distinction is of capital importance for understanding the nature and kinds of knowledge it will help to explain matters if we here call attention to it for the explanation of sense the readiest method certainly is to refer to its external source the organs of sense but to name the organ does not help much to explain what is apprehended by it the real distinction between sense and thought lies in this that the essential feature of the sensible is individuality and that the individual which reduced to its simplest terms is the atom is also a member of a group sensible experience presents a number of mutually exclusive units of units to speak in more definite and abstract formulae which exist side by side and after one another conception or picture thinking works with materials from the same sensuous source but these materials when conceived are expressly characterized as in me and therefore mine and secondly as universal or simple because only referred to self nor is sense the only source of materialized conception there are conceptions constituted by materials emanating from self-conscious thought such as those of law morality religion and even thought itself and it requires some effort to detect wherein lies the difference between such conceptions and thoughts having the same import for it is a thought of which such conception is the vehicle and there is no want of the form of universality without which no content could be in me or be a conception at all yet here also the peculiarity of conception is generally speaking to be sought in the individualism or isolation of its contents true it is that for example law and legal provisions do not exist in a sensible space mutually excluding one another nor as regards to time though they appear to some extent in succession are their contents themselves conceived as affected by time or as transient and changeable in it the fault in conception lies deeper these ideas though implicitly possessing the organic unity of mind stand isolated here and there on the broad ground of conception with its inward and abstract generality thus cut adrift each is simple unrelated right duty god conception in these circumstances either rest satisfied with declaring that right is right god is god or in a higher grade of culture it proceeds to enunciate the attributes as for instance god is the creator of the world omniscient almighty etc in this way several isolated simple predicates are strung together but in spite of the link supplied by their subject the predicates never get beyond mere contiguity 
In this point, conception coincides with understanding, the only distinction being that the latter introduces relations of universal and particular, of cause and effect, etc., and in this way supplies a necessary connection to the isolated ideas of conception, which last has left them side by side, in vague mental spaces, connected only by a bare and the difference between conception and thought is of special importance because philosophy may be said to do nothing but transform conceptions into thoughts though it works the further transformation of a mere thought into a notion sensible existence has been characterized by the attributes of individuality and mutual exclusion of the members it is well to remember that these very attributes of sense are thoughts and general terms it will be shown in the logic that thought and the universal is not a mere opposite of sense it lets nothing escape it but outflanking its other is at once that other and itself now language is the work of thought and hence all that is expressed in language must be universal what i only mean or suppose is mine it belongs to me this particular individual but language expresses nothing but universality and so i cannot say what i merely mean and the unutterable feeling or sensation far from being the highest truth is the most unimportant and untrue if i say the individual this individual here now all these are universal terms everything and anything is an individual a this and if it be sensible is here and now similarly when i say i i mean my single self to the exclusion of all others but what i say viz i is just every i which in like manner excludes all others from itself in an awkward expression which kant used he said that i accompany all my conceptions sensations too desires actions etc i is in essence and act the universal and such partnership is a form though an external form of universality all other men have it in common with me to be i just as it is common to all my sensations and conceptions to be mine but i in the abstract as such is the mere act of self-concentration or self-relation in which we make abstraction from all conception and feeling from every state of mind and every peculiarity of nature talent and experience to this extent i is the existence of a wholly abstract universality a principle of abstract freedom hence thought viewed as a subject is what is expressed by the word i and since i am at the same time in all my sensations conceptions and states of consciousness thought is everywhere present and in a category that runs through all these modifications our first impression when we use the term thought is of a subjective activity one among many similar faculties such as memory imagination and will were thought merely an activity of the subject mind and treated under that aspect by logic logic would resemble the other sciences in possessing a well-marked object it might in that case seem arbitrary to devote a special science to thought whilst will imagination and the rest were denied the same privilege the selection of one faculty however might even in this view be very well grounded on a certain authority acknowledged to belong to thought and on its claim to be regarded as the true nature of man in which consists his distinction from the brutes nor is it unimportant to study thought even as a subjective energy a detailed analysis of its nature would exhibit rules and laws a knowledge of which is derived from experience a treatment of the laws of thought from this point of view used once to form the body of logical science of that science aristotle was the founder he succeeded in assigning to thought what properly belongs to it our thought is extremely concrete but in its composite contents we must distinguish the part that properly belongs to thought or to abstract mode of its action a subtle spiritual bond consisting in the agency of thought is what gives unity to all these contents and it was this bond the form as form that aristotle noted and described up to the present day the logic of aristotle continues to be the received system it has indeed been spun out to greater length especially by the labours of the medieval schoolmen who without making any material additions merely refined in details the moderns have also left their mark upon this logic partly by omitting many points of logical doctrine due to aristotle and the schoolmen and partly by foisting in a quantity of psychological matter the purport of the science is to become acquainted with the procedure of finite thought and if it is adapted to its presupposed object the science is entitled to be styled correct 
The study of this formal logic undoubtedly has its uses. It sharpens the wits, as the phrase goes, and teaches us to collect our thoughts and to abstract. Whereas, in common consciousness, we have to deal with sensuous conceptions which cross and perplex one another. Abstraction, moreover, implies the concentration of the mind on a single point, and thus induces the habit of attending to our inward selves. An acquaintance with the forms of finite thought may be made a means of training the mind for the empirical sciences, since their method is regulated by these forms. And in this sense, logic has been designated instrumental. It is true, we may still be more liberal and say, logic is to be studied not for its utility, but for its own sake. The super-excellent is not to be sought for the sake of mere utility. In one sense, this is quite correct. But it may be replied that the super-excellent is also the most useful, because it is the all-sustaining principle which, having a subsistence of its own, may therefore serve as the vehicle of special ends which it furthers and secures. And thus, special ends, though they have no right to be set first, are still fostered by the presence of the highest good. Religion, for instance, has an absolute value of its own. Yet at the same time, other ends flourish and succeed in its train. As Christ says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and these things shall be added unto you. Particular ends can be attained only in the attainment of what absolutely is, and exists in its own right. b. Thought was described as active. We now, in the second place, consider this action in its bearings upon objects, or as reflection upon something. In this case, the universal, or product of its operation, contains the value of the thing is the essential, inward, and true. The old belief was quoted that the reality in object, circumstance, or event, the intrinsic worth or essence, the thing on which everything depends, is not a self-evident datum of consciousness or coincident with the first appearance and impression of the object. That, on the contrary, reflection is required in order to discover the real constitution of the object, and that by such reflection it will be ascertained. To reflect is a lesson which every child has to learn. One of his first lessons is to join adjectives with substantives. This obliges him to attend and distinguish. He has to remember a rule and apply it to a particular case. This rule is nothing but a universal, and the child must see that the particular adapts itself to this universal. In life, again, we have ends to attain, and with regards to these we ponder which is the best way to secure them. The end represents the universal, or governing principle, when we have means and instruments whose action we regulate in conformity to the end. In the same way, reflection is active in questions of conduct. To reflect here means to recollect the right, the duty, the universal, which serves as a fixed rule to guide our behaviour in the given case. Our particular act must imply and recognise the universal law. We find the same thing exhibited in our study of natural phenomena. For instance, we observe thunder and lightning. The phenomenon is a familiar one, and we often perceive it, but man is not content with bare acquaintance, or with the fact as it appears to the senses. He would like to get behind the surface, to know what it is, and to comprehend it. This leads him to reflect. He seeks to find out the cause as something distinct from the mere phenomenon. He tries to know the inside in its distinction from the outside. Hence the phenomenon becomes double. It splits into inside and outside, into force and its manifestation, into cause and effect. Once more, we find the inside or the force identified with the universal and permanent, not this or that flash of lightning, this or that plant, but that which continues, the same in them all. The sensible appearance is individual and evanescent. The permanent in it is discovered by reflection. Nature shows us a countless number of individual forms and phenomena. Into this variety we feel a need of introducing unity. We compare, consequently, and try to find the universal of each single case individuals are born and perish the species abides and recurs in them all and its existence is only visible to reflection under the same head fall such laws as those regulating the motion of the heavenly bodies to-day we see the stars here and to-morrow there and our mind finds something incongruous in this chaos something in which it can put no faith because it believes in order and in a simple constant and universal law inspired by this belief the mind has directed its reflection towards the phenomena and learnt their laws in other words it has established the movement of the heavenly bodies to be in accordance with universal law from which every change of position may be known and predicted the case is the same with the influences which make themselves felt in the infinite complexity of human conduct 
There too man has a belief in the sway of a general principle. From all these examples it may be gathered how reflection is always seeking for something fixed and permanent, definite in itself and governing the particulars. This universal which cannot be apprehended by the senses counts as the true and essential. Thus duties and rights are all important in the matter of conduct, and an action is true when it conforms to those universal formulae. In thus characterising the universal we become aware of its antithesis to something else. This something else is the merely immediate, outward and individual, as opposed to the immediate, inward and universal. The universal does not exist externally to the outward eye as a universal. The kind as kind cannot be perceived. The laws of the celestial motions are not written on the sky. The universe is neither seen nor heard. Its existence is only for the mind. Religion leads us to a universal which embraces all else within itself, and to an absolute by which all else is brought into being. And this absolute is an object not of the senses, but of the mind and of thought. C. By the act of reflection, something is altered in the way in which the fact was originally presented in sensation, perception, or conception. Thus, as it appears, an alteration of the object must be interposed before its true nature can be discovered. What reflection elicits is a product of our thought. Solon, for instance, produced out of his head the laws he gave to Athenians. This is half the truth, but we must not on that account forget that the universal in Solon's case the laws, is the very reverse of merely subjective, or fail to know that it is the essential, true, and objective being of things. To discover the truth in things, mere attention is not enough. We must call in action our own faculties to transform what is immediately before us. Now at first sight, this seems an inversion of the natural order, calculated to thwart the very purpose on which knowledge is bent. But the method is not so irrational as it seems. It has been the conviction of every age that the only way of reaching the permanent substratum was to transmute the given phenomenon by means of reflection. In modern times, a doubt has for the first time been raised on this point in connection with the difference alleged to exist between the products of our thought and the things in their own nature. This real nature of things, it is said, is very different from what we make out of them. The divorce between the thought and thing is mainly the work of the critical philosophy and runs counter to the conviction of all previous ages that their agreement was a matter of course. The antithesis between them is the hinge on which modern philosophy turns. Meanwhile, the natural belief of men gives lie to it. In common life we reflect, without particularly reminding ourselves, that this is the process of arriving at the truth, and we think without hesitation, and in the firm belief, that thought coincides with thing, and this belief is of the greatest importance. It marks the diseased state of the age when we see it adopt the despairing creed that our knowledge is only subjective, and that beyond the subjective we cannot go. Whereas rightly understood, truth is objective, and not so to regulate the conviction of every one, and the conviction of the individual is stamped as wrong when it does not agree with this rule. Modern views, on the contrary, put great value on the mere fact of conviction, and hold that to be convinced is good for its own sake, whatever be the burden of our conviction. There, being no standard by which we can measure its truth, we said above that, according to the old belief, it was the characteristic right of mind to know the truth. If this be so, it also implies everything we know, both outward and inward, nature in one word the objective world is in itself the same as it is in thought and that to think is to bring out the truth of our object the business of philosophy is only to bring into explicit consciousness what the world in all ages has believed about thought philosophy therefore advances nothing new our present discussion has led us to a conclusion which agrees with the natural belief of mankind d the real nature of the object is brought to light in reflection but it is no less true that this extension of thought is my act if this be so, the real nature is a product of my mind. In its character of thinking, subject, generated by me in simple universality, self-collected and removed from extraneous influences. In one word, in my freedom. Think for yourself is a phrase which people often use as if it had some special significance. The fact is no man can think for another any more than he can eat or drink for them. And the expression is a pleonism. To think is in fact ipso facto to be free, for thought as the action of the universal is an abstract relating of the self to self, or being at home with ourselves, and as regards to our subjectivity, utterly blank. Our consciousness is, in the matter of its contents, only in the fact and its characteristics. If this be admitted, and if we apply the term humility or modesty to an attitude where our subjectivity is not allowed to interfere, 
by act or quality, it is easy to appreciate the question touching the humility or modesty and pride of philosophy. For in point of contents, thought is only true in proportion as it sinks itself in the facts, and in point of form, it is no private or particular state or act of the subject, but rather that attitude of consciousness where the abstract self, freed from all special limitations to which its ordinary states or qualities are liable, restricts itself to that universal action in which it is identical with all individuals in these circumstances philosophy may be acquitted of the charge of pride and when aristotle summons the mind to rise to the dignity of that attitude the dignity he seeks is won by letting slip all our individual opinions and prejudices and submitting to the sway of the fact with these explanations and qualifications thoughts may be termed objective thoughts among which are also to be included the forms which are more especially discussed in the common logic where they are usually treated as forms of conscious thought only logic therefore coincides with metaphysics the science of things set and held in thoughts thoughts accredited able to express the essential reality of things an exposition of the relation in which such forms as notion judgment and the syllogism stand to others such as causality is a matter for the science itself but this much is evident beforehand if thought tries to form a notion of things this notion as well as its proximate phases the judgment and syllogism cannot be composed of articles and relations which are alien and irrelevant to the things reflection it was said above conducts the universal of things which universal is itself one of the constituent factors of a notion to say that reason or understanding is in the world is equivalent in its import to the phrase objective thought the latter phrase however is the inconvenience that thought is usually confined to express what belongs to the mind or consciousness only while objective is a term applied at least primarily only to the non-mental to speak of thought or objective thought as the heart and soul of the world may seem to be ascribing consciousness to the things of nature we feel certain repugnance against making thought the inward function of things especially as we speak of thought as marking the divergence of man from nature it would be necessary therefore if we use the term thought at all to speak of nature as the system of unconscious thought or to use schelling's expression a petrified intelligence in order to prevent misconception thought form or thought type should be substituted for the ambiguous term thought from what has been said the principles of logic are to be sought in the system of thought types or fundamental categories in which the opposition between subjective and objective in the usual sense vanishes the signification thus attached to thought and its characteristic forms may be illustrated by the ancient saying that spirit governs the world or by our own phrase that reason is in the world which means that reason is the soul of the world it inhabits its immanent principle its most proper and inward nature its universal another illustration is offered by the circumstance that in speaking of some definite animal we say it is an animal now the animal qua animal cannot be shown nothing can be pointed out except some special animal animal qua animal does not exist it is merely the universal nature of the individual animals whilst each existing animal is a more concretely defined and particularized thing but to be an animal the law of kind which is the universal in this case is the property of the particular animal and constitutes its definite essence take away from the dog its animality and it becomes impossible to say what it is all things have a permanent inward nature as well as an outward existence they live and die arise and pass away but their essential and universal part is the kind and this means much more than something common to them all if thought is the constitutive substance of external things it is also the universal substance of what is spiritual in all human perception thought is present so too thought is the universal in all the acts of conception and recollection in short in every mental activity in willing wishing and the like all these faculties are only further specializations of thought when it is presented in this light thought has a different part to play from what it has if we speak of a faculty of thought one among a crowd of other faculties such as perception conception and will with which it stands on the same level when it is seen to be the true universal of all that nature and mind contain it extends its scope far beyond all these and becomes the basis of everything from this view of thought in its objective meaning as spirit we may next pass to consider the subjective sense of the term we say first man is a being that thinks but we also say at the same time man is a being that perceives and wills man is a thinker and is universal 
but he is a thinker only because he feels his own universality. The animal, too, is by implication universal, but the universal is not consciously felt to be universal. It feels only the individual. The animal sees a singular object, for instance food or a man. For the animal, all this never goes beyond an individual thing. Similarly, sensation has to do with nothing but singulars, such as this pain or this sweet taste. Nature does not bring its spirit into consciousness. It is man who first makes himself double, so as to be a universal for a universal. This first happens when man knows that he is I. By the term I, I mean myself, a single and altogether determinate person. And yet I really utter nothing peculiar to myself, for everyone else is an I, or ego, and when I call myself I, though I indubitably mean the single person myself, I express a thorough universal. I, therefore, is a mere being for self in which everything peculiar or marked is renounced and buried out of sight it is as it were the ultimate and unanalyzable point of consciousness we may say i and thought are the same or more definitely i is thought as a thinker what i have in my consciousness is for me i is the vacuum or receptacle for anything and everything every man is a world of conceptions that lie buried in the night of the ego it follows that the ego is the universal in which we leave aside all that is particular and in which at the same time all the particulars have a latent existence in other words it is not mere universality and nothing more but the universality which includes in it everything commonly we use the word i without attaching much importance to it nor is it the object of study except to philosophical analysis in the ego we have thought before us in its utter purity while the brute cannot say i man can because it is in his nature to think. Now in the ego, there are a variety of contents, derived both from within and from without, and according to the nature of these contents, our state may be described as perception or conception or reminiscence. But in all of them the I is found, or in them all thought is present. Man therefore is always thinking, even in his perceptions. If he observes anything, he always observes it as a universal, fixes on a single point which he places in relief, thus withdrawing his attention from other points, and takes it as abstract and universal, even if the universal be only in form. In the case of our ordinary conceptions, two things may happen. Either the contents are moulded by thoughts, but not the form, or the form belongs to thought and not the contents. In using such terms, for instance, as anger, rose, hope, I am speaking of things which I have learnt in way of sensation, but I express these contents in a universal mode, that is, in the form of thought. I have left out much that is particular and given the contents in their generality, but still the contents remain sense-derived. On the other hand, when I represent God, the content is undeniably a product of pure thought, but the form still retains the sensuous limitations which it has, as I find it immediately present in myself. In these generalized images, the content is not merely and simply sensible, as it is in a visual inspection, but either the content is sensuous and the form appertains to thought, or vice versa. In the first case, the material is given to us, and our thought supplies the form. In the second case, the content which has its source in thought is by means of the form turned into something given, which accordingly reaches the mind from without logic is the study of thought pure and simple or of pure thought forms in the ordinary sense of the term by thought we generally represent to ourselves something more than simple and unmixed thought we mean some thought the material of which is from experience whereas in logic a thought is understood to include nothing else but what depends on thinking and what thinking has brought into existence it is in these circumstances that thoughts are pure thoughts the mind is then in its own home element and therefore free for freedom means that the other thing with which you deal is a second self so that you never leave your own ground but give the law to yourself in the impulses or appetites the beginning is from something else from something which we feel to be external in this case then we speak of dependence for freedom it is necessary that we should feel no presence of something else which is not ourselves the natural man whose motions follow the rule only of his appetites is not his own master be he as self-willed as he may the constituents of his will and opinion are not his own and his freedom is merely formal but when we think we renounce our selfish and particular being sink ourselves in the thing allow thought to follow its own course and if we add anything of our own we think ill 
we find that the other philosophical sciences the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of mind take the place as it were of an applied logic and that logic is the soul which animates them both their problem in that case is only to recognize the logical forms under the shapes they assume in nature and mind shapes which are only a particular mode of expression for the forms of pure thought if for instance we take the syllogism not as it was understood in the old formal logic but at its real value we shall find it gives expression to the law that the particular is the middle term which fuses together the extremes of the universal and the singular the syllogistic form is a universal form of all things everything that exists is a particular which couples together the universal and the singular but nature is weak and fails to exhibit the logical forms in their purity such a feeble exemplification of the syllogism may be seen in the magnet in the middle or point of indifference of a magnet its two poles however they may be distinguished are brought into one physics also teaches us to see the universal or essence in nature and the only difference between it and the philosophy of nature is that the latter brings before our mind the adequate forms of the notion in the physical world it will now be understood that logic is the all-animating spirit of all sciences and its category is the spiritual hierarchy they are the heart and centre of things and yet at the same time they are always on our lips and apparently at least perfectly familiar objects but things thus familiar are usually the greatest strangers being for example is a category of pure thought but to make is an object of investigation never occurs to us common fancy puts the absolute far away in a world beyond the absolute is rather directly before us so present that so long as we think we must though without express consciousness of it always carry it with us and always use it language is the main depository of these types of thought and one use of the grammatical instruction which children receive is unconsciously to turn their attention to distinctions of thought logic is usually said to be concerned with forms only and to derive the material for them from elsewhere but this only which assumes that the logical thoughts are nothing in comparison with the rest of the contents is not the word to use about forms which are the absolutely real grounded of everything everything else rather is an only compared with these thoughts to make such abstract forms a problem presupposes in the inquirer a higher level of culture than ordinary and to study them in themselves and for their own sake signifies in addition that these thought types must be deduced out of thought itself and their truth or reality examined by the light of their own laws we do not assume them as data from without and then define them or exhibit their value and authority by comparing them with the shape they take in our minds if we thus acted we should proceed from observation and experience and should for instance say we habitually employ the term force in such a case and such a meaning a definition like that would be called correct if it agreed with the conception of its object present in our ordinary state of mind the defect of this empirical method is that a notion is not defined as it is in and for itself but in terms of something assumed which is then used as a criterion and standard of correctness no such test need be applied we have merely to let the thought forms follow the impulse of their own organic life to ask if a category is true or not must sound strange to the ordinary mind for a category apparently becomes true only when it is applied to a given object and apart from this application it would seem meaningless to inquire into its truth but this is the very question on which everything turns we must however in the first place understand clearly what we mean by truth in common life truth means the agreement of an object with our conception of it we thus presuppose an object to which our conception must conform in the philosophical sense of the word on the other hand truth may be described in general abstract terms as the agreement of a thought content with itself this meaning is quite different from the one given above at the same time the deeper and philosophical meaning of truth can be partially traced even in the ordinary usage of language thus we speak of a true friend by which we mean a friend whose manner of conduct accords with the notion of friendship in the same way we speak of a true work of art untrue in this sense means the same as bad or self-discordant in this sense a bad state is an untrue state and evil and untruth may be said to consist in the contradiction subsisting between the functions or notion and the existence of the object of such a bad object we may form a correct representation but the import of such representation is inherently false 
Of these correctnesses, which are at the same time untruths, we may have many in our heads. God alone is the thorough harmony of notion and reality. All finite things involve an untruth. They have a notion and an existence, but their existence does not meet the requirement of the notion. For this reason they must perish, and then the incompatibility between their notion and their existence becomes manifest. It is in the kind that the individual animal has its notion, and the kind liberates itself from this individuality by death. The study of truth, or as it is here explained to mean consistency, constitutes the problem of logic. In our everyday mind, we are never troubled with questions about the truth of the forms of thought. We may also express the problem of logic by saying that it examines the forms of thought, touching their capability to hold truth. And the question comes to this. What are the forms of the infinite and what are the forms of the finite? Usually no suspicion attaches to the finite forms of thought. They are allowed to pass unquestioned. But it is from conforming to finite categories in thought and action that all deception originates. 3. Truth may be asserted by several methods, each of which is however no more than a form. Experience is the first of these methods, but the method is only a form. It has no intrinsic value of its own. For in experience, everything depends on the mind we bring to bear upon actuality. A great mind is great in its existence, and in the motley play of phenomena at once perceives the point of real significance. The idea is present in actual shape, not something as it were over the hill and far away. The genius of Goethe, for example, looking into nature or history, has great experiences, catches the sight of living principle, and gives expression to it. A second method of apprehending the truth is reflection, which defines it by intellectual relations of condition and conditioned. But in these two modes, the absolute truth has not yet found its appropriate form. The most perfect method of knowledge proceeds in the pure form of thought. And here, the attitude of man is one of entire freedom. That the form of thought is the perfect form, and that it presents the truth as it intrinsically and actually is, is the general dogma of all philosophy. To give a proof of the dogma there is, in the first instance, nothing to do but show that these other forms of knowledge are finite the grand scepticism of antiquity accomplished this task when it exhibited the contradictions contained in every one of these forms that scepticism indeed went further but when it ventured to assail the forms of reason it began by insinuating under them something finite upon which it might fasten all the forms of finite thought will make their appearance in the course of logical development the order in which they present themselves being determined by necessary laws here in the introduction they could only be unscientifically assumed as something given in the theory of logic itself these forms will be exhibited not only on their negative but on their positive side when we compare the different forms of ascertaining truth with one another the first of them immediate knowledge may perhaps seem the finest noblest and most appropriate it includes everything which the moralists term innocence as well as religious feeling simple trust love fidelity and natural faith the two other forms, first reflective and secondly philosophical cognition, must leave that unsat natural harmony behind. And so far as they have this in common, the method which claimed to apprehend the truth by thought may naturally be regarded as part and parcel of the pride which leads man to trust his own powers for a knowledge of the truth. Such a position involves a thoroughgoing disruption, and viewed in that light, might be regarded as the source of all evil and wickedness, the original transgression. Apparently, therefore, the only way of being reconciled and restored to peace is to surrender all claims to think or know this lapse from natural unity has not escaped notice and nations from the earliest times have asked the meaning of the wonderful division of the spirit against itself no such inward disunion is found in nature natural things do nothing wicked the mosaic legend of the fall of man has preserved an ancient picture representing the origin and consequence of this disunion the incidents of the legend form the basis of an essential article of the creed the doctrine of original sin in man and its consequent need of succour it may be well at the commencement of logic to examine the story which treats of the origin and the bearings of the very knowledge which logic has to discuss for though philosophy must not allow herself to be overawed by religion or to accept the position of existence on sufferance she cannot afford to neglect these popular conceptions the tales and allegories of religion which have enjoyed for thousands of years the veneration of nations are not to be set aside as antiquated even now upon closer inspection of the story of the fall we find as we already said that it exemplifies 
realise the universal bearings of knowledge upon the spiritual life. In its instinctive and natural stage, spiritual life wears the garb of innocence and confiding simplicity. But the very essence of spirit implies the absorption of this immediate condition in something higher. The spiritual is distinguished from the natural, and more especially from the animal life, in the circumstance that it does not continue a mere stream of tendency, but sunders itself to self-realisation. But this position of severed life has in its turn to be suppressed, and the spirit has by its own act to win its way to concord again the final concord then is spiritual that is the principle of restoration is found in thought and thought only the hand that inflicts the wound is also the hand which heals it we are told in our story that adam and eve the first human beings the types of humanity were placed in a garden where grew a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil god it is said had forbidden them to eat the fruit of this latter tree of the tree of life for present nothing further is said these words evidently assume that man is not intended to seek knowledge not to remain in the state of innocence other meditative races it may be remarked have held the same belief that the primitive state of mankind was one of innocence and harmony now all this is to a certain extent correct the disunion that appears throughout humanity is not a condition to rest in but it is a mistake to regard the natural and immediate harmony as the right state the mind is not mere instinct on the contrary it essentially involves the tendency to reasoning and meditation childlike innocence no doubt has in it something fascinating and attractive but only because it reminds us of what the spirit must win for itself the harmoniousness of childhood is a gift from the hand of nature the second harmony must spring from the labour and culture of the spirit and so the words of christ except ye become as little children etc are very far from telling us we must always remain children again we find in the narrative of moses that the occasion which led man to leave his natural unity is attributed to solicitation from without the serpent was the tempter but the truth is is that the step into opposition the awakening of consciousness follows from the very nature of man and the same history repeats itself in every son of adam the serpent represents likeness to god as consisting in knowledge of good and evil and it is just this knowledge in which a man participates when he breaks the unity of his instinctive being and eats the forbidden fruit the first reflection of awakened consciousness in men told them that they were naked this is a naive and profound trait for the sense of shame bears evidence to the separation of man from his natural sensuous life the beasts never get so far as this separation and they feel no shame and it is in the human feeling of shame that we are to seek the spiritual and moral origin of dress compared with which the merely physical need is a secondary matter next comes the curse as it is called which god pronounced upon man the prominent point in that curse turns chiefly on to the contrast between man and nature man must work in the sweat of his brow and woman bring forth in sorrow as to work if it is the result of the disunion it is also the victory over it the beasts have nothing more to do but to pick up the materials required to satisfy their wants man on the contrary can only satisfy his wants by himself producing and transforming the necessary means thus even in the outside things man is dealing with himself the story does not close with the expulsion from paradise we are further told god said behold adam it is become as one of us to know good and evil knowledge is now spoken as divine and not as before as something wrong and forbidden such words contain a confutation of idle talk that philosophy pertains only to the finitude of the mind philosophy is knowledge and it is through knowledge that man first realises his original vocation to be the image of god when the record adds that god drove men out of the garden of eden to prevent their eating of the tree of life it only means on his natural side certainly man is finite and mortal but in knowledge infinite we all know the theological dogma that man's nature is evil tainted with what is called original sin now while we accept the dogma we must give up the setting of incident which represents original sin as consequent upon an accidental act of the first man for the very notion of spirit is enough to show that man is evil by nature and it is an error to imagine that he could ever be otherwise to such extent as man is and acts like a creature of nature his whole behaviour is what it ought not to be for the spirit it is a duty to be free and to realise itself by its own act nature is for man only the starting point which he has to transform the theological doctrine of original sin is a profound truth but modern enlightenment prefers to believe that man is naturally good and that he acts right so long as he continues true to nature the hour when man leaves the path of mere natural being marks the difference between him a self-conscious agent and the natural world but this schism though it forms a necessary element in the very notion of spirit is not the final goal of man it is to this state of inward breach that the whole finite action of thought and will belongs in that finite sphere man pursues ends of his own and draws from himself the material of his conduct 
while he pursues these aims to the uttermost while his knowledge and his will seek himself his own narrow self apart from the universal he is evil and his evil is to be subjective we seem at first to be a double evil here but both are really in the same man in so far as he is spirit is not the creature of nature and when he behaves as such and follows the cravings of appetite he wills to be so the natural wickedness of man is therefore unlike the natural life of animals a mere natural life may be more exactly defined by saying that the natural man as such is an individual for nature in every part is in the bonds of individualism thus when man wills to be a creature of nature he wills in the same degree to be an individual simply yet against such impulsive and appetitive action due to the individualism of nature there are also steps in the law or general principle this law may either be an external force or have the form of divine authority so long as he continues in his natural state man is in bondage to the law it is true that among the instincts and affections of man there are social or benevolent inclinations love sympathy and others reaching beyond his selfish isolation but so long as these tendencies are instinctive their virtual universality of scope and purport is vitiated by the subjective form which always allows free play to self-seeking and random action the term objective thoughts indicates the truth the truth which is to be the absolute object of philosophy not merely the goal at which it aims but the very expression cannot fail to suggest an opposition to characterize and appreciate which is the main motive of the philosophical attitude of the present time and which forms the real problem of the question about truth and our means of ascertaining it if the thought forms are vitiated by a fixed antithesis i e if they are only of a finite character they are unsuitable for the self-centred universe of truth and truth can find no adequate receptacle in thought such thought which can produce only limited and partial categories and proceed by their means is what in the stricter sense of the word is termed understanding the finitude further of these categories lies in two points firstly they are only subjective and the antithesis of an objective permanently clings to them secondly they are always of restricted content and so persist in antithesis to one another and still more to the absolute in order to more fully explain the position and import here attributed to logic the attitudes in which thought is supposed to stand to objectivity will next be examined by way of further introduction in my phenomenology of the spirit which on that account was at its publication described as the first part of the system of philosophy the method adopted was to begin with the first and simplest phase of mind immediate consciousness and to show how that stage gradually of necessity worked onward to the philosophical point of view the necessity of that view being proved by the process but in these circumstances it was impossible to restrict the quest to mere form of consciousness for the stage of philosophical knowledge is the richest in material and organization and therefore as it came before us in the shape of a result it presupposed the existence of the concrete formations of consciousness such as individual social morality art and religion in the development of consciousness which at first sight appears limited to the point of form merely there is thus at the same time included the development of the matter or the objects discussed in the special branches of philosophy but the latter process must so to speak go on behind consciousness since those factors are the essential nucleus which is raised into consciousness the exposition accordingly is rendered more intricate because so much that properly belongs to concrete branches is prematurely dragged into the introduction the survey which follows in the present work has even more the inconvenience of being only historical and inferential in its method but it tries especially to show how the questions men have proposed outside the school on the nature of knowledge faith and the like questions which they imagine have no connection with abstract thoughts are really reducible to the simple categories which first get cleared up in logic end of chapter two recorded by ryan smallwood Chapter 3 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter 3 First Attitude of Thought to Objectivity. The first of these attitudes of thoughts is seen in the method which has no doubts and no sense of the contradiction in thought, or of the hostility of thought against itself. 
It entertains an unquestioning belief that reflection is the means of ascertaining the truth, and of bringing the objects before the mind as they really are. And in this belief it advances straight upon its objects, takes the materials furnished by the sense and perception, and reproduces them from itself as facts of thought. And then, believing this result to be truth, the method is content. Philosophy in its earliest stages, all the sciences, and even daily action and movement of consciousness, live in this faith. This method of thought has never become aware of the antithesis of subjective and objective, and to that extent there is nothing to prevent its statements from possessing a genuinely philosophical and speculative character, though it is just as possible that they may never get beyond finite categories, or the stage where the antithesis is still unresolved. In the present introduction, the main question for us is to observe this attitude of thought in its extreme form, and we shall accordingly first of all examine its second and inferior aspect as a philosophic system. One of the clearest instances of it, and the one lying nearest to ourselves, may be found in the metaphysics of past as it subsisted among us previous to the philosophy of Kant. It is, however, only in reference to the history of philosophy that this metaphysic can be said to belong to the past. The thing is always and at all places to be found as the view which the abstract understanding takes of the objects of reason. And it is in this point that the real and immediate good lies of a closer examination of its main scope and its modus operandi. This metaphysical system took the laws and forms of thought to be the fundamental laws and forms of things. It assumed that to think a thing was the means of finding its very self and nature, and to that extent it occupied a higher ground than the critical philosophy which succeeded it. But in the first instance, one, these terms of thought were cut off from their connection, their solidarity. Each was believed valid by itself and capable of serving as a predicate of the truth. It was the general assumption of this metaphysic that a knowledge of the absolute was gained by assigning predicates to it. It neither inquired what the terms of understanding specially meant, or what they were worth, nor did it test the method which characterises the absolute by the assignment of predicates. As an example of such predicates may be taken existence in the proposition, God has existence, finitude or infinity in the question, is the world finite or infinite, simple and complex in the proposition, the soul is simple, or again, the thing is a unity, a whole, etc. Nobody asked whether such predicates had any intrinsic and independent truth, or if the propositional form could be a form of truth. The metaphysic of the past assumed, as unsophisticated belief always does, that thought apprehends the very self of things, and that things to become what they truly are required to be thought for nature and the human soul are very proteus in their perpetual transformations and it soon occurs to the observer that the first crude impression of things is not their essential being this is a point of view the very reverse of the result arrived at by critical philosophy a result of which it may be said that it bade man go and feed on mere husks and chaff we must look more closely into the procedure of that old metaphysic in the first place it never went beyond the province of the analytic understanding without preliminary inquiry it adopted the abstract categories of thought and let them rank as predicates of truth but in using the term thought we must not forget the difference between finite or discursive thinking and thinking which is infinite and rational the categories as they meet us prima facie in isolation are finite forms but truth is always infinite and cannot be expressed or presented to consciousness in finite terms the phrase infinite thought may excite surprise if we adhere to the modern conception that thought is always limited but it is speaking rightly the very essence of thought to be infinite the nominal explanation of calling a thing finite is that it has an end that it exists up to a certain point only where it comes into contact with and is limited by its other the finite therefore subsists in reference to its other which is its negation and presents itself as its limit now thought is always in its own sphere its relations are with itself and it is its own object in having a thought for object i am at home with myself the thinking power the i is therefore infinite because when it thinks it is in relation to an object which is itself generally speaking an object means a something else a negative confronting me but in the case where thought thinks itself it has an object which is at the same time no object in other words its objectivity is suppressed and transformed into an idea thought as thought therefore in its unmixed nature involves no limits it is finite only when it keeps to limited categories which it believes to be ultimate infinite or speculative thought on the contrary while it no less defines does in the very act of limiting and defining make that defect vanish 
And so infinity is not, as most frequently happens, to be conceived as an abstract away and away for ever and ever, but in the simple manner previously indicated. The thinking of the old metaphysical system was finite. Its whole mode of action was regulated by categories, the limits of which it believed to be permanently fixed and not subject to any further negation. Thus one of its questions was, has God existence? The question supposes that existence is an altogether positive to him, a sort of ne plus ultra. We shall see, however, at a later point, that existence is by no means a merely positive term, but one which is too low for the absolute idea and unworthy of God. A second question in these metaphysical systems was, is the world finite or infinite? The very terms of the question assume that the finite is a permanent contradictory to the infinite. And one can easily see that, when they are so opposed, the infinite, which of course ought to be the whole, only appears as a single aspect and suffers restriction from the finite. But a restricted infinity is only a finite. In the same way, it was asked whether the soul was simple or composite. Simpleness was, in other words, taken to be an ultimate characteristic, giving expression to a whole truth. Far from being so, simpleness is the expression of a half-truth, as one-sided and abstract as existence, a term of thought which, as we shall hereafter see, is itself untrue and hence unable to hold truth. If the soul be viewed as merely and abstractly simple, it is characterised in an inadequate and finite way. It was therefore the main question of the pre-Kantian metaphysic to discover whether predicates of the kind mentioned were to be ascribed to its objects. Now these predicates are, after all, only limited formulae of the understanding. Instead of expressing the truth, merely impose a limit. More than this, it should be noted that the chief feature of the method lay in assigning or attributing predicates to the object that was to be cognized, for example, to God. But attribution is no more than an external reflection about the object. The predicates by which the object is to be determined are supplied from the resources of picture thought and are applied in a mechanical way. Whereas, if we are to have genuine cognition, the object must characterize its own self and not derive its predicates from without. Even supposing we follow the method of predicating, the mind cannot help feeling the predicates of this sort fail to exhaust the object. From the same point of view, the Orientals are quite correct in calling God the many-named or the myriad-named one. One after another of these finite categories leaves the soul unsatisfied, and the Oriental sage is compelled unceasingly to seek for more and more of such predicates. In finite things, it is no doubt the case that they have to be characterized through finite predicates. And with these things, the understanding finds proper scope for its special action. Itself finite, it knows only the nature of the finite. Thus, when I call some action a theft, I have characterized the action in its essential facts. And such a knowledge is sufficient for the judge. Similarly, finite things stand to each other as a cause and effect, force and exercise. When they are apprehended in these categories, they are known in their finitude. But the objects of reason cannot be defined by these finite predicates. To try to do so was the defect of the old metaphysics. Predicates of this kind, taken individually, have but a limited range of meaning, and no one can fail to perceive how inadequate they are, and how far they fall below the detail which our imaginative thought gives in the case, for example, of God, mind, or nature. Besides, though the fact of their being all predicates of one subject supplies them with a certain connection, their several meanings keep them apart, and consequently each is brought in as a stranger in relation to the others. The first of these defects the Orientals sought to remedy when, for example, they defined God by attributing to him many names. But still, they felt that the number of names would have to be infinite. 2. In the second place, the metaphysical systems adopted a wrong criterion. Their objects were no doubt totalities, which in their own proper selves belonged to reason, that is, to the organised and systematically developed universe of thought. But these totalities, God, the soul, the world, were taken by the metaphysician as subjects, made and ready, to form the basis for an application of the categories of the understanding. They were assumed from popular conception. Accordingly, popular conception was the only canon for settling whether or not predicates were suitable and sufficient. The common conceptions of God, the soul, the world, may be supposed to afford thought a firm and fast footing. They do not really do so. Besides having a particular and subjective character clinging to them, and thus leaving room for a great variety of interpretation, they themselves first of all require a firm and fast definition by thought. This may be seen in any of these propositions where the predicate, or in philosophy the category, is needed to indicate what the subject, or the conception we start with, is. 
In such a sentence as, God is eternal, we begin with the conception of God, not knowing as yet what he is. To tell us that is the business of the predicate. In the principles of logic, accordingly, where terms formulating the subject matter are those of thought only, it is not merely superfluous to make these categories predicates to propositions in which God, or still vaguer the absolute, is the subject, but it would also have the disadvantage of suggesting another canon than the nature of thought besides the propositional form and for proposition it would be more correct to substitute judgment is not suited to express the concrete and the true is always concrete or the speculative every judgment is by the form one-sided and to that extent false this metaphysic was not free or objective thinking instead of letting the object freely and spontaneously expound its own characteristics metaphysic presupposed it ready-made if any one wishes to know what free thought means he must go to greek philosophy for scholasticism like these metaphysical systems accepted its facts and accepted them as a dogma from the authority of the church we moderns too by our whole upbringing have been initiated into ideas which it is extremely difficult to overstep on account of their far-reaching significance but the ancient philosophers were in a different position they were men who lived wholly in the perceptions of the senses and who after their rejection of mythology and its fancies presupposed nothing but the heaven above and the earth around in these material non-metaphysical surroundings thought is free and enjoys its own privacy cleared of everything material and thoroughly at home this feeling that we are all our own is characteristic of free thought and that voyage into the open where nothing is below us or above us and we stand in solitude with ourselves alone three in the third place this system of metaphysic turned into dogmatism when our thought never ranges beyond narrow and rigid terms we are forced to assume that of two opposite assertions such as were the above propositions the one must be true and the other false dogmatism may be the most simply described as the contrary of scepticism the ancient sceptics gave the name of dogmatism to every philosophy whatever holding a system of definite doctrine in this large sense scepticism may apply the name even to philosophy which is properly speculative but in the narrower sense dogmatism consists in the tenacity which draws a hard and fast line between certain terms and others opposite to them we may either see this clearly in the strict either or for instance the world is either finite or infinite but one of these two it must be the contrary of this rigidity is the characteristic of all speculative truth there no such inadequate formulae are allowed nor can they possibly exhaust it these are formulae speculative truth holds in union as a totality whereas dogmatism invests them in their isolation with a title to fixity and truth it often happens in philosophy the half truth takes its place besides the whole truth and assumes on its own account the position of something permanent but the fact is that half truth instead of being a fixed or self-subsistent principle is a mere element absolved and included in the whole the metaphysic of understanding is dogmatic because it maintains half-truths in their isolation whereas the idealism of speculative philosophy carries out the principle of totality and shows that it can reach beyond the inadequate formularies of abstract thought thus idealism would say the soul is neither finite only nor infinite only it is really the one just as much as the other and in that way neither the one nor the other in other words such formularies in their isolation are inadmissible and only come into account as formative elements in a larger notion such idealism we see even in the ordinary phases of consciousness thus we say of sensible things that they are changeable that is they are but it is equally true that they are not we show more obstinacy in dealing with the categories of the understanding these are terms we believe to be somewhat firmer or even absolutely firm and fast we look upon them as separate from each other by an infinite chasm so that the opposite categories can never get at each other the battle of reason is the struggle to break up the rigidity to which the understanding has reduced everything the first part of this metaphysic in its systematic form is ontology or the doctrine of the abstract characteristics of being the multitude of these characteristics and the limits set to their applicability are not founded upon any principle they have in consequence to be enumerated as experience and circumstances direct and the import ascribed to them is founded only upon common centralized conceptions upon assertions that particular words are used in a particular sense and even perhaps upon etymology if experience pronounces the list to be complete and if the usage of language by its agreement shows the analysis to be correct the metaphysician is satisfied and the intrinsic and independent truth and necessity of such characterization is never made a matter of investigation at all 
To ask if being, existence, finitude, simplicity, complexity, etc., are notions intrinsically and independently true, must surprise those who believe that a question about truth can only concern propositions, and to whether a notion is or is not with the truth to be attributed, as the phrase is, to a subject, and that falsehood lies in the contradiction existing between the subject in our ideas, the notion to be predicated of it. Now, as the notion is concrete, it, and every character of it in general, is essentially a self-contained unity of distinct characteristics if truth were nothing more than the absence of contradiction it would be first of all necessary in the case of every notion to examine whether it taken individually did not contain the sort of intrinsic contradiction the second branch of the metaphysical system was rational psychology or pneumatology it dealt with the metaphysical nature of the soul that is of the mind regarded as a thing it expected to find immortality in a sphere dominated by the laws of composition time qualitative change and quantitative increase or decrease the name rational given to this species of psychology served to contrast it with empirical modes of observing the phenomena of the soul rational psychology viewed the soul in its metaphysical nature and through the categories supplied by abstract thought the rationalists endeavoured to ascertain the inner nature of the soul as it is in itself and as it is for thought in philosophy at present we hear little of the soul the favourite term now is mind spirit the two are distinct soul being as it were the middle term between body and spirit or the bond between the two the mind as soul is immersed in corporeity and the soul is the animating principle of the body the pre-kantian metaphysic we say view the soul as a thing thing is a very ambiguous word by a thing we mean firstly an immediate existence something we represent in sensuous form and in this meaning the term has been applied to the soul hence the question regarding the seat of the soul of course if the soul have a seat it is the space and sensuously envisaged so too if the soul be viewed as a thing we can ask whether the soul is simple or composite the question is important as bearing on the immortality of the soul which is supposed to depend on the absence of composition but the fact is that in abstract simplicity we have a category which as little corresponds to the nature of the soul as that of compositeness one word on the relation of rational to empirical psychology the former because it sets itself to apply thought to cognize mind and even to demonstrate the result of such thinking is the higher whereas empirical psychology starts from perception and only recounts and describes what perception supplies but if we propose to think the mind we must not be quite so shy of its special phenomena mind is essentially active in the same sense as the schoolmen said that god is absolute actuosity but if the mind is active it must as it were utter itself it is wrong therefore to take the mind for a processless ans as did the old metaphysic which divided the processless inward life of the mind from its outward life the mind of all things must be looked at in its concrete actuality in its energy and in such a way that its manifestations are seen to be determined by its inward force the third branch of metaphysics was cosmology the topics it embraced were the world its contingency necessity eternity limitations in time and space the laws only formal of its changes the freedom of man and the origin of evil to these topics it applied what were believed to be thoroughgoing contrasts such as contingency and necessity external and internal necessity efficient and final cause or causality in general and design essence or substance and phenomenon form and matter freedom and necessity happiness and pain good and evil the object of cosmology comprised not merely nature but mind too in its external complication in its phenomenon in fact existence in general or the sum of infinite things this object however it viewed not as a concrete whole but only under certain abstract points of view thus the questions cosmology attempted to solve were such as these is accident or necessity dominant in the world is the world eternal or created it was therefore a chief concern of this study to lay down what were called general cosmological laws for instance that nature does not act by fits and starts and by fits and starts they meant a qualitative difference or qualitative alteration showing itself without any antecedent determining mean whereas on the contrary a gradual change of quantity is obviously not without intermediation in regard to mind as it makes itself felt in the world the questions which cosmology chiefly discussed turned upon the freedom of man and the origin of evil nobody can deny that these are questions of the highest importance but to give them a satisfactory answer it is above all things necessary not to claim finality for the abstract form 
formulae of understanding, or to suppose that each of the two terms in an antithesis has independent subsistence or can be treated in its isolation as a complete and self-centred truth. This, however, is the general position taken by the metaphysicians before Kant, and appears in their cosmological discussions, which for that reason were incapable of compassing their purpose, to understand the phenomena of the world. Observe how they proceed with the distinction between freedom and necessity, in their application of these categories to nature and mind. Nature they regard as subject, in its working to necessity. Mind they hold to be free. No doubt there is real foundation for this distinction in the very core of mind itself. But freedom and necessity, when thus abstractly opposed, are terms applicable only to the finite world to which as such they belong. A freedom involving no necessity, or mere necessity without freedom, are abstract and in this way untrue formulae of thought. Freedom is no blank indeterminateness. Essentially concrete and unvaryingly self-determinate, it is so far at the same time necessary. Necessity, again, in the ordinary acceptation of the term in popular philosophy, means determination from without only, as in finite mechanics, where a body moves only when it is struck by another body, and moves in the direction communicated to it by the impact. This, however, is merely an external necessity, not the real inward necessity which is identical with freedom. The case is similar with the contrast of good and evil, the favourite contrast of the introspective modern world. If we regard evil as possessing a fixity of its own, apart and distinct from good, we are to a certain extent extent right there is an opposition between them nor do those who maintain the apparent and relative character of the opposition mean that good and evil in the absolute are one or in accordance with the modern phrase that a thing first becomes evil from our way of looking at it the error arises when we take evil as a permanent positive instead of what it really is a negative though it would fain assert itself has no real persistence and is in fact only the absolute sham existence of negativity itself the fourth branch of metaphysics is natural or rational theology the notion of god or god as a possible being the proofs of his existence and his properties formed the study of this branch when understanding thus discusses the deity its main purpose is to find what predicates correspond or not to the fact we have in our imagination as god and in doing so it assumes the contrast between positive and negative to be absolute and hence in the long run nothing is left for the notion as understanding takes it but the empty abstraction of indeterminate being or mere reality or positivity the lifeless product of modern deism the method of demonstration employed in finite knowledge must always lead to an inversion of the true order for it requires the statement of some objective ground for god's being which thus acquires the appearance of being derived from something else this mode of proof guided as it is by the canon of mere analytic identity is embarrassed by the difficulty of passing from the finite to the infinite either the finitude of the existing world which is left as much a fact as it was before clings to the notion of deity and god as to be defined as the immediate substance of the world which is pantheism or he remains an object set over against the subject and in this way finite which is dualism the attributes of god which ought to be various and precise have properly speaking sunk and disappeared into abstract notion of pure reality or indeterminate being yet in our material thought the finite world continues meanwhile to have real being with god as a sort of antithesis and thus arises the further picture of different relations of god to the world these formulated as properties must on the one hand as relations to finite circumstances themselves possess a finite character giving us such properties as just gracious mighty wise etc on the other hand they might be infinite now on this level of thought the only means and a hazy one of reconciling these opposing requirements was the quantitative exaltation of the properties forcing them into indeterminateness into the sensus eminentior but it was an expedient which really destroyed the property and left a mere name the object of the old metaphysical theology was to see how far unassisted reason could go in the knowledge of god certainly a reason derived knowledge of god is the highest problem of philosophy the earliest teachings of religion are figurate conceptions of god these conceptions as the creed arranges them are imparted to us in youth they are doctrines of our religion and in so far as the individual rests his faith on these doctrines and feels them to be truth he is all he needs as a christian such is faith and the science of this faith is theology but until theology is something more than a bare enumeration and compilation of these doctrines ab extra it has no right to the title of science even the method so much in vogue at present the purely historical mode of treatment which for example reports what has been said by this or the other father of the church does not invest theology with a scientific character to get that we must go on to comprehend the facts by thought which is the business of philosophy genuine theology is thus at the same time a real 
real philosophy of religion, as it was, we may add, in the Middle Ages. And now let us examine this rational theology more narrowly. It was a science which approached God not by reason but by understanding, and its mode of thought employed the terms without any sense of their mutual limitations and connections. The notion of God formed the subject of discussion, and yet the criterion of our knowledge was derived from such extraneous source as the materialized conception of God. Now thought must be free in its movements. It is no doubt to be remembered that the result of independent thought harmonizes the import of the Christian religion. For the Christian religion is a revelation of reason. But such a harmony surpassed the effort of rational theology. It proposed to define the figurate conception of God in terms of thought. But it resulted in a notion of God which was, we may call the abstract of positivity or reality. To the exclusion of all other negation, God was accordingly defined to be the most real of all beings. Any one can see, however, that this most real of beings, in which negation forms no part, is the very opposite of what it ought to be, and of what understanding supposes it to be. Instead of being rich and full above measure, it is so narrowly conceived that it is, on the contrary, extremely poor and altogether empty. It is with reason that the heart craves a concrete body of truth, but without definite feature, that is, without negation, contained in the notion there can only be an abstraction. When the notion of God is apprehended only as that of the abstract or most real being, God is, as it were, relegated to another world beyond, and to speak of a knowledge of him would be meaningless. Where there is no definite quality, knowledge is impossible. Mere light is mere darkness. The second problem of rational theology was to prove the existence of God. Now in this matter, the main point to be noted is that the demonstration as the understanding employs it means the dependence of one truth on another. In such proofs we have a presupposition, something firm and fast from which something else follows. We exhibit the dependence of some truth from an assumed starting point. Hence, if this mode of demonstration is applied to existence of God, it can only mean that being of God is to depend on other terms, which will then constitute the ground of his being it is at once evident that this will lead to some mistakes for god must be simply and solely the ground of everything and in so far not dependent upon anything else and a perception of this danger has in modern times led some to say that god's existence is not capable of proof but must be immediately or intuitively apprehended reason however and even sound common sense give demonstration a meaning quite different from the understanding the demonstration of reason no doubt starts from something which is not god but as it advances it does not leave the starting point a mere unexplained fact which is what it was on the contrary it exhibits that point as derivative and called into being and then god is seen to be primary truly immediate and self-subsisting with the means of derivation wrapped up and absorbed in himself those who say consider nature and nature will lead you to god you will find an absolute and final cause do not mean that god is something derivative they mean that it is we who proceed to god himself from another and in this way god through the consequence is also absolute ground of the initial step the relation of the two things is reversed and what came as a consequence being shown to be an antecedent the original antecedent is reduced to a consequence this is always the way moreover whenever reason demonstrates if in light of the present discussion we cast one glance more on the metaphysical method as a whole we find its main characteristic was to make abstract identity its principle and to try to apprehend the objects of reason by the abstract and finite categories of the understanding but this infinite of the understanding this pure essence is still finite it has excluded all the variety of particular things which thus limit and deny it instead of winning a concrete this metaphysic stuck fast on an abstract identity its good point was the perception that thought alone constitutes the essence of all that is it derived its materials from earlier philosophers particularly the schoolmen in speculative philosophy the understanding undoubtedly forms a stage but not a stage at which we should keep forever standing plato is no metaphysician of this imperfect type still less aristotle though the contrary is still generally believed End of chapter 3. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Part 1 of chapter 4 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Second Attitude of Thought to Objectivity. 1. Empiricism. Under these circumstances, a double want began to be felt. Partly it was the need of a concrete subject matter, as a counterpoise to the abstract theories of understanding, which is unable to advance, unaided from its generalities, to specialization and determination. 
partly too it was the demand for something fixed and secure so as to exclude the possibility of proving anything and everything in the sphere and according to the method of the finite formulae of thought such was the genesis of empirical philosophy which abandons the search for truth in thought itself and goes to fetch it from experience the outward and the inward present the rise of empiricism is due to the need thus stated of concrete contents and a firm footing needs which abstract metaphysics of the understanding fail to satisfy now by concreteness of contents it is meant that we must know the objects of consciousness as intrinsically determinate and as the unity of distinct characteristics but as we have already seen this is by no means the case with the metaphysic of understanding if it conform to its principle with the mere understanding thinking is limited to the form of an abstract universal and can never advance to the particularization of this universal thus we find the metaphysicians engaged in an attempt to elicit by the instrumentality of thought what was the essence of fundamental attribute of the soul the soul they say is simple the simplicity thus ascribed to the soul meant a mere and utter simplicity from which difference is excluded difference or in other words composition being made the fundamental attribute of body or matter in general clearly in simplicity of this narrow type we have a very shallow category quite incapable of embracing the wealth of the soul or the mind when it thus appeared that abstract metaphysical thinking was inadequate it was felt that resource must be had to empirical psychology the same happened in the case of rational physics the current phrases there were for instance that space is infinite that nature makes no leap etc evidently this phraseology was wholly unsatisfactory in presence of the plentitude and life of nature to some extent this source from which empiricism draws is common to it with metaphysic it is in our materialized conceptions i e in facts which emanate in the first instance from experience that metaphysic also finds the guarantee for the correctness of its definitions including both its initial assumptions and its more detailed body of doctrine but on the other hand it must be noted that the single sensation is not the same thing as experience and that the empirical school elevates the facts included under sensation feeling and perception into the form of general ideas propositions or laws this however it does with the reservation that these general principles such as force are to have no further import or validity of their own beyond that taken from the sense impression and that no connection will be deemed legitimate except what can be shown to exist in phenomena and on the subjective side empirical cognition has its stable footing in the fact that in a sensation consciousness is directly present and certain of itself in empiricism lies the great principle that whatever is true must be in the actual world and present to sensation this principle principle contradicts that ought to be on the strength of which reflection is vain enough to treat the actual present with scorn and to point to a scene beyond a scene which is assumed to have place and being only in the understanding of those who talk of it no less than empiricism philosophy recognises only what it is and has nothing to do with what merely ought to be and what is thus confessed not to exist on the subjective side too it is right to notice the valuable principle of freedom involved in empiricism for the main lesson of empiricism is that man must see for himself and feel that he is present in every fact of knowledge which he has to accept when it is carried out to its legitimate consequences empiricism being in its fact limited to the finite sphere denies the supersensible in general or at least any knowledge of it which would define its nature it leaves thought no powers except abstraction and formal universality and identity but there is a fundamental delusion in all scientific empiricism and employs the metaphysical categories of matter force those of one many generality infinity etc following the clue given by these categories it proceeds to draw conclusions and in doing so presupposes and applies the syllogistic form and while it is unaware that it contains metaphysics in wielding which it makes use of those categories and their combinations in a style utterly thoughtless and uncritical from empiricism came the cry stop roaming in empty abstractions keep your eyes open lay hold on man and nature as they are here before you enjoy the present moment nobody can deny that there is a good deal of truth in these words the everyday world what is here and now was a good exchange for the futile other world for the mirages and the chimeras of abstract understanding and thus was acquired an infinite principle that solid footing so much missed in the old metaphysic finite principles are the most that understanding can pick out and these being essentially unstable and tottering the structure they supported must collapse with a crash 
Always the instinct of reason was to find an infinite principle, and yet the time had not come for finding it in thought. Hence, this instinct seized upon the present, the here, the this, where doubtless there is implicit infinite form, but not in the genuine existence of that form. The external world is the truth if it could but know it, for the truth is actual and must exist. The infinite principle, the self-centred truth, therefore, is the world for reason to discover, though it exists in an individual and sensible shape, and not in its truth. Besides, this school makes sense perception the form in which fact is to be apprehended, and in this consists the defect of empiricism. Sense perception as such is always individual, always transient, not indeed that the process of knowledge stops short at sensation. On the contrary, it proceeds to find out the universal and permanent element in the individual apprehended by sense. This is the process leading from simple perception to experience. In order to form experiences, empiricism makes a special use of the form of analysis. In the impression of sense, we have a concrete of many elements, the several attributes of which we are expected to peel off one by one, like the coats of an onion. In thus dismembering the thing, it is understood that we disintegrate and take to pieces these attributes which have coalesced and add nothing but our own act of disintegration. Yet analysis is the process from the immediacy of sensation to thought. Those attributes which the object analysed contain in union, acquire the form of universality by being separated. Empiricism, therefore, labours under a delusion, if it supposes that while analysing the objects, it leaves them as they were it really transforms the concrete into an abstract and as a consequence this change of the living thing is killed life can exist only in the concrete and one not that we can do without this division if it be our intention to comprehend mind itself is an inherent division the error lies in forgetting that it is only half of the process and that the main point is the reunion of what has been parted and it is where analysis never gets beyond the stage of partition that the words of the poet are true in caeres in nature nentikemi Spattet ihr selbst und weiß nicht wie, hat die Teile in ihrer Hand, fällt leider nur das Gesicht der Band. Analysis starts from the concrete, and the possession of this material gives it a considerable advantage over the abstract thinking of the old metaphysics. It establishes the differences in things, and this is very important, but these very differences are nothing after all but abstract attributes, i.e. thoughts. These thoughts, it is assumed, contain the real essence of the object, and thus once more we see the axiom of bygone metaphysics reappear, that the truth of things lies in thought. Let us next compare the empirical theory with that of metaphysics in the matter of their respective contents we find the latter as already stated taking for its theme the universal object of reason viz god the soul and the world and these themes accepted from popular conception it was the problem of philosophy to reduce into the form of thoughts another specimen of the same method was the scholastic philosophy the theme presupposed by which was formed by the dogmas of the christian church and it aimed at fixing their meaning and giving them a systematic arrangement through thought the facts on which empiricism is based are of entirely different kind they are the sensible facts of nature and the facts of the finite mind in other words empiricism deals with the finite material and the old metaphysicians had an infinite though let us add they made this infinite content finite by the finite form of the understanding the same finitude of form reappears in empiricism but here the facts are finite also to this extent then both modes of philosophizing have the same method both proceed from data or assumptions which they accept as ultimate generally speaking empiricism finds the truth in the outward world and even if it allows a supersensible world it holds knowledge of that world to be impossible and would restrict us to the province of sense perception this doctrine when systematically carried out produces what has been laterally named materialism materialism of this stamp looks upon matter qua matter as the genuine objective world but with matter we are at once introduced to an abstraction which as such cannot be perceived and it may be maintained that there is no matter because as it exists it is always something definite and concrete yet the abstraction we term matter is supposed to lie in the basis of the whole world of sense and expresses the sense world in its simplest terms as out and out individualism and hence a congeries of points in mutual exclusion so long then as the sensible sphere is and continues to be for empiricism a mere datum we have a doctrine of bondage for we become free when we are confronted by no absolutely alien world but depend on a fact which we ourselves are consistently with the empirical point of view besides reason and unreason can only be subjective in other words we must take what is given just as it is we have no right to ask whether to what extent it is rational in its own nature touching this principle it has been justly observed that in what we call experience as distinct from mere single perception of single facts there are two elements the one is the matter infinite in its multiplicity and it stands a mere set of singulars 
the other is the form the characteristics of universality and necessity mere experience no doubt offers many perhaps innumerable cases of similar perceptions but after all no multitude however great can be the same thing as universality similarly mere experience affords perception of changes succeeding each other and of objects in juxtaposition but it presents no necessary connection if perception therefore is to maintain its claim to be the sole basis of what men hold for truth universality and the necessity appear something illegitimate they become an accident of our mind a mere custom the content of which might be otherwise constituted than it is it is an important corollary of this theory that on this empirical mode of treatment legal and ethical principles and laws as well as the truths of religion are exhibited as work of chance stripped of their objective character and inner truth the scepticism of hume to which this conclusion was chiefly due should be clearly marked off from greek scepticism hume assumes the truth of the empirical element feeling and sensation and proceeds to challenge the universal principles and laws because they have no warranty from sense perception so far away was ancient scepticism from making feeling and sensation the canon of truth that it turned against the deliverances of sense first of all two the critical philosophy in common with empiricism the critical philosophy assumes that experience affords one sole foundation for cognitions which however it does not allow to rank as truths but only as knowledge of phenomena the critical theory starts originally from distinction of elements presented in the analysis of experience viz the matter of sense and its universal relations taking into account hume's criticism on this distinction as given in the preceding section viz that sensation does not explicitly apprehend more than an individual or more than a event and insists at the same time on the fact that universality and necessity are seen to perform a function equally essential in constituting what is called experience this element not being derived from empirical facts as such must belong to the spontaneity of thought in other words it is a priori the categories or notions of the understanding constitute the objectivity of experimental cognitions in every case they involve a connective reference and hence through their means are formed synthetic judgments a priori that is primary and underivative connections of opposites even hume's scepticism does not deny that characteristics of universality and necessity are found in cognition and even in kant this fact remains a presupposition after all it may be said the use of ordinary phraseology of the sciences that kant did no more than offer another explanation of the fact the critical philosophy proceeds to test the value of the categories implied in metaphysic as well as in other sciences and in ordinary conception this scrutiny however is not directed to the content of these categories nor does it inquire into the exact relation they bear to one another but simply considers them as affected by the contrast between subjective and objective the contrast as we are to understand it here bears upon the distinction of the two elements in experience the name of objectivity is here given to the element of universality and necessity i e to the categories themselves or what is called the a priori constituent the critical philosophy however widen the contrast in such a way that subjectivity comes to embrace the ensemble of experience including both the aforementioned elements and nothing remains the other side but the thing itself the special forms of the a priori element in other words of thought which in spite of its objectivity is looked upon as a purely subjective act present themselves as follows in a systematic order which it may be remarked is solely based upon psychological and historical grounds a very important step was undoubtedly made when the terms of the old metaphysic were subjected to scrutiny the plain thinker pursued in an unsuspecting way in those categories which had offered themselves naturally it never occurred to him to ask to what extent these categories had a value and authority of their own if as has been said it is characteristic of free thought to allow no assumptions to pass unquestioned the old metaphysic would not free thinkers they accepted their categories as they were without further trouble as an a priori datum not just tested by reflection the critical philosophy reversed this kant undertook to examine how far the forms of thought were capable of leading the knowledge of truth in particular he demanded a criticism of the faculty of cognition as preliminary to its exercise this is a fair demand if it means that even the forms of thought must be made an object of investigation unfortunately there soon creeps in the misconception of already knowing before you know the error of refusing to enter the water until you should have learned to swim true indeed the forms of thought should be subjected to a scrutiny before they are used yet what is this scrutiny but ipso facto a cognition so that what we want is to combine in our process of inquiry the action of the forms of thought with a criticism of them the forms of thought must be studied in their essential nature and complete development they are at once the 
object of research and the action of that object. Hence, they examine themselves in their own action. They must determine their limits and point out their defects. This is the action of thought, which will hereafter be specially considered under the name dialectic, and regarding which we need only at the outset observe, instead of being brought to bear upon categories from without, it is imminent in their own action. We may, however, state the first point in Kant's philosophy as follows. Thought must itself investigate its own capacity of knowledge. People in the present day have to get over Kant and his philosophy. Everybody wants to get further, but there are two ways of going further, a backward and a forward. The light of criticism soon shows that many of our modern essays in philosophy are mere repetitions, and the old metaphysical method an endless and uncritical thinking in a groove determined by the natural bent of each man's mind. Kant's examination of the categories suffers from the grave defect of viewing them, not absolutely and for their own sake, but in order to see whether they are subjective or objective. In the language of common life, we mean by objective what exists outside us and reaches us without by means of sensation. What Kant did was to deny the categories such as cause and effect, or in this sense of the word objective or given in sensation, and to maintain on the contrary that they belong to our own thought itself, to the spontaneity of thought. To that extent, therefore, they were subjective, and yet in spite of this, Kant gives the name objective to what is thought, to the universal and necessary, while he describes as subjective whatever is merely felt. This arrangement apparently reverses the first mentioned use of the word, and has caused Kant to be charged with confusing language. But this charge is unfair if we more narrowly consider the facts of the case. The vulgar believe that the objects of perception which confront them, such as an individual animal or a single star, are independent and permanent existences, compared with which which thoughts are unsubstantial and dependent on something else. In fact, however, the perceptions of sense are the properly dependent and secondary feature, while the thoughts are really independent and primary. This being so, Kant gave the title of objective to the intellectual factor, to the universal and necessary. He was quite justified in doing so. Our sensations, on the other hand, are subjective, for sensations lack stability in their own nature, and are no less fleeting and evanescent than thought is permanent and self-subsisting. At the present day, the special line of distinction established by Kant between the subjective and objective is adopted by the phraseology of the educated world. Thus, the criticism of a work of art ought, it is said, to not be subjective, but objective. And in other words, instead of springing from the particular and accidental feeling or temper of the moment, it should keep its eye on the general points of view which the laws of art establish. In the same acceptation, we can distinguish in any scientific pursuit the objective and subjective interest of the investigation. But after all, objectivity of thought in Kant's sense is again to a certain extent subjective. Thoughts according to Kant although universal and necessary categories are only our thoughts separated by an impassable gulf from the thing as it exists apart from our knowledge but the true objectivity of thinking means that thoughts far from being merely ours must at the same time be the real essence of things and of whatever is an object to us. Objective and subjective are convenient expressions in current use, the employment of which may easily lead to confusion. Up to this point the discussion has shown three meanings of objectivity. First it means what has an external existence, in distinction from which the subjective is what is only supposed, dreamed, etc. Secondly, it is the meaning attached to it by Kant, that the universal and necessary, as distinguished from the particular, subjective and occasional element which belongs to our sensation. Thirdly, it has been just explained, it means thought apprehended essence of the existing thing, in contradistinction from what is merely our thought, and what consequently is still separated from the thing itself, as it exists in independent essence. End of part one of chapter four. Recorded by Ryan Smallwood. Part 2 of Chapter 4 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of Chapter 4, Second Attitude of Thought to Objectivity. A. The Theoretical Faculty, Cognition qua Cognition. The specific ground of the categories is declared by the critical system to lie in the primary identity of the I in thought, what Kant calls the transcendental unity of self-consciousness. 
The impressions from feeling and perception are, if we look to their contents, a multiplicity of miscellany of elements, and the multiplicity is equally conspicuous in their form. For sense is marked by a mutual exclusion of members, and that under two aspects, namely space and time, which being the forms, that is to say, the universal type of perception, are themselves a priori. This congeries afforded by sensation and perception must, however, be reduced to an identity or primary synthesis. To accomplish this, the I brings it in relation to itself and unites it there in one consciousness, which Kant calls pure apperception. The specific modes in which the ego refers to itself, the multiplicity of senses, are the pure concepts of understanding, the categories. Kant, it is well known, did not put himself to much trouble in discovering the categories. I, the unity of self-consciousness being quite abstract and completely indeterminate, the question arises, how are we to get at the specialized form of the I, the categories? Fortunately, the common logic offers our hand an empirical classification of the kinds of judgment. Now to judge is the same as to think of a determinate object. Hence, the various modes of judgment, as enumerated to our hand, provide us with several categories of thought. To the philosophy of Fichte belongs the great merit of having called attention to the need of exhibiting the necessity of these categories and giving a genuine deduction of them. Fichte ought to have produced at least one effect on the method of logic. One might have expected that the general laws of thought the usual stock and trade of logicians or the classifications of notions and syllogisms would no longer be taken merely from observation and so only empirically treated but deduced from thought itself if thought is to be capable of proving anything at all if logic must insist on the necessity of proofs and if it proposes to teach the theory of demonstration its first care should be to give a reason for its own subject matter and to see that it is necessary kant therefore holds that the categories have their source in the ego and that the ego consequently supplies the characteristics of universality and necessity if we observe what we have before us primarily we may describe it as a congeries or diversity and in the categories we find the simple points or units to which this congeries is made to converge the world of sense is a scene of mutual exclusion its being is outside itself that is the fundamental feature of the sensible now has no meaning except in reference to a before and a hereafter red in the same way only subsist by being opposed to yellow and blue now this other thing is outside the sensible which latter is only in so far as it is not the other and only in so far as the other is but thought or the ego occupies a position the very reverse of the sensible with its mutual exclusions and being outside itself the i is the primary identity at one with itself and all at home in itself the word i expresses the mere act of bringing to bear upon self and whatever is planned in this unit or focus is affected by it and transformed into it the i is as it were the crucible and the fire which consumes the loose plurality of sense and reduces it to unity this is the process which kant calls pure apperception in distinction from the common apperception to which the plurality it receives is a plurality still whereas pure apperception is rather an act by which the eye makes the materials mine this view has at least the merit of giving correct expression to the nature of all consciousness the tendency of all men's endeavours is to understand the world to appropriate and subdue it to himself and to this end the positive reality of the world must be as it were crushed and pounded in other words idealized at the same time we must note that it is not the mere act of our personal self-consciousness which introduces an absolute unity into the variety of sense rather this identity is itself absolute the absolute is as it were so kind as to leave individual things to their own enjoyment and it again drives them back to the absolute unity expressions like the transcendental unity of self-consciousness have an ugly look about them and suggest a monster in the background but their meaning is not so abstruse as it looks kant's meaning of transcendental may be gathered by the way he distinguishes it from transcendent the transcendent may be said to be what stops out beyond the categories of the understanding a sense in which the term is first employed in mathematics thus in geometry you are told to conceive the circumference of a circle as formed of an infinite number of infinitely small straight lines in other words characteristics which understanding holds to be totally different the straight line and the curve are expressly invested with identity another transcendent of the same kind is the self-consciousness when it is identical with itself and infinite in itself as distinguished from the ordinary consciousness which derives its form and tone 
from finite materials. That unity of self consciousness, however, Kant calls transcendental only, and he meant thereby that the unity was only in our minds and did not attach to objects apart from our knowledge of them. To regard the categories as subjective only, i.e., as a part of ourselves, must seem very odd to the natural mind, and no doubt there is something queer about it. It is quite true, however, that the categories are not contained in the sensation as it is given us. When, for instance, we look at a piece of sugar, we find it hard, white, sweet, etc. All of these properties, we say, are united in one object. Now it is this unity that is not found in the sensation. The same thing happens if we conceive two events to stand in relation of cause and effect. The senses only inform us of the two several occurrences which follow each other in time, but that the one is the cause, the other the effect, in other words, the causal nexus between the two, is not perceived by sense, it is only evident to thought. Still, though the categories, such as unity or cause and effect, are strictly the property of thought, it by no means follows that they must be ours merely and not characteristics of the object. Kant, however, confines them to the subject mind, and his philosophy may be styled subjective idealism for he holds that both the form and the matter of knowledge are supplied by the ego or knowing subject the form by our intellectual the matter by our sentient ego so regards the content of this subjective idealism not a word need be wasted it might perhaps at first sight be imagined that objects would lose their reality when their unity was transferred to the subject but neither we nor the objects would have anything to gain by the mere fact they possessed being the main point is not that they are but what they are and whether or not their content is true it does no good to the things to say merely that they have being what has being will also cease to be when time creeps over it it might also be alleged that subjective idealism tended to promote self-conceit but surely if a man's world be the sum of his sensible perceptions he has no reason to be vain of such a world laying aside therefore as unimportant this distinction between subjective and objective we are chiefly interested in knowing what a thing is i e its content which is no more objective than it is subjective if mere existence be enough to make objectivity even a crime is objective but it is an existence which is nullity at its core as is definitely made apparent when the day of punishment comes the categories may be viewed in two aspects on the one hand it is by their instrumentality that the mere perception of sense rises to objectivity in experience on the other hand these notions are unities in our consciousness merely they are consequently conditioned by the material given to them and having nothing of their own they can be applied to use only within the range of experience but the other constituent of experience the impressions of feeling and perception is not one whit less subjective than the categories to assert the categories taken by themselves are empty can scarcely be right seeing that they have a content at all events in the special stamp and significance which they possess of course the content of the categories is not perceptible to the senses nor is it in time and space but that is rather a merit than a defect a glimpse of this meaning of content may be observed to affect our ordinary thinking a book or a speech for example is said to have a great deal in it to be full of content in proportion to the greater number of thoughts and general results to be found in it whilst on the contrary we should never say that any book for example a novel had much in it because it included a great number of single incidents situations and the like even the popular voice thus recognises that something more than the facts of sense is needed to make a work pregnant with the matter and what is this additional desideratum but thoughts or in the first instance the categories and yet it is not altogether wrong it should be added to call the categories of themselves empty if it be meant that they and the logical idea of which they are the members do not constitute the whole of philosophy but necessarily lead onwards in due progress to the real departments of nature and mind only let the progress not be misunderstood the logical idea does not thereby come into possession of a content originally foreign to it but by its own native action is specialised and developed to nature and mind it follows that the categories are no fit terms to express the absolute the absolute not being given in perception and understanding or knowledge by means of the categories is consequently incapable of knowing the things in themselves the thing in itself and under thing is embraced even mind and god expresses the object when we leave out of sight all consciousness makes of it all of its emotional aspects and specific thoughts of it it is easy to see what is left utter abstraction total emptiness only described still as an other world the negative of every image feeling indefinite thought nor does it require much penetration to see that this caput mortem is still only a product of thought such as accrues when thought is carried to abstraction unalloyed 
that it is work of the empty ego which makes an object out of this empty self identity of its own the negative characteristic which this abstract identity receives as an object is also enumerated among the categories of kant and is no less familiar than the empty identity aforesaid hence one can only read with surprise this perceptual remark that we do not know the thing in itself on the contrary there is nothing we can know so easily it is reason the faculty of the unconditioned which discovers the conditioned nature of the knowledge compromised in experience what is thus called the object of reason the infinite or unconditioned is nothing but the self-sameness or primary identity of the ego and thought reason itself is the name given to the abstract ego or thought which makes this pure identity its aim or object now this identity having no definite attribute at all can receive no illumination from the truths of experience for the reason that these refer always to definite facts such is the sort of unconditioned that is supposed to be the absolute truth of reason what is termed idea whilst the cognitions of experience are reduced to the level of untruth and declared to be appearances kant was the first definitely to signalise the distinction between reason and understanding the object of the former as he applied the term was the infinite and unconditioned of the latter the finite and conditioned kant did valuable service when he enforced the finite character of the cognitions of the understanding founded merely upon experience and stamped their contents with the name of appearance but his mistake was to stop at the purely negative point of view and to limit the unconditionality of reason to an abstract self-sameness without any shade of distinction it degrades reason to a finite and conditioned thing to identify it with a mere stepping beyond the finite and conditioned range of understanding the real infinite far from being a mere transcendence of the finite always involves the absorption of the finite into its own fuller nature in the same way kant restored the idea to its proper dignity vindicating it for reason as a thing distinct from the abstract analytic determinations or from the merely sensible conceptions which usually appropriate to themselves the name of ideas but as respects to the idea also he never got beyond its negative aspect as what ought to be but is not the view that objects of immediate consciousness which constitute the body of experience are mere appearances phenomena was another important result of the kantian philosophy common sense that mixture of sense and understanding believes the objects of which it has knowledge to be severally independent and self-supporting and when it becomes evident that they tend towards and limit one another the interdependence of one upon another is reckoned something foreign to them and to their true nature the very opposite is the truth the things immediately known are mere appearances in other words the ground of their being is not in themselves but in something else but then comes the important step of defining what this something else is according to kant the things that we know about are to us appearances only we can never know their essential nature which belongs to another world we cannot approach plain minds have not unreasonably taken exception to this subjective idealism with the reduction of the facts of consciousness to a purely personal world created by ourselves alone for the true statement of the case is rather as follows the things of which we have direct consciousness are mere phenomena not for us only but in their own nature and the true and proper case of these things finite as they are is to have their existence founded not in themselves but in the universal divine idea this view of things it is true is as idealist as kant's but its contradiction to the subjective idealism of the critical philosophy should be termed absolute idealism absolute idealism however though it is far advanced of vulgar realism is by no means merely restricted to philosophy it lies at the root of all religion for religion too believes the actual world we see the sum total of existence to be created and governed by god but it is not enough to simply indicate the existence of the object of reason curiosity impels us to seek for knowledge of this identity this empty thing in itself but knowledge means such an acquaintance with the object as apprehends its distinct and special subject matter but such subject matter involves a complex inner connection in the object itself and supplies a ground of connection with many other objects in the present case to express the nature of the features of the infinite or thing in itself reason would have nothing except the categories and in any endeavour so to employ them reason becomes oversoaring or transcendent here begins the second stage of the criticism of reason which as an independent piece of work is more valuable than the first the first part as has been explained above teaches that categories originate in the unity of self-consciousness that any knowledge which is gained by their means has nothing objective in it and that the very objectivity claimed for them is only subjective 
So far as this goes, the Kantian criticism presents the common type of idealism, known as subjective idealism. It asks no questions about the meaning or scope of the categories, but simply considers the abstract form of subjectivity and objectivity, and that even in such a partial way that the former aspect, that of subjectivity, is retained as a final and purely affirmative term of thought. In the second part, however, when Kant examines the application, as it is called, which reason makes of the categories in order to know its object the content of the categories at least in some points of view comes in for discussion or at any rate an opportunity presented itself for a discussion of the question it is worthwhile to see what decision kant arrives at on the subject of metaphysics as this application of the categories to the unconditioned is called his method of procedure we shall here briefly state and criticize the first of the unconditioned entities which kant examines is the soul in my consciousness he says quote, i always find that i am the determining subject am singular or abstractly simple am identical or one and the same in all the variety of what i am conscious of distinguish myself as thinking from all things outside of me End quote. now the method of the old metaphysic as kant correctly states consisted in substituting for these statements of experience the corresponding categories or metaphysical terms thus arise these four new propositions a the soul is a substance b it is a simple substance c it is numerically identical at various periods of existence d it stands in relation to space kant discusses this translation and draws attention to the paralogism or mistake of confounding one kind of truth with another he points out that empirical attributes have been replaced by categories and shows that we are not entitled to argue from the former to the latter or to put the latter in place of the former this criticism obviously but repeats the observation of hume that the categories as a whole ideas of universality and necessity are entirely absent from sensation and that the empirical fact both in form and contents differ from its intellectual formulation if the purely empirical fact were held to constitute the credentials of thought then no doubt it would be indispensable to be able to precisely identify the idea in the impression and in order to make out in his criticism the metaphysical psychology that the soul cannot be described as substantial simple self-same and as maintaining its independence in the intercourse with the material world kant argues from the single ground that the several attributes of the soul which consciousness lets us feel in experience are not exactly the same attributes as the result from the action of thought thereon but we have seen above that according to kant all knowledge even experience consists in thinking our impressions in other words in transforming into intellectual categories the attributes primary belonging to sensation unquestionably one good result of the kantian criticism was that it emancipated mental philosophy from the soul thing from the categories and consequently from questions about the simplicity complexity materiality etc of the soul even for the common sense of ordinary man the true point of view from which the inadmissibility of these forms best appears will be not that they are thoughts but that thoughts of such a stamp neither can nor do contain truth if thought and phenomenon do not perfectly correspond to one another we are free at least to choose which of the two shall be held the defaulter the kantian idealism where it touches on the world of reason throws the blame on the thoughts saying that the thoughts are defective and not being exactly fitted to the sensations and to the mode of mind wholly restricted within the range of sensation in which as such there are no traces of the presence of these thoughts but as the actual content of thought no question is raised paralogisms are a species of unsound syllogism the especial vice of which consists in employing one and the same word in two premises with a different meaning according to kant the method adopted by the rational psychology of the old metaphysics when they assume that the qualities of the phenomenal soul as given in experience formed part of its own real essence was based upon such a paralogism nor can it be denied that predicates like simplicity performance etc are inapplicable to the soul but their unfitness is not due to the ground assigned by kant that reason by applying them would exceed its appointed bounds the true ground is that this style of abstract terms is not good enough for the soul which is very much more than a mere simple or unchangeable sort of thing and thus for example while the soul may be admitted to be simple self-sameness it is at the same time active and institutes distinctions in its own nature but whatever is merely or abstractly simple is as such also a mere dead thing by his polemic against the metaphysic of the past kant discarded the predicates of the soul or mind he did well but when he came to state his reasons his failure is apparent the second unconditioned object is the world 
in the attempt which reason makes to comprehend the unconditioned nature of the world, it falls into what are called antinomies. In other words, it maintains two opposite propositions about the same object, and in such a way that each of them has to be maintained with equal necessity. For this, it follows that the body of cosmical fact, the specific statements descriptive of which run into contradictions, cannot be the self-subsistent reality but only an appearance. The explanation offered by Kant alleges that the contradiction does not affect the object in its own proper essence, but attaches only to the reason which seeks to comprehend it. In this way, the suggestion was broached that the contradiction is occasioned by the subject matter itself, or by the intrinsic quality of the categories, and to offer the idea that the contradiction introduced into the world of reason by the categories of understanding is inevitable and essential was to make one of the most important steps in the progress of modern philosophy. But the more important the issue thus raised the more trivial was its solution its only motive was an excess of tenderness for things of the world the blemish of contradiction it seems could not be allowed to mar the essence of the world but there could be no objection to attach to thinking reason to the essence of mind probably nobody will feel disposed to deny that the phenomenal world presents contradictions to the observing mind meaning by phenomenal the world as it presents itself to the senses and understanding to the subjective mind but if a comparison is instituted between the essence of the world and the essence of the mind it does seem strange to hear how calmly and confidently the modest dogma has been advanced by one and repeated by others that thought or reason not the world is the seat of contradiction it is no escape to turn round and explain that reason falls into contradiction only by applying the categories for this application of the categories is maintained to be necessary and reason is not supposed to be equipped with any other forms but the categories for the purpose of cognition but cognition is determining and determinate thinking so if reason be a mere empty indeterminate thinking it thinks nothing and if in the end reason be reduced to mere identity without diversity it will in the end also win a happy release from contradiction at the slight sacrifice of all its facts and contents it may also be noted that his failure to make a more thorough study of antinomony was one of the reasons why kant enumerated only four antinomonies these four attracted his notice because as may be seen in his discussion of the so-called paralogisms of reason he assumed the list of the categories as a basis of his argument employing what has subsequently become a favourite fashion he simply put the object under a rubric otherwise ready to hand instead of deducing its characteristics from its notion further deficiencies in the treatment of the antinomonies i have pointed out as occasion offered in my science of logic here it will be sufficient to say that the antinomonies are not confined to the four special objects objects taken from the cosmology they appear in all objects of every kind in all conceptions notions and ideas to be aware of this and to know objects in this property of theirs makes a vital part in a philosophical theory for the property thus indicated is what we shall afterwards describe as the dialectical influence in logic the principles of the metaphysical philosophy gave rise to the belief that when cognition lapsed into contradictions it was mere accidental aberration due to some subjective mistake in argument and inference according to kant however thought has a natural tendency to issue in contradictions or antinomonies whenever it seeks to apprehend the infinite we have in the latter part of the above paragraph referred to the philosophical importance of the antinomonies of reason and show how the recognition of their existence helped largely to get rid of the rigid dogmatism of the metaphysics of understanding and to direct attention to the dialectical movement of thought but here too kant as we must add never got beyond the negative result that the thing in itself is unknowable and never penetrated to the discovery of what the antinomonies really and positively mean that true and positive meaning of the antinomonies is this that every actual thing involves a coexistence of opposed elements consequently to know or in other words to comprehend an object is equivalent to being conscious of it as a concrete unity of opposed determinations the old metaphysic as we have already seen when it studied the objects of which it sought a metaphysical knowledge went to work by applying categories abstractly and to the exclusion of their opposites kant on the other hand tried to prove that the statements issuing through this method could be met by other statements of contrary import with equal warrant and equal necessity in the enumeration of these antinomonies he narrowed his ground to the cosmology of the old metaphysical system and in his discussion made out four antinomonies a number which rests upon the list of the categories the first antinomony is on the question whether we are or are not to think the world limited in space and time in the second antinomony we have a discussion of the dilemma matter must be conceived either as endlessly divisible or as consisting of atoms 
The third antinomy bears upon the antithesis of freedom and necessity to such extent as it embraced in the question whether everything in the world must be supposed subject to the condition of causality, or if we can also assume free beings, in other words, absolute initial points of action in the world. Finally, the fourth antinomy is the dilemma. Either the world as a whole has a cause, or it is uncaused. The method which Kant follows in discussing these antinomies is as follows. He puts the two propositions implied in the dilemma over against each other as thesis and antithesis, and seeks to prove both. That is to say, he tries to exhibit them as inevitably issuing from reflection on the question. He particularly protests against the charge of being a special pleader, and of grounding his reason on illusions. Speaking honestly, however, the arguments which Kant offers for his thesis and antithesis are mere shams of demonstration the thing to be proved is invariably implied in the assumption he starts from and the speciousness of his proofs is only due to his prolix and apagogic mode of procedure yet it was and still is a great achievement for the critical philosophy and when it exhibited these antinomies for in this way it gave some expression at first certainly subjective and unexplained to the actual unity of those categories which are kept persistently separate by understanding the first of the cosmological antinomies, for example, implies a recognition of the doctrine that space and time present a discrete as well as a continuous aspect, whereas the old metaphysic, laying exclusive emphasis on the continuity, had been led to treat the world as unlimited in space and time. But it is no less correct that space and time are real, and actual only when they are defined or specialised into here and now, a specialization which is involved in the very notion of them. The same observations apply to the rest of the antinomies take for example the antimony of freedom and necessity the main gist of it is that freedom and necessity as understood by abstract thinkers are not independently real as these thinkers suppose but merely ideal factors moments of true freedom and the true necessity and that to abstract and isolate either conception is to make it false the third object of the reason is god he also must be known and defined in terms of thought but in comparison with the unalloyed identity every defining term as such seems to the understanding to be only a limit and a negation every reality accordingly must be taken as limitless i e undefined accordingly god when he is defined to be the sum of all realities the most real of beings turns into a mere abstract and the only term under which the most real of real things can be defined is that of being itself the height of abstraction these are two elements abstract identity on one hand which is spoken of in this place as the notion and being on the other which reason seeks to unify and their union is the ideal of reason to carry out this unification two ways or two forms are admissible either we may begin with being and proceed to the abstractum of thought or the movement may begin with the abstraction and end in being we shall in the first place start from being but being in its natural aspect presents itself to view as a being of infinite variety a world in all its plentitude and this world may be regarded in two ways first as a collection of innumerable unconnected facts and second as a collection of innumerable facts in mutual relation giving evidence of design the first aspect is emphasized in the cosmological proof the latter in the proofs of natural theology suppose now that this fullness of being passes under the agency of thought then it is stripped of its isolation and unconnectedness and viewed as a universal and absolutely necessary being which determines itself and acts by general purposes or laws and this necessary and self-determined being different from the being at the commencement is god the main force of kant's criticism on this process attacks it for being syllogizing i e transition perceptions and the aggregate of perceptions we call the world exhibit as they stand no traces of the universality which they afterwards receive from the purifying act of thought the empirical conception of the world therefore gives no warrant for the idea of universality and so any attempt on the part of thought to ascend from the empirical conception of the world of god is checked by the argument of hume according to which we have no right to think sensations that is to elicit universality and necessity from them man is essentially a thinker and therefore sound common sense as well as philosophy will not yield up their right of rising to god from and out of the empirical view of the world the only basis on which this rise is possible is the thinking study of the world not the bare sensuous animal attuition of it thought and thought alone has eyes for the essence substance universal power and ultimate design of the world and what men call the proofs of god's existence are rightly understood ways of describing and analysing the native course of the mind the course of thought thinking the data of the senses 
the rise of thought beyond the world of sense its passage from the finite to the infinite the leap into the supersensible which it takes when it snaps asunder the chain of sense all this transition is thought and nothing but thought say there must be no such passage and you say there is no thinking and in sooth animals make no such transition they never get further than sensation and the perception of the senses and in consequence they have no religion both on general grounds and in the particular case there are two remarks to be made upon the criticism of this exaltation in thought the first remark deals with the question of form when the exaltation is exhibited in syllogistic process in the shape of what we call proofs of the being of god these reasons cannot but start from some sort of theory of the world which makes it an aggregate of either contingent facts or the final causes and relations involving design the merely syllogistic thinker may deem this starting point a solid basis and suppose that it remains throughout in the same empirical light left at last as it was at first in this case the bearing of the beginning upon the conclusion to which it leads has a purely affirmative aspect as if we were only reasoning from one thing which is and continues to be to another thing which in like manner is but the great error is to restrict our notions of the nature of thought to its form and understanding alone to think the phenomenal world rather means to recast its form and transmute it into a universal and thus the action of thought has also a negative effect upon its basis the matter of sensation when it receives the stamp of universality at once loses its first and phenomenal shape by the removal and negation of the shell the kernel within the sense percept is brought to the light and it is because they do not with sufficient prominence express the negative features implied in the exaltation of the mind from the world to god that the metaphysical proofs of the being of god are defective interpretations and descriptions of the process if the world is only a sum of incidents it follows that it is also deciduous and phenomenal nominal in esse and posse null that upward spring of the mind signifies that the being which the world has is only a substance no real being no absolute truth it signifies that beyond and above that appearance truth abides in god so that true being is another name for god the process of exaltation might thus appear to be a transition and to involve a means but it is not a whit less true and every trace of transition and means is absorbed since the world which might have seemed to be the means of reaching god is explained to be a nullity unless the being of the world is nullified the point d'appui for the exaltation is lost in this way the apparent means vanishes and the process of derivation is cancelled in the very act by which it proceeds it is the affirmative aspect of this relation as supposed to subsist between two things either of which is as much as the other which jacobi mainly has his eye when he attacks the demonstration of the understanding justly censoring them for seeking conditions i e the world for the unconditioned he remarks that the infinite or god must on such a method be presented as dependent and derivative but that elevation as it takes place in the mind serves to correct this semblance in fact it has no other meaning than to correct that semblance jacobi however failed to recognise the genuine nature of essential thought by which it cancels the mediation in the very act of mediating and consequently his objection though it tells against the mere reflective understanding is false when applied to thought as a whole and in particular to reasonable thought to explain what we mean by the neglect of the negative factor in thought we may refer by way of illustration to the charges of pantheism and atheism brought against the doctrines of spinoza the absolute substance of spinoza certainly falls short of absolute spirit and it is a right and proper requirement that god should be defined as absolute spirit but when the definition in spinoza is said to identify the world with god and to confound god with nature and the finite world it is implied that the finite world possesses a genuine actuality and affirmative reality if this assumption be admitted of course the union of god with the world renders god completely finite and degrades him to the bare finite and adventitious congeries of existence but there are two objections to be noted in the first place spinoza does not define god as the unity of god with the world but as the union of thought with extension that is with the material world and secondly even if we accept this awkward popular statement as to this unity it would still be true that the system of spinoza was not atheism but a cosmism defining the world to be an appearance lacking in the true reality a philosophy which affirms that god and god alone is should not be stigmatized as atheistic when even those notions which worship the ape the cow or the images of stone and brass are credited with some religion but as things stand the imagination of ordinary men feels a vehement reluctance to surrender its dearest conviction that this aggregate of finitude which it calls world 
has actual reality and to hold that there is no world is a way of thinking they are fain to believe impossible or at least much less possible than to entertain the idea that there is no god human nature not much to its credit is more ready to believe that a system denies god than that it denies the world a denial of god seems so much more intelligible than a denial of the world the second remark bears on the criticism of the material propositions to which the elevation in thought in the first instance leads if the propositions have for their predicate such terms as substance of the world its necessary essence cause which regulates and directs it according to design they are certainly inadequate to express what is or ought to be understood by god yet apart from the trick of adopting a preliminary popular conception of god and criticising a result of this assumed standard it is certain that these characteristics have great value and are necessary factors in the idea of god but if we wish in this way to bring before thought the genuine idea of god and give its true value and expression to the central truth we must be careful not to start from a subordinate level of facts to speak of the merely contingent things of the world is a very inadequate description of the premises the organic structures and the evidence they afford of mutual adaptation belong to a higher province the province of animated nature but even without taking into consideration the possible blemish which the study of animated nature and the other teleological aspects of existing things may contract from the pettiness of the final causes and from the puerile instances of them and their bearings merely animated nature is at best incapable of supplying the material for a truthful expression of the idea of god god is more than life he is spirit and therefore if the thought of absolute takes a starting point for its rise and desires to take the nearest the most true and the adequate starting point will be found in the nature of spirit alone the other way of unification by which to realise the ideal of reason is to set out from the abstractum of thought and seek to characterise it for which purpose being is the only available term this is the method of the ontological proof the opposition here presented from a merely subjective point of view lies between thought and being whereas in the first way of junction being is common to the two sides of the antithesis and the contrast lies only between its individualization and universality understanding meets the second way with what is implicitly the same objection as it made to the first it denied that the empirical involves the universal so it denies that the universal involves the specialization which specialization in this instance is being in other words it says being cannot be deduced from the notion by any analysis this uniformly favourable reception and acceptance which attended kant's criticism of the ontological proof was undoubtedly due to the illustration which he made use of to explain the differences between thought and being he took the instance of a hundred sovereigns which for anything it matters to the notion are the same hundred whether they are real or only possible though the difference of the two cases is very perceptible to their effect on a man's purse nothing can be more obvious than that anything we only think or conceive is not on that account actual that mental representation and even notional comprehension always falls short of being still it may not unfairly be styled a barbarism in language when the name notion is given to things like a hundred sovereigns and putting that mistake aside those who perpetually urge against the philosophic idea the difference between being and thought might have admitted that philosophers were not wholly ignorant of the fact can there be any proposition more trite than this but after all it is well to remember when we speak of god that we have an object of another kind than any hundred sovereigns and unlike any one particular notion representation or however else it may be styled it is in fact this and this alone which marks everything finite its being in time and space is discrepant from its notion god on the contrary expressly has to be what can only be thought as existing his notion involves being it is this unity of the notion and being that constitutes the notion of god if this were all we should have only a formal expression of the divine nature which would not really go beyond a statement of the nature of the notion itself for that the notion in its most abstract terms involves being as plain for the notion whatever other determination it may receive is at least reference back on itself which results by abolishing the intermediation and thus is immediate and what is that reference to self but being certainly it would be strange if the notion the very inmost of mind if even the ego or above all the concrete totality we call god were not rich enough to include so poor a category as being the very poorest and most abstract of all if we look at the thought nothing can be more insignificant than being and yet there may be something still more insignificant than being that which at first sight is perhaps supposed to be an external and sensible existence like that of the paper lying before me however in this matter nobody proposes to speak of the sensible existence of a limited and perishable thing besides the petty stricture of the critique 
that thought and being are different can at most molest the path of the human mind from the thought of god to certainty that he is it cannot take it away it is this process of transition depending on the absolute inseparability of the thought of god from his being for which its proper authority has been revindicated in the theory of faith or immediate knowledge whereof hereafter in this way thought at its highest pitch has to go outside for any determinateness and although it is continually termed reason is out and out abstract thinking and the result of all is that reason supplies nothing beyond the formal unity required to simplify and systematize experience it is a canon not an organon of truth and can furnish only a criticism of knowledge not a doctrine of the infinite in its final analysis this criticism is summed up in the assertion that in strictness thought is only the indeterminate unity and the action of this indeterminate unity kant undoubtedly held reason to be the faculty of the unconditioned but if reason be reduced to abstract identity only it by implication renounces its unconditionality and is in reality no better than empty understanding for reason is unconditioned only in so far as its character and quality are not due to an extraneous or foreign content only in so far as it is self-characterising and thus in point of content is its own master kant however expressly explains that the action of reason consists solely in applying the categories to systematise the matter given by perception i e to place it in an outside order under the guidance of the principle of non-contradiction end of part two of chapter four recording by ryan smallwood Part 3 of Chapter 4 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter 4 Second Attitude of Thought to Objectivity. B. The practical reason is understood by Kant to mean the thinking will i.e. a will that determines itself on universal principle its office is to give objective imperative laws of freedom laws that is which state what ought to happen the warrant for thus assuming thought to be an activity which makes itself felt objectively that is to be really a reason is the alleged possibility of proving practical freedom by experience that is of showing it in the phenomenon of self-consciousness this experience in consciousness is at once met by all that the necessitarian produces from contrary experience particular by the sceptical induction employed amongst others by hume from the endless diversity of what men regard as right and duty i e from the diversity apparent in those professedly objective laws of freedom what then is to serve as the law which the practical reason embraces and obeys and as the criterion in its act of self-determination there is no rule at hand but the same abstract identity of understanding as before there must be no contradiction in the act of self-determination hence the practical reason never shakes off the formalism which is represented as the climax of the theoretical reason but this practical reason does not confine the universal principle of good to its own inward regulation it first becomes practical in the true sense of the word when it insists on the good being manifested in the world with an outward objectivity and requires that the thought shall be objective throughout and not merely subjective we shall speak of this postulate of the practical reason afterwards the free self-determination which kant denied to the speculative he has expressly vindicated for the practical reason to many minds this particular aspect of the kantian philosophy made it welcome and that for good reasons to estimate rightly what we owe to kant in the matter we ought to set before our minds the form of practical philosophy and in particularly of moral philosophy which prevailed in his time it may generally be described as a system of eudaimonism which when asked what man's chief end ought to be replied happiness and by happiness eudaimonism understood the satisfaction of the private appetites wishes and wants of the man thus raising the contingent and particular into a principle for the will and its actualization to this eudaimonism which was destitute of stability and consistency and which left the door and gate wide open for every woman caprice kant opposed the practical reason and thus emphasized the need for principle of will which should be universal and lay the same obligation on all the theoretical reason as has been made evident in the preceding paragraphs is identified by kant with the negative faculty of the infinite and as it has no positive content of its own it is restricted to the function of detecting finitude of experiential knowledge to the practical reason on the contrary 
he has expressly allowed a positive infinity by ascribing to the will the power of modifying itself in universal modes i e by thought such a power the will undoubtedly has and it is well to remember that man is free only in so far as he possesses it and avails himself of it in his conduct but a recognition of the existence of this power is not enough and does not avail to tell us what are the contents of the will or practical reason hence to say that a man must make the good the content of his will raises the question what that content is and what are the means of ascertaining what good is nor does one get over the difficulty by the principle that the will must be consistent with itself or by the precept to do duty for the sake of duty c the reflective power of judgment is invested by kant with the function of intuitive understanding that is to say whereas the particulars had hitherto appeared so far as the universal or abstract identity was concerned adventitious and incapable of being deduced from it the intuitive understanding apprehends the particulars as moulded and formed by the universal itself experience presents such universalized particulars in the products of art and of organic nature the capital feature in kant's criticism of the judgment is that in it he gave a representation and a name if not even an intellectual expression to the idea such a representation as intuitive understanding or an inner adaptation suggests a universal which is at the same time apprehended as essentially a concrete unity it is in these a pursues alone that kantian philosophy rises to the speculative height schiller and others have found in the idea of artistic beauty when thought and sensuous conception have grown together into one a way of escaping from the abstract and separatist understanding others have found the same relief in the perception and consciousness of life and of living things whether that life be natural or intellectual the work of art as well as the living individual is it must be owned a limited content but in the postulated harmony of nature or necessity and free purpose in the final purpose of the world conceived as realized kant had put before us the idea comprehensive even in its content yet what may be called the laziness of thought when dealing with the supreme idea finds a too easy mode of evasion in what ought to be instead of the actual realization of the ultimate end it clings hard to the disjunction of the notion from reality yet if thought cannot think the ideal realized the senses and the intuition can at any rate see it in the present reality of living organisms and of the beautiful in art and consequently kant's remarks on the objects were well adapted to lead the mind on to grasp and think the concrete idea we are thus led to conceive a different relation between the universal understanding and the particular of perception than that which the theory of theoretical and practical reason is founded but while this is so it is not supplemented by a recognition that the former is the genuine relation and the very truth instead of that the unity of universal with particular is accepted only as it exists in finite phenomena and is adduced only as a fact of experience such experience at first only personal may come from two sources it may spring from genius the faculty which produces aesthetic ideas meaning by aesthetic ideas the picture thoughts of free imagination which subserve an idea and suggest thoughts although their content is not expressed in a notional form and even admits of no such expression it may also be due to taste the feeling of congruity between the free play of intuition or imagination and the uniformity of understanding the principle by which the reflective faculty of judgment regulates and arranges the products of animated nature is described as the end or final cause the notion in action the universal at once determining and determining in itself at the same time kant is careful to discard the conception of external or finite adaptation in which the end is only an adventitious form for the means and material in which it is realised in the living organism on the contrary the final cause is a moulding principle and an energy imminent in the matter and every member is in its turn a means as well as an end such an idea evidently radically transforms the relation which the understanding institutes between means and ends between subjectivity and objectivity and yet in the face of this unification the end or design is subsequently explained to be a cause which exists and acts subjectively i e as our idea only and teleology is accordingly explained to be only a principle of criticism purely personal to our understanding after the critical philosophy had settled that reason can know phenomena only there would still have been an option for animated nature between the two equally subjective modes of thoughts even according to kant's own exposition there would have been an obligation to admit in the case of natural productions a knowledge not confined to the categories of quality cause and effect composition constituents and so on the principle of inward adaptation or design had it been kept to and carried out in scientific application would have led to a different and higher method of observing nature 
If we adopt this principle, the idea, when all limitations were removed from it, would appear as follows. The universality moulded by reason and described as the absolute and final end, or the good, would be realised in the world, and realised moreover by means of a third thing, the power which proposes this end as well as realises it, that is God. Thus in him, who is the absolute truth, those oppositions of universal and individual, subjective and objective, are solved and explained to be neither self-subsistent nor true. But good, which is thus put forward as the final cause of the world, has been already described as only our good, the moral law of our practical reason. This being so, the unity in question goes no further than make the state of the world and the course of its events harmonize with our moral standards. Besides, even with this limitation, the final cause, or good, is a vague abstraction, and the same vagueness attaches to what is to be duty. But further this harmony is met by the revival and reassertion of the antithesis, which by its own principle had nullified. The harmony is then described as merely subjective, something which merely ought to be and which at the same time is not real a mere article of faith possessing a subjective certainty but without truth or that objectivity which is proper to the idea this contradiction may seem to be disguised by adjourning the realization of the idea to a future to a time when the idea will also be but a sensuous condition like time is the reverse of a reconciliation of the discrepancy and infinite progression which is the corresponding image adopted by the understanding and the very face of it only repeats and reenacts the contradiction a general mark may still be offered on the result to which the critical philosophy led as to the nature of knowledge a result which has grown one of the current idols or axiomatic beliefs of the day in every dualistic system and especially in that of kant the fundamental defect makes itself visible in the inconsistency of unifying at one moment what a moment before had been explained to be independent and therefore incapable of unification and then at the very moment after unification has been alleged to be the truth we suddenly come upon the doctrine that the two elements which in their true status of unification have been refused all independent subsistence are only true and actual in their state of separation philosophizing of this kind wants the little penetration needed to discover that this shuffling only evidences how unsatisfactory each one of the two terms is and it fails simply because it is incapable of bringing the two thoughts together and in point of form there are never more than two. It argues an utter want of consistency to say, on the one hand, that the understanding only knows phenomena, and, on the other, assert the absolute character of this knowledge, by such statements as, cognition can go no further, here is the natural and absolute limit of human knowledge. But natural is the wrong word here. The things of nature are limited, and are natural things only to such an extent as they are not aware of their universal limit, or to such extent as their mode or quality is a limit from our point of view, and not from their own. No one knows, or even feels, that anything is a limit or defect, until he is at the same time above and beyond it. Living beings, for example, possess the privilege of pain, which is denied to the inanimate. Even with living beings, a single motor quality passes into the feeling of a negative. For living beings, as such, possess within them a universal vitality which overpasses and includes the single mode and thus as they maintain themselves in the negative of themselves they feel the contradiction to exist within them but the contradiction is within them only so far as one and the same subjects include both the universality of their sense of life and the individual mode which is in negation with it the illustration will show how a limit or imperfection in knowledge comes to be turned a limit or imperfection only when it is compared to the actually present idea of the universal of a total imperfect a very little consideration might show that to call a thing finite or limited proves by implication the very presence of the infinite and unlimited that our knowledge of a limit can only be when the unlimited is on this side in consciousness the result however of kant's view of cognition suggests a second remark the philosophy of kant could have no influence on the method of sciences it leaves the categories and method of ordinary knowledge quite unmolested occasionally it may be in the first sections of a scientific work of that period we find propositions borrowed from the kantian philosophy but the course of the treatise renders it apparent that that these propositions were superfluous decoration and that the first few pages might have been omitted without producing the least change in empirical contents we may next institute a comparison of kant with the metaphysics of the empirical school 
Natural plain empiricism, though it unquestionably insists most upon sensuous perception, still allows a supersensible world of spiritual reality, whatever may be its structure and constitution, whether derived from intellect or from imagination, etc. So far as form goes, the facts of this supersensible world rest on the authority of mind, in the same way as other facts embraced in empirical knowledge rest on authority of external perception. But when empiricism becomes reflective and logically consistent, it turns its arms against this dualism in the ultimate and highest species of fact it denies the independence of the thinking principle and of spiritual world which develops itself in thought materialism or naturalism therefore is the consistent and thoroughgoing system of empiricism in direct opposition to such empiricism kant asserts the principle of thought and freedom and attaches himself to the first mentioned form of empirical doctrine the general principles of which he never departed from there is a dualism in his philosophy also on one side stands the world of sensation and of the understanding which reflects upon it this world it is true he alleges to be a world of appearances but that is only a title or formal description and the modes of observation continue quite the same as in empiricism on the other side an independent stands a self-apprehending thought the principle of freedom which kant has in common with ordinary and bygone metaphysic but emptied of all that it held and without his being able to infuse into it anything new for in the critical doctrine thought or as it is there called reason is divested of every specific form and thus bereft of all authority the main effect of the kantian philosophy has been to revive the consciousness of reason or the absolute inwardness of thought the abstractness indeed prevented that inwardness from developing into anything or from originating any special forms whether cognitive principles or moral laws but nevertheless it absolutely refused to accept or indulge anything possessing the character of externality henceforth the principle of the independence of reason or of its absolute self-subsistence is made a general principle of philosophy as well as a foregone conclusion of the time the critical philosophy has one great negative merit it has brought home the conviction that the categories of understanding are finite in their range and any cognitive process confined within their pale falls short of the truth but kant only had a sight of half the truth he explained the finite nature of the categories to mean that they were subjective only valid only for a thought from which the thing in itself was divided by an impassable gulf in fact however it is not because they are subjective that the categories are finite they are finite by their very nature and it is on their own themselves that it is requisite to exhibit their finitude kant however holds that what we think is false because it is we who think it a further deficiency in the system is that it gives only a historical description of thought and a mere enumeration of the factors of consciousness the enumeration is in the main correct but not a word touches upon the necessity of what is thus empirically colligated the observations made on the various stages of consciousness culminate in the summary statement that the content of all we are acquainted with is only an appearance and as it is true at least that all finite thinking is concerned with appearances so far the conclusion is justified the stage of appearance however the phenomenal world is not the terminus of thought there is another and a higher region but the region was to the kantian philosophy an inaccessible other world after all it was only formally that the kantian system established the principle that thought is spontaneous and self-determining into details of the manner and the extent of the self-determination of thought kant never went it was fichte who first noticed the omission and who after he called attention to the want of a deduction for the categories endeavoured really to supply something of the kind with fichte the ego is the starting point in the philosophical development and the outcome of its action is supposed to be visible in the categories but in fichte the ego is not really present as a free spontaneous energy it is supposed to receive its first excitation by a shock or impulse from without against this shock the ego will it is assumed react and only through this reaction does it first become conscious of itself meanwhile the nature of the impulse remains a stranger beyond our pale and the ego with something else always confronting it is weighed with a condition fichte in consequence never advanced beyond kant's conclusion that the finite only is knowable while the infinite transcends the range of thought what kant calls the thing by itself fichte calls the impulse from without the abstraction of something else than i not otherwise describable or definable than as a negative or non-ego in general the i is thus looked at as standing in essential relation with the not i through which its acts of self-determination is first awakened and in this manner the i is but the continuous act of self-liberation from this impulse never gaining a real freedom because with the surcease of the impulse of the i whose being is its action would also cease to be nor is the content produced by the action of the eye at all different from the ordinary content of experience except by the supplementary remark that this content is mere appearance end of part three of chapter four recording by ryan smallwood
Chapter 5 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter 5 Third Attitude of Thought to Objectivity Immediate or Intuitive Knowledge. If we are to believe the critical philosophy, thought is subjective, and its ultimate and invincible mode is abstract universality or formal identity. Thought is thus set in opposition to truth, which is no abstraction, but concrete universality. In this highest mode of thought, which is entitled reason, the categories are left out of account. The extreme theory on the opposite side holds thought to be an act of the particular only, and on that ground declares it to be incapable of apprehending the truth this is the intuitional theory according to this theory thinking a private and particular operation has its whole scope and product in the categories but these categories as arrested by the understanding are limited vehicles of thought forms of the conditioned of the dependent and derivative a thought limited to these modes has no sense of the infinite and the true and cannot bridge over the gulf that separates it from them this stricture refers to the proofs of god's existence these inadequate modes of categories are also spoken as notions and to get a notion of an object therefore can only mean in this language to grasp it under the form of being conditioned and derivative consequently if the object in question be the true the infinite the unconditioned we change it by our notions into a finite and conditioned whereby instead of apprehending the truth by thought we have perverted it into untruth such is the one simple line of argument advanced for the thesis that the knowledge of god and of truth must be immediate or intuitive at an earlier period all sort of anthropomorphic conceptions as they are termed were banished from god as being finite and therefore unworthy of the infinite and in this way god had been reduced to a tolerably blank being but in those days the thought forms were in general not supposed to come under the head of anthropomorphism thought was believed rather to strip finitude from the conception of the absolute in agreement with the above-mentioned convictions of all ages that reflection is the only road to truth but now at length even the thought forms are pronounced anthropomorphic and thought itself is described as a mere faculty of finitization jacobius stated this charge most distinctly in the seventh supplement to his letters on spinoza borrowing his line of argument from the works of spinoza himself and applying it as a weapon against knowledge in general in his attack knowledge is taken to mean knowledge of the finite only a process of thought from which one condition is a series to another each of which is at once conditioning and conditioned according to such a view to explain and to get the notion of anything is the same as to show it to be derived from something else whatever such knowledge embraces consequently is partial dependent and finite while the infinite or true i e god lies outside the mechanical interconnection to which knowledge is said to be confined it is important to observe that while kant makes the finite nature of the categories consist mainly in the formal circumstance that they are subjective jacobi discusses the categories in their own proper character and pronounces them to be the very import finite which jacobi chiefly had before his eyes when he thus described science was the the brilliant successes of the physical or exact sciences in ascertaining natural forces and laws it is certainly not the finite ground occupied by these sciences that we expect to meet the indwelling presence of the infinite leyland was right when he said he had swept the whole heaven with his glass and seen no god in the field of physical science the universal which is the final result of analysis is only the indeterminate aggregate or the external finite in one word matter and jacobi well perceived that there was no other issue obtainable in the way of a mere advance from one explanatory clause or law to another all the while the doctrine that truth exists for the mind was so strongly maintained by jacobi Kobe, that reason alone is declared to be that by which man lives this reason is the knowledge of god but seeing that derivative knowledge is restricted to the compass of finite facts reason is knowledge underivative or faith knowledge faith thought intuition are the categories that we meet with on this line of reflection these terms as presumably familiar to every one are only too frequently subjected to an arbitrary use under no better guidance than the conceptions and distinctions of psychology without any investigation into their nature and notion which is the main question after all 
Thus we only find knowledge contrasted with faith, and faith at the same time explained to be an underivative or intuitive knowledge, so that it must be at least some sort of knowledge. And besides, it is unquestionably a fact of experience, firstly, that what we believe is in our consciousness, which implies that we know about it and secondly that this belief is a certainty in our consciousness which implies that we know it hence and especially we find thought opposed to immediate knowledge and faith and in particular to intuition but if this intuition be qualified as intellectual we must really mean intuition which thinks unless in a question about the nature of god we are willing to interpret intellect to mean images and representations of imagination the word faith or belief in the dialect of this system comes to be employed even with reference to common objects that are present to the senses we believe says jacobi that we have a body we believe in the existence of the things of sense but if we are speaking of faith in the true and eternal and saying that god is given and revealed to us in immediate knowledge or intuition we are concerned not with things of sense but with objects special to our thinking mind with truths of inherently universal significance and when the individual i or in other words personality is under discussion not the i of experience or a single private person above all when the personality of god is before us we are speaking of personality unalloyed of a personality in its own nature universal such personality is a thought and falls within the province of thought only more than this pure and simple intuition is completely the same as pure and simple thought intuition and belief in the first instance denote the definite conceptions we attach to these words in our ordinary employment of them and to this extent they differ from thought in certain points which nearly every one can understand but here they are taken in a higher sense and must be interpreted to mean a belief in god or an intellectual intuition of god in short we must put aside all that especially distinguishes thought on the one side from belief and intuition on the other how belief and intuition when transferred to these higher regions differ from thought it is impossible for any one to say and yet such are the barren distinctions of words with which men fancy they assert an important truth even while the formula they maintain are identical with those which they impugn the term faith brings with it the special advantage of suggesting faith of the christian religion it seems to include christian faith or perhaps even coincide with it and thus philosophy of faith has a thoroughly orthodox and christian look on the strength of which it takes liberty of uttering its arbitrary dicta with greater pretension and authority but we must not let ourselves be deceived by the semblance surreptitiously secured by merely verbal similarity the two things are radically distinct firstly the christian faith comprises in it an authority of the church but the faith of jacobi's philosophy has no other authority than that of personal revelation and secondly the christian faith is a copious body of objective truth a system of knowledge and doctrine while the scope of the philosophic faith is so utterly indefinite that while it has room for faith of the christian it equally admits a belief in the divinity of the dalai lama the ox or the monkey thus so far as it goes narrowing deity down to its simplest terms a uh, supreme being being faith itself taken in this professedly philosophical sense is nothing but the sapless abstract of immediate knowledge a purely formal category applicable to very different facts and it ought never to be confused or identified with the spiritual fullness of christian faith whether we look at that faith in the heart of the believer and the indwelling of the holy spirit or in the system of theological doctrine with what is here called faith or immediate knowledge must also be identified with inspiration the heart's revelations the truths implanted in man by nature and also in particular healthy reason or common sense as it is called all these forms agree in adopting as their leading principle the immediacy or self-evident way in which a fact or body of truths is presented in consciousness this immediate knowledge consists in knowing that the infinite the eternal the god which is in our idea really is or it asserts that in our consciousness there is immediately and inseparably bound up with this idea the certainty of its actual being to seek to controvert these maxims of immediate knowledge is the last thing a philosophers would think of they may rather find occasion for self-gratulation when these ancient doctrines expressing as they do the general tenor of philosophic teaching have even in this unphilosophical fashion become to some extent universal convictions of the age the true marvel rather is that one could suppose that these principles were opposed to philosophy the maxims viz whatever is held to be true is imminent in the mind and there is truth for the mind from a formal point of view there is a peculiar interest in the maxim that the being of god is immediately and inseparably bound up with the thought of god that objectivity is bound up with the subjectivity which the thought originally presents 
not content with that the philosophy of immediate knowledge goes so far in its one-sided view as to affirm that the attribute of existence even in perception is quite as inseparably connected with the conception we have of our own bodies and of external things as it is with the thought of god now it is the endeavour of philosophy to prove such a unity to show that it lies in the very nature of thought and subjectivity to be inseparable from being and objectivity in these circumstances therefore philosophy whatever estimate may be formed of the character of these proofs must be glad to see it shown and maintained that its maxims are facts of consciousness and thus in harmony with experience the difference between philosophy and the asseverations of immediate knowledge rather centres in the exclusive attitude which immediate knowledge adopts when it sets itself up against philosophy and yet it was self-evident or immediate truth that the cogito ergo sum of descartes the maxim on which may be said to hinge the whole interest of modern philosophy was first stated by its author the man who calls this a syllogism must know little more about a syllogism than that the word ergo occurs in it where shall we look for the middle term and a middle term is a much more essential point of a syllogism than the word ergo if we try to justify the name by calling the combination of ideas in descartes an immediate syllogism this superfluous variety of syllogism is a mere name for an utterly unmediate synthesis of distinct terms of thought that being so the synthesis of being with our ideas as stated in the maxim of immediate knowledge has no more and no less claim to the title of syllogism than the axiom of descartes has from Hotho's dissertation on the Cartesian philosophy, published in 1826, I borrow the quotation in which Descartes himself distinctly declares that the maxim cogito ergo sum is no syllogism. From the first passage, I quote the words more immediately to the point. Descartes says that we are thinking beings is prima quedum notio cu e nullo syllogismo concluditor, a certain notion which is deduced from no syllogism, and goes on, nor, when one says, I think therefore I am or exist, does he deduce existence from thought by means of a syllogism. Descartes knew what it implied in a syllogism, and so he adds that in order to make the maxim admit of a deduction by syllogism, we should have to to add the major premises everything which thinks is or exists of course he remarks this major premise itself has to be deduced from the original statement the language of descartes on the maxim that the i which thinks must also at the same time be his saying that this connection is given and implied in the simple perception of consciousness that this connection is the absolute first the principle and the most certain and evident of all things so that no scepticism can be conceived so monstrous as to not admit it all this language is so vivid and distinct and the modern statements of jacobi and others on this immediate connection can only pass for needless repetitions the theory of which we are speaking is not satisfied when it has shown that immediate knowledge taken separately is an adequate vehicle of truth its distinctive doctrine is that the immediate knowledge alone to the total exclusion of mediation can possess a content which is true this exclusiveness is enough to show that the theory is a relapse into the metaphysical understanding with its passwords either or and thus it is really a relapse into the habit of external mediation the gist of which consists in clinging to those narrow and one-sided categories of the finite which it falsely imagined itself to have left forever behind this point however we shall not at present discuss in detail an exclusively immediate knowledge is asserted as a fact only and in the present introduction we can only study it from an external point of view the real significance of such knowledge will be explained when we come to the logical question of the opposition between mediate and immediate but but it is characteristic of the view before us to decline to examine the nature of the fact that is the notion of it for such an examination would itself be a step towards mediation and even towards knowledge the genuine discussion on logical ground therefore must be deferred till we come to the proper province of logic itself the whole second part of the logic the doctrine of essential being is a discussion of the intrinsic and self-affirming unity of immediacy and mediation beyond this point then we need not go immediate knowledge is to be accepted as a fact under these circumstances examination is directed to the field of experience to a psychological phenomenon if that be so we need only note as the commonest of experiences that truths which we well know to be results of complicated and highly mediated traits of thought present themselves immediately and without effort to the mind of any man who is familiar with the subject the mathematician like every one who has mastered a particular science meets any problem with ready-made solutions which presuppose most complicated analyses and every educated man 
man has a number of general views and maxims which he can muster without any trouble but which can only have sprung from frequent reflection and long experience the facility we attain in any sort of knowledge art or technical expertness consists in having the particular knowledge or kind of action present to our mind in any case that occurs even we may say immediate in our very limbs in an outgoing activity in all these instances immediacy of knowledge is so far from excluding mediation that the two things are linked together immediate knowledge being actually the product and result of mediated knowledge it is no less obvious that immediate existence is bound up with its mediation the seed and the parents are immediate and initial experiences in respect of the offspring which they generate but the seed and the parents though they exist and are therefore immediate are yet in turn generated and the child without prejudice to the mediation of its existence is immediate because it is the fact that i am in berlin my immediate presence here is mediated by my having made the journey hither one thing may be observed with reference to the immediate knowledge of god of legal and ethical principles including under the head of immediate knowledge what is otherwise termed instinct implanted or innate ideas common sense natural reason or whatever form in short we give to the original spontaneity it is a matter of of general experience that education or development is required to bring into consciousness what is therein contained it was so even in the platonic reminiscence and the christian rite of baptism although a sacrament involves the additional obligation of a christian upbringing in short religion and morals however much they may be faith or immediate knowledge are still on every side conditioned by the mediating process which is termed development education training the adherents no less than the assailants of the doctrine of innate ideas have been guilty throughout of the like exclusiveness and narrowness as is here noted they have drawn a hard and fast line between the essential and immediate union as it may be described of universal principles with the soul and another union which has been brought about in an external fashion and through the channel of given objects and conceptions there is one objection borrowed from experience which was raised against the doctrine of innate ideas all men it was said must have these ideas they must have for example the maxim of contradiction present in the mind they must be aware of it for this maxim and others like it were included in the class of innate ideas the objection may be set down to misconception for the principles in question though innate need not on that account have the form of ideas or conceptions of something we are aware of still the objection completely meets and overthrows the crude theory of immediate knowledge which expressly maintains its formulae in so far as they are in consciousness another point calls for notice we may suppose it admitted by the intuitive school that the special case of religious faith involves supplementing by a christian or religious education and development in that case it is is acting capriciously when it seeks to ignore this admission when speaking about faith or it betrays a want of reflection not to know that if the necessity of education be once admitted mediation is pronounced indispensable the reminiscence of ideas spoken by plato is equivalent to saying that ideas implicitly exist in man instead of being as the sophists assert a foreign importation into his mind but to conceive knowledge as reminiscence does not interfere with or set aside as useless the development of what is implicitly in man which development is another word for mediation the same holds of the innate ideas that we find in descartes and the scotch philosophers these ideas are only potential in the first instance and should be looked at as being a sort of mere capacity in man in the case of these experiences the appeal turns upon something that shows itself bound up with immediate consciousness even if this combination be in the first instance taken as an external and empirical connection still even for empirical observation the fact of its being constant shows it essential and inseparable but again if this immediate consciousness as exhibited in experience be taken separately so far as it is consciousness of god and the divine nature the state of mind which it implies is generally described as an exaltation above the finite above the senses and above the instinctive desires and affections of the natural heart which exaltation passes over into and terminates in faith in god and a divine order it is apparent therefore that though faith may be an immediate knowledge and certainty it equally implies the interposition of this process as its antecedent and condition it has been already observed that the so-called proofs of the being of god which start from the finite being give an expression to this exaltation 
In that light they are no inventions of over subtle reflection, but the necessary and native channel in which the movement of mind runs, though it may be that, in their ordinary form, these proofs have not their correct and adequate expression. It is the passage from the subjective idea to being which forms the main concern of the doctrine of immediate knowledge. A primary and self-evident interconnection is declared to exist between our idea and being, yet precisely the central point of transition, utterly irrespective of any connections which show in experience, clearly involves a mediation, and the mediation is of no imperfect or unreal kind, where the mediation takes place with and through something external, but one comprehending both antecedent and conclusion. For what this theory asserts is that truth lies neither in the idea as a mere subjective thought, nor in mere being on its own account. That mere being per se, a being that is not the idea, is the sensible finite being of the world. Now all this only affirms without demonstration that the idea has truth only by means of being, and being has truth only by means of the idea. The maxim of immediate knowledge rejects an indefinite empty immediacy, and such is abstract being, a pure unity taken by itself and affirms in its stead the unity of the idea with being and it acts rightly in so doing but it is stupid not to see the unity of distinct terms or modes is not merely a purely immediate unity i e unity empty and indeterminate but that with equal emphasis the one term is shown to have truth only as mediated through the other or if the phrase is preferred that either term is only mediated with truth through the other that the quality of mediation is involved in the very immediacy of intuition is thus exhibited as a fact against which understanding conformably to the fundamental maxim of immediate knowledge that the evidence of consciousness is fallible can have nothing to object it is only ordinary abstract understanding which takes the terms of mediation and immediacy each by itself absolutely to represent an inflexible line of distinction and thus draws upon its own head the hopeless task of reconciling them the difficulty as we have shown has no existence in the fact and it vanishes in the speculative notion the one-sidedness of the intuitional school has certain characteristics attending upon it which we shall proceed to point out in their main features now that we have discussed the fundamental principle the first of these corollaries is as follows since the criterion of truth is found not in the nature of the content but in the mere fact of consciousness every alleged truth has no other basis than subjective certitude an assertion that we discover a certain fact in our consciousness what i discover in my consciousness is thus exaggerated into a fact of the consciousness of all and even passed off for the very nature of consciousness among the so-called proofs of the existence of god there used to stand the consensus genitium to which appeal is made as early as cicero the consensus gentium is a weighty authority and the transition is easy and natural from a circumstance that a certain fact is found in the consciousness of every one to the conclusion that it is a necessary element in the very nature of consciousness in this category of general agreement there was latent the deep-rooted perception which does not escape even the least cultivated mind that the consciousness of the individual is at the same time particular and accidental yet unless we examine the nature of this consciousness itself stripping it of its particular and accidental elements and by toilsome operation of reflection disclosing the universal in its entirety and purity it is only unanimous agreement upon the given point that can authorize a decent presumption that the point is part of the very nature of consciousness of course if thought insists on seeing the necessity of what is presented as a fact of general occurrence the consensus gentium is certainly not sufficient yet even granting the universality of the fact to be a satisfactory proof it has been found impossible to establish the belief in god on such an argument because experience shows that there are individuals and nations without such a faith but there can be nothing shorter and more convenient than to have a bare assertion to make that we discover a fact in our consciousness and are certain that it is true and to declare that this certainty instead of proceeding from our partial mental constitution only belongs to the very nature of mind a second corollary which results from holding immediacy of consciousness to be the criterion of truth is that all superstition or idolatry is allowed to be truth and that an apology is prepared for any contents of the will however wrong and immoral it is because he believes in them and not from the reasoning and syllogism of what is termed immediate knowledge that the hindu finds god in the cow the monkey the brahmin or the lama but the natural desires and affections spontaneously carry and deposit their interests in consciousness where also immoral aims make themselves naturally at home 
the good or bad character would thus express the definite being of the will which would be known and most immediately in interests and aims thirdly and lastly the immediate consciousness of god goes no further than to tell us that he is to tell us what he is would be an act of cognition involving mediation so that god as an object of religion is expressly narrowed down to the indeterminate supersensible god in general and the significance of religion is reduced to a minimum if it were really needful to win back and secure the bare belief that there is a god or even to create it we might well wonder at the poverty of the age which can see again in the merest pittance of religious consciousness and which in the church has sunk so low as to worship at the altar that stood in athens long ago dedicated to the unknown god we have still briefly to indicate the general nature of the form of immediacy for it is the essential one-sidedness of the category which makes whatever comes under it one-sided and for that reason finite and first it makes the universal no better than an abstraction external to the particulars and god a being without determinate quality but god can only be called a spirit when he is known to be at once the beginning and end as well as the mean in the process of mediation without this unification of elements he is neither concrete nor living nor a spirit thus knowledge of god as a spirit necessarily implies mediation the form of immediacy secondly invests the particular with the character of independent or self-centered being but such predicates contradict the very essence of the particular which is to be referred to something else outside they thus invest the finite with the character of an absolute but besides the form of immediacy is altogether abstract it has no preference for one set of contents more than another but is equally susceptible of all it may as well sanction what is idolatrous and immoral as the reverse only when we discern that the content the particular is not self-subsistent but derivative from something else are its finitude and untruth shown in their proper light such discernment where the content we discern carries with it the ground of its dependent nature is a knowledge which involves mediation the only content which can be held to be truth is not only mediated with something else not limited by other things or otherwise expressed it is one mediated by itself where mediation and immediate reference to self coincide the understanding that fancies it has got clear of finite knowledge the identity of the analytical metaphysicians and the old rationalists abruptly takes again as principle and criterion of truth that immediacy which as an abstract reference to self is the same as abstract identity abstract thought the science scientific form used by reflective metaphysic and abstract intuition the form used by immediate knowledge are one and the same the stereotyped opposition between the form of immediacy and that of mediation gives to the former halfness and inadequacy that affects every content which is brought under it immediacy means upon the whole an abstract reference to self that is an abstract identity or abstract universality according to the essential and real universal when taken merely in its immediacy is a mere abstract universal and from this point point of view god is conceived as a being altogether without determinate quality to call god a spirit is in that case only a phrase for the consciousness and self-consciousness which spirit implies are impossible without a distinguishing of it from itself and from something else i e without mediation it was impossible for us to criticize this the third attitude which thought has been made to take towards objective truth in any other mode than what it naturally indicated and admitted in the doctrine itself the theory asserts that immediate knowledge is a a fact it has been shown to be untrue in fact to say that there is an immediate knowledge a knowledge without mediation by means of something else or in itself it has also been explained to be false in fact to say that thought advances through finite and conditioned categories only which are always mediated by something else and to forget that in the very act of mediation the mediation itself vanishes and to show that in point of fact there is a knowledge which advances neither by unmixed immediacy nor by unmixed mediation which can point to the example of logic and the whole of philosophy if we view the maxims of immediate knowledge in connection with the uncritical metaphysic of the past from which we started we shall learn from this comparison the reactionary nature of the school of jacobi his doctrine is a return to the modern starting point of this metaphysic in the cartesian philosophy both jacobi and descartes maintain the following three points one the simple inseparability of the thought and being of the thinker cogito ergo sum is the same doctrine as that the being reality and existence of the ego is immediately revealed to me in consciousness descartes in fact is careful to state that by thought he means consciousness in general this inseparability is the absolute first and most certain knowledge not mediated or demonstrated two the inseparability of existence from conception of god the former is necessarily implied in the latter or the conception never can be without the attribute of existence which is thus necessary and eternal three the immediate consciousness of the existence 
existence of external things. By this nothing more is meant than sense consciousness. To have such a thing is the slightest of all cognitions, and the only thing worth knowing about it is that such immediate knowledge of the being of things external is error and delusion, that the sensible world as such is altogether void of truth, that the being of these external things is accidental and passes away as a show, and that their very nature is to have only an existence which is separable from their essence and notion. There is, however, a distinction between the points of view. 1. The Cartesian philosophy from these unproved postulates which it assumes to be unprovable proceeds to wider and wider details of knowledge and thus gave rise to sciences of modern times the modern theory of jacobi on the contrary has come to what is intrinsically a most important conclusion that cognition proceeding as it must by finite mediations can know only the finite and never embody the truth and would fain to have consciousness of god go no further than the aforesaid very abstract belief that god is two the modern doctrine on the one hand makes no change in the cartesian method of the usual scientific knowledge and conducts on the same plan the experimental and finite sciences that have sprung from it but on the other hand when it comes to the science which has infinity for its scope it throws aside the method and thus as it knows no other it rejects all methods it abandons itself to wild vagaries of imagination and assertion to a moral priggishness and sentimental arrogance or to a reckless dogmatism and lust of argument which is loudest against philosophy and philosophic doctrines philosophy of course tolerates no mere assertion of conceits and checks the free play of argumentative seesaw we must then reject the opposition between an independent immediacy in the contents or facts of consciousness and an equally independent mediation supposed incompatible with the former the incompatibility is a mere assumption assumption and arbitrary assertion all other assumptions and postulates must in the like manner be left behind at the entrance to philosophy whether they are derived from the intellect or the imagination for philosophy is the science in which every such proposition must first be scrutinized and its meaning and oppositions be ascertained scepticism made a negative science and systematically applied to all forms of knowledge might seem a suitable introduction as pointing out the nullity of such assumptions but a sceptical introduction would be not only an ungrateful but also a useless course and that because dialectic as we shall soon make appear is itself an essential element of affirmative science scepticism besides could only get hold of the finite forms as they were suggested by experience taking them as given instead of deducing them scientifically to require such a scepticism accomplished is the same as to insist on science being preceded by universal doubt or a total absence of presupposition strictly speaking in the resolve that wills pure thought this requirement is accomplished by freedom which abstracting from everything grasps its pure abstraction the simplicity of thought end of chapter five recording by ryan smallwood Chapter 6 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter 6 Logic Further Defined and Divided. In point of form, logical doctrine has three sides the abstract side, or the understanding, the dialectical, or that of negative reason the speculative or that of positive reason these three sides do not make three parts of logic but are stages or moments in every logical entity that is of every notion and truth whatever they may all be put under the first stage that of understanding and so kept isolated from each other but this would give an inadequate conception of them the statement of the dividing lines and the characteristic aspects of logic is at this point no more than historical and anticipatory thought as understanding sticks to fixity of characters and their distinctness from one another every such limited abstract it treats as having a subsistence and being of its own in our ordinary usage of the term thought and even notion we often have before our eyes nothing more than the operation of understanding and no doubt thought is primarily an exercise of understanding only it goes further and the notion is not a function of understanding merely the action of understanding may be in general described as investing its subject matter with the form of universality but this universal is an abstract universal that is to say its opposition to the particular is so rigorously maintained 
that it is at the same time also reduced to a character of a particular again in this separating and abstracting attitude towards its object understanding is the reverse of immediate perception and sensation which as such keep completely to their native sphere of action in the concrete it is by referring to this opposition of understanding to sensation or feeling that we must explain the frequent attacks made upon thought for being hard and narrow and for leading if consistently developed to ruinous and pernicious results the answer to these charges in so far as they are warranted by their facts is that they do not touch thinking in general certainly not the thinking of reason but only the exercise of understanding it must be added however that their merit and rights of the mere understanding should unhesitatingly be admitted and the merits lie in the fact that apart from understanding there is no fixity or accuracy in the region either of theory or of practice thus in theory knowledge begins by apprehending existing objects in their specific differences in the study of nature for example we distinguish matters forces genera and the like and stereotype each in its isolation thought is here acting in its analytic capacity where its canon is identity a simple reference of each attribute to itself it is under the guidance of the same identity that the process in knowledge is affected from one scientific truth to another thus for example in mathematics magnitude is the feature which to the neglect of any other determines our advance hence in geometry we compare one figure with another so as to bring out their identity similarly in other fields of knowledge such as jurisprudence the advance is primarily regulated by identity in it we argue from one specific law or precedent to another and what is this but to proceed on the principle of identity but understanding is as indispensable in practice as it is in theory character is an essential in conduct and a man of character is an understanding man who in that capacity has definite ends in view and undeviatingly pursues them the man who will do something great must learn as goethe says to limit himself the man who on the contrary would do everything really would do nothing and fails there is a host of interesting things in this world spanish poetry chemistry politics and music are all very interesting and if any one takes an interest in them we need not find fault but for a person in a given situation to accomplish anything he must stick to one definite point and not dissipate his forces in many directions in every calling too the great thing is to pursue it with understanding thus the judge must stick to the law and give his verdict in accordance with it undeterred by one motive or another allowing no excuses and looking neither left nor right understanding too is always an element in thorough training the trained intellect is not satisfied with cloudy and indefinite impressions but grasps the objects in their fixed character whereas the uncultivated man wavers unsettled and it often costs a deal of trouble to come to an understanding with him on the matter under discussion and to bring him to fix his eye on the definite point in question it has been already explained that the logical principle in general far from being merely a subjective action in our minds is rather the very universal which as such is also objective this doctrine is illustrated in the case of understanding the first form of logical truths understanding in this larger sense corresponds to what we all call goodness of god so far as that means that finite things are and subsist in nature for example we recognize the goodness of god in the fact that various classes or species of animals and plants are provided with whatever they need for their preservation and welfare nor is man accepted who both as an individual and as a nation possesses partly in the given circumstances of climate of quality and products of soil and partly in his natural parts or talents all that is required for his maintenance and development under this shape understanding is visible in every department of the objective world and no object in that world can ever be wholly perfect which does not give a full satisfaction to the canons of understanding a state for example is imperfect so long as it has not reached a clear differentiation of orders and callings and so long as those functions of politics and government which are different in principle have not evolved for themselves special organs in the same way as we see for example the developed animal organism provided with separate organs for the function of sensation motion digestion etc the previous course of the discussion may serve to show that understanding is indispensable even in those spheres and regions of action which the popular fancy would deem furthest from it and that in proportion as understanding is absent from them 
imperfection is the result. This particularly holds good of art, religion, and philosophy. In art, for example, understanding is visible, where the forms of beauty which differ in principle are kept distinct and exhibited in their purity. The same thing holds good also of a single work of art. It is part of the beauty and perfection of a dramatic poem that the characters of the several persons should be closely and faithfully maintained, and that the different aims and interests involved should be plainly and decidedly exhibited. Or again, take the province of religion. The superiority of Greek over Northern mythology, apart from the other differences of subject matter and conception, mainly consists in this, that in the former, the individual gods are fashioned into forms of sculpture, like distinctness of outline, while in the latter, the figures fade away vaguely and hazily into one another. Lastly comes philosophy. That philosophy never can get on without the understanding hardly calls for special remark after what has been said. Its foremost requirement is that every thought shall be gradually in its full precision and nothing allowed to remain vague and indefinite it is usually added that understanding must not go too far which is so far correct that understanding is not an ultimate but on the contrary finite and so constituted that when carried to extremes it veers round to its opposite it is the fashion of youth to dash about in abstractions but the man who has learnt to know life steers clear of the abstract either or and keeps to the concrete in the dialectical stage these finite characterizations or formulae super proceed themselves and pass into their opposites one but when the dialectical principle is employed by the understanding separately and independently especially as seen in its application to philosophical theories dialectic becomes skepticism in which the result that ensues from its action is presented as a mere negation it is customary to treat dialectic as an adventitious art which for the very wantonness introduces confusion and a mere semblance of contradiction into definite notions and in that light the semblance is the nonentity while the true reality is supposed to belong to the original dicta of understanding often indeed dialectic is nothing more than a subjective seesaw of argument pro and con where the absence of sterling thought is disguised by the subtlety which gives birth to such arguments but in its true and proper character dialectic is the very nature and essence of everything predicated by mere understanding the law of things and of the finite as a whole dialectic is different from reflection in the first instance reflection is the movement out beyond the isolated predicate of a thing which gives it some reference and brings out its relativity while still in other respects leaving it in its isolated validity but by dialectic is meant the indwelling tendency outwards by which the one-sidedness and limitation of the predicates of understanding is seen in its true light and shown to be the negation of them for anything to be finite it is just to suppress itself and put itself aside thus understood the dialectical principle constitutes the life and soul of scientific progress the dynamic which alone gives imminent connection and necessity to the body of science and in a word is seen to constitute the real and true as opposed to the external exaltation above the finite it is of the highest importance to ascertain and understand rightly the nature of dialectic wherever there is movement wherever there is life wherever anything is carried into effect in the actual world there dialectic is at work it is also the soul of all knowledge which is truly scientific in the popular way of looking at things the refusal to be bound by the abstract deliverances of understanding appears as fairness which according to the proverb live and let live demands that each should have its turn we admit the one but we admit the other also but when we look more closely we find that the limitations of the finite do not merely come from without that its own nature is the cause of its abrogation and that by its own act it passes into its counterpart we say for instance that man is mortal and seem to think that the ground of his death is the external circumstances only so that if this way of looking were correct man would have two special properties vitality and also mortality but the true view of the matter is that life as life involves the germ of death and that the finite being radically self-contradictory involves its own self-suppression nor again is the dialectic to be confused with mere sophistry the essence of sophistry lies in giving authority to partial and abstract principle in its isolation as may suit the interest and particular situation of the individual at the time for example a regard to my existence and my having means of existence is a vital motive of conduct but if i exclusively emphasize this consideration or motive of my welfare and draw the conclusion that i may steal or betray my country we have a case of sophistry 
Similarly, it is a vital principle in conduct that I should be subjectively free. That is to say, that I should have an insight into what I am doing, and a conviction that it is right. But if my pleading insists on this principle alone, I fall into sophistry, such as would overthrow all principles of morality. But this sort of party-pleading dialectic is wholly different. Its purpose is to study things in their own being, and movement thus to demonstrate the finitude of partial categories of understanding. A dialectic, it may be added, is no novelty in philosophy. Among the ancients, Plato is termed the inventor of dialectic, and his right to the name rests on the fact that the Platonic philosophy first gave the free scientific and thus at the same time objective form to dialectic. Socrates, as we should expect from the general character of his philosophizing, has the dialectical element in a predominantly subjective shape, that of irony. He used to turn his dialectic first against ordinary consciousness, and then especially against the sophists. In his conversations, he used to simulate the wish for some clearer knowledge about the subject under discussion, and after putting all sorts of questions with that intent, he drew on those with whom he conversed the opposite of what their first impressions had pronounced correct. If, for instance, the sophists claimed to be teachers, Socrates, by a series of questions, forced the sophist Protagoras to confess that all learning is only recollection. In his more strictly scientific dialogues, Plato employs the dialectical method to show the finitude of all hard and fast terms of understanding. Thus in the Parmenides he deduces the many from the one, and shows nevertheless that the many cannot but define itself as the one. In this grand style did Plato treat dialectic. In modern times it was, more than any other, Kant who resuscitated the name of dialectic and restored it to its post of honour. He did it, as we have seen, by working on the antinomonies of reason. The problem of these antinomonies is no more subjective piece of work oscillating between one set of grounds and another. It really serves to show that every abstract proposition of understanding, taken precisely as it is given, naturally veers round into its opposite. However reluctant understanding may be to admit the action of dialectic, we must not suppose that the recognition of its existence is peculiarly confined to the philosopher. It would be truer to say that dialectic gives expression to a law which is felt in other grades of consciousness and in general experience. Everything that surrounds us may be viewed as an instance of dialectic. We are aware that everything finite, instead of being stable and ultimate, is rather changeable and transient. And this is exactly what we mean by the dialectic of the finite, by which the finite, as implicitly other than what it is, is forced beyond its own immediate or natural being to turn suddenly into its opposite. We have before this identified understanding with what is implied in the popular idea of the goodness of God. We may now remark of the dialectic in the same objective signification that its principal answers to the idea of his power. All things, we say, that is the finite world as such, are doomed, and in saying so we have a vision of dialectic as the universal and irresistible power before which nothing can stay, however secure and stable it may deem itself. The category of power does not, it is true, exhaust the depth of the divine nature or the notion of God, but it certainly forms a vital element in all religious consciousness. Apart from this general objectivity of dialectic, we find traces of its presence in each of the particular provinces and phases of the natural and spiritual world. Take as an illusion the motion of the heavenly bodies. At this moment, the planet stands in this spot, but implicitly it is the possibility of being in another spot, and that possibility of being otherwise the planet brings into existence by moving. Similarly, the physical elements prove to be dialectical. The process of the meteorological action is the exhibition of their dialectic. It is the same dynamic that lies at the root of every other natural process, and as it were, forces nature out of itself. To illustrate the presence of dialectic in the spiritual world, especially in the provinces of law and morality, we have only to recollect how general experience shows us the extreme of one state or another suddenly shifting into its opposite a dialectic which is recognized in many ways in common proverbs thus summon jus summa injuria which means that to drive an abstract right to its extremity is to do a wrong in political life as everyone knows extreme anarchy and extreme despotism naturally lead to one another the perception of dialectic in the province of individual ethics is seen in well-known adages pride comes before a fall too much wit outwits itself. Even feeling, bodily as well as mental, has its dialectic. Everyone knows how the extremes of pain and pleasure pass into each other. The heart overflowing with joy seeks relief in tears, and the deepest melancholy will at times betray its presence by a smile. 
Skepticism should not be looked upon merely as a doctrine of doubt. It would be more correct to say that the skeptic has no doubt of his point, which is the nothingness of all finite existence. He who only doubts still clings to the hope that his doubt may be resolved, or that one or other of the definite views between which he always wavers will turn out solid and true. Skepticism, properly so called, is a very different thing. It is complete hopelessness about all which understanding counts stable. The feeble to which it gives birth is one of unbroken calmness and inward repose. Such at least is the noble skepticism of antiquity, especially as exhibited in the writings of Sextus Empiricus when in the later times of Rome it had been systematized as complement to the dogmatic systems of Stoic and Epicurean. A far other stamp, and to be strictly distinguished from it, is the modern skepticism already mentioned, which partly preceded the critical philosophy and partly sprung out of it. That later skepticism consisted solely in denying the truth and certitude of the supersensible, and in pointing to the fact of sense and immediate sensation as what we have to keep to. Even to this day, skepticism is often spoken of as the irresistible enemy of all positive knowledge, and hence of philosophy in so far as philosophy is concerned with positive knowledge. But in these statements there is a misconception. It is only the finite thought of abstract understanding which has to fear skepticism because, unable to withstand it, philosophy includes the sceptical principle as subordinate function of its own, in the shape of dialectic. In contradistinction to mere skepticism, however, philosophy does not remain content with the purely negative result of dialectic the sceptic mistakes the true value of his result when he supposes it to be no more than a negation pure and simple for the negative which emerges as the result of dialectic is because a result at the same time the positive it contains what it results from absorbed into itself and made part of its own nature thus conceived however the dialectical stage has the features characterising the third grade of logical truth the speculative stage or stage of positive reason apprehends the unity of terms propositions in their opposition the affirmative which is involved in their disintegration and in their transition one the result of dialectic is positive because it has a definite content or because its result is not empty and abstract nothing but the negation of certain specific propositions which are contained in the result for the very reason that it is a resultant and not an immediate nothing it follows from this that the reasonable result though it be only a thought and abstract is still concrete being and not plain formal unity but unity of distinct propositions. Bare abstractions or formal thoughts are therefore no business of philosophy, which has to deal only with concrete thoughts. The logic of mere understanding is involved in speculative logic, and can at will be elicited from it by the process of omitting the dialectical and reasonable element. When that is done, it becomes what the common logic is, a descriptive collection of sundry thought forms and rules which, finite though they are, are taken by something infinite. If we consider only what it contains and not how it contains it, the true reason world, so far from being the exclusive property of philosophy, is the right of every human being on whatever grade of culture or mental growth he may stand, which would justify man's ancient title of rational being. The general mode by which experience first makes us aware of the reasonable order of things is by accepted and unreasoned belief, and the character of the rational, as already noted, is to be unconditioned and thus to be self-contained, self-determining. In this sense, man above all things becomes aware of the reasonable order. When he knows of God, he knows him to be the completely self-determined similarly the consciousness a citizen has of his country and its laws is a perception of the reason world so long as he looks up to them as unconditioned and likewise universal powers to which he must subject his individual will and in the same sense the knowledge and will of the child is rational when he knows his parents will and wills it now to turn these rational of course positively rational realities into speculative principles the only thing needed is that they be thought the expression speculation in common life is often used with a very very vague and at the same time secondary sense as when we speak of a matrimonial or commercial speculation by this we only mean two things first that what is immediately at hand has to be passed and left behind and secondly that the subject matter of such speculations though in the first place only subjective must not remain so but be realized or translated into objectivity what was some time ago remarked respecting the idea may be applied to this common usage of the term speculation and we may add that people who rank themselves amongst the educated expressly speak of speculation even as if it were something purely subjective and certain theory of some conditions and circumstances of nature or mind may be say these people very fine and correct as a matter of speculation but it contradicts experience and nothing of the sort is admissible in reality to this the answer is that the speculative is in true signification neither preliminarily 
nor even definitively something merely subjective, that on the contrary it expressly rises above such oppositions as that between subjective and objective, which the understanding cannot get over, and absorbing them into itself evinces its own concrete and all-embracing nature. A one-sided proposition, therefore, can never even give expression to a speculative truth. If we say, for example, that the absolute is the unity of subjective and objective, we are undoubtedly in the right but so far one-sided as we enumerate the unity only and lay assent upon it, forgetting that in reality the subjective and objective are not merely identical but also distinct. Speculative truth, it may also be noted, means very much the same as what, in special connection with religious experience and doctrines, used to be called mysticism. The term mysticism is at present used as a rule to designate what is mysterious and incomprehensible, and in proportion as their general culture and way of thinking vary, the epithet is applied by one class to denote the real and the true by another to name everything connected with the superstition and deception on which we first of all remark there is a mystery in the mystical only however for the understanding which is ruled by the principle of abstract identity whereas the mystical as synonymous with the speculative is the concrete unity of these propositions which understanding only accepts in their separation and opposition if those who recognize mysticism as the highest truth are content to leave it in its original utter mystery their conduct only proves that for them too as well as their antagonists thinking means abstract identification and that in their opinion therefore truth can only be won by renouncing thought or is frequently expressed by leading the reason captive but as we have seen abstract thinking of understanding is so far from being either ultimate or stable that it shows a perceptual tendency to work its own dissolution and swing round into its opposite reasonableness on the contrary just consists in embracing within itself these opposites as unsubstantial elements thus the reason world may be equally styled mystical not however because thought cannot both reach and comprehend it but merely because it lies beyond the compass of understanding logic is subdivided into three parts one the doctrine of being two the doctrine of essence three the doctrine of notion and idea that is into the theory of thought one in its immediacy the notion implicit and in germ two in its reflection and mediation the being for self and show of the notion three its return into itself and its developed abiding by itself the notion in and for itself the division of the logic now given as well as the whole of the previous discussion on the nature of thought is anticipatory and the justification or proof of it can only result from the detailed treatment of thought itself for in philosophy to prove means to show how the subject by and from itself makes itself what it is the relation in which these three leading grades of thought or of the logical idea stand to each other must be conceived as follows truth comes only with the notion or more precisely the notion is the truth of being in essence both of which when separately maintained in their isolation cannot but be untrue the former because it is exclusively immediate and the latter because it is exclusively immediate why then it may be asked begin with the false and not at once with the true to which we answer that truth to deserve the name must authenticate its own truth which authentication here within the sphere of logic is given when the notion demonstrates itself to be what is mediated by and with itself and thus at the same time to be truly immediate this relation between three stages of logical idea appear in a real and concrete shape thus god who is the truth is known by us in his truth that is as absolute spirit only in so far as we at the same time recognize that the world which he created nature and the finite spirit are in their difference from god untrue end of chapter six recording by ryan smallwood Part 1 of Chapter 7 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel Translated by William Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood Part 1 of Chapter 7 First Subdivision of Logic The Doctrine of Being Being is the notion implicit only. Its special forms have the predicate is when they are distinguished they are each of them an other and the shape which dialectic takes in them i e their further specialization is a passing over into another this further determination or specialization is at once a fourth putting and in that way a disengaging of the notion implicit in being and at the same time the withdrawing of being inwards its sinking deeper into itself 
Thus the explication of notion in the sphere of being does two things. It brings out the totality of being, and it abolishes the immediacy of being, or the form of being as such. Being itself, and the special subcategories of it which follow, as well as those of the logic in general, may be looked upon as definitions of the absolute, or metaphysical definitions of God. At least the first and third category in every triad may. The first, where the thought form of the triad is formulated in its simplicity, and the third, being the return from differentiation to a simple self-reference. For a metaphysical definition of God is the expression of his nature in thoughts as such, and logic embraces all thoughts so long as they continue in the thought form. The second subcategory in each triad, where the grade of thought is in its differentiation, gives on the other hand a definition of the finite. The objection to the form of definition is that it implies a something in the mind's eye on which these predicates may fasten. Thus even the absolute, though it purports to express God in the style and character of thought, in comparison with its predicate, which really and distinctly expresses in thought, what the subject does not, is as yet only an inchoate pretended thought, the indeterminate subject of predicates yet to come. The thought which is here, and the matter of sole importance, is contained only in the predicate. And hence the propositional form, like the said subject, viz. the absolute, is a mere superfluity. Each of the three spheres of the logical idea proves to be a systematic whole of thought terms, and a phase of the absolute. This is the case with being, containing the three grades of quality, quantity and measure quality is in the first place the character identical with being so identical that a thing ceases to be what it is if it loses its quality quantity on the contrary is the character external to being and does not affect the being at all thus for example a house remains what it is whether it be greater or smaller and red remains red whether it be brighter or darker measure the third grade of being which is a unity of the first two is a qualitative quantity all things have their measure i e the quantitative terms of their existence their being so or so great does not matter within certain limits but when these limits are exceeded by an additional more or less the things cease to be what they were from measure follows the advance to the second subdivision of the idea essence the three forms of being here mentioned just because they are the first are also the poorest i e the most abstract immediate sensible consciousness in so far as it simultaneously includes an intellectual element is especially restricted to the abstract categories of quality and quantity the sensuous consciousness is in ordinary estimation the most concrete and thus also the richest but that is only true as regards to materials whereas in reference to the thought it contains it is really the poorest and most abstract a quality being pure being makes the beginning because it is on one hand pure thought and on the other immediacy itself simple and indeterminate the first beginning cannot be mediated by anything or be further determined all doubts and admonitions which might be brought against beginning the science with abstract empty being will disappear if we only perceive what a beginning naturally implies it is impossible to define being as i equals i as absolute indifference or identity and so on where it is felt necessary to begin either with what is absolutely certain i e the certainty of oneself or with the definition or intuition of the absolute truth these and other forms of the kind may be looked on as if they must be the first but each of these forms contains a mediation and hence cannot be the real first for all mediation implies advance made from a first on to a second and proceeding from something different if i equals i or even the intellectual intuition are really taken to mean no more than the first they are in this mere immediacy identical with being which conversely pure being if abstract no longer but including in it mediation is pure thought or intuition if we enunciate being as a predicate of the absolute we get the first definition of the latter the absolute is being this is in thought the absolutely initial definition the most abstract and stinted it is the definition given by the eleatics but at the same time it is also a well-known definition of god as the sum of all realities it means in short that we are to set aside that limitation which is in every reality so that god shall be only the real in all reality the superlatively real 
or if we reject reality as implying a reflection we get a more immediate or unreflected statement of the same thing when jacobi says the god of spinoza is the principium of being in all existence when thinking is to begin we have nothing but thought in its merest indeterminateness for we cannot determine unless there is both one and another and in the beginning there is yet no other the indeterminate as we here have it is the blank we begin with not a featureless reached by abstraction not the elimination of all character but the original featurelessness which precedes all definite character and is the very first of all and this we call being it is not to be felt or perceived by sense or pictured in imagination and as such it forms the beginning essence also is indeterminate but in another sense it has traversed the process of mediation and contains implicit the determination it has absorbed in the history of philosophy the different stages of the logical idea assume the shape of successive systems each based on a particular definition of the absolute as the logical idea is seen to unfold itself in a process from the abstract to the concrete so in the history of philosophy the earliest systems are the most abstract and thus at the same time the poorest the relation too of the earlier to the later systems of philosophy is much like the relation of the corresponding stages of the logical idea in other words the earlier are preserved in the later but subordinated and submerged this is the true meaning of a much misunderstood phenomenon in the history of philosophy the refutation of one system by another of an earlier by a later most commonly the refutation is taken in a purely negative sense to mean the system refuted has ceased to count for anything has been set aside and done for were it so the history of philosophy would be of all studies most saddening displaying as it does the refutation of every system which time has brought forth now although it may be admitted that every philosophy has been refuted it must be in an equal degree maintained that no philosophy has been refuted nay or can be refuted and that in two ways for first every philosophy that deserves the name always embodies the idea and secondly every system represents one particular factor or particular stage in the evolution of the idea the refutation of a philosophy therefore only means that its barriers are crossed and its special principle reduces to a factor in the completer principle that follows thus the history of philosophy in its true meaning deals not with a past but with an eternal and veritable present and in its results resembles not a museum or the aberrations of the human intellect but a pantheon of godlike figures these figures of god are the various stages of the idea as they come forward one after another in a dialectical development to the history of philosophy it belongs to point out more precisely how far the gradual evolution of this theme coincides with or swerves from the dialectical unfolding of the pure logical idea it is sufficient to mention here that logic begins where the proper history of philosophy begins philosophy began in the eleatic school particularly with parmenides parmenides who conceives the absolute as being says that being alone is and nothing is not such was the true starting point of philosophy which is always knowledge by thought and here for the first time we find pure thought seized and made an object to itself men indeed thought from the beginning for thus only were they distinguished from the animals but thousands of years had to elapse before they came to apprehend thought in its purity and to see in it the truly objective the eleatics are celebrated as daring thinkers but this nominal admiration is often accompanied by the remark that they went too far when they made being alone true and denied truth of every other object of consciousness we must go further than mere being it is true and yet it is absurd to speak of the other contents of our consciousness as something what as it were outside and beside being or to say that the other things as well as being the true state of the case rather is as follows being as being is nothing fixed or ultimate it yields to dialectic and sinks into opposite which also taken immediately is nothing after all the point is that being is the first pure thought whatever else you may begin with the i equals i the absolute indifference or god himself you begin with a figure of materialized conception not a product of thought and that so far as its thought content is concerned such beginning is merely being but this mere being as it is mere abstraction is therefore the absolutely negative which in a similarly immediate aspect is just nothing hence was derived the second definition of the absolute the absolute is the not in fact this definition is implied in saying that the thing in itself is the indeterminate utterly without form and so without content 
or in saying that god is only the supreme being and nothing more for this is really declaring him to be the same negativity as above the nothing which the buddhist monks make the universal principle as well as the final aim and goal of everything is the same abstraction if opposition in thought is stated in this immediacy as being and nothing the shock of its nullity is too great not to stimulate the attempt to fix being and secure it against the transition into nothing with this intent reflection has recourse to the plan of discovering some fixed predicate for being to mark it off from nothing thus we find being identified with what persists amid all the change with matter susceptible of innumerable determinations or even unreflectingly with a single existence any chance object of the senses or of the mind but every additional and more concrete characterization causes being to lose that integrity and simplicity it has in the beginning only in and by virtue of this mere generality is it nothing something else inexpressible whereof the distinction from nothing is a mere intention or meaning all that is wanted is to realise that these beginnings are nothing but the empty abstractions one as empty as the other the instinct that induces us to attach a settled import to being or to both is the very necessity which leads to the onward movement of being and nothing and gives them a true or concrete significance this advance in the logical deduction and the movement of thought exhibited in the sequel the reflection which finds a profounder connotation for being and nothing is nothing but logical thought through which such connotations is evolved not however in an accidental but a necessary way every signification therefore in which they afterwards appear is only a more precise specification and truer definition of the absolute and when that is done the mere abstract being and nothing are replaced by a concrete in which both these elements form an organic part the supreme form of not as separate principle would be freedom but freedom is negativity in that stage when it sinks self-absorbed to supreme intensity and is itself an affirmation and even an absolute affirmation the distinction between being and not is in the first place only implicit and not yet actually made they only ought to be distinguished a distinction of course implies two things and that one of them possesses an attribute which is not found in the other being however is an absolute absence of attributes and so is not hence the distinction between the two is only meant to be it is a quite nominal distinction which is at the same time no distinction in all other cases of difference there is some common point which comprehends both things suppose for example we speak of two different species the genus forms a common ground for both but in case of mere being and nothing distinction is without a bottom to stand upon hence there can be no distinction both determinations being the same bottomlessness if it be replied that being and nothing are both of them thoughts so that thought may be reckoned common ground the objector forgets that being is not a particular or definite thought and hence being quite indeterminate is a thought not to be distinguished from nothing it is natural too for us to represent being as absolute riches and nothing absolute poverty but if when we view the whole world we can only say everything is and nothing more we are neglecting all specialty and instead of absolute plentitude we have absolute emptiness the same stricture is applied to those who define god to be mere being a definition not a whit better than of the buddhists who make god to be not and who from that principle draw further conclusion that self-annihilation is the means by which man becomes god nothing if it be thus immediate and equal to itself is also conversely the same as being is the truth of being and of nothing is accordingly the unity of the two and the unity is becoming the proposition that being and nothing is the same seems so paradoxical to the imagination or understanding that it is perhaps taken for a joke and indeed it is one of the hardest things thought expects itself to do for being and nothing exhibit the fundamental contrast in all its immediacy that is without one term being invested with any attribute which would involve its connection with another this attribute however as the above paragraph points out is implicit in them the attribute which is just the same in both so far as the deduction of their unity is completely analytical indeed the whole progress of philosophizing in every case if it be a methodical that is to say necessary progress merely renders explicit what is implicit in a notion it is as correct however to say that being and nothing are altogether different as to assert their unity the one is not what the other is but simply the distinction has not at this point assumed definite shape it is in the way they have it something unutterable which we merely mean 
no great expenditure of wit is needed to make fun of the maxim that being and nothing are the same or rather adduce absurdities which it is erroneously asserted are the consequence and illustrations of that maxim if being and nothing are identical say these objectors it follows that it makes no difference whether my home my property the air i breathe the city the sun the law mind god are or are not now in some of these cases the objectors foist in private aims the utility a thing has for me and then ask whether it to be all the same to me if the thing exists or if it do not for that matter indeed the teaching of philosophy is precisely what frees man from the endless crowd of finite aims and intentions by making him so insensible to them that their existence or non-existence is to him a matter of indifference but it is never to be forgotten that once mentioned something substantial you thereby create a connection with other existences and other purposes which are ex hypothesi worth having and on such hypothesis it comes to depend whether being and not being of a determinate subject are the same or not a substantial distinction in these cases secretly subsituated for the empty distinction of being and not in others of the cases referred to it is virtually absolute existence and vital ideas and aims which are placed under the mere category of being or not being but there is more to be said of these concrete objects than that they merely are or are not barren abstractions like being and nothing the initial categories which for that reason are the scantiest anywhere to be found are utterly inadequate to the nature of these objects substantial truth is something far above these abstractions and their positions and always when a concrete existence is distinguished under the name of being and not being empty-headedness makes its usual mistake of speaking about and having in the mind an image of something else than what is in question and in this place the question is about abstract being and nothing it may perhaps be said that nobody can form a notion of the unity of being and not as for that the notion of the unity is stated in the sections preceding and that is all apprehend that and you have comprehended this unity what the objector really means by comprehension by a notion is more than his language properly implies he wants a richer and more complex state of mind a pictorial conception which will profound the notion as concrete case and one more familiar to the ordinary operations of thought and so long as incomprehensibility means only the want of habituation for the effect needed to grasp an abstract thought free from all sensuous admixture and to seize the speculative truth the reply to the criticism is that philosophical knowledge is undoubtedly distinct in kind from the mode of knowledge best known in common life as well as that which reigns in the other sciences but if to have no notion merely means that we cannot represent in imagination the oneness of being and not the statement is far from being true for every one has countless ways of envisaging this unity to say that we have no such conception can only mean that in none of these images do we recognise the notion in question and that we are not aware that they exemplify it the readiest example of it is becoming every one has a mental idea of becoming and will even allow that it is one idea he will further allow that when it is analysed it involves the attributes of being and also in the very reverse of being viz nothing and that these two attributes lie undivided in one idea so that becoming is the unity of being and nothing another tolerably plain example is the beginning in the beginning the thing is not yet but it is more than merely nothing for its being is already in the beginning beginning is itself a case of becoming only the former term is employed with an eye to further advance if we were to adapt logic to the more usual method of the sciences we might start with the representation of a beginning as abstractly thought or with beginning as such and then analyse this representation and perhaps people would more readily admit as a result of this analysis that being and nothing present themselves as undivided in unity it remains to note that such phrases as being and nothing are the same or the unity of being and nothing like all other such unities that of subject and object and others give rise to reasonable objection they misrepresent the facts by giving an exclusive prominence to the unity and leaving the difference which undoubtedly exists in it because it is being and nothing for example the unity of which is declared without any express mention or notice it accordingly seems as if diversity had been unduly put out of court and neglected the fact is no speculative principle can be correctly expressed by any such propositional form for the unity has to be conceived in the diversity which is all the while present and explicit to become is the true expression for the resultant of to be and not to be it is the unity of the two but not only is it the unity it is also the inherent unrest 
the unity which is no mere reference to self and therefore without movement but which through the diversity of being and nothing that is in it it is at war within itself determinate being on the other hand is this unity or becoming in this form of unity hence all that is there and so is one-sided and finite the opposition between the two factors seems to have vanished it is only implied in the unity it is not explicitly put in it the maxim of becoming that being is the passage into not and not the passage into being is controverted by a maxim of pantheism the doctrine of eternity of matter that from nothing comes nothing and something can only come out of something the ancients saw plainly that the maxim from nothing comes nothing from something something really abolishes becoming for what it comes from and what it becomes are one and the same thus explained the proposition is the maxim of abstract identity as upheld by the understanding it cannot but seem strange therefore to hear such maxims as out of nothing comes nothing out of something comes something calmly taught in these days without the teacher being and at least aware that they are the basis of pantheism and even without his knowing that the ancients have exhausted all this to be said about them becoming is the first concrete thought and therefore the first notion whereas being and nothing are empty abstractions the notion of being therefore of which we sometimes speak must mean becoming not the mere point of being which is empty nothing any more than nothing which is empty being in being then we have nothing and in nothing being but this being which does not lose itself in nothing is becoming nor must we omit the distinction while we emphasise the unity of becoming without that distinction we should once more return to abstract being becoming is only the explicit statement of what being is in its truth we often hear it maintained that thought is opposed to being now in the face of such a statement our first question ought to be what is meant by being if we understand being as it is defined by reflection all that we can say of it is that what is wholly identical and affirmative and if we look at thought it cannot escape us that thought is also at least what is absolutely identical with itself both therefore being as well as thought have the same attribute this identity of being and thought is not however to be taken in a concrete sense as if we could say that a stone so far as it has being is the same as a thinking man a concrete thing is always very different from the abstract category as such and in the case of being we are speaking of nothing concrete for being is utterly abstract so far then the question regarding the being of god a being which is in itself concrete above all measure is of slight importance as the first concrete thought term becoming is the first adequate vehicle of truth in the history of philosophy this logical idea finds its analogue in the system of heraclitus when heraclitus says all is flowing he enunciates becoming as the fundamental feature of all existence whereas the eleatics as already remarked saw the only truth in being rigid processless being glancing at the principle of the eleatics heraclitus then goes on to say being no more is than not being a statement expressing the negativity of abstract being and its identity with not being as made explicit in becoming both abstractions being alike untenable this may be looked at as an instance of the real refutation of one system by another to refute a philosophy is to exhibit the dialectical movement in its principle and thus reduce it to a constituent member of a higher concrete form of the idea even becoming however taken at its best on its own ground is an extremely poor term it needs to grow in depth and weight of meaning such deepened force we find for example in life life is a becoming but that is not enough to exhaust the notion of life a still higher form is found in mind here too is becoming but richer and more intensive than mere logical becoming these elements whose unity constitutes mind are not bare abstractions of being and of not but the systems of logical idea and of nature being determinate in becoming the being which is one with nothing and the nothing which is one with being are only vanishing factors they are and they are not thus by its inherent contradiction becoming collapses into the unity in which the two elements are absorbed the result is accordingly being determinate being there and so in the first example we must call to mind once for all what was stated in the note the only way to secure any growth and progress in knowledge is to hold results fast in their truth there is absolutely nothing whatever in which we cannot and must not point to contradictions or opposite attributes and the abstraction made by understanding therefore means a forcible insistence on a single aspect and a real effort to obscure and remove all consciousness of the other attribute which is involved 
Whenever such contradiction, then, is discovered in any object or notion, the usual inference is, hence, this object is nothing. Thus Zeno, who first showed the contradiction native to motion, concluded that there is no motion, and the ancients, who recognised origin and decease, the two species of becoming, as untrue categories, made use of the expression that the one, or absolute, neither arises nor perishes. Such a style of dialectic looks only at the negative aspect of its results, and fails to notice what is at the same time really present. The definite result in the present case appear nothing, but a nothing which includes being, and in like matter a being which includes nothing. Hence being determinate is one, the unity of being and nothing, in which we get rid of the immediacy in these determinations, and their contradiction vanishes in their mutual connection, the unity in which they are only constituent elements, and two, since the result is the abolition of the contradiction, it comes in the shape of simple unity with itself, that is to say, it is also being, but being with negation or determinateness. It is becoming expressly put in the form of one of its elements, viz. being. Even our ordinary conception of becoming implies that somewhat comes out of it, and that becoming therefore has a result. But this conception gives rise to the question how becoming does not remain mere becoming, but as a result. The answer to this question follows from what becoming has already shown itself to be. Becoming always contains being and nothing in such a way that these two are always changing into each other and reciprocally concealing each other. Thus becoming stands before us in this abstract restlessness. For since being and nothing vanish in becoming, and that is the very notion of becoming, the latter must vanish also. Becoming is, as it were, a fire which dies out in itself when it consumes its material. The result of this process, however, is not an empty nothing, but being identical with the negation, what we call being determinant, being then and there, the primary import of which evidently is that it has become. Determinant being is being with a character or mode which simply is, and such unmediated character is quality, and as reflected into itself in this its character or mode, determinant being is somewhat an existent. The categories which issued by a closer analysis of determinate being need only be mentioned briefly. Quality may be described as the determinate mode immediate and identical with being, as distinguished from quantity to come afterwards, which, although a mode of being, is no longer immediately identical with being, but a mode indifferent and external to it. A something is what it is in virtue of its quality, and losing its quality it ceases to be what it is. Quality, moreover, is completely a category only of the finite, and for that reason, too, it has its proper place in nature, not in the world of mind. Thus, for example, in nature, what are styled the elementary bodies, oxygen, nitrogen, etc., should be regarded as existing qualities. But in the sphere of mind, quality appears in a subordinate way only, and not as if its qualitativeness could exhaust any specific aspect of mind if for example we consider the subjective mind which forms the object of psychology we may describe what is called moral and mental character as in logical language identical with quality this however does not mean that character is a mode of being which pervades the soul and is immediately identical with it as is the case in the natural world with the elementary bodies before mentioned yet a more distinct manifestation of quality as such in mind even is found in the case of besotted or morbid conditions, especially in states of passion when the passion rises to derangement. The state of mind of deranged person, being one mass of jealousy, fear, etc., may suitably be described as quality. Quality, as determinateness which is, as contrasted with the negation which is involved in it but distinguished from it, is reality. Negation is no longer an abstract nothing, but as a determinate being and somewhat is only a form on such being. It is as otherness. Since this otherness, though a determination of quality itself, is in the first instance distinct from it, quality is being for another, an expansion of the mere point of determinate being or of somewhat. The being, as such of quality, contrasted with this reference to something else, is being by self. The foundation of all determinateness is negation. As Spinoza says, omnis determinato est negatio. The unreflecting observer supposes that determinate things are merely positive and pins them down under the form of being. Mere being, however, is not the end of the matter. 
it is as we have already seen utter emptiness and instability besides still when abstract being is confused in this way with being modified and determinate it implies some perception of the element of negation this element is at first wrapped up as it were and only comes to the front and receives its due in being for self if we go on to consider determinate being as determinateness which is we get in this way what is called reality we speak for example of the reality of a plan or of a purpose meaning thereby that they are no longer inner and subjective but have passed into being there and then in the same sense the body may be called the reality of the soul and the law the reality of freedom and the world altogether the reality of the divine idea the word reality is however used in another acceptation to mean that something behaves conformably to its essential characteristic or notion for example we use the expression this is a real occupation this is a real man here the term does not merely mean outward and immediate existence but rather that some existence agrees with its notion in which sense be it added reality is not distinct from ideality which we shall in the first instance become acquainted with in the shape of being for self being if kept distinct and apart from its determinate mode as it is in being by self being implicit would be only the vacant abstraction of being in being determinate there and then the determinateness is one with being yet at the same time when we explicitly made a negation it is a limit a barrier hence the otherness is not something indifferent and outside it but a function proper to it somewhat is by its quality firstly finite secondly alterable so that finitude and variability appearing to its being in being there and then the negation is still directly one with being and this negation is what we call a limit boundary a thing is what it is only in and by reason of its limit we cannot therefore regard the limit as only external to being which is then and there it rather goes through and through the whole of such existence the view of limit as merely an external characteristic of being there and then arises from a confusion of quantitative with the qualitative limit here we are speaking primarily of the qualitative limit if for example we observe a piece of ground three acres large that circumstance is quantitative limit but in addition the ground is it may be a meadow not a wood or a pond this is its qualitative limit man if he wishes to be actual must be there and then and to this end he must set a limit to himself people who are too fastidious towards the finite never reach actuality but linger lost in abstraction and their light dies away if we take a closer look at what a limit implies we see it involving a contradiction in itself and thus evincing its dialectical nature on the one side the limit makes the reality of a thing on the other it is its negation but again the limit as the negation of something is not an abstract nothing but a nothing which is what we call an other given something and up starts an other to us we know that there is not something only but an other as well nor again is the other of such a nature that we can think something apart from it a something is implicitly the other of itself and the somewhat sees its limit become objective to it in the other if we now ask for the difference between something and other it turns out that they are the same which sameness is expressed in latin by calling the pair aliad aliad the other as opposed to the something it is itself a something and hence we say some other or something else and so on the other hand the first something when opposed to the other also defined as something is itself an other when we say something else our first impression is that something taken separately is only something and that the quality of being another attaches to it only from outside considerations thus we might suppose that the moon being something else than the sun might very well exist without the sun but really the moon as a something has its other implicit in it plato says god made the world out of the nature of the one and the other having brought these together he formed from them a third which is of the nature of the one and the other in these words we have in general terms a statement of nature of the finite which as something does not meet the nature of the other as if it had no affinity to it but being implicitly the other of itself thus undergoes alteration alteration thus exhibits the inherent contradiction which originally attaches to determinate being and which forces it out of its own bounds to materialized conception existence stands in the character of something solely positive and quietly abiding within its own limits 
though we also know it is true that everything finite such as existence is subject to change such changeableness in existence is only to the superficial eye a mere possibility the realization of which is not a consequence of its own nature but the fact is mutability lies in the notion of existence and change is only the manifestation of what it implicitly is the living dies simply because as living they bear in themselves the germ of death something becomes another this other is itself somewhat therefore it likewise becomes an other and so on ad infinitum this infinity is the wrong or negative infinity it is only a negation of a finite but the finite rises again the same as ever and is never got rid of and absorbed in other words this infinite only expresses the ought to be elimination of the finite the progression to infinity never gets further than a statement of the contradiction involved in the finite that it is somewhat as well as somewhat else it sets up with endless iteration the alteration between the two terms each of which calls up the other if we let somewhat and another the elements of determinate being fall asunder the result is that some becomes other and this other is itself a somewhat which then as such changes likewise and so on ad infinitum this result seems to superficial reflection something very grand the grandest possible but such a progression to infinity is not the real infinite that consists in being at home with itself in its other or if enunciated as a process in coming to itself in its other much depends on rightly apprehending the notion of infinity and not stopping short at the wrong infinity of endless progression when time and space for example are spoken of as infinite it is in the first place the infinite progression on which our thoughts fasten we say now this time and then we keep continually going forward and backward beyond this limit the case is the same with space the infinity of which has formed the theme of barren declamation to astronomers with a talent for edification in the attempt to contemplate such an infinite our thoughts we are commonly informed must sink exhausted it is true indeed that we must abandon the unending contemplation not however because the occupation is too sublime but because it is too tedious it is tedious to expatiate the contemplation of this infinite progression because the same thing is constantly recurring we lay down a limit then we pass it next we have a limit once more and so on for ever all this is but superficial alteration which never leaves the region of the finite behind to suppose that by stepping out and away into the infinity we release ourselves from the finite is in truth but to seek the release which comes by flight but the man who flees is not yet free in fleeing he is still conditioned by that from which he flees if it be also said that the infinite is unattainable the statement is true but only because to the idea of infinity has been attached the circumstance of being simply and solely negative with such empty and other world stuff philosophy has nothing to do what philosophy has to do with is always something concrete and in the highest sense present no doubt philosophy has also sometimes been set the task of finding an answer to the question how the infinite comes to the resolution of issuing out of itself this question founded as it is upon the assumption of a rigid opposition between finite and infinite may be answered by saying that the opposition is false and that in point of fact the infinite eternally proceeds out of itself and yet does not proceed out of itself if we further say that the infinite is the not finite we have in point of fact virtually expressed the truth for the finite itself is the first negative the not finite is the negative of that negation the negation which is identical with itself and thus at the same time a true affirmation the infinity of reflection here discussed is only an attempt to reach the true infinity a wretched neither one thing nor another generally speaking it is the point of view which has in recent times been emphasised in germany the finite this theory tells us ought to be absorbed the infinite ought not to be negative merely but also a positive that ought to be betrays the incapacity of actually making good a claim which is at the same time recognised to be right this stage never passed by the systems of kant and fichte so far as ethics are concerned the utmost to which this way brings us is only the postulate of a never-ending approximation to the law of reason which postulate has been made an argument for the immortality of soul what we have now in point of fact before us is that somewhat comes to be another and that the other generally comes to be another this essentially relative to another somewhat is virtually another against it and since what is passed into is quite the same as what passes over since both have one and the same attribute viz to be another it follows that something in its passage into other only joins with itself to be thus self-related in the passage and in the other is the genuine infinity or under a negative aspect what is altered is the other 
it becomes the other of the other thus being as a negation of the negation is restored again it is now being for self dualism in putting an inseparable opposition between finite and infinite fails to notice the simple circumstances that the infinite is thereby only one of two and is reduced to a particular to which finite forms the other particular such an infinite which is only a particular is coterminous with the finite which makes for its limit and a barrier it is not what it ought to be that is the infinite but is only finite in such circumstances where the finite is on this side and the infinite on that this world as the finite and the other world as the infinite an equal dignity of permanence and independence is ascribed to finite and to infinite the being of the finite is made an absolute being and by this dualism gets independence and stability touched so to speak by the infinite it would be annihilated but it must not be touched by the infinite there must be an abyss an impassable gulf between the two with the infinite abiding on yonder side and the finite steadfast on this those who attribute to the finite this inflexible persistence in comparison with the infinite are not as they imagine far above metaphysic they are still on the level of most ordinary metaphysic of understanding for the same thing occurs here as in the infinite progression at one time it is admitted that the finite has no independent actuality no absolute being no root and development of its own but is only a transient but next moment this straightaway forgotten the finite made a mere counterpart to the infinite wholly separated from it and rescued from annihilation is conceived to be persistent in its independence while thought thus imagines itself elevated to the infinite it meets with the opposite fate it comes to an infinite which is only a finite and the finite which it had left behind has always to be retained and made into an absolute after this examination with which it were well to compare plato's philebus tending to show the nullity of the distinction made by understanding between the finite and the infinite we are liable to glide into the statement that the infinite and finite are therefore one and the genuine infinity the truth must be defined and enunciated as the unity of the finite and infinite such a statement would be to some extent correct but is just as open to perversion and falsehood as the unity of being and nothing already noticed besides it may very fairly be charged with reducing the infinite to finitude and making a finite infinite for so far as the expression goes the finite seems left in its place and not expressly stated to be absorbed or if we reflect that the finite when identified with the infinite certainly cannot remain what it is out of such unity and will at least suffer some change in its characteristics as an alkali when combined with an acid loses some of its properties we must see that the same fate awaits the infinite which as the negative will on its part likewise have its edge as it were taken off on the other and this does not really happen with the abstract one-sided infinite of understanding the genuine infinite however is not merely in the position of the one-sided acid and so does not lose itself the negation of negation is not a neutralization the infinite is the affirmative and it is only the finite which is absorbed and being for self enters the category of ideality being there and then as in the first instance apprehended in its being or affirmation has reality and thus even finitude in the first instance is in the category of reality but the truth of the finite is rather its ideality similarly the infinite of understanding which is coordinated with the finite is itself only one of two finites no whole truth but a substantial element this ideality of the finite is the chief maxim of philosophy and for the reason every genuine philosophy is idealism but everything depends upon not taking for the infinite what in the very terms of its characterization is at the same time made a particular and finite for this reason we have bestowed a greater amount of attention on this distinction the fundamental notion of philosophy the genuine infinite depends upon it the distinction is cleared up by the simple and for that reason seemingly insignificant but incontrovertible reflections contained in the first paragraph of this section being for self being for self as a reference to itself is immediacy and as a reference to the negative to itself is a self-subsistent the one this unit being without distinction in itself thus excludes the other from itself to be for self to be one is completed quality and as such contains abstract being and being modified as non-substantial elements as simple being the one is simple self-reference as being modified it is determinate but the determinateness is not in this case a finite determinateness a somewhat in distinction from another but infinite because it contains distinction absorbed and annulled in itself the readiest instance of being for self is found in the i we know ourselves as existence 
distinguished in the first place from other existence and with certain relations thereto but we also come to know this expansion of existence in these relations reduced as it were to a point in the simplest form of being for self when we say i we express the reference to self which is infinite and at the same time negative man it may be said is distinguished from the animal world and in that way from nature altogether by knowing himself as i which amounts to saying that natural things never attain a free being for self but as limited to being there and then are always only being for an other again being for self may be described as ideality just as being there and then was described as reality it is said that besides reality there is also ideality these two categories are made equal and parallel properly speaking ideality is not somewhat outside of and beside reality the notion of ideality just lies in its being the truth of reality that is to say when reality is explicitly put as what it implicitly is it is at once seen to be ideality hence ideality has not received its proper estimation when you allow that reality is not all in all but that an ideality must be recognised outside of it such an ideality external to or may be even beyond reality would be no better than an empty name ideality only has a meaning when it is the ideality of something but this something is not a mere indefinite this or that but existence characterised as reality which if retained in isolation possesses no truth the distinction between nature and mind is not improperly conceived when the former is traced back to reality and the latter to ideality as a fundamental category nature however is far from being so fixed and complete as to subsist even without mind a mind at first as it were attains its goal and its truth and similarly mind on its part is not merely a world beyond nature and nothing more it is really and with full proof seen to be mind only when it involves nature as absorbed in itself apropos of this we should note the double meaning of the german word aufheben to put by or set aside when we mean it by one to clear away or annul we thus say a law or regulation is set aside two to keep or preserve in which sense we use it when we say something is well put by this double usage of language which gives to the same word a positive and negative meaning is not an accident and gives no ground for reproaching language as a cause of confusion we should rather recognise in it the speculative spirit of our language rising above the mere either or of understanding the relation of the negative to itself is a negative relation and so a distinguishing of the one from itself the repulsion of the one that is makes many ones so far as regards the immediacy of the self-existence these many are and the repulsion of every one of them becomes to that extent their repulsion against each other as existing units in other words their reciprocal exclusion when we speak of the one the many usually come into our mind at the same time whence then we are forced to ask do the many come this question is unanswerable by consciousness which pictures the many as a primary datum and treats the one as only one among the many but the philosophic notion teaches contrawise that the one forms the presupposition of the many and in the thought of the one is implied that it explicitly make itself many so self-existing unit is not like being void of all connective reference it is a reference as well as being there and then was not however a reference connecting somewhat with an other but as a unity of the sum and the other it is a connection with itself and this connection be it noted is a negative connection hereby the one manifests an utter incompatibility with itself a self-repulsion and what it makes itself explicitly be is the many we may denote this side in the process of being for self by the figurative term repulsion repulsion is a term originally employed in the study of matter to mean that matter as a many in each of these many ones behaves as exclusive to all the others it would be wrong however to view the process of repulsion as if the one were repellent and the many the repelled the one as already remarked just is self-exclusion and explicit putting itself as the many each of the many however is itself a one and in virtue of so behaving this all-round repulsion is by one stroke converted into its opposite attraction but the many are one the same as another each is one or even one of the many they are consequently one and the same or when we study all the repulsion involves we see the attitude of many ones to one another it is just as essentially a connective reference to them to each other and those to which the one is related in its act of repulsion are ones it is in them thrown into relation with itself the repulsion therefore has an equal right to be called attraction 
and the exclusive one or being for self suppresses it. Qualitative character, which in the one or unit has reached the extreme point of its characterisation, has thus passed over into determinateness, quality, suppressed, i.e. into being as quantity. The philosophy of the atomists is the doctrine in which the absolute is formulated as being for self, as one and many ones and it is the repulsion which shows itself in the notion of the one which is assumed as the fundamental force in these atoms but instead of attraction it is accident that is mere unintelligence which is expected to bring them together so long as the one is fixed as one it is certainly impossible to regard its congression with others as anything but external and mechanical the void which is assumed as the complementary principle to the atoms is repulsion and nothing else present under the image of the nothing existing between the atoms modern atomism and physics is still in principle atomistic has surrendered the atoms so far as to pin its faith on molecules or particles in so doing science has come closer to sensuous conception at the cost of losing the precision of thought to put an attractive by the side of a repulsive force as the moderns have done certainly gives completeness to the contrast and the discovery of this natural force as it is called has been a source of much pride but the mutual implication of the two which makes what is true and concrete in them would have to be wrestled from the obscurity and confusion in which they were left even in kant's metaphysical rudiments of natural science in modern times the importance of the atomic theory is more evident in political than in physical science according to it the will of individuals as such is the creative principle of the state the attracting force is the special wants and inclinations of individuals and the universal or the state itself is the external nexus of a compact the atomic philosophy forms a vital stage in the historical evolution of the idea the principle of that system may be described as being for itself in the shape of the many at present students of nature who are anxious to avoid metaphysics turn a favourable ear to atomism but it is not possible to escape metaphysics and cease to trace nature back to terms of thought by throwing yourselves into the arms of atomism the atom in fact is itself a thought and hence the theory which holds matter to consist of atoms is a metaphysical theory newton gave physics an express warning to beware of metaphysics it is true but to his honour be it said he did not by any means obey his own warning the only mere physicists are the animals they alone do not think while man is a thinking being and a born metaphysician the real question is not whether we shall apply metaphysics but whether our metaphysics are of the right kind in other words whether we are not instead of concrete logical idea adopting one-sided forms of thought rigidly fixed by understanding and making these the basis of our theoretical as well as our practical work it is on this ground that one objects to the atomic philosophy the old atomists viewed the world as a many as successors often do to this day on chance they laid the task of collecting the atoms which float about in the void but after all the nexus binding the many with one another is by no means a mere accident as we have already remarked the nexus is founded on their very nature to kant we owe the completed theory of matter as the unity of repulsion and attraction the theory is correct so far as it recognises attraction to be the other of the two elements involved in the notion of being for self and to be an element no less essential than repulsion to constituent matter still this dynamical construction of matter as it is termed has the fault for taking for granted instead of deducing attraction and repulsion had they been deduced we should then have seen the how and the why of a unity which is merely asserted kant indeed was careful to inculcate that matter must not be taken to be existence per se and then as it were incidentally to be provided with the two forces mentioned but must be regarded as consisting solely in their unity german physicists for some time accepted this pure dynamic but in spite of this the majority of these physicists in modern times have found it more convenient to return to the atomic point of view and in spite of the warnings of kessner one of their number have began to regard matters consisting of infinitesimally small particles termed atoms which atoms then have to be brought into relation with one another by the play of forces attached to them attractive repulsive or whatever they may be this too is metaphysics and metaphysics for its utter unintelligence there would be sufficient reason to guard against the transition from quality to quantity indicated in the paragraph before us is not found in our ordinary way of thinking which deems each of these categories to exist independently beside the other we are in the habit of saying that things are not merely qualitatively but also quantitatively defined but whence these categories originate and how they are related to each other are questions not further examined the fact is quantity just means quality superseded and absorbed and it is by the dialectic of quality here examined that this supersession is effected 
First of all we had Being, as the truth of Being came becoming, which formed the passage into Being determinate, and the truth of that we found to be alteration. And in its result alteration showed itself to be Being for self, exempt from the implication of another, and from passage into another, which Being for self, finally in the two sides of its process, repulsion and attraction, was clearly seen to annul itself, and thereby to annul quality in the totality of its stages. Still, this superseded and absorbed quality is neither an abstract nothing, nor an equally abstract and featureless being. It is only being as indifferent to determinateness or character. This aspect of being is also what appears as quantity in our ordinary conceptions. We observe things first of all with an eye to their quality, which we take to be the character identical with the being of the thing. If we proceed to consider their quantity, we get the conception of an indifferent and external character or mode, of such a kind that a thing remains what it is, though its quantity is altered and the thing becomes greater or less. End of part one of chapter seven. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Part 2 of Chapter 7 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel Translated by William Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood Part 2 of Chapter 7 B. Quantity Pure Quantity Quantity is pure being, where the mode or character is no longer taken as one with the being itself, but explicitly put as superseded or indifferent. The expression magnitude especially marks determinate quantity, and is for that reason not a suitable name for quantity in general. Mathematics usually define magnitude as what can be increased or diminished. This definition has the defect of containing the thing to be defined over again, but it may serve to show that the category of magnitude is explicitly understood to be changeable and indifferent, so that in spite of its being altered by an increased extension or intention, the thing, a house for example, does not cease to be a house and red to be red. The absolute is pure quantity. This point of view is upon the whole the same as when the absolute is defined to be matter, in which, though form undoubtedly is present, the form is characteristic of no importance one way or another. Quantity, too, constitutes the main characteristic of the absolute, when the absolute is regarded as absolute indifference and only admitting of quantitative distinction. Otherwise, pure space, time, etc. may be taken as examples of quantity. If we allow ourselves to regard the real as whatever fills up space and time, it matters not with what. The mathematical definition of magnitude as what may be increased or diminished appears at first sight to be more plausible and perspicuous than the exposition of the notion in the present section. When closely examined, however, it involves under cover of presuppositions and images the same elements as appear in the notion of quantity reached by the method of logical development. In other words, when we say that the notion of magnitude lies in the possibility of being increased or diminished, we state that magnitude, or more correctly quantity, as distinguished from quality, is characteristic of such kind that the characterized thing is not in the least affected by any change in it. What then, it may be asked, is the fault which we have to find in this definition? It is that to increase and to diminish is the same thing as to characterize magnitude otherwise. If this aspect were then an adequate account of it, quantity would be described merely as whatever can be altered. But quality is no less than quantity open to alteration, and the distinction here given between quantity and quality is expressed by the saying, increase or diminution. The meaning being that, towards whatever side the determination of magnitude be altered, the thing still remains what it is. One remark more. Throughout philosophy we do not seek merely for correct, still less for plausible definitions, whose correctness appeals directly to the popular imagination. We seek approved or verified definitions, the content of which is not assumed merely as given, but is seen and known to warrant itself because warranted by the free self-evolution of thought. To apply this to the present case, however correct and self-evident the definition of quantity usual in mathematics may be, it will still fail to satisfy the wish to see how far this particular thought is founded in universal thought, and in that way necessary. This difficulty, however, is not the only one. If quantity is not reached through the action of thought, 
but taken uncritically from our generalised image of it, we are liable to exaggerate the range of its validity, or even to raise it to the height of an absolute category. And that such a danger is real, we see when the title of exact science is restricted to those sciences, the object of which can be submitted to mathematical calculation. Here we have another trace of the bad metaphysics, which replace the concrete idea by partial and inadequate categories of understanding. Our knowledge would be in a very awkward predicament if such objects as freedom, law, morality, or even God himself, because they cannot be measured and calculated or expressed in mathematical formula, were to be reckoned beyond the reach of exact knowledge, and we had to put up with a vague generalised image of them leaving their details or particulars to the will. The pernicious consequences to which such a theory gives rise in practice are at once evident, and this mere mathematical view, which identifies with the ideas one of its specialised stages, viz. quantity, is no other than the principle of materialism. Witness the history of the scientific modes of thought, especially in France since the middle of last century. Matter, in the abstract is just what, though of course there is form in it, has that form only as an indifferent and external attribute. The present explanation would be utterly misconceived if it were supposed to disparage mathematics. By calling the quantitative characteristic merely external and indifferent, we provide no excuse for indolence and superficiality, nor do we assert that the quantitative characteristic may be left to mind themselves, or at least require no very careful handling. Quantity, of course, is a stage of the idea and as such it must have its due, first as a logical category, and then, in the world of objects, natural as well as spiritual. Still, even so, there soon emerges the different importance attaching to the category of quantity according as its object belong to the natural or the spiritual world. For in nature, where the forms of the idea is to be other than, and at the same time outside itself, greater importance is for that very reason attached to quantity than in the spiritual world, the world of free inwardness. No doubt we regard even spiritual facts under a quantitative point of view, but it is at once apparent that in speaking of God as a trinity, the number three has by no means the same prominence as when we consider the three dimensions of space or the three sides of a triangle, the fundamental feature of which last is just to be a surface bounded by three lines. Even inside the realm of nature we find the same distinction of greater or less importance of quantitative features. In the inorganic world, quantity plays, so to say, a more prominent part than in the organic. Even in organic nature, when we distinguish mechanical functions from what are called chemical and in the narrower sense physical, there is the same difference. Mechanics is of all the branches of science, confessedly, that in which the aid of mathematics can be least dispensed with where indeed we cannot take one step without them. On that account, mechanics is regarded next to mathematics as the science par excellence, which leads us to repeat the remark about the coincidence of materialist and the exclusively mathematical point of view. After all that has been said, we cannot but hold it in the interest of exact and thorough knowledge, one of the most hurtful prejudices to seek all distinction and determinateness of objects merely in quantitative considerations. Mind, to be sure, is more than nature, and the animal is more than the plant, but we know very little of these objects and the distinction between them. If a more and a less is enough for us, and if we do not proceed to comprehend them in their peculiar, that is their qualitative character. Quantity, as we saw, has two sources, the exclusive unit and the identification or equalization of these units. When we look, therefore, at its immediate relation to self, or at the characteristic of self-sameness made explicit by attraction, quantity is continuous magnitude. But when we look at the other characteristic, the one implied in it, it is discrete magnitude. Still, continuous quantity has also a certain discreteness, being but a continuity of the many, and discrete quantity is no less continuous, its continuity being the one or unit that is the self-same point of the many ones continuous and discrete magnitude therefore must not be supposed two species of magnitude as if the characteristic of the one did not attach to the other the only distinction between them is that the same whole of quantity is at the same time explicitly put under the one at another under the other of its characteristics the antinomony of space of time or of matter which discusses the question of their being divisible forever or of consisting of indivisible units just means that we maintain quantity as as at one time discrete, at another continuous. If we explicitly invest time, space, or matter with the attribute of continuous quantity alone, they are divisible ad infinitum. When on the contrary, they are invested with the attribute of discrete quantity, they are potentially divided already and consist of indivisible units. 
the one view is as inadequate as the other quantity as the proximate result of being for self involves the two sides in the process of the latter attraction and repulsion as constitutive elements of its own idea it is consequently continuous as well as discrete each of these two elements involves the other also and hence there is no such thing as merely continuous or merely discrete quantity we may speak of the two as the two particular and opposite species of magnitude but that is merely the result of our abstracting reflection which in viewing definite magnitudes waves now the one now the other of the elements contained in inseparable unity in the notion of quantity thus it may be said the space occupied by this room is a continuous magnitude and the hundred men assembled in it form a discrete magnitude and yet the space is continuous and discrete at the same time hence we speak of points of space or we divide space at a certain length into so many feet inches etc which can be done only on the hypothesis that space is also potentially discrete similarly on the other hand the discrete magnitude made up of a hundred men is also continuous and the circumstance on which this continuity depends is the common element the species of man which pervades all the individuals and unites them with each other quantum how much quantity essentially invested with the exclusionist character which it involves is quantum or how much i e limited quantity quantum is as it were the determinate being of quantity whereas mere quantity corresponds to abstract being and the degree which is next to be considered corresponds to being for self as for the details of the advance from mere quantity to quantum it is founded on this that whilst the mere quantity the distinction as a distinction of continuity and discreteness is at first only implicit in a quantum the distinction is actually made so that the quantity in general now appears as distinguished or limited but in this way the quantum breaks up at the same time into an indefinite multitude of quanta or definite magnitudes each of these definite magnitudes as distinguished from the others forms a unity while on the other hand viewed per se it is a many and when that is done the quantum is described as number in number the quantum reaches its development and perfect mode like the one the medium in which it exists number involves two qualitative factors or functions enumeration or sum which depend on the factor discreteness and unity which depends on continuity in arithmetic the several kinds of operation are usually presented as accidental modes of dealing with numbers if necessity and meaning is to be found in these operations it must be by a principle and that must come from the characteristic elements in the notion of number itself this principle must here be briefly exhibited the characteristic elements are enumeration on the one hand and unity on the other which together constitute number but unity when applied to empirical numbers is only the equality of these numbers hence the principle of arithmetical operations must be to put numbers in ratio of unity and sum or amount and to elicit the equality of these two modes the ones or the numbers themselves are indifferent towards each other and hence the unity into which they are translated by the arithmetical operation takes the aspect of an external colligation all reckoning is therefore making up the tale and the difference between the species of it lies only in the qualitative constitution of the numbers of which we make up the tale the principle for this constitution is given by the way we fix unity and enumeration numeration comes first what we may call making number a colligation of as many units as we please but to get to a species of calculation it is necessary that what we count up should be numbers already and no longer a mere unit first and as they naturally come to hand numbers are quite vaguely numbers in general so on the whole unequal the colligation or telling the tale of these is addition the second point of view under which we regard numbers is as equal so that they make one unity and of such there is an enumeration or sum before us to tell the tale of these is multiplication it makes no matter in the process how the function of sum and unity are distributed between the two numbers or factors of the product either may be sum and either may be unity the third and final point of view is the equality of sum amount and unity to number together numbers when so characterized is involution and in the first instance raising them to the square power to raise the number to a higher power means in point of form to go on multiplying a number with itself an indefinite amount of times since this third type of calculation exhibits the complete equality of the sole existing distinction in number viz the distinction between sum or amount and unity there can be no more than these three modes of calculation corresponding to the integration 
we have the dissolution of numbers according to the same features hence besides the three species mentioned which may to that extent be called positive there are three negative species of arithmetical operation number in general is the quantum in its complete specialization hence we may employ it not only to determine what we call discrete but what are called continuous magnitudes as well for that reason even geometry must call in the aid of number when it is required to specify definite figurations of space and their ratios the limit in a quantum is identical with the whole of the quantum itself as in itself multiple the limit is extensive magnitude as in the simple determinateness qualitative simplicity it is the intensive magnitude or degree the distinction between continuous and discrete magnitude differs from that between extensive and intensive in the circumstance that the former apply to the quantity in general while the latter apply to the limit or determinateness of it as such intensive and extensive magnitude are not any more than the other two species of which the one involves a character not possessed by the other what is extensive magnitude is just as much intensive and vice versa intensive magnitude or degree is in its notion distinct from extensive magnitude or the quantum it is therefore inadmissible to refuse as many do to recognise this distinction and without scruple to identify the two forms of magnitude they are so identified in physics when difference of specific gravity is explained by saying that a body with a specific gravity twice of another contains within the same space twice as many material parts or atoms as the other so with heat and light if the various degrees of temperature and brilliancy were to be explained by the greater or less number of particles or molecules of heat and light no doubt the physicists who employ such a mode of explanation usually excuse themselves when they are remonstrated with on its untenableness by saying that the expression is without prejudice to the confessedly unknowable essence of such phenomena and employed merely for greater convenience the greater convenience is meant to point to the easier application of the calculus but it is hard to see why intensive magnitudes having as they do a definite numerical expression of their own should not be as convenient for calculation as extensive magnitudes if convenience be all that is desired surely it would be more convenient to banish calculation and thought altogether a further point against the apology offered by physicists is that to engage in explanations of this kind is to overstep the sphere of perception and experience and resort to the realm of metaphysics and of what at other times would be called idle or even pernicious speculation it is certainly a fact of experience that if one of two purses filled with shillings is twice as heavy as the other the reason must be that the one contains say two hundred and the other only one hundred shillings these pieces of money we can see and feel with our senses atoms molecules and the like are beyond the range of sensuous perception and thought alone can decide whether they are admissible and have a meaning but it is abstract understanding which stereotypes the factor of multeity involved in the notion of being for self in the shape of atoms and adopts it as an ultimate principle it is the same abstract understanding which in present instance at equal variance in unprejudiced perception and with real concrete thought regards extensive magnitudes as the sole form of quantity and where intensive magnitudes occur does not recognise them in their own character but makes a violent attempt by a wholly untenable hypothesis to reduce the extensive magnitudes among the charges made against modern philosophy one is heard more than another modern philosophy it is said reduces everything to identity hence its nickname the philosophy of identity but the present discussion may teach that it is philosophy and philosophy alone which insists on distinguishing what is logically as well as in experience different while the professed devotees of experience are the people who erect abstract identity into the chief principle of knowledge it is their philosophy which might be more appropriately termed one of identity because it is quite correct that there are no merely extensive and merely intensive magnitudes just as little as there are merely continuous and merely discrete magnitudes the two characteristics of quantity are not opposed as independent kinds every intensive magnitude is also extensive and vice versa thus a certain degree of temperature is an intensive magnitude which has a perfectly simple sensation corresponding to it as such if we look at a thermometer we find this degree of temperature as a certain expansion of the column of mercury corresponding to it with extensive magnitude changes simultaneously with the temperature or intensive magnitude the case is similar in the world of mind a more intensive character has a wider range with its effects than a less intensive in degree the notion of quantum is explicitly put it is magnitude as indifferent on its own account and simple but in such a way that the character or modal being which makes it a quantum lies quite outside it in other magnitudes 
In this contradiction, where the independent, indifferent limit is absolute externality, the infinite quantitative progression is made explicit. In immediacy which immediacy veers round into its counterpart, into mediation, the passing beyond and over the quantum just laid down, and vice versa. Number is a thought, but thought in its complete self-externalization. Because it is a thought, it does not belong to perception, but it is a thought which is characterised by the externality of perception. Not only, therefore, may the quantum be increased or diminished without end, the very notion of quantum is thus pushed out and out beyond itself. The infinite quantitative progression is only the meaningless repetition of one and the same contradiction which attaches to the quantum, both generally and when explicitly invested with its special character as degree. Touching the futility of enunciation, this contradiction in the form of infinite progression, Zeno, as quoted by Aristotle, rightly says, it is the same to say a thing once and to say it for ever if we follow the usual definition of the mathematicians and say that magnitude is what can be increased or diminished there may be nothing to urge against the correctness of the perception on which it is founded but the question remains how we come to assume such a capacity of increase or diminution if we simply appeal for an answer to experience we try an unsatisfactory course because apart from the fact that we should merely have a material image of magnitude and not the thought of it magnitude will come out as a bare possibility of increasing or diminishing and we should have no key to the necessity for its exhibiting this behaviour in the way of our logical evolution on the contrary quantity is obviously agreed in the process of the self-determining thought and it has been shown that it lies in the very notion of quantity to shoot out beyond itself in that way the increase or diminution of which we have heard is not merely possible but necessary the quantitative infinite progression is what the reflective understanding usually relies upon when it is engaged with the general question of infinity the same thing however holds good of this progression as was already remarked on the occasion of the qualitatively infinite progression and was then said it is not the expression of a true but of a wrong infinity it never gets further than a bare ought and thus really remains within the limits of finitude the quantitative form of this infinite progression which spinoza rightly calls a mere imaginary infinity infinitum imaginationis is an image often employed by poets such as holler and klopstock to depict the infinity not of nature merely but even of god himself thus we find holler in a famous description of god's infinity saying ich häufe ungeheure zahlen gebirge millionen auf ich sesse seit auf seit und welt auf welt zu hauf und wenn ich von der grauen ho mit schwindel wieder nach dir seh ich alle macht der zahl bemehr zu tausendmal noch nicht ein teil von dir i heap up monstrous numbers mountains of millions i pile time upon time and world on top of world and when from the awful height i cast dizzy look towards thee all the power of number multiplied a thousand times is not yet one part of thee here then we meet in the first place that continual extrusion of quantity and especially of number beyond itself which kant describes as eerie and the only really eerie thing about it is the wearisome of ever fixing and anon unfixing a limit without advancing a single step the same poet however well adds to that description of false infinity the closing line ich zieht sie ab und du liegt ganz vor mir these i remove and the lie stall before me which means that the true infinite is more than a mere world beyond the finite and that we in order to become conscious of it must renounce that progressus in infinitum pythagoras as is well known philosophized in numbers and conceived number as a fundamental principle of things to the ordinary mind this view must at first glance seem an utter paradox perhaps a mere craze what then are we to think of it to answer this question we must in the first place remember that the problem of philosophy consists in tracing back things to thoughts and of course to definite thoughts now number is undoubtedly a thought it is the thought nearest the sensible or more precisely expressed it is the thought of the sensible itself if we take the sensible to mean what is many and in reciprocal exclusion the attempt to apprehend the universe as number is therefore the first step to metaphysics in the history of philosophy pythagoras as we know stands between the ionian philosophers and the eleatics while the former as aristotle says never got beyond viewing the essence as mere material and the latter especially parmenides advanced as far as pure thought in the shape of being the principle of the pythagorean philosophy forms as it were the bridge from the sensible to the supersensible. We may gather from this what is to be said of those who suppose that Pythagoras undoubtedly went too far when he conceived the essence of things as mere number. It is true they admit that we can number things, but they contend things are far more than mere numbers. In what respect are they more? 
the ordinary sensuous consciousness from its own point of view would not hesitate to answer the question by handing us over the sensuous perception and remarking that things are not merely numbers but also visible odorous palpable etc in the phrase of modern times the fault of pythagoras would be described as the excess of idealism as may be gathered from what has been said on the historical position of the pythagorean school the real state of the case is quite the reverse let it be conceded that things are more than mere numbers but the meaning of that admission must be that the bare thought of number is still insufficient to enunciate the definite notion or essence of things instead of saying that pythagoras went too far with his philosophy of number it would be nearer to the truth to say that he did not go far enough and in fact the eleatics were the first to take the furthest step into pure thought besides even if there are not things there are states of things and phenomena of nature altogether the character of which mainly rests on definite numbers and proportions this is especially the case with the difference of tones and their harmonic concord which according to a well-known tradition first suggested to pythagoras to conceive the essence of things as number though it is unquestionably important to science to trace back these phenomena to the definite numbers on which they are based to the definite numbers on which they are based it is wholly inadmissible to view the characterization by thought as a whole as merely numerical we may certainly fear ourselves prompted to associate the most general characteristics of thought with the numbers saying one is the simple and immediate two is the difference and mediation and three the unity of both of these such associations however are purely external there is nothing in mere numbers to make them express these definite thoughts with every step in this method the more arbitrary grows the association of definite numbers with definite thoughts thus we may view four as the unity of one and three and the thoughts associated with them but four is just as much the double of two similarly nine not merely the square of three but the sum of eight and one of seven and two and so on to attach as do some secret societies of modern times importance to all sorts of numbers and figures is to some extent innocent amusement but it is also a sign of the deficiency of intellectual resource these numbers it is said conceal a profound meaning and suggest a deal to think about but the point in philosophy is not what you may think but what you do think and the genuine air of thought is to be sought in thought itself and not in arbitrarily selected symbols that the quantum is the independent character is external to itself is what constitutes quality in that externality it is itself and referred connectively to itself there is a union in it of externality i e of the quantitative and of independency being for self the qualitative the quantum when explicitly put thus in its own self is the quantitative ratio a mode of being which while in its exponent it is an immediate quantum it is also mediation viz the reference of some one quantum to another forming the two sides of the ratio but the two quanta are not reckoned as their immediate value their value is only in this relation the quantitative of infinite progression appears at first as a continual extrusion of number beyond itself on looking closer it is however apparent that this progression quantity returns to itself and for meaning of this progression so far as it goes is in fact that number is determined by number this gives the quantitative ratio take for example the ratio two to four here we have two magnitudes not counted in their several immediate values in which we are not concerned with their mutual relations the relation of the two terms the exponent of the ratio is itself a magnitude distinguished from the related magnitudes by this that a change in it is followed by a change of the ratio whereas the ratio is unaffected by the change of both its sides and remains the same so long as the exponent is not changed consequently in place of two to four we can put three to six without changing the ratio as the exponent two remains the same in both cases the two sides of the ratio are still immediate quanta and the qualitative and quantitative characteristics still external to one another but in their truth seeing that the quantitative itself in its externality is relation to self or seeing that the independence and the indifference of the character are combined it is measure thus quantity by means of the dialectical movement so far studied through its several stages turn out to be a return to the quality the first notion of quantity presented to us was that of quality abrogated and absorbed that is to say quantity seemed an external character not identical with being to which it is quite immaterial this notion as we have seen underlines the mathematical definition of magnitude as what can be increased or diminished at first sight this distinction may create the impression that quantity is merely whatever can be altered increase and diminution alike implying determination of magnitude otherwise and may tend to confuse it with determinate being 
The second stage of quality, which in its notion is similarly conceived as alterable, we can however complete the definition by adding that in quantity we have an alterable which in spite of alterations still remains the same. The notion of quantity, it thus turns out, implies an inherent contradiction. This contradiction is what forms the dialectic of quantity. The result of the dialectic, however, is not a mere return to quality, as if that were the true and quantity the false notion but in advance to the unity and truth of both to qualitative quantity or measure it may be well therefore at this point to observe that whenever in our study of the objective world we are engaged in quantitative determinations it is in all cases measure it is in all cases measure which we have in view as the goal of our operations this is hinted at even in language when the ascertainment of quantitative features and relations is called measuring we measure for example the length of different chords that have been put into a state of vibration with an eye to the qualitative difference of the tones caused by their vibration corresponding to this difference of length similarly in chemistry we try to ascertain the quantity of the matters brought into combination in order to find out the measures or proportions conditioning such combinations that is to say those quantities which give rise to definite qualities in statistics too the numbers with which the study is engaged are important only from the qualitative results conditioned by them mere collection of numerical facts prosecuted without regard to ends here noted is justly called an exercise of idle curiosity of neither theoretical nor practical interest c measure measure is the qualitative quantum in the first place as immediate a quantum to which a determinate being or a quality is attached measure where quality and quantity are in one is thus the completion of being being as we first apprehend it is something utterly abstract and characterless but it is in its very essence of being to characterize itself and its complete characterization is reached in measure measure like the other stages of being may serve as a definition of the absolute god it has been said is the measure of all things it is this idea which forms the ground note of many of the ancient hebrew hymns in which the glorification of god tends in the main to show that he is appointed to everything its bound to the sea and the solid land to the rivers and mountains and also to the various kinds of plants and animals to the religious sense of the greeks the divinity of measure especially in respect to the social elites was represented by nemesis the concept implies a general theory that all human things riches honour and power as well as joy and pain have their definite measure the transgression of which brings ruin and destruction in the world of objects too we have measure we see in the first place existences in nature of which measure forms the essential structure this is the case for example with the solar system which may be described as the realm of free measure as we next proceed to the study of inorganic nature measure retires as it were into the background at least we often find the quantitative and qualitative characteristics showing indifference to each other thus the quality of a rock or a river is not tied to a definite magnitude but even these objects when closely inspected are found not to be quite measureless the water of a river and the single constituents of rock when chemically analyzed are seen to be qualities conditioned by quantitative ratios between the matters they contain in organic nature however measure again rises into immediate perception the various kinds of plants and animals in the whole as well as in their parts have a certain measure though it is worth noticing that the more imperfect forms those which are least removed from inorganic nature are partly distinguished from the higher forms by the greater indefiniteness of their measure thus among fossils we find some ammonites discernible only by the microscope and others as large as a cartwheel the same vagueness of measure appears in several plants which stand on a low level of organic development for instance ferns in so far as in measure quality and quantity are only in immediate unity to that extent their difference presents itself in a manner equally immediate two cases are then possible either the specific quantum or measure is a bare quantum and the definite being there and then is capable of an increase or a diminution without measure which to that extent is a rule being thereby set completely aside or the alteration of the quantum is also an alteration of the quality the identity between quantity and quality which is found in measure is at first only implicit and not yet explicitly realized in other words these two categories which unite in measure each claim an independent authority on the one hand the quantitative features of existence may be altered without affecting its quality on the other hand this increase and diminution immaterial though it be has its limit by exceeding which the quality suffers change thus the temperature of water is in the first place a point of no consequence in respect to its liquidity 
Still, with the increase or diminution of the temperature of liquid water, there comes a point where the state of cohesion suffers a qualitative change, and the water is converted into steam or ice. A quantitative change takes place apparently without any further significance. But there is something lurking behind, and a seemingly innocent change of quantity acts as a kind of snare to catch hold of the quality. The antinomony of measure, which this implies, was exemplified under more than one garb among the Greeks. It was asked, for example, whether a single grain makes a heap of wheat, or whether it makes a bald tail to tear out a single hair from the horse's tail. At first, no doubt, looking at the nature of quantity as an indifferent and external character of being, we are disposed to answer these questions in the negative. And yet we must admit, this indifferent increase in diminution has its limit. A point is finally reached where a single additional grain makes a heap of wheat, and the bald tail is produced if we continue plucking out single hairs. These examples find a parallel in the story of the peasant, who as his ass trudged carefully along, went on adding ounce after ounce to its load, till at length it sunk under the unendurable burden. It would be a mistake to treat these examples as pedantic futility, they really turn on thoughts, an acquaintance with which is of great importance in practical life, especially in ethics. Thus, in the matter of expenditure, there is a certain latitude within which a more or less does not matter. But when the measure imposed by the individual circumstances of the special case is exceeded on the one side or the other, the qualitative nature of measure, as in the above example in the different temperature of water, makes itself felt, and a course which a moment before was held good economy turns into avarice or prodigality. The same principle may be applied in politics, when the constitution of a state has to be looked at as independent of, no less than dependent on, the extent of its territory, the number of its inhabitants, and other quantitative points of the same kind. If we look, for example, at a state with a territory of 10,000 square miles and a population of 4 millions, we should, without hesitation, admit that a few square miles of land or a few thousand inhabitants more or less exercise no essential influence on the character of its constitution but on the other hand we must not forget that by a continual increase or diminishing of a state we finally get to a point where apart from all other circumstances this quantitative alteration alone necessarily draws with an alteration in the quality of the constitution the constitution of a little swiss canton does not suit a great kingdom and similarly the constitution of the roman republic was unsuitable when transferred to the small imperial towns of germany in this case when a measure through its quantitative nature has gone in excess of its qualitative character we meet what is at first an absence of measure the measureless but seeing that the second quantitative ratio which in comparison with the first is measureless is none the less qualitative the measureless is also a measure these two transitions from quality to quantum and from the latter back again to quality may be represented under the image of an infinite progression the self-abrogation and restoration of measure in the measureless quantity as we have seen is not only capable of alteration i e of increase or diminution it is naturally and necessarily a tendency to exceed itself this tendency is maintained even in measure but if the quality present in measure exceeds a certain limit the quality corresponding to it is also put in abeyance this however is not a negation of the quality altogether but only the definite quality the place of which is at once occupied by another this process of measure which appears alternately as a mere change in quantity and as a sudden revulsion of quantity into quality must be envisaged under the figure of a nodal knotted line such lines we find in nature under a variety of forms we have already referred to the qualitatively different states of aggregation water exhibits under increase or diminution of temperature the same phenomenon is present by the different degrees in the oxidation of metals even the difference of musical notes may be regarded as an example of what takes place in the process of measure the revulsion from what is at first merely quantitative into qualitative alteration what really takes place here is that the immediacy which still attaches to measure as such is set aside in measure at first quality and quantity itself are immediate and measure is only their relative identity but measure shows itself absorbed and superseded in the measureless yet the measureless although it be the negation of measure is itself a unity of quantity and quality thus in the measureless the measure is still seen to meet only with itself instead of the more abstract factors being a nothing some and other etc the infinite which is affirmation as negation of negation now finds factors in quality and quantity these have in the first place passed over quality into quantity 
and quantity into quality, and thus are both shown up as negations. But in their unity, that is, in measure, they are originally distinct, and one is only through the instrumentality of the other. And after the immediacy of this unity has turned out to be self-annulling, the unity is explicitly put as what it implicitly is, simple relation to self, which contains in it being and all its forms absorbed. Being, or immediacy, which by the negation of itself is a mediation with self and a reference to self, which consequently is also a mediation which cancels itself into reference to self or immediacy, is essence. The process of measure, instead of being only the wrong infinite of an endless progression, in the shape of an ever-recurrent recoil from quality to quantity and from quantity to quality, is also the true infinity of coincidence with self in another. In measure, quality and quantity originally confront each other like some and other. But quality is implicitly quantity, and conversely quantity is implicitly quality. In the process of measure, therefore, these two pass into each other. Each of them becomes what it already was implicitly, and thus we get being thrown into a band and absorbed, with its several characteristics negatived. Such being is essence. Measure is implicitly essence, and its process consists in realising what it is implicitly. The ordinary consciousness conceives things as being, and studies them in quality, quantity, and measure. These immediate characteristics, however, soon show themselves to be not fixed, but transient, and essence is the result of their dialectic. In the sphere of essence, one category does not pass into another, but refers to another merely, and being the form of reference is purely due to our reflection on what takes place but it is special and proper characteristic of essence in the sphere of being when somewhat becomes another the somewhat has vanished not so in essence here there is no real other but only diversity reference of the one to its other the transition of essence is therefore at the same time no transition for in the passage of different into different the different does not vanish the different terms remain in their relation when we speak of being and not being is independent so is not the case is otherwise with the positive and negative no doubt these possess the characteristics of being and not but the positive by itself has no sense and is wholly in reference to the negative and it is the same with the negative in the sphere of being the reference of one term to another is only implicit in essence on the contrary it is explicit and this in general is the distinction between the forms of being and essence in being everything is immediate in essence everything is relative End of part two of chapter seven. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Part one of chapter eight of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter 8. Second Subdivision of Logic. The Doctrine of Essence. The terms in essence are always mere pairs of correlatives, and not yet absolutely reflected in themselves. Hence, in essence, the actual unity of the notion is not realised, but only postulated by reflection. Essence, which is being coming into mediation with itself, through the negativity of itself is self-relatedness only in so far as it is relation to an other this other however coming to view at first not as something which is but as postulated and hypothetized being has not vanished but firstly essence as simple reflection is being and secondly as regards to its one-sided characteristic of immediacy being is deposed to a mere negative to a seeming or reflected light essence accordingly is being thus reflecting light into itself the absolute is the essence this is the same definition as the previous one that the absolute is being in so far as being likewise is simple self-relation but it is at the same time higher because essence is being that has gone into itself that is to say simple self-relation in being is expressly put as negation of the negative as imminent self-mediation. Unfortunately, when the absolute is defined to be the essence, the negativity which this implies is often taken only to mean the withdrawal of all determinate predicates. This negative action of withdrawal or abstraction thus falls outside of the essence, which is thus left as a mere result apart from its premises, the caput mortem of abstraction. But as this negativity, instead of being external to being, is its own dialectic, the truth of the latter, viz. essence, 
will be being as retired within itself immanent being that reflection or light thrown into itself constitutes the distinction between essence and immediate being and is the peculiar characteristic of essence itself any mention of essence implies that we distinguish it from being the latter is immediate and compared with the essence we look upon it as mere seeming but this seeming is not an utter non-entity and nothing at all but being superseded and put by the point of view given by the essence is in general the standpoint of reflection this word reflection is originally applied when a ray of light in a straight line impinging upon the surface of a mirror is thrown back from it in this phenomenon we have two things first an immediate fact which is and secondly the deputed derivated and transmitted phase of the same something of this sort takes place when we reflect or think upon an object for here we want to know the object not in its immediacy but as derivative or mediated the problem or aim of philosophy is often represented as the ascertainment of the essence of things a phrase which only means shown to be mediated by or based upon something else the immediate being of things is thus conceived under the image of a rind or a curtain behind which the essence lies hidden everything it is said has an essence that is things really are not what they immediately show themselves there is therefore something more to be done than merely row from one quality to another and merely to advance from qualitative to quantitative and vice versa there is a permanent in things and that permanent is in the first instance their essence with respect to other meanings and uses of the category of essence we may note that in the german auxiliary verb sein the past tense is expressed by the term essence wesen we designate past being as gewesen this anomaly of language implies to some extent a correct perception of the relation between being and essence essence we may certainly regard as past being remembering however meanwhile that past is not utterly denied but only laid aside and thus at the same time preserved thus to say caesar was in gaul only denies the immediacy of the event but not a sojourn in gaul altogether that sojourn is just what forms the import of the proposition in which however it is represented as over and gone wesen in ordinary life frequently means only collection or aggregate zeitungswesen the press postwesen the post office steuerwesen the revenue all that these terms mean is that things in question are not to be taken single in their immediacy but as complex and then perhaps in addition in their various bearings this usage of terms is not very different in its implications from our own people also speak of finite essences such as man but the very term essence implies that we have made a step beyond finitude and the title as applied to man is so far inexact it is often added there is a supreme essence being by which is meant god on this two remarks may be made in the first place the phrase there is suggests a finite only as when we say there are so many planets or there are plants of such and such a constitution and plants of such another in these cases we are speaking of something which has other things beyond and beside it but god the absolutely infinite is not something outside and beside whom there are other essences all else outside god if separated from him possesses no essentiality in its isolation it becomes a mere show or seeming without stay or essence in its own but secondly it is a poor way of talking to call god the highest or supreme essence the category of quantity which the phrase employs has its proper place within the compass of the finite when we call one mountain the highest on earth we have a vision of other high mountains beside it so too we call any one of the richest or most learned in his country but god far from being a being even the highest is the being this definition however such a representation of god is an important and necessary stage in the growth of religious consciousness does not by any means exhaust the depth of the ordinary christian idea of god if we consider god as the essence only and nothing more we know him only as the universal and irresistible power in other words as the lord now the fear of lord is doubtless the beginning but only the beginning of wisdom to look at god in this light as the lord and the lord alone is especially characteristic of judaism and also mohammedanism the defect of these religions lies in their scant recognition of the finite which be it as natural things or finite phases of mind it is characteristic of the heathen and as they for that reason are polytheistic religions to maintain intact another not uncommon assertion is that god as the supreme being cannot be known such is the view taken by modern enlightenment and abstract understanding which is content to say il y a un être suprême 
and there lets the matter rest to speak thus and treat god merely as the supreme other world being implies that we look upon the world before us in its immediacy as something permanent and positive and forget that true being is just the superseding of all that is immediate if god be the abstract supersensible being outside whom therefore lies all difference and all specific character he is only a bare name a mere caput mortem of the abstract understanding the true knowledge of god begins when we know that things as they immediately are have no truth in reference also to other subjects besides god the category of essence is often liable to an abstract use by which in the study of anything its essence is held to be something unaffected by and subsisting in independence of its definite phenomenal embodiment thus we say for example of people that the great thing is not what they do and how they behave but what they are this is correct if it means that a man's conduct should be looked into not in its immediacy but only as it is explained by his inner self and as a revelation of that inner self still it should be remembered that the only means by which the essence and the inner self can be verified is the appearance in outward reality whereas the appeal which men make to the essential life as distinct from material facts of conduct is generally prompted by a desire to assert their own subjectivity and to elude an absolute objective judgment self-relation is essence in the form of identity or of reflection into self which has here taken place of the immediacy of being they are both the same abstraction self-relation the unintelligence of sense to take everything limited and finite for being passes into the obstinacy of understanding which views the limit as self-identified not inherently self-contradictory this identity as it is descended from being appears in the first place only charged with the characteristics of being and referred to being as to something external this external being if taken in separation from the true being of essence is called unessential but that turns out a mistake because essence is being in self it is essential only to the extent that it has itself its negative i e reference to another or mediation consequently it has the unessential as its own proper seeming reflection in itself but in seeming or mediation there is distinction involved and since what is distinguished as distinguished from the identity out of which it arises in which it is not or lies as seeming receives itself the form of identity the semblance is still in the mode of being or self-related immediacy the sphere of essence thus turns out to be a still imperfect combination of immediacy and mediation in it every term is expressly invested and the character of self-relatedness while yet at the same time one is forced beyond it it has being reflected being a being in which another shows which shows in another and so it is also the sphere in which contradiction still implicit in the sphere of being is made explicit as the one notion is the common principle underlying all logic there appear in the development of essence the same attributes or terms as in the development of naught we have now the forms of positive and negative the former at first as identity corresponding to pure and uncontrasted being the latter developed showing in itself as difference so also we have becoming represented by the ground of determinate being which itself when reflected upon the ground is existence the theory of essence is the most difficult branch of logic it includes the categories of metaphysic and of the sciences in general these are products of reflective understanding which while it assumes the differences to possess a footing of their own and at the same time also expressly affirms their relativity still combines the two statements side by side or one after the other by an also without bringing these thoughts into one or unifying them into the notion a essence is ground or existence the pure principles or categories of reflection identity the essence lights up in itself or is mere reflection and therefore is only self-relation not as immediate but as reflected and that reflex relation is self-identity the identity becomes an identity in form only or of the understanding if it be held hard and fast quite aloof from difference or rather abstraction is the imposition of this identity of form the transformation of something inherently concrete into this form of elementary simplicity and this may be done in two ways either we may neglect a part of the multiple features which are found in the concrete thing by which is called analysis and select only one of them or in neglecting their variety we may concentrate the multiple characters into one if we associate identity with the absolute making the absolute the subject of a proposition we get the absolute is what is identical with itself however true this proposition may be it is doubtful whether it be meant in its truth and therefore it is at least imperfect in the expression 
For it is left undecided whether it means the abstract identity of understanding, abstract that is, because contrasted with other characteristics of essence, or the identity which is inherently concrete. In the latter case, as will be seen, true identity is first discoverable in the ground, and with a higher truth in the notion. Even the word absolute is often used to mean no more than abstract. Absolute space and absolute time, for example, is another way of saying abstract space and abstract time. When the principles of essence are taken as essential principles of thought, they become predicates of a presupposed subject, which, because they are essential, is everything. The propositions thus arising have been stated as universal laws of thought. Thus the first of them, the inaxim of identity, reads, Every thing is identical with itself, A equals A, and negatively, A cannot at the same time be A, and not a this maxim instead of being true law of thought is nothing but the law of abstract understanding the propositional form itself contradicts it for a proposition always promises a distinction between subject and predicate while the present one does not fulfil what its form requires but the law is particularly set aside by the following so-called laws of thought which make laws out of its opposite it is asserted that the maxim of identity though it cannot be proved regulates procedure of every consciousness and the experience shows it to be accepted as soon as its terms are apprehended to this alleged experience of the logic books may be opposed to the universal experience that no mind thinks or forms conceptions or speaks in accordance with this law and no existence of any kind whatever conforms to it utterances after the fashion of this pretended law a planet is a planet magnetism is magnetism mind is mind are as they deserve to be reputed silly this is certainly matter of general experience the logic which seriously propounds such laws and scholastic world in which alone they are valid have long been discredited with practical common sense as well as with the philosophy of reason identity is in the first place the repetition of what we had earlier as being but as become through the supersession of its character of immediateness it is therefore being as ideality it is important to come to a proper understanding of the true meaning of identity and for that purpose we must especially guard against taking it as abstract identity to the exclusion of all difference that is the touchstone for distinguishing all bad philosophy from what alone deserves the name of philosophy identity in truth as an ideality of what immediately is is a high category of our religious modes of mind as well as all other forms of thought and mental activity the true knowledge of god it may be said begins when we know him as identity as absolute identity to know so much is to see that all the power and glory of the world sinks into nothing in god's presence and subsists only as the reflection of his power and his glory in the same way identity as self-consciousness is what distinguishes man from nature particularly from the brutes which never reach the point of comprehending themselves as i that is pure self-contained unity so again in connection with thought the main thing is not to confuse the true identity which contains being and its characteristics ideally transfigured in it with an abstract identity identity of bare form all the charges of narrowness hardness meaninglessness which are so often directed against thought from the quarter of feeling and immediate perception rest on the perverse assumption that thought acts only as a faculty of abstract identification the formal logic itself confirms this assumption by laying down the supreme law of thought so called which has been discussed above if thinking were no more than an abstract identity we could not but own it to be the most futile and tedious business no doubt the notion and the idea too are identical with themselves but identical only in so far as they at the same time involve distinction difference essence is mere identity and reflection in itself only as it is self-relating negativity and in that way self-repulsion it contains therefore essentially the characteristic of difference other being is here no longer qualitative taking the shape of the character or limit it is now in essence in self-relating essence and therefore the negation is at the same time a relation is in short distinction relativity mediation to ask how identity comes to difference assumes that identity as mere abstract identity is something of itself and difference also something else equally independent the supposition renders an answer to the question impossible if identity is viewed as diverse from difference all that we have in this way is but difference and hence we cannot demonstrate the advance to difference because the person who asks for the how of the progress thereby implies that for him the starting point is non-existent the question then when put to the test has obviously no meaning and its proposer may be met with the question what he means by identity whereupon we should soon see that he attaches no idea to it at all and that identity is for him an empty name 
As we have seen, besides identity is undoubtedly a negative, not however an abstract empty not, but the negation of being and its characteristics. Being so, identity is at the same time self-relation, and what is more, negative self-relation. In other words, it draws a distinction between it and itself. Difference is first of all one immediate difference, i.e. diversity or variety. In diversity, the different things are each individually what they are, and unaffected by the relation in which they stand to each other. This relation is therefore external to them. In consequence, the various things being thus indifferent to the difference between them, it falls outside them into a third thing, the agent of comparison. This external difference as an identity of the objects related is likeness, as a non-identity of them is unlikeness. The gap which understanding allows to divide these characteristics is so great that although comparison has one and the same substratum for likeness and unlikeness, which are explained to be different aspects and points of view in it, still likeness by itself is the first of the elements alone, viz. identity, and unlikeness by itself is difference. Diversity has, like identity, been transformed into a maxim. Everything is various or different, or there are no two things completely like each other. Here everything is put under a predicate which is the reverse of the identity attributed to it in the first maxim, and therefore under a law contradicting the first. However, there is an explanation. As the diversity is supposed due only to an external comparison, anything taken per se is expected and understood always to be identical with itself, so that the second law need not interfere with the first. But in that case, variety does not belong to something or everything in question. It constitutes no intrinsic characteristic of the subject, and the second maxim on this showing does not admit of being stated at all. If, on the other hand, something itself is, at the, as the maxim says, diverse, it must be in virtue of its own proper character. But in this case, the specific difference, and not variety as such, is what is intended. And this is the meaning of the maxim of Leibniz. When understanding sets itself to study identity, it has already passed beyond it, and is looking at difference in the shape of bare variety. If we follow the so-called law of identity, and say, the sea is the sea, the air is the air, the moon is the moon, these objects pass for having no bearing on one another. What we have before us, therefore, is not identity, but difference. We do not stop at this point, however, or regard things merely as different. We compare them one with another, and thus discover the features of likeness and unlikeness. The work of the finite sciences lies to a great extent in the application of these categories, and the phrase scientific treatment generally means no more than the method which has for its aim comparison of the objects under examination. This method has undoubtedly led to some important results. We may particularly mention the great advance of modern times in the provinces of comparative anatomy and comparative linguistic, but it is going too far to suppose that comparative method can be employed with equal success in all branches of knowledge. Nor, and this must be emphasized, can mere comparison ever ultimately satisfy the requirements of science. Its results are indeed indispensable, but they are all still labours only preliminary to true intelligent cognition. If it be the office of comparison to reduce existing differences to identity, the science which most perfectly fulfils the ends is mathematics. The reason of that is that quantitative difference is only the difference which is quite external. Thus in geometry a triangle and a quadrangle figures qualitatively different, have this qualitative difference discounted by abstraction, and are equated to one another in magnitude. It follows from what has been formerly said about the mere identity of understanding that, as has also been pointed out, neither philosophy nor the empirical sciences need envy the superiority of mathematics the story is told that when leibniz propounded the maxim of variety the cavaliers and lady of the court as they walked round the garden made efforts to discover two leaves indistinguishable from each other in order to confute the law stated by the philosopher their device was unquestionably a convenient method of dealing with metaphysics one which has not ceased to be fashionable all the same as regards to the principle of leibniz difference must be understood to mean not an external and indifferent diversity merely but difference essential hence the very nature of things implies they must be different likeness is an identity only of these things which are not the same not identical with each other and unlikeness is a relation of things unlike the two therefore do not fall on different aspects or points of view in the thing without any mutual affinity but one throws light into the other variety thus comes to be reflexive difference or difference distinction implicit and essential determinate or specific difference while things merely various show themselves unaffected by each other likeness and unlikeness on the contrary are a pair of characteristics which are in completely reciprocal relation the one of them cannot be thought without the other 
This advance from simple variety to opposition appears in our common acts of thought, when we allow that comparison has a meaning only upon the hypothesis of an existing difference, and that, on the other hand, we can distinguish only the hypothesis of existing similarity. Hence, if the problem be the discovery of a difference, we attribute no great cleverness to the man who only distinguishes those objects of which difference is palpable, for example, a pen and a camel, and similarly it implies no very advanced faculty of comparison, when the objects compared, for example, a beech and an oak, a temple and a church, are near akin. In the case of difference, in short, we like to see identity, in the case of identity we like to see difference. Within the range of the empirical sciences, however, the one of these two categories is often allowed to put the other out of sight and mind. Thus the scientific problem at one time is to reduce existing differences to identity. On another occasion, with equal one-sidedness, to discover new differences. We see this especially in physical science. There the problem consists in the first place in the continual search for new elements, new forces, new genera, and new species. Or in another direction it seeks to show that all modern physicists and chemists smile at the ancients who were satisfied with four elements, and these not simple. Secondly, on the other hand, mere identity is made the chief question. Thus electricity and chemical affinity are regarded as the same, and even the organic processes of digestion and assimilation are looked upon as a mere chemical operation. Modern philosophy has often been nicknamed the philosophy of identity, but as we already remarked, it is precisely philosophy, and in particular speculative logic, which lays bare the nothingness of the abstract and differentiated identity known to understanding, though it also undoubtedly urges its disciples not to rest at mere diversity, but to ascertain the inner unity of all existence. Difference implicit is essential difference, the positive and the negative, and that is this way. The positive is the identical self-relation in such a way as not to be the negative, and the negative is the different by itself so as not to be the positive. Thus either has an existence of its own in proportion as it is not the other. The one is made visible in the other, and is only in so far as that other is. Essential difference is therefore opposition, according to which the different is not confronted by any other, but by its other. That is, either of these two, positive and negative, is stamped with a characteristic of its own only in its relation to the other, and the one is only reflected into itself as it is reflected into the other, and so with the other. Either in this way is the other's own other. Difference implicit or essential gives the maxim, everything is essentially distinct, or as it also has been expressed, of two opposite predicates, the one only can be assigned to anything, and there is no third possible. This maxim of contrast or opposition most expressly controverts the maxim of identity. The one says a thing should be only self-relation. The other says that it must be an opposite, a relation to its other. The native unintelligence of abstraction betrays itself by setting in juxtaposition two contrary maxims like these, as laws without even so much as comparing them. The maxim of excluded middle is the maxim of the definite understanding, which would fain avoid contradiction, but in so doing falls into it. A must be either plus a or minus a it says it virtually declares in these words a third a which is neither plus nor minus and which at the same time is yet invested with plus and minus characters if plus w means six miles to the west and minus w means six miles to the east and if plus and minus cancel each other the six miles of way or space remain what they were with and without the contrast even the mere plus and minus of number or abstract direction have if we like zero for their third but it need not be denied that the empty contrast which understanding institutes between plus and minus is not without its value in such abstraction as number, direction, etc. In the doctrine of contradictory concepts, the only notion is, say, blue, for in this doctrine even the sensuous generalised image of a colour is called a notion, and the other not blue. This other, then, would not be an affirmative, say, yellow, but would merely be kept at the abstract negative that the negative in its own nature is quite as much positive is implied in saying that what is opposite to another is its other the inanity of the opposition between what are called contradictory notions is fully exhibited in what we may call the grandiose formula of a general law that everything has the one and not the other of all predicates which are in such opposition in this way mind is either white or not white yellow or not yellow etc ad infinitum it was forgotten that identity and opposition are themselves opposed, and the maxim of opposition was taken, even for that of identity, in the shape of the principle of contradiction, a notion which possesses neither or both of two mutually contradictory remarks. For example, a quadrangular circle is held to be logically false. Now, though a multangular circle and a rectilineal arc 
No less contradict this maxim, geometers never hesitate to treat the circle as a polygon with rectilineal sides. But anything like a circle, that is to say its mere character or nominal definition, is still no notion. In the notion, a circle, centre and circumference are equally essential. Both marks belong to it, and yet centre and circumference are opposite and contradictory to each other. The conception of polarity, which is so dominant in physics, contains by implication the more correct definition of opposition. But physics, for its theory of the laws of thought, adheres to the ordinary logic. It might therefore be well horrified, in case it should ever work out the concept of polarity, and get at the thoughts which are implied in it. With the positive we return to identity, but in its higher truth as identical self-relation, and at the same time with the note that it is not the negative. The negative per se is the same as difference itself. The identical, as such, is primarily the yet uncharacterized. The positive, on the other hand, is what is self-identical, but with the mark of antithesis to another. And the negative is the difference, as such characterized, as not identity. This is the difference of difference within its own self. Positive and negative are supposed to express an absolute difference. The two, however, are at bottom the same. The name of either might be transferred to the other. Thus, for example, debts and assets are not two particular self-subsisting species of property. What is negative to the debtor is positive to the creditor. A way to the east is also a way to the west. Positive and negative are therefore intrinsically conditioned by one another, and are only in relation to each other. The north pole of the magnet cannot be without the south pole and vice versa. If we cut a magnet in two, we have not a north pole in one piece and a south pole in the other. Similarly, in electricity, the positive and the negative are not too diverse and independent fluids. In opposition, the different is not confronted by any other, but by its other usually we regard different things as unaffected by each other thus we say i am a human being and around me are air water animals and all sorts of things everything is thus put outside of every other but the aim of philosophy is to banish indifference and to ascertain necessity of things by that means the other is seen to stand over against its other thus for example inorganic nature is not to be considered merely something else than organic nature but the necessary antithesis of it both are in essential relation to one another and the one of the two is only in so far as it excludes the other from it and thus relates itself thereto nature in like manner is not without mind nor mind without nature an important step has been taken when we cease in thinking to use phrases like of course something else is also possible while we so speak we are still tainted with contingency and all true thinking we have already said is a thinking of necessity in modern physical science, the opposition, first observed to exist in magnetism as polarity, has come to be regarded as a universal law pervading the whole of nature. This would be a real scientific advance, if care were at the same time taken, not to let the mere variety revert without explanation as a valid category side by side with opposition. Thus at one time the colours are regarded as in polar opposition to one another, and called complementary colours, as another time they are looked at in their indifferent and merely quantitative difference of red, yellow, green, etc. Instead of speaking by the maxim of excluded middle, which is the maxim of abstract understanding, we should rather say everything is opposite neither in heaven nor on earth neither in the world of mind nor of nature is there anywhere such an abstract either or as the understanding maintains whatever exists is concrete with difference and opposition in itself the finitude of things will then lie in want of correspondence between their immediate being and what they essentially are thus in inorganic nature the acid is implicitly at the same time the base in other words its only being consists in its relation to its other hence also the acid is not something that persists quietly in the contrast it is always an effort to realise what it potentially is contradiction is the very moving principle of the world and it is ridiculous to say that contradiction is unthinkable the only thing correct in that statement is that contradiction is not the end of the matter but cancels itself but contradiction when cancelled does not leave abstract identity for that is itself only one side of the contrary the proximate result of opposition when realized as contradiction is the ground which contains identity as well as difference superseded and deposed to elements in the completer notion contrariety then has two forms the positive is the aforesaid various different which is understood to be independent and yet at the same time not to be unaffected by its relation to its other the negative to be no less independently negative self-relating self-subsistent and yet at the same time as negative must on every point have this its self-relation i e its positive only in the other both positive and negative are therefore explicit contradictions both are potentially the same both are actually also since either is the abrogation of the other and of itself thus they fall to the ground or as is plain the essential difference as a difference 
is only the difference of it from itself and thus contains the identical so that to essential and actual difference there belongs itself as well as identity as self-relating difference it is likewise virtually enunciated as the self-identical and the opposite is in general that which includes the one and its other itself and its opposite the immanence of essence thus defined is the ground the ground the ground is the unity of identity and difference the truth of what difference and identity have turned out to be the reflection into self which is equally a reflection into another and vice versa it is essence put explicitly as totality the maxim of the ground runs thus everything has its sufficient ground that is the true essentiality of any thing is not the predication of it as an identical with itself or as different various or merely positive or merely negative but as having its being in another which being itself same is its essence and to this extent the essence is not abstract reflection into self but into another the ground is the essence in its own inwardness the essence is intrinsically a ground and it is a ground only when it is a ground of somewhat or of another we must be careful when we say that the ground is the unity of identity and difference not to understand by this unity of an abstract identity otherwise we only change the name while we still think the identity of understanding already seen to be false to avoid this misconception we may say the ground besides being the unity is also the difference of identity and difference in that case in the ground which promised at first to supersede contradiction a new contradiction seems to arise it is however a contradiction which so far from persisting quietly in itself is rather the expulsion of it from itself the ground is a ground only to the extent that it affords ground but the result which thus issued from the ground is only itself in this lies its formalism the ground and what is grounded are one and the same content the difference between the two is the mere difference of form which separates simple self-relation on the one hand and from mediation or derivativeness on the other inquiries into the ground of things goes with the point of view which as already noted is adopted by reflection we wish as it were to see the matter double first in its immediacy and secondly in its ground where it is no longer immediate this is the plain meaning of the law of sufficient ground as it is called it asserts that things should essentially be viewed as mediated the manner in which formal logic establishes this law of thought sets a bad example to other sciences formal logic asks these sciences not to accept their subject matter as it is immediately given and yet herself lays down a law of thought without deducing it in other words without exhibiting its mediation with the same justice as the logician maintains our faculty of thought to be constituted that we must ask for ground of everything might the physicist when asked why a man who falls into the water is drowned reply that man happens to be so organised that he cannot live under water or the jurist when asked why a criminal is punished reply that civil society happens to be so constituted that crimes cannot be left unpunished yet even if logic be executed the duty of giving a ground for the law of the sufficient ground it might at least explain what is to be understood by a ground the common explanation which describes the ground as what has a consequence seems at first glance more lucid and intelligible than the preceding definition in logical terms if you ask however what the consequence is you are told that it is what has a ground and it becomes obvious that the explanation is intelligible only because it assumes what in our case has been reached as the termination of an antecedent movement of thought and this is the true business of logic to show that those thoughts which as usually employed merely float before consciousness neither understood nor demonstrated are really grades in the self-determination of thought it is by this means that they are understood and demonstrated in common life and it is the same in finite sciences this reflective form is often employed as a key to the secret of real condition of the object under investigation so long as we deal with what may be termed the household needs of knowledge nothing can be urged against this method of study but it can never afford definitive satisfaction either in theory or practice and the reason why it fails is that the ground is yet without a definite content of its own so that to regard anything as resting upon a ground merely gives the formal difference of mediation in place of immediacy we see an electrical phenomenon for example and we ask for its ground or reason we are told that electricity is the ground of this phenomenon what is this but the same content as we had immediately before us only translated into the form of inwardness the ground however is not merely simple self-identity but also different hence various grounds may be alleged for the same sum of fact this variety of grounds again following the logic of difference culminates in the opposition of grounds 
pro and contra in any action such as theft there is a sum of fact in which several aspects may be distinguished the theft has violated the rights of property it has given the means of satisfying his wants to the needy thief possibly too the man from whom the theft was made misused his property the violation of property is unquestionably the decisive point of view before which the other must give way but the bare law of the ground cannot settle that question usually indeed the law is interpreted to speak of a sufficient ground not of any ground whatever and it might be supposed therefore that the action referred to that although other points of view beside the violation of property might be held as grounds yet would not be sufficient grounds but here comes a dilemma if we use the phrase sufficient ground the epithet is either otios or of such a kind as to carry us past the mere category of ground the predicate is odios and tautological if it only states the capability of giving a ground of reason for the ground is a ground only in so far as it has this capability if a soldier runs away from battle to save his life his conduct is certainly a violation of duty but it cannot be held that the ground which led him so to act was insufficient otherwise he would have remained at his post besides there is this also to be said on one hand any ground suffices on the other no ground suffices as mere ground because as already said it is yet void of a content objectively and intrinsically determined and this is therefore not self-acting and productive a content thus objectively and intrinsically determined and hence self-acting will hereafter come before us as the notion and it is the notion which leibniz had in his eye when he spoke of sufficient ground and urged the study of things under its point of view his remarks were originally directed against the merely mechanical method of conceiving things so much in vogue even now a method which he justly pronounces insufficient we may see an instance of this mechanical theory of investigation when the organic process of circulation of the blood is traced back merely to the contraction of the heart or when certain theories of criminal law explain the purpose of punishment to lie in deferring people from crime in rendering the criminal harmless or in other extraneous grounds of the same kind it is unfair to leibniz to suppose that he was content with anything so poor as this formal law of the ground the method of investigation which he inaugurated is the very reverse of a formalism which acquiesces in mere grounds where a full and concrete knowledge is sought considerations to this effect led leibniz to contrast cause efficientes and cause finales to insist on the place of final causes as the conception to which the efficient were to lead up if we adopt this distinction light heat and moisture would be the causa efficientes not the causa finalis of the growth of plants the causa finalis is the notion of the plant itself to get no further than mere grounds especially on questions of law and morality is the position and principle of the sophists sophistry as we ordinarily conceive it is a method of investigation which aims at distorting what is just and true and exhibiting things in a false light such however is not proper or primary tendency of sophistry the standpoint of which there is no other than the raisonnement the sophists came on the scene at a time when the greeks had begun to grow dissatisfied with mere authority and tradition and felt need of intellectual justification for what they were to accept as obligatory the desideratum of the sophists supplied by teaching their countrymen to seek for the various points of view under which they may be considered which points of view are the same as grounds but the ground as we have seen has no essential and objective principles of its own and it is easy to discover grounds for what is wrong and immoral as for what is moral and right upon the observer therefore it depends to decide what points are to have most weight the decision in such circumstances is prompted by individual views and sentiments thus the objective foundation of what ought to have been of absolute and essential obligation accepted by all was undermined and sophistry by this destructive action deservedly brought upon itself the bad name previously mentioned socrates as we all know met the sophists at every point not by a bare reassertion of authority and tradition against their argumentations but by showing dialectically how untenable the mere grounds were and by vindicating the obligation of justice and goodness by reinstating the universal notion of the will in the present day such a method of argumentation is not quite out of fashion nor is that the case only in the discussion of secular matters it occurs even in sermons such as those every possible grounds of gratitude to god is propounded to such pleading socrates and plato would not have scrupled to apply the name of sophistry for sophistry has nothing to do with what is taught that may very possibly be true sophistry lies in the formal circumstances of teaching it by grounds which are as available for attack as for defence in a time so rich in reflection and so devoted to raisonnement as our own he must be a poor creature who cannot advance a good ground for everything even what is worst and most depraved everything in the world that has become corrupt has had a good ground for its corruption an appeal to grounds at first makes the hearer think of beating a retreat 
But when experience has taught him the real state of these matters, he closes his ears against them and refuses to be imposed upon any more. As it first comes, the chief feature of essence is shown in itself and intermediation in itself. But when it has completed the circle of intermediation, its unity with itself is explicitly put to the self-annulling of difference, and therefore of intermediation. Once more, then, we come back to the immediacy or being. But being in so far as it is intermediated by annulling the intermediation, and that being is existence. The ground is not yet determined by objective principles of its own, nor is it an end or final cause. Hence it is not active nor productive, and existence only proceeds from the ground. The determinate ground is therefore a formal matter. That is to say, any point will do so long as it is expressly put as self-relation, as affirmation and correlation with the immediate existence depending on it. If it be a ground at all, it is a good ground. For the term good is employed abstractly as equivalent to affirmative, and any point or feature is good, which can in any way be enunciated as confessedly affirmative. So it happens that a ground can be found and adducted for everything, and a good ground, for example, a good motive for action, may affect something or may not. It may have a consequence or it may not. It may become a motive, strictly so called, an effect of something, for example, through its reception into a will. There and there only it becomes active and is made a cause. End of part one of chapter eight. Part two of chapter eight of the logic of Hegel by Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brian Smallwood Existence Existence is the immediate unity of reflection into self and reflection into another. It follows from this that existence is the indefinite multitude of existences as reflected into themselves, which at the same time equally throw light upon one another, which in short are correlative and form a world of reciprocal dependence and infinite interconnection between grounds and consequences. The grounds are themselves existences, and the existents, in like manner, are in many directions grounds as well as consequence. The phrase existence, derived from existere, suggests the fact of having proceeded from something. Existence is being, which has proceeded from the ground, and been reinstated by annulling its intermediation. The essence as being, set aside and absorbed, originally came before us as shining or showing in itself, and the categories of this reflection are identity, difference, and ground. The last is the unity of identity and difference. Because it unifies them, it has the same time to distinguish itself from itself. But that which is in this way distinguished from the ground is as little more difference as the ground itself is abstract sameness. The ground works its own suspension, and when suspended, the result of its negation is existence. Having issued from the ground, existence contains the ground in it, and the ground does not remain, as it were, behind existence, but by its very nature supersedes itself and translates itself into existence. This is exemplified even in our ordinary mode of thinking, when we look upon the ground of a thing, not as something abstractly inward, but as itself also an existent. For example, the lightning flash, which has to set a house on fire, will be considered the ground of the conflagration, or the manners of a nation and the condition of its life would be regarded as the ground of its constitution. Such indeed is the ordinary aspect in which the existent world ordinarily appears to reflection, an indefinite crowd of things existent, which, being simultaneously reflected on themselves and on one another, are related reciprocally in the ground in consequence. In this motley play of the world, if we may so call the sum of existence, there is nowhere a firm footing to be found. Everything bears an aspect of relativity, conditioned by and conditioning something else. The reflective understanding makes it its business to elicit and trace these connections, running out in every direction. But the question touching an ultimate design is so far left unanswered, and therefore the craving of reason, after knowledge passes, with the further development of the logical idea, beyond this position of mere relativity. The reflection on another of the existent is however inseparable from the reflection on self the ground is their unity from which existence has issued the existent therefore includes relativity and has on its own part its multiple interconnections with other existents it is reflected on itself as its ground the existent is when so described a thing the thing by itself or thing in the abstract so famous in the philosophy of kant shows itself here in its genesis it is seen to be the abstract reflection on self 
which is clung to, to the exclusion of reflection on other things, and with all predication of difference. The thing by itself, therefore, is the empty substratum for these predicates of relation. If to know means to comprehend an object in its concrete character, then the thing by itself, which is nothing but the quite abstract and indeterminate thing in general, must certainly be as unknowable as it is alleged to be. With as much reason, however, as we speak of the thing by itself, we might speak of quality by itself, or quantity by itself, and any other category. The expression would then serve to signify that these categories are taken in their abstract immediacy, apart from their development and inward character. It is no better than a whim of the understanding, therefore, if we attach the qualificatory in or by itself to the thing only. But this in or by itself is also applied to the facts of the mental as well as the natural world, as we speak of electricity or of a plant in itself, so we speak of man or the state in itself. But this in itself and these objects, we are meant to understand what they strictly and properly are. The usage is liable to the same criticism of the phrase thing in itself for if we stick to the mere in itself of an object we apprehend it not in its truth but in the inadequate form of mere abstraction thus the man by or in himself is the child and what the child has to do is to rise out of this abstract and undeveloped in himself and become for himself what he is at first only in himself a free and reasonable being similarly the state in itself is yet immature and patriarchal state where the various political functions latent in the notion of the state have not received the full logical constitution which the logic of political principles demands in the same sense the germ may be called the plant in itself these examples may show the mistake of supporting that the thing in itself or the in itself of things is sometimes inaccessible to our cognition all things are originally in themselves but that is not the end of the matter as the germ being the plant in itself means self-development so the thing in general passes beyond its in itself and the abstract reflection on self to manifest itself further as reflection on other things it is in this sense that it has properties the thing the thing is the totality the development and explicit unity of the categories of the ground and of existence on the side of one of its factors viz reflection on other things it has in its differences in virtue of which it is characterized in concrete thing these characteristics are different from one another they have their reflection into self not on their own part but on the part of the thing they are properties of the thing and their relation to the thing is expressed by the word have as a term of relation to have takes place to be true somewhat has qualities on its part too but this transience of having into the sphere of being is inexact because the character as quality is directly one with the somewhat and the somewhat ceases to be when it loses its quality but the thing is reflection into self for it is an identity which is also distinct from the differences i e from the attributes in many languages have is employed to denote past time and with reason for the past is absorbed or suspended being and the mind is in itself reflection into self in the mind only it continues to subsist and the mind however distinguishing from itself this being in it which has been absorbed or suspended in the thing all the characteristics of reflection recur as existent thus the thing in its initial aspect as the thing by itself is the self-same or identical but identity it was proved is not found without difference so the properties which the thing has are the existent differences in the form of diversity in the case of diversity or variety each diverse member exhibited an indifference to every other and they had no other relation to each other save what was given by a comparison external to them but now in the thing we have a bond which keeps the various properties in union property besides should not be confused with quality no doubt we also say a thing has qualities but the phraseology is misplaced one having hints at independence foreign to the somewhat which is still directly identical with its quality somewhat is what it is only by its quality whereas though the thing indeed exists only as it has its properties it is not confined to this or that definite property and can therefore lose it without ceasing to be what it is even in the ground however the reflection on something else is directly convertible with the reflection on self and hence the properties are not merely different from each other they are also self-identical independent and relieved from their attachment to the thing still as they are characters of the thing distinguished from one another as reflected into self they are not themselves things if things be concrete but only existences reflected into themselves as abstract characters they are what are called matters nor is the name things given to matters such as magnetic and electric matters they are qualities proper and reflected being one with their being they are the character that has reached immediacy existence they are entities to elevate the properties which the thing has 
So the independent position of matters or materials of which it consists is a proceeding based upon the notion of a thing, and for that reason it is also founded in experience. Thought and the experience, however, alike protest against concluding from the fact that certain properties of a thing, such as colour or smell, may be represented as particular colouring or odorific matters, that we are then at the end of the inquiry, and that nothing more is needed to penetrate to the true secret of things than a disintegration of them into their component materials. This disintegration into the independent matters is properly restricted to inorganic nature only. The chemist is in the right, therefore, when, for example, he analyzes common salt or gypsum into its elements and finds that the former consists of muriatic acid and soda, the latter of sulfuric acid and calcium. So too the geologist is well to regard granite as a compound of quartz, felspar, and mica. These matters again of which the thing consists are themselves partly things, which in that way may be once more reduced to more abstract matters. Sulfuric acid, for example, is a compound of sulphur and oxygen. Such matters or bodies can, as a matter of fact, be exhibited as subsisting by themselves, but frequently we find other properties of things, entirely wanting the self-subsistence, also regarded as particular matters. Thus we hear caloric and electrical or magnetic matters spoken of. Such matters are the best figments of understanding, and we see here the usual procedure of the abstract reflection of understanding. Capriciously adopting single categories, whose value entirely depends on their place in the gradual evolution of the logical idea and employs them in the pretended interests of explanation but in the face of plain and prejudiced perception and experience so as to trace back to them every object investigated nor is this all the theory which makes things consist of independent matters is frequently applied in a region where it has neither meaning nor force for within the limits of nature even wherever there is organic life this category is obviously inadequate an animal may be said to consist of bones muscles nerves etc but evidently we are here using the term consist in a very different sense from its use when we spoke of the pieces of granite as consisting of the above-mentioned elements the elements of granite are utterly indifferent to their combination they could subsist as well without it the different parts and members of the organic body on the contrary subsist only in their union they cease to exist as such when they are separated from each other thus matter is the mere abstract or indeterminate reflection into something else or reflection into self at the same time as determinate it is consequently thinghood which then and there is the subsistence of the thing by this means the thing has on the part of matters its reflection into self it subsists not on its own part but consists of the matters and is only a superficial association between them and external combination of them matter being the immediate unity of existence with itself is also indifferent towards specific character hence the numerous diverse matters coalesce into one matter or into existence under the reflective characteristic of identity in contrast to this one matter these distinct properties and their external relation which they have to one another in the thing constitute the form the reflective category of difference but a difference which exists and is a totality this one featureless matter is also the same as the thing by itself was only the latter is intrinsically quite abstract while the former essentially implies relation to something else and is in the first place to the form the various matters of which the thing consists are potentially the same as one another thus we get one matter in general to which the difference is expressly attached externally and as a bare form this theory which holds things all round to have one and the same matter at bottom and merely to differ externally in respect of form is much in vogue with the reflective understanding matter in that case counts for naturally indeterminate but susceptible of any determination while at the same time it is perfectly permanent and continues the same amid all change and alteration and in finite things at least this disregard of matter for any determinate form is certainly exhibited for example it matters not to a block of marble whether it receive the form of this or that state or even the form of a pillar be it noted however that a block of marble can disregard form only relatively that is in reference to the sculptor it is by no means purely formless and so the mineralogist considers the relatively formless marble as a special formation of rock differing from other equally special formations such as sandstone or porphyry therefore we say it as abstraction and understanding which isolates matter into certain natural formlessness for properly speaking the thought of matter includes the principle of form throughout and no formless matter therefore appears anywhere even an experience as existing still the conception of matter as original and pre-existent and as naturally formless is a very ancient one it meets us even among the greeks at the first in the mythical shape of chaos which is supposed to represent the unformed substratum of the existing world such a conception must of necessity tend to make god not the creator of the world but a mere world moulder or demiurge a deeper insight into nature reveals god as creating the world out of nothing and that teaches two things on the one hand it enunciates that matter as such has no independent subsistence and on the other that the form does not supervene 
intervene upon matter from without but as totality involves the principle of matter itself this free and infinite form will hereafter come before us as the notion thus the thing suffers a disruption into matter and form each of these is the totality of thinghood and subsists for itself but matter which is meant to be the positive and indeterminate existence contains as existence reflection on another every whit as much as it contains self-enclosed being accordingly as uniting these characteristics it is itself the totality of form but form being a complete whole of characteristics ipso facto involves reflection into self in other words as self-relating form it has the very function attributed to matter both are at bottom the same invest them with the unity and you have the relation of matter and form which are also no less distinct the thing being this totality is a contradiction on the side of its negative unity it is form which matter is determined and deposed to the rank of properties at the same time it consists of matters which in the reflection of the thing into itself are much independent as they are at the same time negatived thus the thing in its essential existence in such a way as to be an existence that suspends or absorbs itself in itself in other words the thing is an appearance or phenomenon the negation of several matters which is insisted on in the thing no less than in their independent existence occurs in physics as porosity each of the several matters colouring matter odorific matter and if we believe some people even sound matter not excluding caloric electric matter etc is also negated and in the negation of theirs whereas in interpenetrating their pores we find the numerous other independent matters which being similarly porous make room in turn for the existence of the rest pores are not empirical facts they are figments of the understanding which uses them to represent the element of negation and in independent matters the further working out of the contradictions is concealed by the nebulous imbroglio in which all matters are independent and all no less negated in each other if the faculties or activities are similarly hypostatized in the mind their living unity similarly turns to the imbroglio of an action of the one on the others these pores meaning thereby not the pores in an organic body such as the pores of wood or of the skin but those of so-called matters such as colouring matter caloric or metals crystals etc cannot be verified by observation in the same way matter itself furthermore form which is separated from matter whether that be the thing as consisting of matters or the view that the thing itself subsists and only as properties is all a product of the reflective understanding which while it observes and professes to record only what it observes is rather creating a metaphysic bristling with contradictions of which it is unconscious end of part two of chapter eight recording by ryan smallwood Part three of chapter eight of the Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Second subdivision of logic: the doctrine of essence. B. Appearance. The essence must appear or shine forth. Its shining or reflection in it is the suspension of the translation of it to immediacy, which, whilst as reflection on self is a matter of subsistence is also form reflection on something else a subsistence which sets itself aside to show or shine is the characteristic by which essence is distinguished from being by which it is essence and it is this show which when it is developed shows itself and is appearance essence accordingly is not something beyond or behind appearance but just because it is the essence which exists the existence is appearance forth shining existence stated explicitly in its contradiction is appearance but appearance forth shining is not to be confused with the mere show shining show is the proximate truth of being or immediacy the immediate instead of being as we suppose something independent resting on its own self is a mere show and as such it is packed or summed up under the simplicity of the immanent essence the essence is in the first place the sum total of the showing itself shining in itself inwardly but far from abiding in this inwardness it comes as a ground forward into existence and this existence being grounded not in itself but on something else is just appearance in our imagination we ordinarily combine the term of appearance or phenomenon the conception of an indefinite congeries of things existing the being of which is purely relative and which consequently do not rest on a foundation of their own but are esteemed only as passing stages but in this conception it is no less implied that essence does not linger behind or beyond appearance rather it is we must say the infinite kindness which lets its own show freely issue into immediacy and graciously allows it the joy of existence the appearance 
which is thus created does not stand on its own feet and has its being not in itself but in something else god who is the essence when he lends existence to the passing stages of his own show in himself may be described as the goodness that creates a world but he is also the power above it and the righteousness which manifests the merely phenomenal character of the content of this existing world whenever it tries to exist in independence appearance is in every way a very important grade of the logical idea it may be said to be the distinction of philosophy from ordinary consciousness that it seems the merely phenomenal character of what the latter supposes to have a self-subsisting being the significance of appearance however must be properly grasped or mistakes will arise to say that anything is a mere appearance may be misinterpreted to mean that as compared with what is merely phenomenal there is a greater truth in the immediate in that which is now in strict fact the case is precisely the reverse appearance is higher than mere being a richer category because it holds in combination the two elements of reflection into self and reflection into another whereas being or immediacy is still mere relationless and apparently rests upon itself alone still to say that anything is only an appearance suggests a real flaw which consists in this that appearance is still divided against itself and without intrinsic stability beyond and above mere appearance comes in the first place actuality the third grade of essence of which we shall afterwards speak in the history of modern philosophy kant has the merit of first rehabilitating this distinction between the common and the philosophic modes of thought he stopped half way however when he attached to appearance a subjective meaning only and put the abstract essence immovable outside it as the thing in itself beyond the reach of our cognition for it is the very nature of the world of immediate objects to be appearance only knowing it to be so we know at the same time the essence which far from staying behind or beyond the appearance rather manifests its own essentiality by deposing the world to a mere appearance one can hardly quarrel with the plain men who in his desire for totality cannot acquiesce in the doctrine of subjective idealism that we are solely concerned with phenomena the plain man however in his desire to save the objectivity of knowledge may very naturally return to the abstract immediacy and maintain that immediacy to be true and actual in a little work published under this title a report clear as day to the larger public touching the proper nature of the latest philosophy an attempt to force the reader to understand in a little work published under the title quote, a report clear as day to the larger public touching the proper nature of the latest philosophy an attempt to force the reader to understand end quote. fichte examined the opposition between subjective idealism and immediate consciousness in a popular form under the shape of a dialogue between the author and the reader and tried hard to prove that the subjective idealist point of view was right in this dialogue the reader complains to the author that he has completely failed to place himself in the idealist position and is inconsolable at the thought that things around him are no real things but mere appearances the affliction of the reader can scarcely be blamed when he is expected to consider himself hemmed in by an impervious circle of purely subjective conceptions apart from this subjective view of appearance however we have all reason to rejoice that the things which environ us are appearances and not steadfast and independent existences since in that case we should soon perish of hunger both bodily and mental the world of appearance the apparent or phenomenal exists in such a way that its subsistence is ipso facto thrown into abeyance or suspended and is only one stage in the form of itself the form embraces in it the matter or subsistence as it one of its characteristics in this way the phenomenal has its ground in this form as its essence but its reflection into self in contrast with its immediacy but in doing so has it only in another aspect of the form the ground of its no less phenomenal than itself and the phenomenon accordingly goes on to an endless mediation of subsistence by means of form and thus equally by non-subsistence this endless intermediation is at the same time a unity of self-relation and existence is developed into a totality into a world of phenomena of reflected finitude content and form outside one another as the phenomena in this phenomenal world are they form a totality and are wholly contained in their self-relatedness in this way the self-relation of the phenomenon is completely specified it has the form in itself and because it is in this identity has it as essential subsistence 
so it comes about that the form is content and in its mature phase is the law of phenomenon when the form on the contrary is not reflected into self it is equivalent to the negative of the phenomenon to the non-independent and changeable and that sort of form is the indifferent or external form the essential point to keep in mind about the opposition of form and content is that the content is not formless but has the form in its own self quite as much as the form is external to it there is thus a doubling of form at one time it is reflected into self and then is identical with the content at another time it is not reflected into itself and then is external existence which does not at all affect the content we are here in presence implicitly of the absolute correlation of content and form viz their reciprocal revulsion so that content is nothing but the revulsion of form into content and form nothing but the revulsion of content into form this mutual revulsion is one of the most important laws of thought but it is not explicitly brought out before the relations of substance and causality form and content are a pair of terms frequently employed by the reflective understanding especially with a habit of looking on the content as the essential and independent the form on the contrary as the unessential and dependent against this it is to be noted that both are in fact equally essential and that while a formless content can be as little found as a formless matter the two content and matter are distinguished by this circumstance that matter though implicitly not without form still in its existence manifests a disregard of form whereas the content as such is what it is only because the matured form is included in it still the form comes before us sometimes as an existence indifferent and external to content and does so for the reason that the whole range of appearance still suffers from externality in a book for instance it certainly has no bearing upon the content whether it be written or printed bound in paper or in leather that however does not in the least imply that apart from such an indifferent and external form the content of the book is itself formless there are undoubtedly books enough which even in reference to their content may well be styled formless but want of form in this case is the same as bad form and means the defect of the right form not the absence of all form whatever so far as this right form from being unaffected by the content that it is rather the content itself a work of art that wants the right form is for that very reason no right or true work of art and it is a bad way of excusing an artist to say that the content of his works is good and even excellent though they want the right form real works of art are those which content and form exhibit a thorough identity the content of the iliad it may be said is the trojan war and especially the wrath of achilles in that we have everything and yet very little after all for the iliad is made an iliad by poetic form in which that content is moulded the content of romeo and juliet may similarly be said to be the ruin of two lovers through the discord between their families but something more is needed to make shakespeare's immortal tragedy in reference to the relation of form and content in the field of science we should recollect the difference between philosophy and the rest of the sciences the latter are finite because of their mode of thought as a merely formal act derives its content from without their content therefore is not known as moulded from within through the thoughts which lie at the ground of it and form and content do not thoroughly interpenetrate each other this partition disappears in philosophy and thus justifies its title of infinite knowledge yet even philosophic thought is often held to be a merely formal act and that logic which confessedly deals with thoughts qua thoughts is merely formal is especially a foregone conclusion and if content means no more than what is palpable and obvious to the senses all philosophy and logic in particular must be at once acknowledged to be void of content that is to say content perceptible to the senses even ordinary forms of thought however and the common usage of language do not in the least restrict the appellation of content to what is perceived by the senses or to what is being in a place and time a book without content is as every one knows not a book with empty leaves but one of which content is as good as none we shall find as the last result on closer analysis that what is called content an educated mind means nothing but the presence and power of thought this is to admit that thoughts are not empty forms without affinity to their content and that in other spheres as well as in art the truth and the sterling value of the content essentially depend on the content showing itself identical with the form but immediate existence is a character of the subsistence itself as well as of the form it is consequently external to the character of the content 
but in an equal degree this externality which the content has through the factor of its subsistence is essential to it when thus explicitly stated the phenomenon is relativity or correlation where one and the same thing viz the content or the developed form is seen as the externality and antithesis of independent existences and their reduction to a relation of identity in which identification alone the two things distinguished are what they are relation or correlation the immediate relation is that of the whole and the parts the content is the whole and consists of the parts the form its counterpart the parts are diverse one from another it is they that possess independent being but they are parts only when they are identified by being related to one another or in so far as they make up the whole when taken together but this together is the counterpart and negation of the part essential correlation is the specific and completely universal phase in which things appear everything that exists stands in correlation and this correlation is the veritable nature of every existence the existent thing in this way has no being of its own but only in something else in this other however it is self-relation and the correlation is the unity of the self and relation to others the relation of the whole and the parts is untrue to this extent that the notion and the reality of the relation are not in harmony the notion of the whole is to contain parts but if the whole is taken and made what its notion implies i e if it is divided it at once ceases to be a whole things there are no doubt which correspond to this relation but for that very reason they are low and untrue existences we must remember however what untrue signifies when it occurs in a philosophical discussion the term untrue does not signify that the thing to which it is applied is non-existent a bad state or a sickly body may exist all the same but these things are untrue because their notion and reality are out of harmony the relation of whole and parts being the immediate relation comes easy to reflect of understanding and for that reason it often satisfies when the question really turns on profounder ties the limbs and organs for instance of an organic body are not merely parts of it it is only in their unity that they are what they are and they are unquestionably affected by that unity as they also in turn affect it these limbs and organs become mere parts only when they pass under the hands of the anatomist whose occupation be it remembered is not with the living body but with the corpse not that such analysis is illegitimate we only mean that the external mechanical relation of the whole and parts is not sufficient for us if we want to study organic life in its truth and if this be so in organic life it is the case to a much greater extent when we apply this relation to the mind and formations of the spiritual world psychologists may not expressly speak of parts of the soul or mind but the mode in which this subject is treated by the analytic understanding is largely founded on the analogy of this finite relation at least that is so when the different forms of mental activity are enumerated and described merely in their isolation one after another as so-called special powers and faculties the one and same of this correlation the self-relation found in it is thus immediately a negative self-relation the correlation is in the short the mediating process whereby one and the same is first unaffected towards difference and secondly it is the negative self-relation which repels itself as reflection into self to difference and invests itself as reflection into something else with existence whilst it conversely leads back this reflection into other to self-relation and indifference this gives the correlation of force and its expression the relationship of whole and part is the immediate and therefore unintelligent mechanical relation revulsion of self-identity into mere variety thus we pass from the whole to the parts and from the parts to the whole in the one we forget its opposition to the other while each on its own account at one time the whole at another the parts is taken to be an independent existence in other words when the parts are declared to subsist in the whole and the whole to consist in the parts we have either member of the relation at different times taken to be permanently subsistent while the other is non-essential in its superficial form the mechanical nexus consists in the parts being independent of each other and of the whole this relation may be adopted for the progression ad infinitum in the case of the divisibility of matter and then it becomes an unintelligent alteration with the two sides a thing at one time is taken as a whole then we go on to specify the parts this specifying is forgotten and what was a part is regarded as a whole then the specifying of the part comes up again and so on for ever but this infinity be taken as the negative which it is it is the negative self-relating element in the correlation force the self-identical whole or immanency 
which yet supersedes this immanency and gives itself expression, and conversely the expression which vanishes and returns into force. Force, notwithstanding this infinity, is also finite, for the content, or the one and the same of the force and its outputting, is this identity at first only for the observer. The two sides of the relation are not yet each on its own account, the concrete identity of that one and the same, not yet the totality. For one another they are not therefore different, and the relationship is a finite one. Force, consequently, requires the solicitation from without. It works blindly, and on account of this defectiveness of form, the content is also limited and accidental. It is not yet genuinely identical with the form, not yet is it as a notion and an end. That is to say, it is not intrinsically and actually determinate. This difference is most vital, but not easy to apprehend. It will assume a clear formulation when we reach design. If it be overlooked, it leads to the confusion of conceiving God as force, a confusion from which Herder's God especially suffers. It is often said, the nature of force itself is the unknown, and only its manifestation apprehended. But in the first place, it may be replied, every article in the import of force is the same as what is specified in the exertion. And the explanation of a phenomenon by a force is to that extent a mere tautology. What is supposed to remain unknown, therefore, is really nothing but the empty form of reflection into self, by which alone the force is distinguished from the exertion. And that form, too, is something familiar. It is a form that does not make the slightest addition to the content and to the law, which have to be discovered from the phenomenon alone. Another assurance always given is that to speak of forces implies no theory as to their nature. And that being so, it is impossible to see why the form of force has been introduced into the sciences at all. In the second place, the nature of force is undoubtedly unknown. We are still without any necessity binding and connecting its content together in itself, as we are without necessity in the content in so far as it is expressly limited, and hence has its character by means of another thing outside it. Compared with the immediate relation of whole and parts, the relation between force and its putting forth may be considered infinite in it that identity of the two sides is realized which is the former relation only existed for the observer the whole though we can see that it consists of parts ceases to be a whole when it is divided whereas force is only shown to be force when it exerts itself and its exercise only comes back to itself the exercise is only force once more yet on further examination even this relation will appear finite and finite in virtue of this mediation just as conversely the relation of the whole and parts is obviously finite in virtue of its immediacy. The first and simplest evidence for the finitude of the mediated relation of force and its exercise is that each and every force is conditioned and requires something else than itself for its subsistence. For instance, a special vehicle of magnetic force, as it is well known, is iron, and the other properties of which, such as its colour, specific weight, or relation to acids, are independent of this connection with magnetism. The same thing is seen in all other forces, which from one end to the other are found to be conditioned and mediated by something else than themselves. Another proof of the finite nature of force is that it requires solicitation before it can put itself forth. That through which the force is solicited is itself another exertion of force, which cannot put itself forth without similar solicitation. This brings us either to a repetition of the infinite progression, reciprocity of soliciting, and being solicited. In either case we have no absolute beginning of emotion. The context is given to it as determined, and force, when it exerts itself, is according to the phrase blind in its working. That phrase implies the distinction between abstract force manifestation and teleological action. The oft-repeated statement that the exercise of the force, and not the force itself, admits of being known, must be rejected as groundless. It is the very essence of force to manifest itself, and thus, in totality of manifestation, conceived as a law, we are at the same time discover the force itself. And yet this assertion that force in its own self is unknowable betrays a well-grounded presentiment that this relation is finite. The several manifestations of a force at first meet us in the indefinite multiplicity, and in their isolation seem accidental. But reducing this multiplicity to its inner unity, which we term force, we see that the apparently contingent is necessary by recognising the law that rules it. But the different forces themselves are a multiplicity again, and in their mere juxtaposition seem to be contingent. Hence, in empirical physics, we speak of the forces of gravity, magnetism, electricity, etc., and the empirical psychology of the forces of memory, imagination, will, and all other faculties. 
All this multiplicity again excites a craving to know these different forces as a single whole, nor would this craving be appeased even if several forces were traced back to one common primary force. Such a primary force would be really no more than an empty abstraction, with as little content as the abstract thing in itself. And besides this, the correlation of force and manifestation is essentially a mediated correlation of reciprocal dependence and it must therefore contradict the notion of force to view it as primary or resting on itself such being the case with the nature of force though we may consent to let the world be called a manifestation of divine forces we should object to have god himself viewed as a mere force for force is after all a subordinate and finite category at the so-called renaissance of the sciences when steps were taken to trace the single phenomena of nature back to underlying forces the church branded the enterprise as impious the argument of the church was as follows if it be the forces of gravitation of vegetation etc which occasion the movement of the heavenly bodies the growth of plants etc there is nothing left for divine providence and god sinks to the level of a leisurely onlooker surveying this play of forces the students of nature it is true and newton more than others when they employed the reflective category of force to explain natural phenomena have expressly pleaded that the honour of god as the creator and governor of the world would not thereby be impaired still the logical issue of this explanation by means of force is that the inferential understanding proceeds to fix each of these forces and to maintain them in their finite ultimate and contrasted with this de-infinitized world of independent forces and matters the only terms in which it is possible still to describe god will present him in abstract infinity of an unknowable supreme being in some other world far away this is precisely the position of materialism and of modern free thinking whose theology ignores what god is and restricts itself to the mere fact that he is in this dispute therefore the church and the religious mind have to a certain extent the right on their side the finite forms of understanding certainly fail to fulfil the conditions for a knowledge either of nature or of the formations in the world of mind as they truly are yet on the other side it is impossible to overlook the formal right which in the first place entitles the empirical sciences to vindicate the right of thought to know the existent world in all the speciality of its content and to seek something further than the bare statement of mere abstract faith that god creates and governs the world when our religious consciousness resting upon the authority of the church teaches us that god created the world by his almighty will that he guides the stars in their courses and vouchsafes to all his creatures their existence and their well-being the question why is still left to answer now it is the answer to this question which forms the common task of empirical science of philosophy when religion refuses to recognize this problem or the right to put it and appeals to the unsearchable of the decrees of god it is taking up the agnostic ground as is taken by the mere enlightenment of understanding such an appeal is no better than arbitrary dogmatism which contravenes the express command of christianity to know god in spirit and in truth and is prompted by a humility which is not christian but born of ostentatious bigotry force is a whole which is in its own self-negative self-relation and as such a whole it continually pushes itself off from itself and puts itself forth but since this reflection into another corresponding to the distinction between the parts of the whole is equally a reflection into self this outputting is the way and means by which force that returns back into itself is as a force the very act of outputting accordingly sets in abeyance the diversity of the two sides which is found in this correlation and expressly states the identity which virtually constitutes their content the truth of force and utterance therefore is that relation in which the two sides are distinguished only as outward and inward the inward interior is the ground when it stands as the mere form of the one side of the appearance and the correlation the empty form of reflection into self as a counterpart to it stands outward exterior existence also is the form of the other side of the correlation with the empty characteristic of reflection into something else but inward and outward are identified and their identity is identity brought to fullness in the content that unity of reflection into self and reflection into other which was forced to appear in the movement of force both are the same one totality and this unity makes them the content in the first place then exterior is the same content as interior what is inwardly is also found outwardly and vice versa the appearance shows nothing that is not in the essence and in essence there is nothing but what is manifested in the second place inward and outward as formal terms are also reciprocally opposed and that thoroughly 
the one is the abstraction of identity with the self the other a mere multiplicity or reality but as stages of the one form they are essentially identical so whatever is the first explicitly put only in the one abstraction is also as plainly at one step only in the other therefore what is only internal is also only external and what is only external is so far only at first internal it is the customary mistake of reflection to take the essence to be merely the interior if it be so taken even this way of looking at it is purely external that sort of essence is the empty external abstraction ins innerer der natur dringt seiner schaffner geist so glücklich wenn er nur die ausere schale weist it ought rather have been said if the essence of nature is ever described as the inner part the person who so describes it only knows its outer shell in being as a whole or even in mere sense perception the notion is at first only an inward and for that very reason is something external to being a subjective thinking and being devoid of truth in nature as well as in mind so long as the notion design or law are first the inner capacity mere possibilities they are first only external inorganic nature the knowledge of a third person alien force and the like as a man is outwardly that is to say his actions not of course in merely bodily outwardness so is he inwardly and if this virtue morality etc are only inwardly his that is if they exist only in his intentions and sentiments and his outward acts are not identical with them the other half of him is as hollow and empty as the other the relation of outwardness and inwardness unites the two relations that proceed and at the same time sets in abeyance mere relativity and phenomenality in general yet so long as understanding keeps the inward and outward fixed in their separation they are empty forms the one as null as the other not only in the study of nature but also of the spiritual world much depends on just appreciation of the relation of inward and outward and especially on avoiding the misconception that the former only is the essential point on which everything turns while the latter is unessential and trivial we find this mistake made when as it is often done the difference between nature and mind is traced back to abstract difference between inner and outer as for nature it certainly is in the gross external not merely to the mind but even on its own part but to call it external in the gross is not to imply an abstract externality for there is no such thing it means rather that the idea which forms the common content of nature and mind is found only in nature as outward only and for that very reason only inward the abstract understanding with its either or may struggle against this conception of nature it is none the less obviously found in other modes of consciousness particularly in religion it is the lesson of religion that nature no less than the spiritual world is a revelation of god but with this distinction that while nature never gets so far as to be conscious of its divine essence that consciousness is the express problem of the mind which in the matter of that problem is as yet finite those who look upon the essence of nature as mere inwardness and therefore inaccessible to us take up the same line as the ancient creed which regarded god as envious and jealous a creed which both plato and aristotle pronounced against long ago and all god is he imparts and reveals and does so at first in and through nature any object indeed is faulty and imperfect when it is only inward and thus at the same time only outward or which is the same thing when it is only an outward and thus only an inward for instance a child taken in the gross as human being is no doubt a rational creature but the reason of the child as child is at first a mere inward in the shape of natural ability or vocation etc this mere inward at the same time has for the child the form of a more outward in the shape of a will of his parents the attainments of his teachers and the whole world of reason that environs him the education and instruction of a child aim at making him actually and for himself what he is at first potentially and therefore for others viz for his grown-up friends the reason which at first extends in the child only as an inner possibility or actualized through education and conversely the child by these means becomes conscious that the goodness religion and science which he had first looked upon as outward authority are his own and inward nature as with the child so it is in the matter with the adult when in opposition to his true destiny his intellect and will remain in the bondage of the natural man thus the criminal sees the punishment to which he has to submit as an act of violence from without whereas in fact the penalty is only the manifestation of his own criminal will from what has now been said we may learn what to think of a man who when blamed for his shortcomings it may be his discreditable acts appeal to the professedly excellent intentions and sentiments of the inner self be distinguished therefrom there certainly may be individual cases 
where the malice of outward circumstances frustrates well-meant designs and disturbs the execution of the best laid plans but in general even here the essential unity between inward and outward is maintained we are thus justified in saying that a man is what he does and that the lying vanity which consoles itself with the feeling of inward excellence may be confronted with the word of the gospel by their fruits ye shall know them that grand saying applies primarily in a moral and religious aspect but it also holds good in reference to performances in art and science the keen eye of a teacher who perceives in his pupil decided evidences of talent may lead him to state his opinion that a raphael or a mozart lies hidden in the boy and the result will show how far such an opinion was well founded but if a daub of a painter or a poetester soothe themselves by the conceit that their head is full of high ideals their consolation is a poor one and if insist on being judged not by their actual works but by their projects we may safely reject their pretensions as unfounded and unmeaning the converse case however also occurs in passing judgment on men who have accomplished something great and good we often make use of the false distinction between inward and outward all that they accomplished we say is outward merely inwardly they were acting from some very different motive such as a desire to gratify their vanity or unworthy passion this is the spirit of envy incapable of any great action of its own envy tries hard to depreciate greatness and to bring it down to its own level let us rather recall the fine expression of goethe that there is no remedy but love against great superiorities of others we may seek to rob men's great actions of their grandeur by the insinuation of hypocrisy but though it is possible that men in an instance now and then dissemble and distinguish a good deal they cannot conceal the whole of their inner self which infallibility betrays itself as the discursus vitae even here it is true that a man is nothing but the series of his actions what is called the pragmatic writing of history has in modern times as frequently sinned in its treatment of the great historical characters and defaced and tarnished the true conception of them by this fallacious separation of the outward from the inward not content with telling the unvarnished tale of the great acts which have been wrought by the heroes of the world history and with acknowledging that their inward being corresponds with the import of their acts the pragmatic history fancies himself justified even obliged to trace the supposed secret motives that lie behind the open facts of the record the historian in that case is supposed to write with more depth in proportion as he succeeds in tearing away the aureole from all that has been heretofore held grand and glorious and in depressing it so far as its origin and proper significance are concerned to the level of vulgar mediocrity to make these pragmatical researches in history easier it is usual to recommend the study of psychology which is supposed to make us acquainted with the real motives of human actions the psychology in question however is only the petty knowledge of men which looks away from the essential and permanent in human nature to fasten its glance on the casual and private features shown in isolated instincts and passions pragmatical psychology ought at least to leave the historian who investigates the motives at the ground of great actions a choice between the substantial interests of patriotism justice religious truth and the like on the one hand and the subjective and formal interests of vanity ambition avarice and the like on the other the latter however the motives which must be viewed by the pragmatist as really efficient otherwise the assumption of a contrast between the inward disposition of the agent and the outward the import of the action would fall to the ground but inward and outward have in truth the same content and the right of doctrine is the very reverse of this pedantic judiciality if the heroes of history had been actuated by subjective and formal interests alone they would never have accomplished what they have and if we have due regard to the unity between the inner and outer we must owe that great men willed what they did and did what they willed the empty abstractions by means of which the one identical content per force continues in the two correlatives suspend themselves in immediate transition the one in the other the content is itself nothing but their identity and these abstractions are seeming of essence put as seeming but by manifestation of force the inward is put into existence but this putting is mediated by empty abstractions in its own self the intermediating process vanishes to the immediacy in which the inward and outward are absolutely identical and their difference is distinctly no more than assumed and imposed this identity is actuality end of part three of chapter eight recording by ryan smallwood Part four of chapter eight of the Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Ryan Smallwood. The Doctrine of Essence. C. Actuality. Actuality is the unity, become immediate, of essence with existence, or of inward with outward. The utterance of the actual is the actual itself, so that in this utterance it remains just as essential and only is essential in so far as it is in immediate external existence. We have here this met being and existence as forms of the immediate. Being is, in general, unreflected immediacy and transition into another. Existence is immediate unity of being and reflection, hence appearance. It comes from the ground and falls to the ground. In actuality this unity is explicitly put, and the two sides of the relation identified. Hence the actual is exempted from transition, and its externality is its energizing. In that energizing it is reflected into self. Its existence is only the manifestation of itself, not of another. Actuality and thought, or idea, are often absurdly opposed. How commonly we hear people saying that, though no objection can be urged against the truth and correctness of a certain thought, there is nothing of the kind to be seen in actuality, or it cannot actually be carried out. People that use such language only prove that they have not properly apprehended the nature either of thought or of actuality. Thought in such a case is on one hand the synonym for subjective conception, plan, intention, or the like just as actuality, on the other, is made synonymous with external and sensible existence. This is all very well in common life, where great laxity is allowed in the categories and the names given to them. And it may of course happen that, for example, the plan or so-called idea, say of a certain method of taxation, is good and advisable in the abstract, but nothing of the sort is found in so-called actuality, or could possibly be carried out under the given conditions. But when the abstract understanding gets hold of these categories, and exaggerates the distinction they imply into a hard and fast line of contrast, when it tells us that in this actual world we must knock ideas out of our head, it is necessary energetically to protest against these doctrines, alike in nature of science and of sound reason. For on the one hand ideas are not confined to our heads merely, nor is the idea, upon the whole, so feeble as to leave the question of its actualization or non-actualization dependent on our will. The idea is rather the absolutely active as well as the actual. And on the other hand, actuality is not so bad and irrational, as purblind or wrong-headed and muddle-brained would-be reformers imagine. So far is actuality, as distinguished from mere appearance, and primarily presenting unity of inward and outward, from being in contrariety with reason, that it is rather thoroughly reasonable, and everything which is not reasonable must on that very ground cease to be held actual. The same view may be traced in the usages of educated speech, which declines to give the name of real poet or real statesman to a poet or a statesman who can do nothing really meritorious or reasonable in that vulgar conception of actuality which mistakes for it what is palpable and directly obvious to the senses we must seek the ground of a widespread prejudice about the relation of philosophy of aristotle to that of plato popular opinion makes the difference to be as follows while plato recognises the idea and only the idea as the truth aristotle rejecting the idea keeps to what is actual and is on that account to be considered the founder and chief of empiricism on this it may be remarked that although actuality certainly is the principle of the aristotelian philosophy it is not the vulgar actuality of what is immediately at hand but the idea as actuality where then lies the controversy of aristotle against plato it lies in this aristotle calls platonic idea a mere greek and establishes in opposition to plato that the idea which both equally recognize to be only truth is essentially to be viewed as an greek in other words, as the inward, which is quite the force, as the unity of inner and outer, or as actuality in the emphatic sense here given to the word. Such a concrete category as actuality includes the characteristics aforesaid and their difference, and is therefore also the development of them, in such a way that, as it has them, they are at the same time plainly understood to be a show, to be assumed or imposed. Viewed as identity in general, actuality is first of all possibility the reflection into self which as in contrast to the concrete unity of the actual is taken and made an abstract and unessential essentiality possibility is what is essential to reality but in such a way that it is at the same time only a possibility it was probably the import of possibility which induces kant to regard it along with necessity and actuality as modalities since these categories do not in the least increase the notion as object but only express its relation to the faculty of knowledge for possibility is really the bare abstraction of reflection into self what was formerly called the inward only that is now to take in the mean external inward lifted out of reality and with the being 
being of a mere supposition, and is thus, sure enough, supposed only as a bare modality, an abstraction which comes short, and in more concrete terms belongs only to subjective thought. It is otherwise with actuality and necessity. They are anything but a mere sort and mode for something else. In fact, the very reverse of that. If they are supposed, it is as the concrete, not merely superstitious, but intrinsically complete as possibility is in the first instance the mere form of identity with self as compared with the concrete which is actual the rule for it merely is that a thing must not be self-contradictory thus everything is possible for an act of abstraction can give any content this form of identity everything however is an impossible as it is possible in every content which is and must be concrete the speciality of its nature may be viewed as a specialised contrariety and in that way as a contradiction nothing therefore can be more meaningless than to speak of such possibility and impossibility in philosophy in particular there should never be a word said of showing that it is possible or there is still another possibility or to adopt another phrase it is conceivable the same consideration should warn the writer of history against employing a category which has now been explained to be on its own merits untrue but the subtlety of the empty understanding finds its chief pleasure in the fantastic ingenuity of suggesting possibilities and lots of possibilities our picture thought is at first disposed to see in possibility the richer and more comprehensive in actuality the poorer and narrower category everything it is said is possible but everything which is possible is not on that account actual in real truth however if we deal with them as thoughts actuality is the more comprehensive because it is the concrete thought which includes possibility as an abstract element and that superiority is to some extent expressed in our ordinary mode of thought when we speak of the possible in distinction from the actual as only possible possibility is often said to consist in a thing being thinkable think however in the use of the word only means to conceive any content under the form of an abstract identity now every content can be brought under this form since nothing is required except to separate it from the relations in which it stands hence any content however absurd and nonsensical can be viewed as possible it is possible that the moon might fall upon the earth to-night for the moon is a body separate from the earth and may as well fall down upon it as a stone thrown into the air does it is possible that the sultan may become pope for being a man he may be converted to christian faith may become a catholic priest and so on in language like this about possibility it is chiefly the law of sufficient ground or reason which is manipulated in the style already explained everything it is said is possible for which you can state some ground the less education a man has or in other words the less he knows of the specific connections of the object to which he directs his observations the greater his tendency to launch into all sorts of empty possibilities an instance of this habit in the political sphere is seen in the pothouse politician in practical life too it is no uncommon thing to see ill will and indolence slink behind the category of possibility in order to escape definite obligations to such conduct the same remarks apply as were made in connection with the law of sufficient ground reasonable and practical men refuse to be imposed upon by the possible for the simple ground that is possible only they stick to the actual not meaning by that word merely whatever immediately is now and here many of the proverbs of common life express the same contempt for what is abstractly possible a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush after all there is good reason for taking everything to be impossible as to be possible for every content a content is always concrete including not only diverse but even opposite characteristics nothing is so impossible for instance as this that i am for i is at the same time simple self-relation and is undoubtedly a relation to something else the same may be seen in every other fact in the natural or spiritual world matter it may be said is impossible for it is the unity of attraction and repulsion the same is true of life law freedom and above all of god himself as the truth i e the triune god a notion of god which the abstract enlightenment of understanding in conformity with its canons rejected on the allegation that it was contradictory in thought generally speaking it is empty understanding which haunts these empty forms the business of philosophy in the matter is to show how null and meaningless they are whether a thing is possible or impossible depends altogether on the subject matter that is on the sum total of elements in actuality which as it opens itself out discloses itself to be necessity but the actual in its distinction from possibility which is reflection into self is itself only the outward concrete 
the unessential immediate. In other words, to such an extent as the actual is primarily the simple, merely immediate unity of inward and outward, it is obviously made an unessential outward, and thus at the same time it is merely inward, the abstraction of reflection into self. Hence it is itself characterised as merely possible. When thus valued at the rate of mere possibility, the actual is a contingent or accidental, and conversely possibility is mere accident itself or chance possibility and contingency are two factors of actuality inward and outward put as mere forms which constitute the externality of the actual they have their reflection into self on the body of actual fact or content with its intrinsic definiteness which gives the essential ground of their characterization the finitude of contingent and the possible lies therefore as we now see in the distinction of the form determination from the content and therefore it depends on the content alone whether anything is contingent and possible as possibility is the mere inside of actuality it is for that reason a mere outside actuality in other words contingency the contingent roughly speaking is what has the ground of its being not in itself but in somewhat else such is the aspect under which actuality first comes before consciousness which often mistakes for actuality itself but the contingent is only one side of the actuality the side namely of reflection on something else it is the actual and the signification of something merely possible accordingly we consider the contingent to be what may or may not be what may be in one way or in another whose being or not being and whose being on this wise or otherwise depends not upon itself but on something else overcome this contingency is roughly speaking the problem of science on the one hand as in the range of practice on the other the end of action is to rise above the contingency of the will or above caprice it is however often happened most of all in modern times that contingency has been unwarrantably elevated and had value attached to it both in nature and the world of mind to which it has no just claim frequently nature is to take it first and chiefly admired for the richness and variety of its structures apart however from what disclosure it contains of the idea this richness gratifies none of the higher interests of reason and in its vast variety of structures organic or inorganic affords us only the spectacle of contingency losing itself in vagueness at any rate the chequered scene presented by the several varieties of animals and plants conditioned as it is by outward circumstances the complex changes in the figuration of grouping clouds and the like ought not to be ranked higher than equally casual fancies of the mind which surrenders itself to its own caprices the wonderment with which such phenomena are welcomed is a most abstract frame of mind from which one should advance to a closer insight into the natural harmony and uniformity of nature of contingency in respect of the will it is especially important to form a proper estimate the freedom of the will is an expression that often means mere free choice or the will in form of contingency freedom of choice or the capacity of determining ourselves towards one thing or another is undoubtedly a vital element in the will which in the very notion is free but instead of being freedom itself it is only the first instance of freedom in form the genuinely free will which includes free choice as suspended is conscious of itself that its content is intrinsically firm and fast and knows it at the same time to be thoroughly its own a will on the contrary which remains standing on the grade of option even supposing it does decide in favour of what is import right and true true is always haunted by the conceit that it might if it had so pleased have decided in favour of the reverse course when more narrowly examined free choice is seen to be a contradiction to this extent that its form and content stand in antithesis the matter of choice is given and known as a content dependent not on the will itself but on outward circumstances in reference to such a given content freedom lies only in the form of choosing which as it is only a freedom in form may consequently be regarded as freedom only in supposition in an ultimate analysis it will be seen that the same outwardness of circumstances on which is founded the content that will finds to its hand can alone account for the will giving its decision for the one and not the other of the two alternatives although contingency as it has thus been shown is only one aspect of the whole actuality and therefore not to be mistaken for actuality itself it has no less the rest of the forms of the idea it is due office in the world of objects this is in the first place seen in nature on the surface of nature so to speak chance ranges unchecked and that contingency must simply be recognised without the pretension sometimes erroneously ascribed to philosophy of seeking to find in it a could only be so and not otherwise nor is contingency less visible in the world of mind the will as we have already remarked includes contingency under the shape of option or free choice but only as a vanishing and abrogated element in respect of mind and its works just as in the case of nature 
we must guard against being so far misled by a well-meant endeavour after rational knowledge as to try to exhibit the necessity of phenomena which are marked by a decided contingency or as the phrase is to construe them a priori thus in language although it be as it were the body of thought chance still unquestionably plays a decided part the same is true of creations of law and art the problem of science and especially of philosophy undoubtedly consists in eliciting the necessity concealed under the semblance of contingency that however is far from meaning that contingency belongs to our subjective conception alone and must therefore be simply set aside if we wish to get at the truth all scientific researches which pursue this tendency exclusively lay themselves fairly open to the charge of mere jugglery and overstrained precisionism when more closely examined what the aforesaid outward side of actuality implies is this contingency which is actuality in its immediacy is the self-identical essentially only a supposition which is no sooner made than it is revoked and leaves an existent externality in this way the external contingency is somewhat presupposed the immediate existence of which is at the same time a possibility and has the vocation to be suspended to be possibility of something else now this possibility is the condition the contingent as immediate actuality is at the same time the possibility of something else no longer however the abstract possibility which we had at first but the possibility which is and the possibility existent is a condition by the condition of a thing we mean first an existence in short an immediate and secondly the vocation of this immediate to be suspended and subserve the actualising of something else immediate actuality is in general as such never what it ought to be it is a finite actuality with an inherent flaw and its vocation is to be consumed but the other aspect of actuality is its essentiality this is primarily the inside which a mere possibility is no less destined to be suspended possibility thus suspended is the issuing of a new actuality of which the first immediate actuality was the presupposition here we see the alteration which is involved in the notion of a condition the conditions of a thing seem at first sight to involve no bias any way really however an immediate actuality of this kind includes in it the germ of something else altogether at first the something else is only a possibility but the form of possibility is soon suspended and translated into actuality this new actuality thus issuing is the very inside of the immediate actuality which it uses up thus there comes into being quite another shape of things and yet it is not another for the first actuality is only put as what it in essence was the conditions which are sacrificed which fall to the ground and are spent only unite with themselves in the other actuality such in general is the nature of the process of actuality the actual is no mere case of immediate being but as essential being a suspension of its own immediacy and thereby mediating itself with itself when this externality is thus developed into a circle of the two categories of possibility and immediate actuality showing the intermediation of the one by the other is what is called real possibility being such a circle further it is the totality and thus the content the actual fact or affair in its all-round definiteness whilst in like manner if we look at the distinction between the two characteristics in this unity it realises the concrete totality of the form the immediate self-translation of the inner into the outer and of the outer into the inner this self-movement of the form is activity carrying into effect the fact or affair as a real ground which is self-suspended to actuality and carrying into itself the contingent actuality the conditions i e it is their reflection in self their self-suspension to another actuality the actuality of of the actual fact and all the conditions are at hand the fact even must be actual and the fact itself is one of the conditions for being in the first place only inner it is at first itself only presupposed developed actuality as the coincident alteration of inner and outer the alteration of their opposite motions combined into a single motion is necessity necessity has been defined and rightly so as the union of possibility and actuality the mode of expression however gives a superficial and therefore unintelligible description of the very difficult notion of necessity it is difficult because it is the notion itself only that its stages or factors are still as actualities which are yet at the same time to be viewed as forms only collapsing and transient in the two following paragraphs therefore an exposition of the factors which constitute necessity must be given at greater length when anything is said to be necessary the first question we ask is why anything necessary accordingly comes before us as something due to a supposition the rest of certain antecedents if we go no further than to mere derivation from antecedents however we have not gained a complete notion of what necessity means what is merely derivative is what it is not through itself but through something else and in this way it too is merely contingent 
What is necessary, on the other hand, we would have be what it is through itself, and thus, although derivative, it must still contain the antecedent, whence it is derived as a vanishing element in itself. Hence we say that what is necessary it is, and thus hold it to be simple self-relation, in which all dependence on something else is removed necessity is often said to be blind if that means that in the process of necessity the end or final cause is not explicitly and overtly present the statement is correct the process of necessity begins with the existence of scattered circumstances which appear to have no interconnection and no concern one with another these circumstances are an immediate actuality which collapses and out of this negation a new actuality proceeds here we have a content which in point of form is doubled once as a content of the final realised fact and once as a content of the scattered circumstances which appear as if they were positive and make themselves at first felt in that character the latter content is in itself not and is accordingly inverted into its negative thus becoming content of the realised fact the immediate circumstances fall to the ground as conditions but are at the same time restrained as content of the ultimate reality from such circumstances and conditions there has as we say proceeded quite another thing and it is for that reason that we call this process of necessity blind if on the contrary we consider teleological action we have in the end of action a content which is already foreknown this activity therefore is not blind but seeing to say that the world is ruled by providence implies that design as what has been absolutely predetermined is the active principle so that the issue corresponds to what has been foreknown and forewilled the theory however which regards the world as determined through necessity and the belief in a divine providence are by no means mutually exclusive points of view the intellectual principle underlying the idea of divine providence will hereafter be shown to be the notion but notion is the truth of necessity which contains in suspension in itself just as conversely necessity is the notion implicit necessity is blind only so long as it is not understood there is nothing therefore more mistaken than the charge of blind fatalism made against the philosophy of history when it takes for its problem to understand the necessity of every event the philosophy of history rightly understood takes the rank of a theodicy and those who fancy they honour divine providence by excluding necessity from it are really degrading it by the exclusiveness to a blind and irrational caprice in the simple language of the religious mind which speaks of god's eternal and immutable decrees there is implied an express recognition that necessity forms a part of the essence of god in his difference from god man with his own private opinion and will follows the call of caprice and arbitrary humour and thus often finds his acts turn out to be something quite different from what he had meant and willed but god knows what he wills is determined in his eternal will neither by accident from within nor from without and what he wills he also accomplishes irresistibly necessity gives a point of view which has important bearing upon our sentiments and behaviours when we look upon events as necessary our situation seems at first to sight to lack freedom completely in the creed of ancients as we know necessity figured as destiny the modern point of view on the contrary is that of consolation and consolation means that if we renounce our aims and interests we do so only in prospect of receiving compensation destiny on the contrary leaves no room for consolation but a close examination of ancient feeling about destiny will not by any means reveal a sense of bondage to its power rather the reverse this will clearly appear if we remember that the sense of bondage springs from inability to surmount the antithesis and from looking at what is and what happens as contradictory to what ought to be and happen in the ancient mind the feeling was more of the following kind because such a thing is it is and as it is so ought it to be here there is no contrast to be seen and therefore no sense of bondage no pain and no sorrows true indeed as already remarked this attitude towards destiny is void of consolation but then on the other hand it is a frame of mind which does not need consolation so long as personal subjectivity has not acquired its infinite significance in this point on which special stress should be laid in comparison to the ancient sentiment with that of modern and christian world by subjectivity we may understand in the first place that only the natural and finite subjectivity which its contingent and arbitrary content of private interests and inclinations all in short that we call person as distinguished from thing taking thing in the emphatic sense of the form in which we use the correct expression that it is a question of things and not of persons in this sense of subjectivity we cannot help admiring the tranquil resignation of the ancients to destiny and feeling that it is much higher and worthier mood than that of the moderns who obstinately pursue their subjective aims and when they find themselves constrained to rein the hope of reaching them console themselves with the prospect of a reward in some other shape but the term subjectivity is not to be confined merely to the bad and finite kind of it which is contrasted with the thing fact in its true subjectivity is immanent in the fact 
and subjectivity thus infinite is the very truth of the fact thus regarded the doctrine of consolation receives a newer and higher significance it is in this sense that the christian religion is to be regarded as the religion of consolation and even of absolute consolation christianity we know teaches that god wishes all men to be saved that teaching declares that subjectivity has an infinite value and the consoling power of christianity just lies in the fact that god himself is in it known as the absolute subjectivity so that inasmuch as subjectivity involves the element of particularity our particular personality too is recognised not merely as something to be solely and simply nullified but as the same thing to be preserved the god of ancient worlds were also it is true looked upon as personal but the personality of a zeus and apollo is not a real personality it is only a figure in the mind in other words these gods are mere personifications which being such do not know themselves and are only known an evidence of this defect and this powerlessness of the old gods is found in the religious belief of antiquity in ancient creeds not only men but even gods were represented as subject to destiny a destiny which we must conceive as necessity not unveiled and thus as something wholly impersonal selfless and blind on the other hand the christian god is god not known merely but also self-knowing he is a personality not merely figured in our minds but rather absolutely actual we refer to the philosophy of religion for a further discussion of the points here touched but we may note in passing how important it is for any man to meet everything that befalls him with the spirit of the old proverb which describes each man as the architect of his own fortune that means that it is only himself after all of which a man has the usufruct the other way would be to lay the blame of whatever we experience upon other men upon unfavourable circumstances and the like and this is a fresh example of language of unfreedom at the same time the spring of discontent if man saw on the contrary that whatever happens to him is the only outcome of himself and that he only bears his own guilt he would stand free and in everything that came upon him would have the consciousness that he suffered no wrong a man who lives in displace with himself and his lot commits much that is perverse and amiss for no other reason than because of the false opinion that he is wronged by others no doubt too there is a great deal of chance in what befalls us but the chance has its root in the natural man so long however as man is otherwise conscious that he is free his harmony of soul and peace of mind will not be destroyed by the disagreeables that befall him it is their view of necessity therefore which is at the root of content and discontent of men and which in that determines their destiny itself among the three elements in the process of necessity the condition the fact and the activity the condition is what is presupposed or antistated i e it is not only supposed or stated and so only a correlative to the fact but also prior and so independent a contingent and external circumstance which exists without respect to the fact while thus contingent however this presupposed or antistated term in respect with all of the fact which is the totality is a complete circle of conditions the conditions are passive are used as materials for the fact into the content of which they thus enter they are likewise intrinsically conformable to this content and already contain its whole characteristic the fact is also something presupposed or antistated i e it is at first and as only supposed only inner and possible and also being prior and independent content by itself by using up the conditions it receives its external existence the realization of the articles of its content which reciprocally correspond to the conditions so whilst it presents itself out of these as the fact it also proceeds from them the activity similarly has an independent existence of its own as a man a character and at the same time it is possible only where the conditions are and the fact it is the movement which translates the conditions into fact the latter into the former as the side of existence or rather the movement which deduces the fact from the conditions in which it is potentially present and which gives existence to the fact by abolishing the existence possessed by the conditions in so far as these three elements stand to each other in the shape of independent existences this process is the aspect of an outward necessity outward necessity has a limited content for its fact for the fact is the whole in phase of singleness but since in its form this holds external to itself it is self-externalized even in its own self and in its content and this externality attached to the fact is a limit of its content necessity then is potentially the one essence self-same but now full of content and the reflected light of which its distinctions take the form of independent realities this self-sameness is at the same time as absolute form the activity which reduces into dependency and mediates into immediacy whatever is necessary is through another which is broken up into mediating ground the fact and the activity 
an immediate actuality or accidental circumstance which is at the same time a condition the necessary being through another is not in and for itself hypothetical it is a mere result of assumption but this intermediation is just as immediately however the abrogation of itself the grounding contingent condition is translated into immediacy by which that dependency is now lifted up into actuality and the fact has closed with itself in this return to itself the necessary simply and positively is an unconditioned actuality the necessary is so mediated through a circle of circumstances it is so because the circumstances are so and at the same time it is so unmediated it is so because it is relationship of substantiality the necessary is in itself an absolute correlation of elements i e the process is developed in preceding paragraphs in which the correlation also suspends itself to absolute identity in its immediate form it is the relationship of substance and accident the absolute self-identity of this relationship is substance as such which as necessity gives the negative to this form of inwardness and thus invests itself with actuality but which also gives the negative to this outward thing in this negativity the actual as immediate is only an accidental which through this bare possibility passes over into another actuality this transition into identity of substance regarded as form activity substance is accordingly the totality of accidents revealing itself in them and in their absolute negativity that is to say as absolute power and at the same time as the wealth of all content this content however is nothing but the very revelation since the character being reflected in itself to make content is only a passing stage of the form which passes away in the power of substance substantiality is the absolute form activity and the power of necessity all content is but a vanishing element which merely belongs to this process where there is an absolute revulsion of form and content into another in the history of philosophy we meet with the substance as the principle of spinoza's system on the import and value of that much praised and no less decried philosophy there has been great misunderstanding and a deal of talking since the days of spinoza the atheism and as further charged the pantheism of the system has formed the commonest ground of accusation these cries arise because of spinoza's conception of god as substance and substance only what are we to think of this charge follows in the first instance from the place of the substance takes in the system of the logical idea though an essential stage in the evolution of the idea substance is not the same with absolute idea but the idea under the still limited form of necessity it is true that god is necessity or as we may also put it he is the absolute thing he is however no less the absolute person that he is the absolute person however is a point which the philosophy of spinoza never reached and on that side it falls short of the true notion of god which forms the content of religious consciousness in christianity spinoza was by descent a jew and it is upon the whole oriental way of seeing things according to which the nature of the finite world seems frail and transient that has founded its intellectual expression in his system this oriental view of the unity of substance certainly gives the basis for all further development still it is not the final idea it is marked by the absence of the principle of the western world the principle of individuality which first appeared under the philosophic shape contemporaneously with spinoza in the monadology of leibniz from this point we glance back to the alleged atheism of spinoza the charge will be seen to be unfounded if we remember that his system instead of denying god rather recognises that he alone really is nor can it be maintained that the god of spinoza although he is described as alone true is not the true god and therefore as good as no god if that were a just charge it would only prove that all of their systems where speculation has gone beyond a subordinate stage of the idea that the jews and mohammedans who know god only as the lord and even the many christians for whom god is merely the most high unknowable and transcendent being are as much atheists as spinoza the so-called atheism of spinoza is merely an exaggeration of the fact that he defrauds the principle of difference or finitude of its doom hence the system as it holds that there is properly speaking no world at any rate that the world has no positive being should rather be styled a cosmism these considerations will also show what it is to be said of the charge of pantheism the pantheism means as it often does a doctrine which takes finite things in their finitude and in the complex of them to be god we must acquit the system of spinoza of the crime of pantheism for in that system finite things in the world as the whole are denied all truth on the other hand the philosophy which is a cosmism is for that recently certain pantheistic the shortcoming thus acknowledged to attach the content turns out at the same time to be a shortcoming in respect of form spinoza puts substance at the head of his system and defines it as the unity of thought and extension without demonstrating how he gets to this distinction and how he traces it back to the unity of substance the further treatment of the subject proceeds in what is called the mathematical method 
definitions and axioms are first laid down after them comes a series of theorems which are proved by analytical reduction of them to these unproved postulates although the system of spinoza and that even by those who altogether reject its contents and results is praised for the strict sequence of its method such unqualified praise of form is as little justified as unqualified rejection of the content the defect of the content is that form is not known as immanent in it and therefore only approaches it as an outer and subjective form as intuitively accepted by spinoza without a previous mediation by dialectic substance as the universal negative power is as it were a dark shapeless abyss which engulfs all definite content as radically null and produces from itself nothing that has a positive subsistence of its own at the stage where substance an absolute power is the self-relating power itself merely inner possibility which determines itself to accidentality from which power the externality it thereby creates is distinguished necessity is a correlation strictly so called just as in first form of necessity it is substance this is the correlation of causality relationship of causality substance is cause in so far as substance reflects into itself against its passage into accidentality and so stands as the primary fact but again no less suspends this reflection into self its bare possibility lays itself down as the negative of itself and thus produces an effect an actuality which though so far only assumed as a sequence is through the process that effectuates it at the same time necessary as primary fact the cause is qualified as having absolute independence and a subsistence maintained in the face of the effect but in the necessity whose identity constitutes the primariness itself it is wholly passed into the effect so far again as we can speak of a definite content there is no content in the effect that is not in the cause that identity in fact is the absolute content itself but it is no less also the form characteristic the primariness of the cause is suspended in the effect in which cause makes itself a dependent being the cause however does not for that reason vanish and leave the effect to be alone actual for this dependency is in like manner directly suspended and is rather the reflection of the cause in itself its primariness in short it is in the effect that the cause first becomes actual and a cause the cause consequently is in full truth causa sui jacobi sticking to the partial conception of mediation in his letters on spinoza second edit has treated the causa sui and the effectus sui as the same which is the absolute truth of the cause as a mere formalism he has also made the remark that god ought to be defined not as the ground of things but essentially as cause a more thorough consideration of nature of cause would have shown that jacobi did not by this means gain what he intended even in the finite cause and its conception you can see this identity between cause and effect in point of content the rain the cause and the wet the effect are the self-same existing water in point of form the cause rain is dissipated or lost in the effect wet in that case the result no longer can be described as effect for without the cause it is nothing we should have only unrelated wet left in the common acceptation of causal relation the cause is finite to such extent as its content is so as it is also the case with the finite substance in so far as cause and effect are conceived as two several independent existences which they are however only when we leave the causal relation out of sight in the finite sphere we never get over the difference of the form characteristics in their relation and hence we turn the matter round and define the cause also as something dependent or as an effect this again has another cause and thus there grows up a progress from effects to causes ad infinitum there is a descending progress too the effect looked at in its identity with the cause is itself defined as a cause and at the same time as another cause which again has other effects and so on for ever the way understanding bristles up against the idea of substance is equalled by its readiness to use relation of cause and effect whether it is proposed to view any sum of fact as necessary is especially the relation of causality to which the reflective understanding makes a point of tracing it back now although this relation does and undoubtedly belong to necessity it forms only one aspect in the process of that category that process equally requires the suspension of mediation involved in causality and the exhibition of it as simple self-relation if we stick to causality as such we have it not in its truth such a causality is a merely finite and its finitude lies in retaining the distinction between cause and effect unassimilated but these two terms if they are distinct are also identical even in ordinary consciousness the identity may be found we say that a cause is a cause only when it has an effect and vice versa both cause and effect are thus one and the same content and the distinction between them is primary only that the one lays down and the other is laid down this formal difference however again suspends itself because the cause is not only a cause of something else but also a cause of itself 
while the effect is not only an effect of something else but also an effect of itself the infinitude of things consists accordingly in this while cause and effect are in their notion identical the two forms present themselves severed so that though the cause is also an effect the effect is also a cause and the cause is not an effect in the same connection as its cause nor the effect a cause in the same connection as it is an effect this again gives the infinite progression in the shape of an endless series of causes which shows itself at the same time as an endless series of effects the effect is different from the cause the former as such has being dependent on the latter but such a dependence is likewise reflection into self and immediacy and the action of the cause as it constitutes the effect is at the same time the pre-constitution of the effect so long as effect is kept separate from cause there is thus already in existence another substance on which the effect takes place as immediate the substance is not self-related negativity and active but passive yet it is a substance and it is therefore active also therefore suspends the immediacy it was originally put forward with and the effect which was put into it it reacts i.e. suspends the activity of the first substance but this first substance also in the same way sets aside its own immediacy or the effect which is put into it it thus suspends the activity of the other substance and reacts this inner causality passes into a relation of action and reaction or reciprocity in reciprocity although causality is not yet invested with its true characteristic the rectilinear movement out from causes to effects from effects to causes is bent round and back into itself and this progresses ad infinitum of causes and effects and thus the progress ad infinitum of causes and effects is as a progress really and truly suspended this bend which transforms the infinite progression into a self-contained relationship here is always the plain reflection that in the above meaningless repetition there is only one and the same thing viz one cause and another and their connection with one another reciprocity which is the development of this relation itself however only distinguishes turn and turn about not causes but factors of causation in each of which just because they are inseparable on principle of identity that the cause is a cause in the effect and vice versa the other factor is also equally supposed reciprocity or action and reaction the characteristic which in reciprocal action are retained as distinct are potentially the same the one side is a cause is primary active passive etc just as the other is similarly the presupposition of another side and the action upon it the immediate primariness and the dependence produced by the alternation are one and the same on both sides the cause assumed to be first is on account of its immediacy passive a dependent being and an effect the distinction of the causes spoken of as two is accordingly void and properly speaking there is only one cause which while it suspends itself as substance in its effect also rises in this operation only to independent existence as a cause but this unity of double cause is also actual all this alternation is properly the cause in act of constituting itself and in such constitution lies its being the nullity of the distinctions is not only potential or reflection of ours reciprocal action just means that each characteristic we impose is also to be suspended and inverted into its opposite and that in this way the essential nullity of the moments is explicitly stated an effect is introduced into the primariness in other words the primariness is abolished the action of a cause becomes reaction and so on reciprocal action realizes the causal relation in its complete development it is this relation therefore in which reflection usually takes shelter when the conviction grows that things can no longer be studied satisfactorily from a causal point of view on account of the infinite progress already spoken of thus in historical research the question may be raised in a first form whether the character and manner of a nation are the cause of its constitution and its laws or if they are not rather the effect then as the second step to the character and manners on one side the constitution and laws on the other are conceived on the principle of reciprocity and in that case the cause in the same connection as it is a cause will at the same time be an effect and vice versa the same thing is done in the study of nature and especially of living organisms there are several organs and functions that are similarly seen to stand each other in relation of reciprocity reciprocity is undoubtedly the proximate truth of the relation of cause and effect and stands so to say on the threshold of notion but on that very ground supposing that our aim is a thoroughly comprehensive idea we should not rest content with applying this relation if we get no further than studying a given content under the point of view of reciprocity we are taking up an attitude which leaves matters utterly incomprehensible we are left with a mere dry fact and the call for mediation which is the chief motive in applying the relation of causality is still unanswered if we look more narrowly into the dissatisfaction felt in applying the relation of reciprocity we shall see that it consists in the circumstance that this relation instead of being treated as an equivalent for the notion 
ought first of all to be known and understood in its own nature and to understand the relation of action and reaction we must not let two sides rest in their state of mere given facts but recognise them as has been shown into two paragraphs preceding for factors of a third and higher which is the notion and nothing else to make for example the manners of spartans the cause of their constitution and their constitution conversely the cause of their manners may no doubt be in the way correct but as we have comprehended neither the manners nor the constitution of the nation the results of such reflection can never be final or satisfactory the satisfactory point will be reached only when these two as well as all other special agents of spartan life and spartan history are seen to be founded in this notion this pure self-reciprocation is therefore necessity unveiled or realised the link of necessity qua necessity is identity as still inward and concealed because it is the identity of what are esteemed actual things although their very self-subsistence is bound to be necessity the circulation of substance through causality and reciprocity therefore only expressly makes out or states that self-subsistence is the infinite negative self-relation a relative negative in general for in the act of distinguishing and intermediating becomes a primariness of actual things independent one against the other an infinite self-relation because their independence only lies in their identity this truth of necessity therefore is freedom and the truth of substance is the notion an independence which though self-repulsive into distinct independent elements yet in that repulsion is self-identical in the movement of reciprocity still at home conversant only with itself necessity is often called hard and rightly so if we keep only to necessity as such i e to its immediate shape here we have first of all some state or generally speaking fact possessing an independent subsistence a necessity primarily implies that there falls upon such a fact something else by which is brought low this is what is hard and sad in necessity immediate or abstract the identity of two things which necessity presents is bound to each other and thus bereft of their independence is at first only inward and therefore has no existence for those under the yoke of necessity freedom too from this point of view is only abstract and is preserved only by renouncing all that we immediately are and have but as we have already seen the process of necessity is so directed that it overcomes the rigid externality which it first had and reveals its inward nature it then appears that the members linked to one another are not really foreign to each other but only elements of one whole each of them in its connection with the other being as it were at home and combining with itself in this way necessity is transfigured into freedom not the freedom that consists in abstract negation but freedom concrete and positive from which we may learn what a mistake it is to regard freedom and necessity as mutually exclusive necessity indeed qua necessity is far from being freedom yet freedom presupposes necessity and contains it as unsubstantial element in itself a good man is aware that the tenor of his conduct is essentially obligatory and necessary but this consciousness in so far as making an abatement from his freedom that without it real and reasonable freedom could not be distinguished from arbitrary choice or freedom which has no reality is merely potential a criminal when punished may look upon his punishment as a restriction of his freedom really the punishment is not foreign constraint to which he is subjected but the manifestation of his own act and if he recognises this he comports himself as a free man in short man is most independent when he knows himself to be determined by the absolute idea throughout it was this phase of mind and conduct which spinoza calls amor intellectualis dei thus the notion is the truth of being in essence inasmuch as the shining or show of self-reflection is itself at the same time independent and immediacy and this being of a different actuality is immediately only a shining or show on itself the notion has exhibited itself as the truth of being in essence as the ground to which the regress of both leaves conversely it has been developed out of being as its ground the former aspect of the advance may be regarded as a concentration of being into its depth thereby disclosing its inner nature the latter aspect as issuing of the more perfect from the less perfect when such development is viewed on the latter side only it does prejudice to the method of philosophy the special meaning which these superficial thoughts of more imperfect and more perfect have in this place is to indicate the distinction of being as an immediate unity with itself from the notion as free mediation with itself since being has shown that it is an element in the notion the latter has thus exhibited itself as the truth of being as this its reflection in itself and as an absorption of the mediation the notion is the presupposition of the immediate a presupposition which is identical with the return to self and in this identity lie freedom and the notion if the partial element therefore be called the imperfect then the notion or the perfect is certainly a development from the imperfect since its very nature is thus to suspend its presupposition and at the same time it is the notion alone which in the act of supposing itself makes its presupposition as has been made apparent in causality in general and especially in reciprocal action 
Thus, in reference to being and essence, the notion is defined as essence reverted into the simple immediacy of being, the shining or show of essence thereby having actuality, and its actuality being at the same time a free shining or show in itself. In this manner, the notion that has been as its simple self relation, or as the immediacy of its immanent unity, being is so poor a category that it is the least thing which can be shown to be found in the notion. The passage from necessity to freedom, or from actuality into the notion, is the very hardest because it prov- proposes that independent actuality shall be thought as having all its substantiality in the passing over an identity with the other independent actuality the notion too is extremely hard because it is itself just this very identity but the actual substance as such the cause which in its exclusiveness resists all invasion is ipso facto subjected to necessity or the destiny of passing into dependency and it is the subjection rather than where the chief hardness lies to think necessity on the contrary rather tends to melt that hardness for thinking means that in the other one meets with one's self it means liberation which is not the flight of abstraction but consists in that which is actually having itself not as something else but as its own being and creation the other actuality with which itself is bound up by force of necessity as existing in an individual form this liberation is called i as developed to its totality it is free spirit as feeling it is love and as enjoyment it is blessedness the great vision of substance in spinoza is only a potential liberation from finite exclusiveness and egoism but the notion itself realises for its own both the power of necessity and actual freedom when as now the notion is called the truth of being and essence we must expect to be asked why we do not begin with the notion the answer is that where knowledge by thought is our aim we cannot begin with the truth because the truth when it forms the beginning must rest on mere assertion the truth when it is thought must as such verify itself to thought if the notion were put at the head of logic and defined quite correctly in point of content as the unity of being and essence the following question would come up what are we to think under the terms being and essence and how do they come to be embraced in the unity of the notion but if we answered these questions then our beginning with the notion would be merely nominal the real start would be made with being as we have done with this difference that characteristics of being as well as those of essence would have to be accepted uncritically from figure at conception whereas we have observed being and essence in their own dialectical development and learned how they lose themselves in the unity of the notion End of part four of chapter eight. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Part one of chapter nine of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter 9. Third Subdivision of Logic. The Doctrine of Notion. The notion is the principle of freedom, the power of substance self-realized. It is a systematic whole in which each of the constituent functions is the very total of which the notion is, and is put as indissolubly one with it. Thus, in its self-identity it has original and complete determinateness the position taken up by the notion is that of absolute idealism philosophy is a knowledge through notions because it sees what on other grades of consciousness is taken to have being and to be naturally or immediately independent is but a constituent stage in the idea in the logic of understanding the notion is generally reckoned a mere form of thought and treated as a general conception it is to this inferior view of the notion that the assertion refers so often urged on behalf of the heart and sentiment that notions as such are something dead empty and abstract the case is really quite the reverse the notion is on the contrary the principle of all life and thus possesses at the same time a character of thorough concreteness that it is so follows from the whole logical movement up to this point and need not be here proved the contrast between form and content which is thus used to criticise the notion when it is alleged to be merely formal has like all other contrasts upheld by reflection been already been left behind and overcome dialectically or through itself the notion in short is what contains all the earlier categories of thought merged in it it certainly is a form but an infinite and creative form which includes but at the same time releases from itself the fullness of all content and so too the notion may if it be wished be styled abstract if the name concrete is restricted to the concrete facts of sense or of immediate perception 
for the notion is not palpable to the touch and when we engage with it hearing and seeing must quite fail us and yet as it was before remarked the notion is a true concrete for the reason that it involves being and essence and the total wealth of these two spheres with them merged into the unity of thought if as was said in an earlier point the different stages of the logical idea are to be treated as a series of definitions of the absolute the definition which now results for us is that the absolute is the notion that necessitates a higher estimate of the notion however than is found in formal conceptual logic where the notion is a mere form of our subjective thought with no original content of its own but if speculative logic thus attaches a meaning to the term notion so very different from that usually given it may be asked why the same word should be employed in two contrary acceptations and on occasion thus given for confusion and misconception the answer is that great as the interval is between the speculative notion and the notion of formal logic closer examination shows that the deeper meaning is not so foreign to the general usages of language as it seems at first sight we speak of the deduction of a content from the notion for example of the specific provisions of the law of property from the notion of property and so again we speak of tracing back these material details to the notion we thus recognise that the notion is no mere form without a content of its own for if it were there would be in the one case nothing to deduce from such a form and in the other case to trace a given body of fact back to the empty form of the notion would only rob the fact of its specific character without making it understood the onward movement of the notion is no longer either a transition into or reflection on something else but development for in the notion the elements distinguished are without more ado at the same time declared to be identical with one another and with the whole and the specific character of each is a free being of the whole notion transition into something else is the dialectical process within the range of being reflection bringing something else into light is the range of essence the movement of the notion is development by which that only is explicit which is already implicitly present in the world of nature it is organic life that corresponds to the grade of the notion thus for example the plant is developed from its germ the germ virtually involves the whole plant but does so only ideally or in thought and it would therefore be a mistake to regard the development of the root stem leaves and other different parts of the plant as meaning that they were realiter present but in a very minute form in the germ that is the so-called box within box hypothesis a theory which commits the mistake of supposing an actual existence of what is at first found only as a postulate of the complete thought the truth of the hypothesis on the other hand lies in its perceiving that in the process of development the notion keeps to itself and only gives rise to alteration of form without making any addition in point of content it is this nature of the notion this manifestation of itself in its process as development of its own self which is chiefly in view with those who speak of innate ideas or who like plato describe all learning merely as reminiscence of course that again does not mean that everything which is embodied in a mind after that mind has been formed by instruction have been present in the mind beforehand in its definitely expanded shape the movement of the notion is as it were to be looked upon as mere play the other which it sets up is in reality not another or it is expressed in the teaching of christianity not merely has god created a world which confronts him as another he is also from all eternity begotten a son in whom he a spirit is at home with himself the doctrine of notion is divided into three parts one the first is the doctrine of the subjective or formal notion two the second is the doctrine of the notion invested with the character of immediacy or of objectivity three the third is the doctrine of the idea the subject object the unity of notion and objectivity the absolute truth the common logic covers only the matters which come before us here as a portion of the third part of the whole system together with the so-called laws of thought which we have already met and in the applied logic it adds a little about cognition this is combined with psychological metaphysical and all sorts of empirical materials which were introduced because when all was done those forms of thought could not be made to do all that was required of them but with these additions the science lost its unity of aim then there was a further circumstance against common logic those forms which at least do belong to the proper domain of logic are supposed to be categories of conscious thought only of thought too in the character of understanding not of reason the preceding logical categories those viz being in essence are it is true no mere logical modes or entities they are proved to be notions in their transition or their dialectical element and in return into themselves and totality but they are only in a modified form notions notions rudimentary or what is the same thing notions for us the antithetical term into which each category passes or in which it shines so producing correlation is not characterised as a particular 
The third, in which they return to unity, is not characterised as a subject or an individual, nor is there any explicit statement that the category is identical in its antithesis. In other words, its freedom is not expressly stated. And all this because the category is not universality. What generally passes current under the name of a notion is a mode of understanding, or even a mere general representation, and therefore, in short, a finite model of thought the logic of the notion is usually treated as a science of form only and understood to deal with the form of notion judgment syllogism as form without in the least touching on the question of whether anything is true the answer to that question is supposed to depend on the content only if the logical form of the notion were really dead and inert receptacles of conceptions and thoughts careless of what they contained knowledge about them would be an idle curiosity which the truth might dispense with on the contrary they really are as forms of the notion the vital spirit of the actual world that only is true of the actual which is true in virtue of these forms through them and in them and yet however the truth of these forms has never been considered or examined on their own account any more than their necessary interconnection a the subjective notion the notion as notion the notion as notion contains the three following moments or functional parts one the first is universality meaning that it is free equality with itself in its specific character two the second is particularity that is the specific character in which the universal continues serenely equal to itself three the third is individuality meaning the reflection into self of the specific characters of universality and particularity which negative self-unity has complete and original determinateness without any loss to its self-identity or universality individual and actual are the same thing only the former is issued from the notion and is thus as a universal stated expressly as a negative identity with itself the actual because it at first is no more than a potential or immediate unity of essence and existence may possibly have effect but the individuality of the notion is the very source of effectiveness effective moreover no longer as the cause is with the showing of affecting something else but effective of itself individuality however is not to be understood to mean the immediate or natural individual as when we speak of individual things or individual men for that special phrase of individuality does not appear till we come to the judgment every function and moment of the notion is itself a whole notion but the individual or subject is the notion expressly put as a totality the notion is generally associated in our minds with abstract generality and on that account is often described as a general conception we speak accordingly of the notions of colour plant animal etc they are supposed to be arrived at by neglecting the particular features which distinguish the different colours plants and animals from each other and retaining those common to them all this is the aspect of the notion which is familiar to understanding and feeling is in the right when it stigmatises such hollow and empty notions as mere phantoms and shadows but the universal of the notion is not a mere sum of features common to several things confronted by a particular which enjoys an existence of its own it is on the contrary self particular particularizing or self-specifying and with undimmed clearness finds itself at home in its antithesis for the sake of both cognition and of our practical conduct it is of the utmost importance that the real universal should not be confused with what is merely held in common all those charges with the devotees of feeling make against thought and especially against philosophic thought and the reiterated statement that it is dangerous to carry thought to what they call too great lengths originate in the confusion of these two things the universal in its true and comprehensive meaning is the thought which as we know cost thousands of years to make it enter into the consciousness of men the thought did not gain full recognition till the days of christianity the greeks in other respects so advanced knew neither god nor even man in their true universality the gods of the greeks were only particular powers of the mind and the universal god the god of all nations was to the athenians a god concealed they believed in the same way that an absolute gulf separated themselves from the barbarians man as man was not then recognised to be the infinite worth and to have infinite rights the question has been asked why slavery has vanished from modern europe one special circumstance after another has been adduced in the explanation of this phenomenon but the real ground why there are no more slaves in christian europe is only to be found in the very principle of christianity itself the religion of absolute freedom only in christendom is man respected as man in his infinitude and universality what the slave is without is the recognition that he is a person and the principle of personality is universality the master looks upon his slave not as a person but as a selfless thing the slave is not himself reckoned an i his eye is his master the distinction referred to above between what is merely in common and what is truly universal is strikingly expressed by rousseau in his famous contrat social when he says the laws of a state must spring from the universal will 
volon général, but need not on that account be the will of all, volon de tout. Rousseau would have made a sounder contribution towards the theory of the state if he had always kept the distinction in sight. The general will is the notion of the will, and the laws are special clauses of this will based upon the notion of it. We add a remark upon account of origin and formation of notions which is usually given in the logic of understanding. It is not we who frame the notions. The notion is not something which is originated at all. No doubt the notion is not mere being or the immediate. It involves mediation, but the mediation lies in itself. In other words, the notion is what is mediated through itself and with itself. It is a mistake to imagine the objects of which form the content of our mental ideas come first and that our subjective agency then supervenes, and by aforesaid operation of abstraction and by colligating the points possessed in common by the objects, frames notions of them. Rather, the notion is the genuine first, and things are what they are through the action of the notion imminent in them, revealing itself in them. In religious language we express this by saying that God created the world out of nothing. In other words, the world and the finite things have issued from the fullness of the divine thoughts and the divine decrees. Thus religion recognises thought and, more exactly, the notion to be the infinite form, or the free creative activity, which can realise itself without the help of a matter that exists outside it. The notion is concrete out and out, because the negative unity with itself as characterization, pure and entire, which is individuality, is just what constitutes its self-relation, its universality. The functions or moments of the notion are to this extent indissoluble. The categories of reflection are expected to be severally apprehended and separately accepted as current apart from their opposites. But in the notion, where their identity is expressly assumed, each of its functions can be immediately apprehended only from and with the rest. Universality, particularity, and individuality are, taken in the abstract, the same as identity difference and ground. But the universal is the self-identical, with the express qualification that it simultaneously contains the particular and the individual. Again, the particular is the different or the specific character, but with the qualification that it is in itself universal and is as an individual. Similarly, the individual must be understood to be the subject or substratum, which involves the genus and species in itself and possesses a substantial existence. Such is the explicit or realised inseparability of the functions of the notion in their difference, what may be called the clearness of the notion in which each distinction causes no dimness or interruption, but is quite as much transparent. No complaint is oftener made against the notion than that it is abstract. Of course it is abstract, if abstract means that the medium in which the notion exists is thought in general and not the sensible thing in its empirical concreteness. It is abstract also because the notion falls short of the idea. To this extent the subjective notion is still formal. This, however, does not mean that it ought to have or receive another content than its own. It is itself the absolute form, and so is all specific character, but as that character is in its truth. Although it be abstract, therefore, it is the concrete, concrete altogether, the subject as such. The absolutely concrete is the mind, the notion when it exists as notion distinguishing itself from its objectivity, which notwithstanding the distinction still continues to be its own. Everything else which is concrete, however rich it be, is not so intensely identical with itself and therefore not so concrete on its own part. Least of all what is commonly supposed to be concrete, but is only a congeries held together by external influence. What are called notions, and in fact specific notions such as man, house, animal, etc., are simply denotations and abstract representations. These abstractions retain out of all functions of the notion only that of universality. They leave particularity and individuality out of account and have no development in these directions. By so doing, they dismiss the notion. It is the element of individuality which first explicitly differentiates the elements of the notion. Individuality is the negative reflection of the notion into itself. It is in this way the first free differentiating of it as the first negation, by which the specific character of the notion is realised under the form of particularity. That is to say, the different elements are in the first place only qualified as the several elements of the notion. And secondly, their identity is no less explicitly stated, the one being said to be the other. This realised particularity of the notion is the judgment. The ordinary classification of notions as clear, distinct and adequate is no part of the notion. It belongs to psychology. Notions, in fact, are here synonymous with mental representations. A clear notion is an abstract, simple representation. A distinct notion is one where, in addition to the simplicity, there is one mark or character emphasised as a sign for subjective cognition. There is no more striking mark of the formalism and decay of logic than the favourite categories of the mark. 
the adequate notion comes nearer the notion proper or even the idea but after all it expresses only the formal circumstance that a notion or representation agrees with its object that is with an external thing the division into what are called subordinate and coordinate notions implies a mechanical distinction of universal from particular which allows only a mere correlation of them in external comparison again an enumeration of such kinds as contrary and contradictory affirmative and negative notions etc is only chance directed gleaning of logical forms which properly belong to the sphere of being or essence where they have been already examined and which have nothing to do with the specific notional character as such the true distinctions in the notion universal particular and individual may be said to constitute species of it but only when they are kept severed from each other by external reflection the imminent differentiating and specifying of the notion come to the sight in the judgment for to judge is to specify the notion the judgment the judgment is the notion in its particularity as a connection which is also a distinguishing of its functions which are put as independent and yet as identical with themselves not with one another one's first impression about the judgment is the independence of the two extremes the subject and the predicate the former we take to be a thing or term per se and the predicate a general term outside the said subject and somewhat in our heads the next point is for us to bring the latter into combination with the former and in this way frame a judgment the copula is however enunciates the predicate of the subject so that external subjective subsumption is again put in abeyance and the judgment taken as a determination of the object itself the etymological meaning of judgment or tile in german goes deeper as it were declaring the unity of the notion to be primary and its distinction to be the original partition and that is what the judgment really is in its abstract terms a judgment is expressible in the proposition the individual is the universal these are the terms under which the subject and the predicate first confront each other when the functions of the notions are taken in their immediate character or first abstraction propositions such as the particular is the universal and the individual is the particular belong to further specialization of the judgment it shows a strange want of observation in the logic books that in none of them is the fact stated that in every judgment there is such a statement made as the individual is the universal or still more definitely the subject is the predicate for example god is the absolute spirit no doubt there is also a distinction between terms like individual and universal subject and predicate but it is none the less the universal fact that every judgment states them to be identical the copula is springs from the nature of the notion to be self-identical even in parting with its own the individual and universal are its constituents and therefore characters which cannot be isolated the earlier categories of reflection in their correlations also refer to one another but their interconnection is only having and not being i e it is not the identity which is realised as identity or universality in the judgment therefore for the first time there is seen the genuine particularity of the notion for it is the speciality or distinguishing of the latter without thereby losing universality judgments are generally looked upon as combinations of notions and be it added of heterogeneous notions this theory of judgment is correct so far as it implies that it is the notion which forms the presupposition of the judgment and which in the judgment comes up under the form of difference but on the other hand it is false to speak of notions differing in kind the notion although concrete is still as a notion essentially one and the functions which it contains are not different kinds of it it is equally false to speak of a combination of two sides in the judgment if we understand the term combination to imply the independent existence of the combining members apart from the combination the same external view of their nature is more forcibly apparent when judgments are described as produced by the ascription of a predicate to the subject language like this looks upon the subject as self-subsistent outside and the predicate is found somewhere in our head such conception of the relation between subject and predicate however is at once contradicted by the copula is by saying this rose is red or this picture is beautiful we declare that it is not we who from the outside attach beauty to the picture or redness to the rose but that these are the characteristics proper to these objects an additional fault in the way which formal logic conceives the judgment is that it makes judgment look as if it were something merely contingent it does not offer any proof for the advance from notion on to judgment for the notion does not as understanding supposes stand still in its own immobility it is rather an infinite form of boundless activity as it were the punctum saliens of all vitality and thereby self-differentiating this disruption of the notion into difference of its constituent functions disruption imposed by the native act of the notion is the judgment a judgment therefore means the particularizing of the notion no doubt the notion is implicitly 
the particular but in the notion as notion the particular is not yet explicit and still remains in transparent unity with the universal thus for example we remarked before the germ of a plant contains its particular such as root branches leaves etc but these details are at first present only potentially and are not realised till the germ uncloses this unclosing is as it were the judgment of the plant the illustration may also serve to show how neither the notion nor the judgment are merely found in our head or merely framed by us the notion is the very heart of things and makes them what they are the form of a notion of an object means therefore to become aware of its notion when we proceed to a criticism or judgment of the object we are not performing a subjective act in merely ascribing this or that predicate to the object we are on the contrary observing the object in specific character imposed by its notion the judgment is usually taken in a subjective sense as an operation and a form occurring merely in self-conscious thought this distinction however has no existence on purely logical principles by which the judgment is taken in quite universal signification that all things are a judgment that is to say they are individuals which are a universality or inner nature in themselves a universal which is individualized the universality and individuality are distinguished but the one is at the same time identical with the other the interpretation of the judgment according to which it is assumed to be merely subjective as if we ascribed a predicate to a subject is contradicted by the decidedly objective expression of the judgment the rose is red gold is a metal it is not by us that something is first ascribed to them a judgment is however distinguished from a proposition the latter contains a statement about the subject which does not stand to it in any universal relationship but expresses some single action or some state or the like thus caesar was born at rome in such or such a year waged war in gaul for ten years crossed the rubicon etc are propositions but not judgments again it is absurd to say that such statements as i slept well last night or present arms may be turned into the form of a judgment a carriage is passing by would be a judgment and a subjective one at best only if it were doubtful whether the passing object was a carriage or whether or not the point of observation was in motion in short only if it were desired to specify a conception which was still short of appropriate specification the judgment is an expression of finitude things from its point of view are said to be finite because they are a judgment because their definite being and their universal nature their body and their soul though united indeed otherwise the things would be nothing are still elements in constitution which are already different and also in any case separable the abstract terms of the judgment that individual is the universal present the subject as negatively self-relating as what is immediately concrete while the predicate is what is abstract indeterminate in short the universal but the two elements are connected together by an is and thus the predicate in its universality must also contain the speciality of the subject must in short have particularity and so is realised the identity between subject and predicate which being thus unaffected by this difference in form is the content it is the predicate which first gives the subject which till then was on its own a bare mental representation or an empty name specific character and content in judgments like god is the most real of all things or the absolute is the self-identical god and absolute are mere names what they are we only learn in the predicate what the subject may be in other respects as a concrete thing is no concern of this judgment to define the subject as that of which something is said and the predicate as what is said about it is mere trifling it gives no information about the distinction between the two in point of thought the subject is primarily the individual and the predicate the universal as the judgment receives further development the subject ceases to be merely the immediate individual the predicate merely the abstract universal the former acquires the additional significations of particular and universal the latter the additional significations of particular and individual thus while the same names are given to the two terms the judgment their meaning passes through a series of changes Changes. we now go closer into the speciality of subject and predicate the subject as negative self-relation is the stable substratum in which the predicate has its subsistence where it is ideally present the predicate as the phrase is inheres in the subject further as the subject is in general and immediately concrete the specific connotation of the predicate is only one of the numerous characters of the subject the subject is ampler and wider than the predicate conversely the predicate as universal is self-subsistent and indifferent whether the subject is or not the predicate outflanks the subject assuming it under itself and hence on its side is wider than the subject the specific content of the predicate alone constitutes the identity of the two at first subject predicate and the specific content or identity are even in their relation still put in judgment as different and divergent by implication however that is in their notion they are identical for the subject is a concrete totality which means no any indefinite multiplicity but individuality alone 
the particular and the universal in an identity and the predicate too is the very same unity the copula again even while stating the identity of subject and predicate does so at first only by an abstract is conformably to such an identity the subject has to be put also in the characteristic of the predicate by this means the latter also receives the characteristic of the former so that the copula receives its full complement and full force such as the continuous specification by which the judgment through a copula charged with content comes to be a syllogism as it is primarily exhibited in the judgment this gradual specification consists in giving to originally abstract sensuous universality a specific character of allness of species of genus and finally the developed universality of the notion after we have made aware of this continuous specification of the judgment we can see a meaning and an interconnection in what are usually stated as the kinds of judgment not only does the ordinary enumeration seem purely casual but it is also superficial and even bewildering in its statement of their distinctions the distinction between positive categorical and assertory judgments is either a pure invention of fancy or is left undetermined on the right theory the different judgments follow necessarily from one another and present the continuous specification of the notion for the judgment itself is nothing but the notion specified when we look at the two preceding spheres of being and essence we see the specified notion as judgments are reproductions of these spheres but put in the simplicity of relation peculiar to the notion the various kinds of judgment are no empirical aggregate they are a systematic whole based on a principle and it was once kant's great merits to have first emphasized the necessity of showing this his proposed division according to the headings in this table of categories into judgments of quality quantity relation and modality cannot be called satisfactory partly from the merely formal application of this categorical rubric partly on account of their content still it rests upon a true perception of the fact the different species of judgment derive their features from the universal forms of the logical idea itself if we follow this clue it will supply us with three chief kinds of judgment parallel to the stages of being essence and notion the second of these kinds is required by the character of essence which is the stage of differentiation must be doubled we find inner ground for the systematization of judgments in the circumstance that when the notion which is the unity of being and essence in comprehensive thought unfolds as it does in the judgment it must reproduce these two stages in transformation proper to the notion the notion itself meanwhile is seen to mould and form genuine grade of judgment far from occupying the same level and being of equal value the different species of judgment form a series of steps the difference of which rests upon logical significance of the predicate that judgments differ in value is evident even in our ordinary ways of thinking we should not hesitate to ascribe a very slight faculty of judgment to a person who habitually framed only such judgment as this wall is green this stove is hot on the other hand we should credit with a genuine capacity of judgment the person whose criticism dealt with such questions as whether a certain work of art was beautiful whether a certain action was good and so on in judgments of the first mentioned kind the contents form only an abstract quality the presence of which can be sufficiently detected by immediate perception to pronounce a work of art to be beautiful or an action to be good requires the contrary a comparison of objects with what they ought to be i e with their notion qualitative judgment the immediate judgment is the judgment of definite being the subject is invested with universality as its predicate which is an immediate and therefore a sensible quality it may be one a positive judgment the individual is a particular but the individual is not a particular or in more precise language such a single quality is not congruous with the concrete nature of the subject this is two a negative judgment it is one of the fundamental assumptions of dogmatic logic that qualitative judgment such as the rose is red or is not red can contain truth correct they may be i e in limited circle of perception of finite conception and thought that depend on the content which likewise is finite and on its own merits untrue truth however as opposed to correctness depends solely on the form viz on the notion as it is put and the reality corresponding to it but truth of that stamp is not found in the qualitative judgment in common life the terms truth and correctness are often treated as synonymous we speak of the truth of a content when we are only thinking of its correctness correctness generally speaking concerns only the formal coincidence between our conception and its content whatever the constitution of this content may be truth on the contrary lies in the coincidence of the object with itself that is with its notion that a person is sick or that someone has committed a theft may certainly be correct but the content is untrue a sick body is not in harmony with the notion of body and there is want of congruity between theft and notion of human conduct these instances may show that an immediate judgment which an abstract quality is predicated of an immediate individual thing however correct it may be cannot contain truth the subject and predicate of it do not stand to each other in the relation of reality and notion 
we may add the untruth of the immediate judgment lies the incongruity between its form and content to say this rose is red involves in virtue of the copula is the coincidence of subject and predicate the rose however is a concrete thing and so is not red only it has also an odour a specific form and many other features not implied in the predicate red the predicate on its part is an abstract universal and is not applied to the rose alone there are other flowers and other objects which are red too the subject and predicate in immediate judgment touch as it were only in a single point but do not cover each other the case is different with the notional judgment in pronouncing an action to be good we frame the notional judgment here as we at once perceive there is a close and more intimate relation than in the immediate judgment the predicate in the latter is some abstract quality which may or may not be applied to the subject in the judgment of the notion the predicate is as it were the soul of the subject by which the subject as the body of the soul is characterised through and through this negation of a particular quality which is the first negation still leaves the connection of the subject with the predicate subsisting the predicate is in that matter a sort of relative universal of which a special phase only has been negatived to say that the rose is not red implies that it is still coloured in the first place with another colour which however would only be one more positive judgment the individual however is not a universal hence the judgment suffers disruption into one of two forms it is either a the identical judgment an empty identical relation stating that the individual is the individual or it is b what is called the infinite judgment in which we are presented with the total incompatibility of subject and predicate examples of the latter are the mind is no elephant a line is no table propositions which are correct but absurd exactly like the identical propositions a lion is a lion mind is mind propositions like these are undoubtedly true of the immediate or as it is called qualitative judgment but they are not judgments at all and can only occur in the subjective thought or even an untrue abstraction may hold its ground in their objective aspect these latter judgments express the nature of what is or of sensible things which as they declare suffer disruption into an empty identity on the one hand and on the other fully charged relation only this relation is qualitative antagonism of the things related their total incongruity the negatively infinite judgment in which the subject has no relation whatever to the predicate gets its place in the formal logic solely as nonsensical curiosity but the infinite judgment is not really a mere casual form adopted by subjective thought it exhibits the proximate result of the dialectical process in the immediate judgments preceding the positive and simply negative and distinctly displays their finitude and untruth crime may be quoted as an objective instance of the negatively infinite judgment the person committing a crime such as theft does not as in a suit about civil rights merely deny the particular right of another person to some one definite thing he denies the right of that person in general and therefore he is not merely forced to restore what he has stolen but is punished in addition because he has violated law as law i e law in general the civil lawsuit on the contrary is an instance of the negative judgment pure and simple where the mere particular law is violated whilst law in general is so far acknowledged such a dispute is precisely paralleled by negative judgment like this flower is not red by which we merely deny the particular colour of the flower but not its colour in general which may be blue yellow or another similarly death as a negatively infinite judgment is distinguished from disease as simply negative in disease merely this or that function of life is checked or negatived in death as we ordinarily say body and soul part i e subject and predicate utterly diverge judgment of reflection the individual put as individual i e as reflected into self into the judgment has a predicate in comparison with which the subject as self-relating continues to be still an other thing in existence the subject ceases to be immediately qualitative it is in correlation and interconnection with another thing with an external world in this way the universality of the predicate comes to signify this relativity for example useful or dangerous weight or acidity or again instinct are examples of such relative predicates the judgment of reflection is distinguished from the qualitative judgment by the circumstance that a predicate is not an immediate or abstract quality but of such a kind as to exhibit the subject as in relation to something else when we say for example the rose is red we regard the subject in its immediate individuality without reference to anything else if on the other hand we frame the judgment this plant is medicinal we regard the subject plant as standing in connection with something else the sickness which it cures by means of its predicate its medicinality the case is the same as the judgments like this body is elastic this instrument is useful this punishment has a deterrent influence in every one of these instances the predicate is some category of reflection they all exhibit an advance beyond the immediate individuality of the subject 
but none of them goes so far as to indicate the adequate notion of it. It is in this mode of judgment that ordinary raisonnement luxuriates. The greater the concreteness of the object in the question, the more points of view does it offer to reflection, by which, however, its proper nature or notion is not exhausted. Firstly, then, the subject, the individual as individual, in the singular judgment, is universal. But two, secondly, in this relation it is elevated above its singularity. This enlargement is external due to the subjective reflection, and at first is an indefinite number of particulars. This is seen in the particular judgment, which is obviously negative as well as positive. The individual is divided in itself. Partly it is self-related, partly related to something else. Thirdly, some are the universal. Particularity is thus enlarged to universality, where universality is modified through the individuality of the subject, and appears as allness, community, the ordinary universality of reflection. The subjective receiving, as in the singular judgment, a universal predicate, is carried out beyond its mere individual self. To say, this plant is wholesome, implies not only that the single plant is wholesome, but that some or several are so. We have thus the particular judgment, some plants are wholesome, some men are inventive, etc. By means of particularity, the immediate individual comes to lose its independence and enters into an interconnection with something else. Man, as this man, is not this single man alone. He stands beside other men and becomes one in the crowd. Just by this means, however, he belongs to his universal and is consequently raised. A particular judgment is as much negative as positive. If only some bodies are elastic, it is evident that the rest are not elastic. On this fact again depends the advance to the third form of the reflective judgment, viz. the judgment of allness. All men are mortal, all metals conduct electricity. It is as all that the universal is in the first instance generally encountered by reflection. The individuals form for reflection the foundation, or it is only our subjective action which collects and describes them as all. So far the universal has the aspect of external fastening. It holds together a number of independent individuals, which have not the least affinity towards it. The semblance of indifference is however unreal, for the universal is the ground and foundation, the root and substance of the individual. If for example we take Caius, Titus, Sempronius, and other inhabitants of a town or country, the fact that all of them are men is not merely something which they have in common but their universal or kind without which these individuals would not be at all the case is very different with the superficial generality falsely so called which really means only what attaches or is common to all individuals it has been remarked for example that men in contradistinction from the lower animals possess in common the appendage of ear-lobes it is evident however that the absence of these ear-lobes in one man or another would not affect the rest of his being character or capacities whereas it would be nonsense to suppose that caius without being a man would still be brave learned etc the individual man is what he is in particular only in so far as he is before all things a man as man and in general and that generality is not something external to or something in addition to other abstract qualities or to mere features discovered by reflection it is what permeates and includes in it everything particular the subject being thus likewise characterized as a universal there is an express identification of subject and predicate by which at the same time speciality of judgment form is deprived of all importance the unity of the content the content being the universality which is identical with the negative reflection in self of the subject makes the connection in judgment a necessary one the advance from the reflective judgment of allness to the judgment of necessity is found in our usual modes of thought when we say that whatever appertains to all appertains to the species is therefore necessary to say all plants or all men is, is the same thing as to say the plant or the man judgment of necessity the judgment of necessity i e of the identity of the content in its difference contains in predicate partly the substance of nature of the subject the concrete universal of the genus partly seeing that this universal also contains the specific character as negative the predicate represents the exclusive essential character the species this is the categorical judgment two conformably to their substantiality the two terms receive the aspect of independent actuality their identity is inward only and thus the actuality of the one is at the same time not its own but the being of the other this is the hypothetical judgment three if in this self-surrender and self-alienation of the notion its inner identity is at the same time explicitly put the universal is the genus which is self-identical in its mutually exclusive individualities this judgment which has this universal for both its terms the one time as universal the other time as the circle of itself excluding particularization in the either or as much as the as well as stands for the genus is the disjunctive judgment universality at first as a genus and now and now also the circuit of its species is thus described and expressly put as a totality the categorical judgment 
such as gold is a metal the rose is a plant is the unmediated judgment of necessity and finds within the sphere of essence its parallel in the relation of substance all things are a categorical judgment in other words they have their substantial nature forming their fixed and unchangeable substratum it is only when things are studied from the point of view of their kind and as necessity determined by the kind that the judgment first begins to be real it portrays a defective logical training to place upon the same level judgments like gold is dear and judgments like gold is a metal gold is dear as a matter of external connection between it and our wants or inclinations the cost of obtaining it in other circumstances gold remains the same as it was though that external reference is altered or removed metality on the contrary constitutes the substantial nature of gold apart from which it and all else that is in it or can be predicated of it would be unable to subsist the same is the case if we say caius is a man we express by that that whatever else he may be has worth and meaning only when it corresponds to his substantial nature or manhood but even the categorical judgment is to a certain extent defective it fails to give due place to the function or electment of particularity thus gold is a metal it is true but so are silver copper iron the metality as such has no leaning to any of its particular species in these circumstances we must advance from the categorical to the hypothetical judgments which may be expressed in the formula if a is b is the present case exhibits the same advance as formerly took place from a relation of substance to the relation of cause in the hypothetical judgment the specific character of the content shows itself mediated and dependent on something else and this is exactly the relation of cause and effect and if we were to give a general interpretation of the hypothetical judgment we should say that it is expressly realizes the universal in its particularizing this brings us to the third form of the judgment of necessity the disjunctive judgment a is either b or c or d a a work of poetic art is either epic or lyric or dramatic colour is either yellow or blue or red the two terms in the disjunctive judgment are identical the genus is the sum total of the species and the sum total of the species is the genus this unity of universal and particular is the notion and it is the notion which as we now see forms the content of the judgment judgment of the notion the judgment of the notion has for its content the notion the totality in simple form the universal with its complete speciality the subject is one in the first place an individual which has for its predicate the reflection of the particular existence on its universal or the judgment states the agreement or disagreement of these two aspects that is the predicate is such a term as good true correct this is the assertory judgment judgments such as whether an object action etc is good bad true beautiful etc are those to which even ordinary language first applies the name of judgment we should never ascribe judgment to a person who frame positive or negative judgments like this rose is red this picture is green dusty etc the assertory judgment though rejected by society is out of place when it claims authority on its own showing has however been made a single and all essential form of doctrine even in philosophy the influence of the principle of immediate knowledge and faith in the so-called philosophic work which maintain this principle we may read hundreds and hundreds of assertions about reason knowledge thought etc which now that external authority counts for little seek to accredit themselves by an endless restatement of the same thesis on the part of its first unmediated subject the assertory judgment does not contain the relation of particular with the universal which is expressed in the predicate this judgment is consequently a mere subjective particularity and is confronted by a contrary assertion with equal right or rather want of right it is therefore at once turned into a problematical judgment when we explicitly attach the objective particularity to the subject and make its speciality the constitutive feature of its existence the subject three then expresses the connection of that object particularity with its constitution i with its genus and thus expresses what forms the content of the predicate this the immediate individuality house the genus being so and so constituted particularity is good or bad the apodictic judgment all things are a genus i e have a meaning and purpose in an individual actuality of a particular constitution and are finite because of the particular in them nay and may not conform to the universal in this manner subject and predicate are the whole judgment the immediate constitution of the subject is at first exhibited as the intermediating ground where the individuality of the actual thing meets with its universality and in this way is the ground of judgment what has been really made explicit is the oneness of subject and predicate as the notion itself filling up the empty is of the copula while its constituent elements are at the same time distinguished as subject and predicate the notion is put as their unity as a connection which serves to intermediate them in short as the syllogism end of part one of chapter nine recording by ryan smallwood
Part 2 of Chapter 9 of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter 9 The Doctrine of Notion. The Syllogism. The syllogism brings the notion and the judgment into one. It is notion, being the simple identity into which the distinction of form and the judgment have retired. It is judgment because it is at the same time set in reality, that is, put in the distinction of its terms. The syllogism is the reasonable and everything reasonable. Even the ordinary theories represent the syllogism to be the form of reasonableness, but only a subjective form, and no interconnection whatever is shown to exist between it and other reasonable content, such as the reasonable principle, a reasonable action, idea, etc. The name of reason is much and often heard and appealed to, but no one thinks of explaining its specific character or saying what it is, least of all that it has any connection with the syllogism. But formal syllogism really presents what is reasonable in such a reasonless way that it has nothing to do with any reasonable matter. But as the matter in question can only be rational in virtue of the same quality by which thought is reason, it can be made by the form only, and that form is syllogism. And what is a syllogism but an explicit putting, i.e. realising of the notion, at first in form only as stated above? Accordingly, the syllogism is the essential ground of whatever is true. And at the present stage, the definition of the absolute is that it is the syllogism, or stating the principle in a proposition, everything is a syllogism. Everything is a notion, the existence of which is the differentiation of its members or functions so that the universal nature of the notion gives itself external reality by means of particularity and thereby as a negative reflection into self makes itself an individual or conversely the actual thing is an individual which by means of particularity rises to the universality and makes itself identical with itself the actual is one but it is only the divergence from each other of the constituent elements of the notion and the syllogism represents the orbit of intermediation of its elements by which it realizes its unity the syllogism like the notion and the judgment is usually described as a form merely of our subjective thinking the syllogism it is said is the process of proving the judgment and certainly the judgment does in every case refer us to the syllogism the step from the one to the other however is not brought about by our subjective action but by the judgment itself which puts itself as syllogism and in the conclusion returns to the unity of the notion the precise point by which we pass to the syllogism is found in the apodictic judgment in it we have an individual which by means of its qualities connects itself with its universal or notion here we see the particular becoming the mediating mean between the individual and the universal this gives the fundamental form of the syllogism the gradual specification of which formally considered consists in the fact that universal and individual also occupy this place of mean this again paves the way for the passage from subjectivity to objectivity in the immediate syllogism the several aspects of the notion confront one another abstractly and stand in an external relation only we have first the two extremes which are individuality and universality and then the notion as the mean for locking the two together is in like manner only abstract particularity in this way the extremes are put as independent and without affinity either towards one another or towards their mean such a syllogism contains reason but in under notionlessness the formal syllogism of understanding in it the subject is coupled with an other character or the universal by this mediation subsumes the subject external to it in the rational syllogism on the contrary the subject is by means of the mediation coupled with itself in this manner it first comes to be a subject or in the subject we have the first germ of the rational syllogism in the following examination the syllogism of understanding according to the interpretation usually put upon it is expressed in its subjective shape the shape which it has when we are said to make such syllogisms and it really is only a subjective syllogizing such syllogism however has only an objective meaning it expresses only the finitude of things but does so in the specific mode which the form has here reached in the case of finite things their subjectivity being only thinghood is separable from their properties or their particularity but also separable from their universality not only when the universality is the bare quality of the thing and its external interconnections with other things but also when its genus and notion on the above-mentioned theory of syllogism as the rational form par excellence reason has been defined as the faculty of syllogizing whilst understanding is defined as the faculty of forming notions 
we might object to the conception on which this depends and according to which the mind is merely a sum of forces or faculties existing side by side but apart from that objection we may observe in regard to the parallelism of understanding with the notion as well as of reason with syllogism that the notion is as little a mere category of the understanding as the syllogism is without qualification definable as rational for in the first place what the formal logic usually examines is the theory of syllogism is really nothing but mere syllogism of understanding which has no claim to the honour of being made a form of rationality still less to be held as the embodiment of all reason the notion in the second place so far from being a form of understanding owns its degradation to such place entirely to the influence of that abstract mode of thought and it is not usual to draw such a distinction between a notion of understanding and a notion of reason the distinction however does not mean that notions are of two kinds it means that our own action often stops short at the mere negative and abstract form of the notion when we might also proceed to apprehend the notion in its true nature as at once positive and concrete it is for example the mere understanding which thinks liberty to be the abstract contrary of necessity whereas the adequate rational notion of liberty requires the element of necessity to be merged in it similarly the definition of god given by what is called deism is merely the mode in which the understanding thinks god whereas christianity to which he is known as the trinity contains the rational notion of god qualitative syllogism the first syllogism is the syllogism of definite being a qualitative syllogism as stated in the last paragraph its form is i p u i e a subject as individual is coupled with the universal character by means of particular quality of course the subject terminus minor has other characteristics besides individuality just as the other extreme the predicate of the conclusion or terminus major has other characteristics than mere universality but here the interest turns only on characteristics through which these terms make a syllogism the syllogism of existence is a syllogism of understanding merely at least in so far as it leaves the individual the particular and the universal to confront each other quite abstractly in this syllogism the notion is at the very height of self-estrangement we have in it an immediately individual thing as subject next some one particular aspect or property attaching to this subject is selected and in the means of property the individual turns out to be a universal thus we may say this rose is red red is a colour therefore this rose is a coloured object in this aspect of the syllogism which the common logics mainly treat of there was a time when the syllogism was regarded as an absolute rule of all cognition when a scientific statement was not held to be valid till it had been shown to follow from a process of syllogism at present on the contrary the different forms of the syllogism are met nowhere save in the manuals of logic and the acquaintance with them is considered a piece of mere pedantry of no further use either in practical life or in science it would indeed be both useless and pedantic to parade the whole machinery of the formal syllogism on every occasion and yet the several forms of syllogism make themselves constantly felt in our cognition if any one when awakening on a winter morning hears the creaking of the carriages on the street and is thus led to conclude that it has frozen hard in the night he has gone through a syllogistic operation an operation which is every day repeated under the greatest variety of conditions the interest therefore ought at least not to be less in becoming expressly conscious of this daily action of our thinking selves that confessedly belongs to the study of functions of organic life such as the processes of digestion assimilation respiration or even the process and structures of the nature around us we do not however for a moment deny that a study of logic is no more necessary to teach us how to draw correct conclusions than a previous study of anatomy and physiology is required in order to digest or breathe aristotle was the first to observe and describe the different forms or as they are called figures of syllogism in their subjective meaning and he performed this work so exactly and surely that no essential addition has ever been required but while sensible of the value of what he has thus done we must not forget that the forms of the syllogism of understanding and of finite thought altogether are not what aristotle has made use of in his properly philosophical investigations the syllogism is completely contingent in the matter of its terms the middle term being an abstract particularity is nothing but any quality whatever of the subject but the subject being immediate and thus empirically concrete has several others and could therefore be coupled with exactly as many other universalities as it possesses single qualities similarly a single particularity may have various characters in itself so that the same medius terminus would serve to connect the subject with several different universals it is more a caprice of fashion than a sense of incorrectness which has led to the disuse of ceremonious syllogizing this in the following section indicate the uselessness of such syllogizing for the ends of truth the point of view indicated in the paragraph shows how the style of syllogizing can demonstrate as the phrase goes the most diverse conclusions 
All that is requisite is to find a medius terminus from which the transition can be made to the proposition sought. Another medius terminus would enable us to demonstrate that something else, even the contrary of the last, and the more concrete an object is, the more aspects it has which may become such middle terms. To determine which of these aspects is more essential than another, again, requires a further syllogism of this kind, which fixing on the single quality can with equal ease discover in it some aspect or consideration, by which it can make good its claim to be considered necessary and important. Little as we usually think on the syllogism of understanding in the daily business of life it never ceases to play its part there in a civil suit for instance it is the duty of the advocate to give due force to the legal titles which make in favour of his client in logical language such legal title is nothing but a middle term diplomatic transactions afford another illustration of the same when for instance different powers lay claim to one in the same territory in such a case the laws of inheritance the geographical position of the country the descent and language of its inhabitants or any other ground may be emphasised as a medius terminus this syllogism if it is contingent in point of its terms is no less contingent in virtue of the form of relation which is found in it in the syllogism according to its notion truth lies in connecting two distinct things by a middle term in which they are one but connection of the extremes with the middle term the so-called premises the major and the minor premise are in case of this syllogism much more decidedly immediate connections in other words they have not a proper middle term this contradiction in the syllogism exhibits a new case of the infinite progression each of the premises evidently calls for a fresh syllogism to demonstrate it and as the new syllogism has two immediate premises like its predecessor the demand for proof is doubled at every step and repeated without end on account of its importance for experience there has been here noted a defect in the syllogism to which in this form absolute correctness had been ascribed this defect however must lose itself in the further specification of the syllogism for we are now within the sphere of the notion and therefore as well as in judgment the opposite character is not merely present potentially but is explicit to work out the gradual specification of the syllogism therefore there need only be admitted and accepted what is that each step realized by the syllogism itself through the immediate syllogism i p u the individual is mediated through a particular which the universal and in this condition put as a universal it follows that the individual subject becomes itself a universal serves to unite two extremes and to form their ground of intermediation this gives the second figure of the syllogism u i p it expresses the truth of the first it shows in other words that the intermediation has taken place in the individual and is thus something contingent the universal which in the first conclusion was specified through individuality passes over into a second figure and there now occupies the place that belongs to the immediate subject in the second figure it is concluded with the particular by this conclusion therefore the universal is explicitly put as particular and is now made to mediate between the two extremes the places of which are occupied by the two others the particular and the individual this is the third figure of the syllogism p u i what are called the figures of the syllogism being three in number for the fourth is superfluous and even absurd addition of the moderns to the three known aristotle and in their usual mode of treatment put side by side without the slightest thought of showing their necessity and still less of pointing their import and value no wonder then that the figures have been in later times treated as an empty piece of formalism they have however a very real significance derived from the necessity for every function or characteristic element of the notion to become the whole itself and to stand as mediating ground but to find out what moods of the propositions such as whether they may be universals or negatives are needed to enable us to draw a correct conclusion in different figures is a mechanical inquiry which is purely mechanical in nature and is intrinsic meaninglessness have very properly consigned to oblivion and aristotle would have been the last person to give any countenance to those who wished to attach importance to such inquiries or to the syllogism of understanding in general it is true that he describes these as well as numerous other forms of mind and nature and that he examined and expounded their specialities but in his metaphysical theories as well as his theories of nature and mind he was very far from taking as basis or criterion the syllogistic forms of the understanding indeed it might be maintained that not one of these theories would ever have come into existence or been allowed to exist if it had been compelled to submit to the laws of understanding with all descriptiveness and analytic faculty which aristotle after his fashion is sustainably strong in his ruling principle is always the speculative notion and the syllogistic understanding to which he first gave such a definite expression is never allowed to intrude in the higher domain of philosophy in their objective sense the three figures of the syllogism declare that everything rational is manifested as a triple syllogism that is to say each one of the members takes in turn the place of the extremes as well as of the mean which reconciles them 
Such, for example, is the case with the three branches of philosophy, the logical idea, nature, and mind. As we first see them, nature is the middle term which links the others together. Nature, the totality immediately before us, unfolds itself into two extremes of the logical idea and mind. But mind is mind only when it is mediated through nature. Then in the second place, mind, which you know is the principle of individuality, whereas the actualizing principle is the mean, and nature, the logical idea, are the extremes. It is mind which cognizes its essence. In the third place, the logical idea itself becomes the mean. It is absolute substance both of mind and of nature, the universal and all-pervading principle. These are the members of the absolute syllogism. In the round by which each constituent function assumes successively the place of mean, and of the two extremes their specific difference from each other has been superseded. In this form, where there is no distinction between its constituent elements, the syllogism at first has for its connective link equality, or the external identity of understanding. This is the quantitative or mathematical syllogism. If two things are equal to a third, they are equal to one another. Everybody knows that this quantitative syllogism appears as a mathematical axiom which like other axioms is said to be a principle that does not admit of proof and which indeed being self-evident does not require such proof these mathematical axioms however are really nothing but logical propositions which so far as they enunciate definite and particular thoughts are deducible from the universal and self-characterizing thought to deduce them is to give their proof that is true of the quantitative syllogism to which mathematics gives the rank of an axiom it is really the proximate result of the qualitative or immediate syllogism Finally, the quantitative syllogism is the syllogism in utter formlessness. The difference between terms which is required by the notion is suspended. Extraneous circumstances alone can decide what propositions are to be premises here, and therefore in applying the syllogism we make a presupposition of what has been elsewhere proved and established. Two results follow as to the form. In the first place, each constituent element has taken the place and performed the function of the means, and therefore of the whole, thus implicitly losing its partial and abstract character. Secondly, the mediation has been completed through the completion too is only implicit, that is, only a circle of mediations, which in turn presuppose each other. In the first figure I, P, U, the two premises I is P and P is U are yet without a mediation. The former premise is mediated in the third, the latter in the second figure. But each of these two figures again, for the mediation of its premises, presupposes the two others. In consequence of this, the mediating unity of the notion must be put no longer as an abstract particularity, but as developed unity of the individual and universal, and in the first place a reflected unity of these elements. That is to say, the individuality gets at the same time the character of universality. A mean of this kind gives the syllogism of reflection. Syllogism of Reflection if the mean in the first place be not only an abstract particular character of the subject but at the same time all the individual concrete subjects which possess that character but possess it only along with the others we have the syllogism of allness the major premise however which has for its subject the particular character the terminus medius as allness presupposes the very conclusion which ought rather have presupposed it it rests therefore on an induction in which the mean is given by the complete list of individuals such as a b c d etc on account of the disparity however between universality and an immediate and empirical individuality the list can never be complete induction therefore rests upon analogy the middle term of analogy is an individual which however is understood as equivalent to its essential universality its genus or essential character the first syllogism for its intermediation turns us over to the second and the second turns us over to the third but the third no less demands an intrinsically determinate universality or an individuality as type of the genus after the round of forms of external connection between individuality and universality has been run through in the figures of reflective syllogism by the syllogism of allness the defect in the first form of the syllogism of understanding is remedied but only to give rise to a new defect this defect is that the major premise itself presupposes what really ought to be the conclusion and presupposes it as what is thus an immediate proposition all men are mortal therefore caius is mortal all metals conduct electricity therefore copper does so in order to enunciate these major premises which when they say all mean the immediate individuals are properly intended to be empirical propositions it is requisite that the propositions about the individual man caius or the individual metal copper should previously have been ascertained to be correct everybody feels not merely the pedantry but the unmeaning formalism of such syllogism as 
all men are mortal, Caius is a man, therefore Caius is mortal. The syllogism of allness hands us over to the syllogism of induction, in which the individuals form the coupling mean. All metals conduct electricity is an empirical proposition derived from the experiments made with each of the individual metals. We thus get the syllogism of induction in the following shape. Reader's note. There's several letters in a plus shape going horizontally p i u and then going vertically is i i i and then a dot 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 which is showing the syllogism shape particular individual universal and an infinite number of individuals going down the center of the syllogism end of reader's note gold is a metal silver is a metal so is copper lead etc this is the major premise then comes the minor premise all these bodies conduct electricity and hence results the conclusion that all metals conduct electricity the point which brings about a combination here is the individuality in the shape of allness but the syllogism once more hands us over to another syllogism its means is constituted by the complete list of the individuals that presupposes over a certain region observation and experience are completed but the things in question here are individuals and so again we are landed in the progression ad infinitum i i i etc in other words in no induction can we ever exhaust the individuals the all metals all planets of our statements mean only all metals all planets which have hitherto been acquainted with every induction is consequently imperfect one and the other observation many it may be have been made but all the cases all the individuals have not been observed by this defect of induction we are led on to analogy in the syllogism of analogy we conclude from the fact that some things of a certain kind possess a certain quality that same quality is possessed by other things of the same kind it would be a syllogism of analogy for example if we said in all planets hitherto discovered this has been found to be the law of motion consequently a newly discovered planet will probably move according to the same law in the experimental sciences analogy deservedly occupies a higher place and has led to result as the highest importance analogy is the instinct of reason creating an anticipation that this or that characteristic which experience has discovered has its root in the inner nature of kind of an object and arguing on the faith of that anticipation analogy it should be added may be superficially or may be thorough it would certainly be a very bad analogy to argue that since the man caius is a scholar and titus is also a man titus will probably be a scholar too it would be bad because man's learning is not unconditional consequence of his manhood superficial analogies of this kind however are very frequently met with it is often argued for example the earth is a celestial body so is the moon and it is therefore all probability inhabited as well as the earth the analogy is not one whit better than the previously mentioned that the earth is inhabited does not depend on its being a celestial body but on other conditions such as the presence of an atmosphere and of water in connection with the atmosphere etc and these are precisely the connections which the moon so far as we know does not possess what has in modern times been called the philosophy of nature consists principally in a frivolous play with empty and external analogies which however claim to be considered profound results the natural consequence has been to discredit the philosophical study of nature syllogism of necessity the syllogism of necessity if we look to its purely abstract characteristics or terms has for its mean the universal in the same way as the syllogism of reflection has the individual the latter in being in the second and the former in the third figure the universal is expressly put in its very nature intrinsically determined in the first place one the particular meaning by the particular the specific genus or species it is the term for mediating the extremes as is done in the categorical syllogism two the same office is performed by the individual taking the individual as immediate being so that it is as much mediating as mediated as happens in the hypothetical syllogism we have also a mediating universal explicitly put as a totality of its particular members and as a single particular or exclusive individuality which happens in the disjunctive syllogism it is one and the same universal which is in these terms of the disjunctive syllogism the only different forms for expressing it the syllogism has been taken conformably to the distinctions which it contains and the general result of the course of their evolution has been shown that these differences work out in their own abolition and destroy the notion's outwardness to its own self and as we see in the first place one each of the dynamic elements has proved itself the systematic whole of these elements in short of the whole syllogism they are consequently implicitly identical 
In the second place, too, the negation of their distinctions and the mediation of one through another constitutes independency, so that it is one and the same universal which is in these forms, and which is in this way also explicitly put as their identity. In this identity of its dynamic elements, the syllogistic process may be described as essentially involving the negation of characteristics through which its course runs, as being a mediative process through the suspension of mediation, as coupling the subject not with another, but with a suspended other, in one word with itself. In common logic, the doctrine of syllogism is supposed to conclude the first part what is called the elementary theory it is followed by the second part the doctrine of method which proposes to show how a body of scientific knowledge is created by applying to existing objects the form of thought discussed in the elementary part once these objects originate and what thought of objectivity generally speaking implies are questions to which the logic of understanding vouchsafes no further answer it believes thought to be a mere subjective and formal activity and the objective fact which confronts thought to have a separate and permanent being but this dualism is a half-truth and there is want of intelligence in the procedure which at once accepts without inquiring into their origin the categories of subjectivity and objectivity both of them subjectivity as well as objectivity are certainly thoughts even specific thoughts which must show themselves founded on the universal and self-determining thought this has here been done at least for subjectivity we have recognised it or the notion subjective which includes the notion proper the judgment and the syllogism as the dialectical result of the first two main stages of the logical idea being and essence to say that the notion is subjective and subjective only is so far quite correct for the notion certainly is subjectivity itself no less subjective than the notion are also the judgment and syllogism and these forms together with the so-called laws of thought the laws of identity difference and sufficient ground make up the contents of what is called the elements in common logic but we may go a step further the subjectivity with its functions of notion judgment and syllogism is not like a set of empty compartments which has to get filled from without by separately existing objects it would be truer to say it is subjectivity itself which as dialectical breaks through its own barriers and opens out into objectivity by means of the syllogism this realization of the notion a realization in which the universal is this one totality withdrawn back into itself of which the different members are no less the whole and which has given itself a character of immediate unity by merging the mediation this realization of the notion is the object this transition from subject the notion in general and especially the syllogism to the object may at first glance appear strange particularly if we look only at the syllogism of understanding and suppose syllogizing to be only an act of consciousness but that strangeness imposes on us no obligation to seek to make transition plausible to the image loving conception the only question which can be considered is whether our usual conception of what is called an object approximately corresponds to the object as here described by object is commonly understood not an abstract being or an existing thing merely or any sort of actuality but something independent concrete and self-complete this completeness being the totality of the notion that the object object is object to us gegenstand and is external to something else will be more precisely seen when it puts itself in contrast with the subjective at present as that into which the notion has passed from its mediation it is only immediate object and nothing more just as the notion is not describable as subjective previous to the subsequent contrast with objectivity further the object in general is the one total in itself still unspecified the objective world as a whole god the absolute object the object however has also difference attaching to it it falls into pieces indefinite in their multiplicity making an objective world in each of these individualized parts is also an object and intrinsically concrete complete and independent existence objectivity has been compared with being existence and actuality and so too the transition to existence and actuality not to being for it is the primary and quite abstract immediate may be compared with the transition to objectivity the ground from which existence proceeds and the reflective correlation which is merged in actuality are nothing but the as yet imperfectly realized notion they are not abstract aspects of it the ground being its merely essence-bred unity and the correlation only the connection of the real sides which are supposed to have only self-reflected being the notion is the unity of the two the object is not a merely essence-like but inherently universal unity not only containing real distinctions but containing them as totalities in itself it is evident that in all these transitions there is a further purpose than merely to show the indissoluble connection between the notion or thought and being it has been more than once remarked that being is nothing more than simple self-relation and this meagre category certainly implied in the notion 
or even in thought but the meaning of these transitions is not to accept characteristics or categories as only implied a fault which mars even ontological argument for god's existence when it is stated that being is one among realities what such a transition does is to take the notion as it ought to be primarily characterized per se as a notion with which this remote abstraction of being or even of objectivity has yet nothing to do and looking at its specific character as notional character alone to see when and whether it passes over into a form which is different from the character as it belongs to the notion and appears in it if the object the product of this transition be brought into relation with the notion which so far as its special form is concerned has vanished in it we may give a correct expression to the result by saying that notion or if it be preferred subjectivity and object are implicitly the same but it is equally correct to say that they are different in short the two modes of expression are equally correct and incorrect the true state of the case can be presented in no expressions of this kind the implicit is an abstraction still more partial and inadequate than the notion itself of which the inadequacy is upon the whole suspended by suspending itself to the object with its opposite inadequacy hence the implicitness also must by its negation give itself the character of explicitness as in every case speculative identity is not the above-mentioned triviality of an implicit identity of subject and object this has been said often enough and it cannot be too often repeated if the intention were really to put an end to the stale and purely malicious misconception in regard to this identity of which however there can be no reasonable expectation looking at that unity in quite a general way and raising no objection to the one-sided form of its implicitness we find it as the well-known presupposition of the ontological proof for the existence of god there it appears as supreme perfection anselm in whom the notable suggestion of this proof first occurs no doubt originally restricted himself to the question whether a certain content in our critical thinking his words are briefly this certe id quo magis cogitari nequit non postest esse in intellectu solo si enem vel in solo intellectu est potest cogitari esse et in re quod magis est si ergo id quod magus cogitari non potest est in solo intellectu id ipsum quo magus cogitari non potest est quo magus cogitari potest sed certe hoc esse non potest certainly that than which is nothing greater can be thought cannot be an intellect alone for even if it is in the intellect alone it can also be thought to exist in fact and that is greater but then that than which nothing is greater can be thought is in the intellect alone then the very thing which is greater than anything which can be thought can be exceeded in thought but certainly this is impossible the same unity received a more objective expression in descartes spinoza and others while the theory of immediate certitude or faith presents it on the contrary in somewhat the same subjective aspect as anselm these intuitionalists hold that in our consciousness the attribution of being is indissolubly associated with the conception of god the theory of faith brings even the conception of the external finite things under the same inseparable nexus between the consciousness and the being of them on the ground that perception presents them conjoined with the attribute of existence and in so saying it is no doubt correct it would be utterly absurd however to suppose that the association in consciousness between existence and our conception of finite things is of the same description as the association between existence and the conception of god to do so would be to forget that finite things are changeable and transient i e that existence is associated with them for a season but the association is neither eternal nor inseparable speaking in the phraseology of the categories before us we may say that to call a thing finite means that its objective existence is not in harmony with the thought of it with its universal calling its kind and its end and some consequently neglecting any such conjunction as occurs in finite things has with good reason pronounced that only to be the perfect which exists not merely in a subjective but also in an objective mode it does no good to put on airs against our ontological proof as it is called and against anselm thus defining the perfect the argument is one latent in every unsophisticated mind and it recurs in every philosophy even against its wish without its knowledge as may be seen in the theory of immediate belief the real fault in the argumentation of anselm is one which is chargeable on descartes and spinoza as well as well as on the theory of immediate knowledge it is this this unity which is enunciated as the supreme perfection or maybe subjectively as the true knowledge is presupposed as it is assumed only as a potential this identity abstract as it thus appears between the two categories may be at once met and opposed by their diversity and this was the very answer given to anselm long ago in short the conception and existence of the finite is set in antagonism to the infinite 
For, as previously remarked, the finite possesses objectivity of such a kind as its once incongruous with and different from the end or aim, its essence and notion, or the finite such as a conception and in such a way subjective that it does not involve existence. This objection, this antithesis, are got over, and only by showing the finite to be untrue, and these categories and their separation to be inadequate and null. Their identity is thus seen to be one into which they spontaneously pass over, and which they are reconciled. End of part two of chapter nine. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Part three of chapter nine of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter nine. The doctrine of notion. B. The object. The object is immediate being, because insensible to difference, which in it has suspended itself. It is further a totality in itself, whilst at the same time, as this identity is only implicit identity of its dynamic elements, it is equally indifferent to its immediate unity. It thus breaks up into distinct parts, each of which is itself the totality. Hence the object is the absolute contradiction between the complete independence of the multiplicity and equally complete non-independence of the different pieces. The definition which states the absolute is the object is most definitely implied in the Leibnizian monad. Monads are each an object, but an object implicitly representative, indeed the total representation of the world. In the simple unity of the monad, all difference is merely ideal, not independent or real. Nothing from without comes into the monad. It is the whole notion in itself, only distinguished by its own greater or less development. Nonetheless, the simple totality into the absolute multeity of differences, each becoming an independent monad. In the monad of monads and the pre-established harmony of their inward developments, these substances are in like manner again reduced to ideality and unsubstantiality. The philosophy of Leibniz, therefore, represents contradiction in its complete development. As Fichte in modern times has especially and with justice insisted, the theory which regards the absolute or God as the object and there stops expresses the point of view taken by superstition and slavish fear. No doubt God is object, and indeed the object out and out confronted with our particular and subjective opinions and desires have no truth and no validity. As absolute object, however, God does not therefore take up the position of a dark and hostile power over against subjectivity. He rather involves it as a vital element in himself. Such also is the meaning of the Christian doctrine, according to which God has willed that all men be saved and all attain blessedness. The salvation and the blessedness of men are attained when they come to feel themselves at one with God, so that God, on the other hand, ceases to be for them mere object, and in that way an object of fear and terror so as was especially the case in the religious consciousness of the romans but god in the christian religion is also known as love because in his son who is one with him he has revealed himself to men as a man amongst men and thereby redeemed them all which is only another way of saying that the antithesis of subjective and objective is implicitly overcome and that it is our affair to participate in this redemption by laying aside our immediate subjectivity putting off the old adam and learning to know god as our true and essential self just as religion and religious worship consist in overcoming the antithesis of subjectivity and objectivity so science too and philosophy have no other task than to overcome this antithesis by the medium of thought the aim of knowledge is to divest the objective world that stands opposed to us of its strangeness and as the phrase is to find ourselves at home in it which means no more than to trace the objective world back to the notion to our innermost self we may learn from the present discussion the mistakes regarding antithesis of subjectivity and objectivity as an abstract and permanent one the two are wholly dialectical the notion is at first only subjective but without the assistance of any foreign material or stuff it proceeds in obedience of its own action to objectify itself so too the object is not rigid and processless the process is to show us what is at the same time subjective and thus form the step onwards to the idea any one who from want of familiarity with the categories of subjectivity and objectivity seeks to retain them in their abstraction will find the isolated categories slip through his fingers before he is aware and he says the exact contrary of what he wanted to say objectivity contains the three forms of mechanism 
chemism, and teleology, the object of mechanical type is the immediate and undifferentiated object. No doubt it contains difference, but the different pieces stand, as it were, without affinity to each other, and their connection is only extraneous. In chemism, on the contrary, the object exhibits an essential tendency to differentiation, in such a way that the objects are what they are only by their relation to each other. This tendency to difference constitutes their quality. The third type of objectivity, the teleological relation, is the unity of mechanism and chemism. Design like the mechanical object is a self-contained totality, enriched, however, by the principle of differentiation which came to the fore in chemism, and thus referring itself to the object that stands over against it. Finally, it is the realization of design which forms the transition to the idea. The object, in its immediacy, is the notion only potentially. The notion as subjective is primarily outside it, and all its specific character is imposed from without. As a unity of difference, therefore, it is composite and aggregate, and its capacity of acting on anything else continues to be an external relation. This is formal mechanism. Notwithstanding, and in this connection and non-independence, the object remains independent and offer resistance external to each other. Pressure and impact are examples of mechanical relations. Our knowledge is said to be mechanical or by rote when the words have no meaning for us, but continue external to sense, conception, thought, and when, being similarly external to each other, they form a meaningless sequence. Conduct, piety, etc. are in the same way mechanical when a man's behaviour is settled for him by ceremonial law, by a spiritual visor, etc. In short, when his own mind and will are not in his actions, which in this way are extraneous to himself. Mechanism, the first form of objectivity, is also the category which primarily offers itself to reflection, as it examines the objective world. It is also the category beyond which reflection seldom goes. It is, however, a shallow and superficial mode of observation. One cannot carry us through in connection with nature, and still less in connection with the world of mind. In nature it is only the veriest abstract relation of matter, in its inner masses which obey the law of mechanism. On the contrary, the phenomena and operations of the province, which the term physical in its narrower sense is applied, such as phenomena of light, heat, magnetism, and electricity, cannot be explained by any mere mechanical processes such as pressure, impact, displacement of parts, and the like. Still less satisfactory is it to transfer these categories and apply them in the field of organic nature, at least if it be our aim to understand the specific features of that field, such as the growth and nourishment of plants, or it may be even animal sensation. It is, at any rate, a very deep-seated and perhaps the main defect of modern research is into nature that even when other and higher categories than those of mere mechanism are in operation they stick obstinately to the mechanical laws although they thus conflict with the testimony of unbiased perception and foreclose the gate to an adequate knowledge of nature but even in considering the formations in the world of mind the mechanical theory has been repeatedly invested with an authority which it has no right to take as an instance the remark that man consists of soul and body in this language the two things stand each self-subsistent and associated only from without similarly we find the soul regarded as a mere group of forces and faculties subsisting independently side by side thus decidedly we must reject the mechanical mode of inquiry when it comes forward and arrogates to itself the place of rational cognition in general and seeks to get mechanism accepted as an absolute category but we must not on that account forget expressly to vindicate for mechanism the right to import a general logical category it would be therefore a mistake to restrict it to the special physical department from which it derives its name there is no harm done for example in directing attention to mechanical actions such as that is gravity the lever etc even in departments notably in physics and in physiology beyond the range of mechanics proper it must however be remembered that within these spheres the laws of mechanics cease to be final or decisive and sink as it were into a subservient position to which it may be added that in nature when the higher organic functions are in any way checked or disturbed in their normal efficiency the otherwise subordinate category of mechanism is immediately seen to take the upper hand thus the sufferer from ingestion feels pressure on the stomach after partaking of certain food in slight quantity whereas those whose digestive organs are sound remain free from sensation although they have eaten as much the same phenomenon occurs in the general feeling of heaviness in the limbs experienced in bodily indisposition even in the world of mind mechanism has its place though there too it is a subordinate one we are right in speaking of the mechanical memory and of all sorts of mechanical operations such as reading writing playing on musical instruments etc in memory indeed the mechanical quality of the action is essential a circumstance the neglect of which has not infrequently caused great harm in the training of the young 
from the misapplied zeal of the modern educationalists for the freedom of intelligence it would betray bad psychology however to have the recourse to mechanism for an explanation of the natural memory and apply mechanical laws straight off to the soul the mechanical features in memory lie merely in the fact that certain signs tones etc are apprehended in purely external association and then reproduce in this association without attention being expressly directed to their meaning and inward association to become acquainted with these conditions of mechanical memory requires no further study of mechanics nor would the study tend at all to advance the special inquiry of psychology the want of stability in itself which allows the object to suffer violence is possessed by it only in so far as it has a certain stability now as the object is implicitly invested with the character of notion the one of these characteristics is not merged into its other but the object through the negation of itself its lack of independence closes with itself and not till it so closes is it independent thus at the same time in distinction from the outwardness and negativing that outwardness in its independence does this independence form a negative unity with self centrality subjectivity so conceived the object itself has direction and reference towards the external but this external object is similarly central in itself and being so is no less only referred towards the other centre so that it no less has its centrality in the other this is mechanism with affinity with bias or difference and may be illustrated by gravitation appetite social instinct etc this relationship when fully carried out forms a syllogism in that syllogism the imminent negativity as the central individuality of an object abstract centre relates itself to non-independent objects as the other extreme by a mean which unites the centrality with the non-independence of objects relative centre this is absolute mechanism the syllogism is thus indicated i p u is a triad of syllogisms the wrong individuality of non-independent objects in which formal mechanism is at home is by reason of non-independence no less universality though it be only external hence these objects also form the mean between the absolute and the relative centre the form of syllogism being u i p for it is by this want that the independence of those two are kept asunder and made extremes as well as related to one another similarly absolute centrality as the permanently underlying universal substance illustrated by the gravity which continues identical which as pure negativity equally includes individuality in it is what mediates between the relative of centre and non-independent objects the form of syllogism being p u i it does so no less essentially as a disintegrating force in its character of imminent individuality than in virtue of universality acting as an identical bond of union and tranquil self-containedness like the solar system so for example in the practical sphere the state is a system of three syllogisms one the individual or person through his particular or physical or mental needs which when carried out to their full development give civil society is coupled with the universal i e the society law right government two the will or action of the individual is the intermediating force which procures for these needs satisfaction in society and law etc and which give to society law etc their fulfilment and actualization three but the universal that is to say the state government and law is the permanent underlying mean in which the individuals and their satisfaction have and receive their fulfilled reality intermediation and persistence each of their functions of the notion as it is brought by intermediation to coalesce in the other extreme is brought into union with itself and produces itself which production is self-preservation it is only by the nature of the triple coupling by this triad of syllogisms with the same termini that a whole is thoroughly understood in its organization the immediacy of existence which the objects have in absolute mechanism is implicitly negatived by the fact that their independence is derived from and due to their connection with each other and therefore to their own want of stability thus the object must be explicitly stated as in its existence having an affinity or a bias towards its other as non-indifferent chemism the non-indifferent biased object has an imminent mode which constitutes its nature and in which it has existence but as it is invested with the character of total notion it is the contradiction between the totality and the special mode of its existence consequently it is the constant endeavour to cancel this contradiction to make its definite being equal to the notion chemism is a category of objectivity which as a rule is not particularly emphasised and is generally put under the head of mechanism the common name of mechanical relationship is applied to both in contradistinction to the teleological 
There is a reason for this in the common feature which belongs to mechanism and chemism. In them the notion exists, but only implicit and latent, and they are thus both marked off from teleology, where the notion has real independent existence. This is true, and yet chemism and mechanism are very decidedly distinct. The object in the form of mechanism is primarily only an indifferent reference to self, while the chemical object is seen to be completely in reference to something else. No doubt even in mechanism as it develops itself there spring up references to something else, but the nexus of mechanical objects with one another is at first only external nexus, so that the objects in connection with one another still remain the semblance of independence. In nature, for example, the several celestial bodies which form our solar system compose a kinetic system, thereby show that they are related to one another. Motion, however, as the unity of time and space, is a connection which is purely abstract and external and it seems therefore as if these celestial bodies which are thus externally connected with each other would continue to be what they are even apart from this reciprocal relation the case is quite different with chemism objects chemically biased are what they are expressly by that bias alone hence they are absolute impulse towards integration by and in one another the product of the chemical process consequently is the neutral object latent in two extremes each on the alert the notion or concrete universal by means of the bias of the objects the particularity coalesces with the individuality in the shape of the product and in that only with itself in this process too the other syllogisms are equally involved the place of mean is taken both by individuality as activity and by the concrete universal the essence of the strained extremes which essence reaches definite being in the product chemism as it is reflectional nexus of objectivity has presupposed not merely the bias or non-indifferent nature of the objects but also their immediate independence the process of chemism consists in passing to and fro from one form to another which forms continue to be as external as before the neutral product the specific properties which the extremes bore towards each other are merged but although the product is conformable to the notion the inspiring principle of active differentiation does not exist in it for it has sunk back to immediacy the neutral body is therefore capable of disintegration but the discerning principle which breaks up the neutral body into biased and strained extremes which gives to the indifferent object in general its affinity and animation towards another that principle and the process as a separation with tension falls outside of that first process the chemical process does not rise above a conditioned and finite process the notion as notion is only the heart and core of the process and does not in this stage come to an existence of its own in the neutral product the process is extinct and the existing cause falls outside it each of these two processes the reduction of the biased non indifferent to the neutral and the differentiation of the indifferent or neutral goes its own way without hindrance from the other but that want of interconnection shows that they are finite by their passage into products in which they are merged and lost conversely the process exhibits the non-entity of the presupposed immediacy of the non-indifferent objects by this negation of immediacy and externalism in which the notion as object was sunk is liberated and invested with independent being in face of that externalism and immediacy in these circumstances it is the end final cause the passage from chemism to the teleological relation is implied in the mutual cancelling of both of the forms of the chemical process the result thus attained is the liberation of the notion which in chemism and mechanism was present only in the germ and not yet evolved the notion in the shape of the aim or end thus comes to an independent existence teleology in the end the notion has entered on free existence and has a being of its own by means of the negation of immediate objectivity it is characterized as subjective seeing that this negation is in the first place abstract and hence at first the relation between it and objectivity still one of contrast this character of subjectivity however compared with the totality of the notion is one-sided and that be it added for the end itself in which all specific characters have been put as subordinated and merged for it therefore even the object which it presupposes has only a hypothetical ideal reality essentially no reality the end in short is a contradiction of its self-identity against the negation stated in it i e its antithesis to objectivity and being so contains the eliminative or destructive activity which negates the antithesis and renders it identical with itself this is the realization of the end in which while it turns itself into the other of its subjectivity and objectifies itself thus cancelling the distinction between the two it has only been closed with itself and retained itself the notion of design or end while on one hand called redundant is on another justly described as the rational notion and contrasted with the abstract universal of understanding 
the latter only subsumes the particular and so connects it with itself but has it not in its own nature the distinction between the end or final cause and the mere efficient cause which is the cause ordinarily so called is of supreme importance causes properly so called belong to the sphere of necessity blind and not yet laid bare the cause therefore appears as passing into its correlative and losing its primordiality thereby sinking into dependency it is only by implication or for us that the cause in the effect made for the first time a cause and that it there returns into itself the end on the other hand is expressly stated as containing the specific character in its own self the effect namely which in the purely causal relation is never free from otherness the end therefore in its efficiency does not pass over but retains itself i e it carries into effect itself only and is at the end what it was in the beginning of primordial state until it thus retains itself it is not genuinely primordial the end then requires to be speculatively apprehended as the notion which itself in the proper unity and ideality of its characteristics contains the judgment or negation the antithesis of subjective and objective and which to an equal extent suspends that antithesis by end however we must not at once nor must we ever merely think of form which it has consciousness as a mode of mere mental representation by means of the notion or inner design kant has resuscitated the idea in general and particularly the idea of life aristotle's definition of life virtually implies inner design and is thus far in advance of the notion of design in modern teleology which had in view finite and outward design only animal wants and appetites are some of the readiest instances of the end they are felt contradiction which exists within the living subject and passes into the activity of negating this negation which mere subjectivity still is the satisfaction of the want or appetite restores peace between the subject and object the objective thing which so long as the contradiction exists i e so long as the want is felt stands on the other side loses its quasi independence by its union with the subject those who talk of the permanence and immutability of the finite as well subjective as objective may see the reverse illustrated in the operations of every appetite appetite is so to speak the conviction that the subjective is only a half truth no more adequate than the objective but appetite in the second place carries out its conviction it brings about the supersession of these finites it cancels the antithesis between the objective which would be and stay an objective only and the subjective which in like manner would be and stay a subjective only as regards the action of the end attention may be called to the fact that in syllogism which represents that action and shows the enclosing with itself by the means of realization the radical feature is the negation of the termini that negation is the one just mentioned both of the immediate subjectivity appearing in the end as such and of immediate objectivity as seen in the means and the object presupposed this is the same negation as it is in operation when mind leaves the contingent thing of the world as well as its own subjectivity and rises to god it is the moment or factor which was overlooked and neglected in analytic form of syllogisms under which the so-called proofs of the being of god presented this elevation in its primary and immediate aspect the teleological relation is external design and the notion confronts a presupposed object the end is consequently finite and that partly in its content partly in the circumstance that it has external condition in the object which has to be found existing which is taken as material for its realization its self-determining is to that extent in form only the unmediatedness of the end has the further result that its particularity or content which has form characteristics is the subjectivity of the end is reflected into self so different from the totality of the form subjectivity in general the notion this variety constitutes the finitude of design within quite limited and contingent and given as object is particular and found ready to hand generally speaking the final cause is taken to mean nothing more than external design in accordance with this view of it things are supposed not to carry their vocation in themselves but merely to be means employed and spent in realising a purpose which lies outside them this may be said to be the point of view taken by utility which once played a great part even in the sciences but of late has fallen into merited disrepute now the people have begun to see that it failed to give a genuine insight into the nature of things it is true that finite things as finite ought in justice to be viewed as non-ultimate and as pointing beyond themselves this negativity of finite things however is their own dialectic and in order to ascertain it we must pay attention to their positive content teleological observations on things often proceed from a well-meant wish to display the wisdom of god as it is especially revealed in nature now in thus trying to discover the final cause for which the things serve as means we must remember that we are stopping short at the finite and are liable to fall into trifling reflections 
as for instance if we not merely studied the vine in respect of its well-known use for man but proceeded to consider the cork tree in connection with the corks which are cut from its bark to put into the wine bottles whole books used to be written in this spirit it is easy to see that they promoted the genuine interest neither of religion nor of science external design stands immediately in front of the idea but what thus stands on the threshold often for that reason is least adequate the teleological relation is a syllogism in which the subjective end coalesces with the objectivity external to it through a middle term which is the unity of both this unity is on one hand the purposive action on the other the means i e objectivity made directly subservient to purpose the development from end to idea ensues by three stages first subjective end second end in process of accomplishment and third end accomplished first of all we have the subjective end and that as the notion in independent being is itself the totality of the elementary functions of the notion the first of these functions is that of self-identical universality as it were the neutral first water in which everything is involved but nothing as yet discriminated the second of these elements is particularizing of this universal by which it acquires the specific content as the specific content again is realized by the agency of the universal the latter returns by its means to itself and closes with itself hence too when we set some end before us we say we conclude to do something a phrase which implies that we were so to speak open and accessible to this or that determination similarly we also at a further step speak of man resolving to do something meaning that the agent steps forward out of his self-regarding inwardness and enters into dealing with the environing objectivity this applies the step from the merely subjective end to the purpose of action which tends outward the first syllogism of the final cause represents the subjective end the universal notion is brought to unite with individuality by means of particularity so that the individual as self-determination acts as judge that is to say it not only particularizes or makes into determining content the still indeterminate universal but also explicitly puts an antithesis of subjectivity and objectivity and at the same time is in its own self a return to itself for it stamps the subjectivity of the notion presupposed as against objectivity with the mark of defect in comparison with the complete and rounded totality and thereby at the same time turns outwards the action which is directed outwards is the individuality which in the subjective end is identical with the particularity under which along with the content is also comprised the external objectivity it throws itself in the first place immediately upon the object which it appropriates to itself as a means the notion is the immediate power for the notion is the self-identical negativity in which the being of the object is characterised as wholly and merely ideal the whole means then is the inward power of the notion the shape of an agency with which the object as means is immediately united in obedience to which it stands in finite teleology the means is thus broken up into two elements external to each other a the action and b the object which serves as means the relation of the final cause is power to this object and the subjugation of the object to it is immediate it forms the first premise in this syllogism to this extent that in the teleological notion as self-existent ideality the object is put as potentially null this relation as represented in the first premise itself becomes the means which at the same time involves the syllogism that through this relation in which the notion of the end is contained and dominant the end is coupled with objectivity the execution of the end is the mediated mode of realising the end but the immediate realisation is not less needful the end lays hold of the object immediately but it is the power over the object because in the end particularity and in particularity objectivity also is involved a living being has a body the soul takes possession of it and without intermediary has objectified itself in it the human soul has much to do before it makes the corporeal nature into its means man must as it were take possession of his body so that it may be the instrument of his soul purpose of action with its means is still direct outwardness because the end is not identical with the object and must consequently first be mediated with it the means in its capacity of object stands this second premise in direct relation to the other extreme of the syllogism namely the material or objectivity which is presupposed this relation is the sphere of chemism and mechanism which have now become the servants of the final cause where lies their truth and free notion thus the subjective end which is the power ruling these processes in which the objective things wear themselves out on one another contrives to keep itself free from them and to preserve itself in them doing so it appears as the cunning of reason reason is as cunning as it is powerful cunning may be said to lie in the intermediative action 
which, while it permits the objects to follow their own bent and act upon one another till they waste away, does not itself directly interfere in the process, is nevertheless only working out its own aims. With this explanation, divine providence may be said to stand to the world in its process in the capacity of absolute cunning. God lets men do as they please with their particular passions and interests, but the result is the accomplishment of not their plans but his, and these differ decidedly from the ends primarily sought by those whom he employs. The realized end is thus the overt unity of subjective and objective. It is however essentially characteristic of this unity that the subjective and objective are neutralized and cancelled only in the point of their one-sidedness, which the objective is subdued and made conformable to the end, as the free notion, and thereby to the power above it. The end maintains itself against and in the objective, for it is no mere one-sided subjective or particular. It is also the concrete universal, the implicit identity of both. This universal, as simply reflected in itself, is the content which remains unchanged through all three termini of the syllogism and their movement. In finite design, however, even the executed end has the same radical rift or flaw as had the means and the initial end. We have got, therefore, only a form of extraneously impressed on a pre-existing material. And this form, by reason of the limited content of the end, is also a contingent characteristic. The end achieved, consequently, is only an object, which again becomes a means or material for other ends, and so on for ever. But what virtually happens in the realising of the end is that the one-sided subjectivity and the show of the objective independence confronting it are both cancelled. In laying hold of the means, the notion constitutes itself the very implicit essence of the object. In the mechanical and chemical processes, the independence of the object has been already dissipated implicitly and in the course of their movement under the dominion of the end the show of that independence the negative which confronts the notion is got rid of but in fact that the end is achieved is characterised only as a means and a material this object viz the teleological is there and then put implicitly null and only ideal this being so the antithesis between form and content has also vanished while the end by the removal and absorption of all form characteristics coalesces with itself the form as self-identical is thereby put as the content so that the notion which is the action of form has only itself for content through this process therefore there is made explicitly manifest what was the notion of design viz the implicit unity of subjective and objective is now realised and this is the idea the finitude of the end consists in the circumstance that in the process of realizing it the material which is employed as a means is only externally subsumed under it and made conformable to it but as a matter of fact the object is the notion implicitly and thus when the notion in the shape of end is realized in the object we have but the manifestation of the inner nature of the object itself objectivity is thus as it were only covering under which the notion lies concealed within the range of the finite we can never see or experience that the end has really been secured the consummation of the infinite end therefore consists merely in removing the illusion which makes it seem yet unaccomplished the good the absolutely good is eternally accomplishing itself in the world the result is that it needs not wait upon us but is already by implication as well as in full actuality accomplished this is the illusion under which we live it alone supplies at the same time the actualizing force on which the interest in the world reposes in the course of its process the idea creates that illusion by setting an antithesis to confront it, and its action consists in getting rid of the illusion which it has created. Only out of this error does the truth arise. In this fact lies the reconciliation with error and with finitude. Error, or other being, when superseded, is still a necessary dynamic element of truth. For truth can only be where it makes it itself its own result. End of part three of chapter nine. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Part four of chapter nine of the Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter nine The Doctrine of Notion C the Idea. The idea is truth in itself and for itself, the absolute unity of the notion and objectivity. Its ideal content is nothing but the notion in its detailed terms its real content is only the exhibition which the notion gives itself in the form of external existence whilst yet by enclosing the shape in its ideality it keeps it in its power and so keeps itself in it 
The definition which declares the absolute to be the idea is itself absolute. All former definitions come back to this. The idea is the truth, for truth is the correspondence of objectivity with the notion, not, of course, the correspondence of external things with my conceptions, for these are only correct conceptions held by me, the individual person. In the idea we have nothing to do with the individual, nor with the figure at conceptions, nor with external things. And yet again, everything actual, in so far as it is true, is the idea, and has its truth by and in virtue of the idea alone. Every individual being is some one aspect of the idea, for which therefore yet other actualities are needed, which in their turn appear to have a self-subsistence of their own. It is only in them altogether, and in their relation that the notion is realised. The individual by itself does not correspond to its notion. It is this limitation of its existence which constitutes the finitude and the ruin of the individual. The idea itself is not to be taken as an idea of something or other, any more than the notion is to be taken as merely a specific notion. The absolute is the universal in one idea, which, by an act of judgment, particularizes itself to the system of specific ideas, which after all are constrained by their nature to come back to the one idea where their truth lies. As issued out of this judgment, the idea is in the first place only the one universal substance, but its developed and genuine actuality is to be a subject, and in that way as mind. Because it has no existence for our starting point and point d'appui, the idea is frequently treated as a mere logical form. Such a view must be abandoned to those theories which ascribe so-called reality and genuine actuality to the existent thing, and all other categories which have not yet penetrated as far as the idea. It is no less false to imagine the idea to be mere abstraction. It is abstract certainly, in so far as everything untrue is consumed in it, but in its own self it is essentially concrete because it is the free notion giving character to itself, and that character, reality. It would be an abstract form only if the notion which is its principle, were taken to be an abstract unity, and not the negative return of it into self as the subjectivity which it really is. Truth is at first taken to mean that I know how something is. This is truth, however, only in reference to consciousness. It is a formal truth, bare correctness. Truth in the deeper sense consists in the identity between objectivity and the notion. It is in this deeper sense of truth that we speak of a true state, or of a true work of art. These objects are true if they are as they ought to be, i.e. if their reality corresponds to their notion. When thus viewed to be untrue means much the same as to be bad. A bad man is an untrue man, a man who does not behave as his notion or his vocation requires. Nothing, however, can subsist if it be wholly devoid of identity between the notion and reality. Even bad and untrue things have being, in so far as their reality still somehow conforms to their notion. Whatever is thoroughly bad or contrary to the notion is for that very reason on the way to ruin. It is by the notion alone that the things in the world have their subsistence, or, as it is expressed in the language of religious conception, things are what they are only in virtue of the divine and thereby creative thought which dwells within them. When we hear the idea spoken of, we need not imagine something far away beyond this mortal sphere. The idea is rather what is completely present, and it is found, however confused and degenerated, in every consciousness. We conceive the world to ourselves as a great totality which is created by God, and so created that in it God has manifested himself to us. We regard the world also as ruled by divine providence, implying that the scattered and divided parts of the world are continually brought back and made conformable to the unity from which they have issued. The purpose of philosophy has always been the intellectual ascertainment of the idea. Everything deserving the name of philosophy has constantly been based on the consciousness of an absolute unity where the understanding sees and accepts only separation. It is too late now to ask for proof that the idea is the truth. The proof of that is contained in the whole deduction and development of thought up to this point. The idea is the result of this course of dialectic. Not that it is to be supposed that the idea is mediate only, i.e. mediated through something else than itself. It is rather its own result, and being so is no less immediate than mediate. The stages hitherto considered, viz. those of being and essence, as well as those of notion and objectivity, are not, when so distinguished, something permanent resting upon themselves. They have proved to be dialectical, and their only truth is that they are dynamic elements of the idea. The idea may be described in many ways, and may be called reason, and this is the proper philosophical signification of reason, subject-object, the unity of the ideal and the real, of the finite and infinite of soul and body, the possibility which has its actuality in its own self, that of which the nature can be thought only as existent, etc. 
All these descriptions apply, because the idea contains all the relations of understanding, but contains them in their infinite self-return and self-identity. It is easy work for the understanding to show that everything said of the idea is self-contradictory, but that can quite as well be retaliated, or rather in the idea the retaliation is actually made. And this work, which is the work of reason, is certainly not easy as that of understanding. Understanding may demonstrate that the idea is self-contradictory, because the subjective is subjective only, and is always confronted by the objective. Because being is different from notion, therefore cannot be picked out of it, because the finite is finite only, and the exact antithesis of the infinite, and therefore not identical with it, and so on with every term of the description. The reverse of all this, however, is the doctrine of logic. Logic shows that the subjective, which is to be subjective only, the finite which would be finite only, the infinite which would be infinite only, and so on, have no truth, but contradict themselves and pass over into their opposites. Hence this transition and the unity in which the extremes are merged and become factors, each with a merely reflected existence, reveals itself as their truth. The understanding which addresses itself to deal with the idea commits a double misunderstanding. It takes first the extremes of the idea, be they expressed as they will, as long as they are in their unity, not as they are understood when stamped with this concrete unity, but as if they remained abstractions outside of it. It no less mistakes the relation between them ever when it has been expressly stated. Thus, for example, it overlooks even the nature of the copula in the judgment, which affirms that the individual or subject is after all not individual but universal. But in the second place, the understanding believes its reflection that the self-identical idea contains its own negative or contains contradiction to be an external reflection which does not lie within the idea itself. But the reflection really is no peculiar cleverness of understanding. The idea itself is the dialectic which forever divides and distinguishes the self-identical from the differentiated, the subjective from the objective, the finite from the infinite, soul from body. Only on these terms is it an eternal creation, eternal vitality, and eternal spirit. But while it thus passes, or rather translates itself into the abstract understanding, it forever remains reason. The idea is the dialectic, which again makes this mass of understanding and diversity understand its finite nature and the pseudo-independence in its production, which brings the diversity back to unity. Since this double movement is not separate or distinct in time, nor indeed in any other way, otherwise it would only be a repetition of the abstract understanding. The idea is the eternal vision of itself in the other, notion which in its objectivity has carried out itself, object which is inward design, essential subjectivity. The different modes of apprehending the idea as the unity of ideal and real, of finite and infinite, of identity and difference, etc., are more or less formal. They designate some one stage of the specific notion. Only the notion itself, however, is free and the genuine universal. In the idea, therefore, the specific character of the notion is only the notion itself, an objectivity viz. into which, being the universal, continues itself and in which it has only its own character, the total character the idea is the infinite judgment of which the terms are severally the independent totality and in which as each grows to the fullness of its own nature it has thereby at the same time passed into the other none of the other specific notions exhibit this totality complete on both its sides as the notion itself and objectivity the idea is essentially a process because its identity is the absolute and free identity of the notion only in so far as it is absolute negativity for that reason dialectical it is the round of movement in which the notion in the capacity of universality which is individuality gives itself the character of objectivity and of the antithesis thereto and this externality which has the notion for its substance finds its way back to subjectivity through its immediate dialectic as the idea is a a process it follows that such an expression for the absolute as unity of thought and being of finite and infinite etc is false for unity expresses an abstract and merely quiescent identity. As the idea is B, subjectivity, it follows that expression is equally false on another account, that unity of which it speaks expressly a merely virtual or underlying presence of the genuine unity. The infinite would thus seem to be merely neutralized by the finite, the subjective by the objective, thought by being. But in the negative unity of the idea, the infinite overlaps includes the finite, thought overlaps being, subjectivity overlaps objectivity. The unity of the idea is thought, infinity, and subjectivity, and is in consequence to be essentially distinguished from the idea as substance, just as this overlapping subjectivity, thought, or infinity, is to be distinguished from the one-sided subjectivity, one-sided thought, one-sided infinity, to which it descends in judging and defining. The idea as process runs through three stages in development. The first form of the idea is life, that is, the idea in the form of immediacy. 
The second form is that of mediation or differentiation, and this is the idea in the form of knowledge, which appears under the double aspect of the theoretical and practical idea. The process of knowledge eventuates in the restoration of the unity enriched by difference. This gives the third form of the idea, the absolute idea, which last stages of logical idea evinces itself to be at the same time the true first and to have being due to itself alone the immediate idea is life as soul the notion is realised in a body of whose externality the soul is the immediate self-relating universality but the soul is also the particularization so that the body expresses no other distinctions than follow from the characterizations of its notion and finally it is the individuality of the body as infinite negativity the dialectic of that bodily objectivity with its parts lying out of one another conveying them away from the semblance of independent subsistence back into subjectivity so that all members are reciprocally momentary means as well as momentary ends thus as life is the initial particularization so it results in the negative self-asserting unity in the dialectic of its corporality it only coalesces with itself in this way life is essentially something alive and in point of its immediacy this individual living thing it is characteristic of finitude in the sphere that by reason of the immediacy of the idea body and soul are separable this constitutes the mortality of the living being it is only however when the living being is dead that these two sides of the idea are different ingredients the single members of the body are what they are only by and in relation to their unity a hand for example when hewn off from the body is as aristotle has observed a hand in name only not in fact from the point of view of understanding life is usually spoken of as a mystery and in general as incomprehensible but giving it such a name however the understanding only confesses it only finitude and nullity so far is life from being incomprehensible that in it the very notion is presented to us or rather the immediate idea existing as notion and having said that we have vindicated the defect of life its notion and reality do not thoroughly correspond to each other the notion of life is the soul and this notion has the body for its reality the soul is as it were infused into its corporeity and in that way it is at first sentient only and not yet freely self-conscious the process of life consists in getting the better of the immediacy with which it is still beset and this process which is itself threefold results in the idea under the form of judgment i e the idea as cognition a living being is a syllogism of which the very elements are in themselves systems and syllogisms they are however active syllogisms of processes and in the subjective unity of the vital agent make only one process thus the living being is the process of its coalescence with itself which runs on through three processes one the first process of the living being inside itself in that process it makes a split on its own self and reduces its corporeity to its object or its inorganic nature this corporeity as an aggregate of correlations enter in its very nature into difference and opposition of its elements which mutually become each other's prey and assimilate one another and are retained by producing themselves yet this action of several members organs is only the living subjects one act to which their productions revert so that in these productions nothing is produced except the subject in other words the subject only reproduces itself the process of the vital subject within its own limits has in nature the threefold form of sensibility irritability and reproduction as sensibility the living being is immediately simple self-relation it is the soul omnipresent in its body the outsideness of each member of which to others it has for it no truth as irritability the living being appears split up in itself and as reproduction it is perpetually restoring itself from the inner distinction of its members and organs vital agent only exists as this continually self-renewing process within its own limits but the judgment of the notion proceeds as free to discharge the objective or bodily nature as independent totality from itself and the negative relation of the living thing to itself makes as immediate individuality the presupposition of an inorganic nature confronting it as this negative of animate is no less a function in the notion of the animate itself it exists consequently in the latter which is at the same time a concrete universal in the shape of a defect or a want the dialectic by which the object being implicitly null is merged is the action of self-assured living thing which in this process against an inorganic nature thus retains develops and objectifies itself the living being stands face to face with an inorganic nature comports itself as a master which it assimilates to itself the result of the assimilation is not as in the chemical process a neutral product in which the independence of the two confronting sides is merged but the living being shows itself as large enough to embrace its other which cannot withstand its power the inorganic nature which is subdued by the vital agent suffers this fate because it is virtually the same as what life is actually 
thus in the other living being only coalesces with itself but when the soul has fled from the body the elementary powers of objectivity begin their play these powers are as it were continually on the spring ready to begin their process in the organic body and life is the constant battle against them the living individual which in its first process comports itself as intrinsically subject and notion through its second assimilates its external objectivity and thus puts the character of reality into itself it is now therefore implicitly a kind with essential universality of nature the particularising of this kind is the relation of living subject to another subject of its kind and the judgment is the tie of kind over these individuals thus appointed for each other this is the affinity of the sexes the process of kind brings it to a being of its own life being no more than the idea immediate the product of this process breaks up into two sides on the one hand the living individual which was at first presupposed as immediate is now seen to be mediated and generated on the other hand the living individuality which on account of its first immediacy stands in a negative attitude towards universality sinks in the superior power of the latter the living being dies because it is a contradiction implicitly is the universal or kind and yet immediately it exists as an individual only death shows the kind to be the power that rules the immediate individual for the animal the process of the kind is the highest point of its vitality but the animal never gets so far in its kind as to have a being of its own it succumbs to the power of kind in the process of kind the immediate living being mediates itself with itself and thus rises above its immediacy only however to sink back into it again life thus runs away in the first instance only into the false infinity of the progress ad infinitum the real result however of the process of life and the point of its notion is to merge and overcome that immediacy with which the idea and the shape of life is still beset in this manner however the idea of life has thrown off not some one particular and immediate this but this first immediacy as whole it thus comes to itself to its truth it enters upon existence as a free kind self-subsistence the death of merely immediate and individual vitality is the procession of spirit cognition in general the idea exists free for itself in so far as it has universality for the medium of its existence as objectivity itself has notional being as the idea is its own object its subjectivity thus universalized is pure self-contained distinguishing of the idea intuition which keeps itself in this identical universality but as specific distinguishing it is the further judgment of repelling itself as a totality from itself and thus in the first place presupposing itself as an external universe these two judgments which though implicitly identical are not yet explicitly put as identical the relation of these two ideas which implicitly and as life are identical is this one of correlation and it is that correlativity which constitutes the characteristic of finitude in the sphere in the relationship of reflection seeing that the distinguishing of the idea is in its own self is only the first judgment presupposing the other and not yet supposing itself to constitute it and thus for the subjective idea the objective is the immediate world found ready to hand or the idea is life in the phenomenon of individual existence at the same time in so far as this judgment is pure distinguishing within its own limits the idea realizes in one both itself and its other consequently it is the certitude of the virtual identity between itself and the objective world reason comes to the world with an absolute faith in its ability to make the identity actual and to raise its certitude to truth and with instinct of realizing explicitly the nullity of that contrast which it sees to be implicitly null this process is in general terms cognition in cognition in a single act the contrast is virtually superseded as regards both the one-sidedness of subjectivity and the one-sidedness of objectivity at first however the supersession of the contrast is but implicit the process as such is in consequence immediately infected with the finitude of the sphere and splits into the twofold movement of the instinct of reason presented as two different movements on the one hand it supersedes the one-sidedness of the idea's subjectivity by receiving the existing world into itself into subjective conception and thought and with this objectivity which is thus taken to be real and true for its content it fills up the abstract certitude of itself on the other hand it supersedes the one-sidedness of the objective world which is now on the contrary estimated as only a mere semblance a collection of contingencies and shapes at bottom visionary it modifies and informs that world by the inward nature of the subjective which is here taken to be the genuine object the former is the instinct of science after truth cognition properly so called the theoretical action of the idea the latter is the instinct of good to fulfil the same practical activity as the idea or volition cognition proper the universal finitude of cognition which lies in the one judgment the presupposition of the contrast 
a pre supposition in contradiction of which its own act lodges protest specialises itself more precisely on the face of its own idea the result of that specialisation is that its two elements receive the aspect of being diverse from each other and as they are at least complete they take up the relation of reflection not of notion to one another the assimilation of the matter therefore as a datum presents itself in the light of reception of it into categories which at the same time remain external to it which meet each other in the same style of diversity reason is active here but it is reason in the shape of understanding the truth which such cognition can reach will therefore be only finite the infinite truth of the notion is isolated and made transcendent an inaccessible goal in a world of its own still in its external action cognition stands under the guidance of the notion the notional principles form the secret clue to its movement the finitude of cognition lies in the presupposition of a world already in existence and in the consequent view of the knowing subject as tabula rasa the conception is one attributed to aristotle but no man is further than aristotle from such an outside theory of cognition such a style of cognition does not recognise in itself the activity of the notion an activity which it is implicitly but not consciously in its own estimation its procedure is passive really that procedure is active finite cognition when it presupposes what is distinguished from it to be something already existing and confronting it to be various facts of external nature and consciousness has in the first place one formal identity or the abstraction of universality for the form of its action its activity therefore consists in analysing the given concrete object isolating its differences and giving them the form of abstract universality or it leaves the concrete thing as a ground and by setting aside the unessential looking particulars brings into relief a concrete universal the genus or force and law this is the analytic method people generally speak of the analytical and synthetical methods as if it depended solely on our choice which we pursued this is far from the case it depends on the form of the objects of our investigation which of the two methods that are derivable from the notion of finite cognition ought to be applied in the first place cognition is analytical analytical cognition deals with an object which is presented in detachment and the aim of its action is to trace back to a universal the individual object before it thought in such circumstances means no more than an act of abstraction or formal identity that is the sense in which thought is understood by locke and all empiricists cognition it is often said can never do more than separate the given concrete object into their abstract elements and then consider these elements in their isolation it is however at once apparent that this turns things upside down and that cognition if its purpose be to take things as they are thereby falls into contradiction with itself thus the chemist for example places a piece of flesh in his retort tortures it in many ways and then informs us that it consists of nitrogen carbon hydrogen etc true but these abstract matters have ceased to be flesh the same defect occurs in the reasoning of an empirical psychologist when he analyses an action in the various aspects which presents and then sticks to these aspects in their separation the object which is subject to analysis is treated as a sort of onion from which one coat is peeled off after another this universality is too also a specific universality in this case the line of activity follows the three moments of the notion which as it has not its infinity and finite cognition is the specific or definite notion of understanding the reception of the object into the forms of this notion is the synthetic method the movement of synthetic method is the reverse of the analytical method the latter starts from the individual and proceeds to the universal in the former the starting point is given by the universal as a definition from which we proceed by particularising in division to the individual the theorem the synthetic method thus presents itself as the development the moments of the notion of the object when the object has been in the first instance brought by cognition into the form of specific notion in general so that in this way its genus and its universal character or speciality are explicitly stated we have definition the materials and proof of definition are procured by means of the analytical method the specific character however is expected to be a mark only that is to say it is to be in behoof only of the purely subjective cognition which is external to the object definition involves the three organic elements of the notion the universal or proximate genus genus proximum the particular specific character of the genus qualitas specifica and the individual or object defined the first question that definition suggests is where it comes from the general answer to this question is to say that definitions originate by way of analysis this will explain how it happens that people quarrel about the correctness of proposed definitions for here everything depends on what perception we started from and what points of view we had before our eyes the richer the object to be defined is 
that is the more numerous are the aspects of which it offers to our notice the more various are the definitions we may frame of it thus there are quite a host of definitions of life of the state etc geometry on the contrary dealing with a theme so abstract as space has an easy task in giving definitions again in respect to the matter or contents of the objects defined there is no constraining necessity present we are expected to admit that space exists that there are plants animals etc nor is it the business of geometry botany etc to demonstrate that the objects in question necessarily are the very circumstance makes the synthetical method of cognition as little suitable for philosophy as the analytical for philosophy has above all things to leave no doubt of the necessity of its objects and yet several attempts have been made to introduce the synthetical method into philosophy thus spinoza in particular begins with definition he says for instance that substance is causa sui his definitions are unquestionably a storehouse of the most speculative truth but it takes the shape of dogmatic assertion the same thing is also true of schelling the statement of the second element of the notion i e of the specific character of the universal as particularizing is given by division in accordance with some external consideration division we are told ought to be complete that requires a principle or ground of division so constituted that the division based upon it embraces the whole extent of the region designated by the definition in general but in division there is further requirement that the principle of it must be borrowed from the nature of the object in question if this condition be satisfied the division is natural and not merely artificial that is to say arbitrary thus in zoology the ground of division adopted in the classification of the mammalia is mainly afforded by their teeth and claws that is so far sensible as the mammals themselves distinguish themselves from one another by these parts of their bodies back to which therefore the general type of their various classes is to be traced in every case the genuine division must be controlled by the notion to that extent a division in the first instance has three members but as particularity it exhibits itself as double the division may go to the extent even of four members in the sphere of mind trichotomy is predominant a circumstance which kant has the credit of bringing into notice in the concrete individuality where the mere unanalyzed quality of the definition is regarded as correlation of elements the object is a synthetical nexus of distinct characteristics it is a theorem being different these characteristics possess but a mediated identity to supply the materials which form the middle terms is the office of construction the process of mediation itself from which cognition derives the necessity of that nexus is the demonstration as the difference between the analytical and synthetical methods is commonly stated it seems entirely optional which of the two we employ if we assume to start with the concrete thing which the synthetical method presents as a result we can analyze from it as consequence the abstract propositions which formed the presuppositions and the material for the proof thus algebraic definitions of curved lines are theorems in the method of geometry similarly even the pythagorean theorem if made the definition of a right angled triangle might yield to analysis those propositions which geometry had already demonstrated on its behoof the optionalness of either method is due to both alike starting from an external presupposition so far as nature of the notion is concerned analysis is prior since it has to raise the given material with its empirical concreteness into the form of general abstractions which may then be set in front of the synthetic method as definitions that these methods however indispensable and brilliantly successful in their own province are unserviceable for philosophical cognition is self-evident they have presuppositions and their style of cognition is that of understanding proceeding under the canon of formal identity in spinoza who was especially addicted to the use of geometrical method we are at once struck by its characteristic formalism yet his ideas were speculative in spirit whereas the system of wolf who carried the method out to the height of the pedantry was even in subject matter a metaphysic of understanding the abuses which these methods with their formalism once led to in philosophy and science have in modern times been followed by the abuses of what is called construction kant brought into vogue the phrase that mathematics construes its notions all that was meant by the phrase was that mathematics has not to do with notions but with abstract qualities of sense perception the name construction constructing of notions has since been given to a sketch or statement of sensible attributes which were picked up from perception quite guiltless of any influence of the notion and to additional formalism of classifying scientific and philosophical objects in a tabular form on some presupposed rubric but in other respects at the fancy and discretion of the observer in the background of all this certainly there is a dim consciousness of the idea of the unity of the notion and objectivity a consciousness too that the idea is concrete but that play of what is styled construing is far from presenting this unity adequately a unity which is none other than the notion properly so called and the sensuous concreteness of perception is as little the concreteness of reason and the idea another point calls for notice 
Geometry works with the sensuous but abstract perception of space, and in space it experiences no difficulty in isolating and defining certain simple analytical modes. To geometry alone, therefore, belongs in its perfection the synthetical method of finite cognition. In its course, however, and this is the remarkable point, it finally stumbles upon what are termed irrational and incommensurable qualities, and in their case any attempt at further specification drives it beyond the principle of the understanding. This is only one of many instances in terminology where the title rational is perversely applied to the province of understanding, while we stigmatize as irrational that which shows a beginning and a trace of rationality. Other sciences, removed as they are from simplicity of space or number, often and necessarily reach a point where understanding permits no further advance, but they go over the difficulty without trouble they make a break in the strict sequence of their procedure and assume whatever they require though it be the reverse of what proceeded from some external quarter opinion perception conception or any other source its inobservancy as to the nature of its method and their relativity to the subject matter prevents the finite cognition from seeing that when it proceeds by definitions and divisions etc it is really led on by the necessity of the laws of notion for the same reason it cannot see when it has reached its limit nor if it has transgressed that limit does it perceive that it is in a sphere where the categories of understanding which it still continues rudely to apply have lost all authority the necessity which finite cognition produces in the demonstration is in the first place an external necessity intended for the subjective intelligence alone but in necessity as such cognition itself has left behind its presupposition and starting point which consisted in the accepting its content as given or found necessity qua necessity is implicitly the self-relating notion the subjective idea has thus implicitly reached an original and objective determinateness a something not given for that reason imminent in the subject is passed over into the idea of will the necessity which cognition reaches by means of demonstration is the reverse of what formed its starting point in its starting point cognition has a given and contingent content but now at the close of its movement it knows its content to be necessary this necessity is reached by means of the subjective agency similarly subjectivity at starting was quite abstract a bare tabula rasa and now shows itself as a modifying and determining principle in this way we pass from the idea of cognition to that of will the passage will be apparent on a closer examination means that the universal to be truly apprehended must be apprehended as subjectivity as notion self-moving active and form imposing the subjective idea as an original and objective determinateness and as the simple uniform content is the good its impulse towards self-realisation is in its behaviour the reverse of the idea of truth and rather directed towards moulding the world it finds before it into a shape conformable to its purpose end this volition has on the other hand the certitude of the nothingness of the presupposed object but on the other as finite it at the same time presupposes the purpose end of the good to be a mere subjective idea and the object to be independent this action of the will is finite and its finitude lies in the contradiction that in the inconsistent terms applied to the objective world the end of the good is just as much not executed as executed the ending question put as unessential as much as essential the actual and at the same time is merely possible this contradiction presents itself to imagination as an endless progress in the actualizing of the good which is therefore set up and fixed as a mere ought or goal of perfection in point of form however this contradiction vanishes when the action supersedes the subjectivity of the purpose and along with it the objectivity with the contrast which makes both finite abolishing subjectivity as a whole and not merely the one-sidedness of this form of it for another new subjectivity of the kind that is a new generation of the contrast is not distinct from that which is supposed to be past and gone this return into itself is at the same time the content's own recollection that is is the good and the implicit identity of the two sides it is a recollection of the presupposition of the theoretical attitudes of mind that the objective world is its own truth and substantiality while intelligence merely proposes to take the world as it is will takes steps to make the world what it ought to be will looks upon the immediate and given present not as solid being but as mere semblance without reality it is here that we meet those contradictions which are so bewildering from the standpoint of abstract morality this position in its practical bearings is the one taken by the philosophy of kant and even by that of fichte the good say these writers has to be realised we have to work in order to produce it and will is only the god actualising itself if the world then were as it ought to be the action of will would be at an end the will itself therefore requires that its end should not be realised in these words a correct expression is given to the finitude of will but finitude was not meant to be the ultimate point and it is the process of will itself which abolishes finitude and the contradiction it involves the reconciliation is achieved when will in its results returns to the presupposition made by cognition 
In other words, it consists in the unity of the theoretical and practical idea. Will knows the end to be its own, and intelligence apprehends the world as the notion actual. This is the right attitude of rational cognition. Nullity and transitoriness constitute only the superficial features and not real essence of the world. That essence is the notion in passe and in esse, and thus the world is itself the idea. All unsatisfied endeavour ceases when we recognise that the final purpose of the world is accomplished no less than ever accomplishing itself. Generally speaking, this is the man's way of looking. While the young imagine the world is utterly sunk in wickedness and that the first thing needful is a thorough transformation. The religious mind, on the contrary, views the world as ruled by divine providence, therefore correspondent with what it ought to be. But this harmony between the is and the ought to be is not torpid and rigid stationary. Good, the final end of the world, has being only while it constantly produces itself. And the world of spirit and the world of nature continue to have this distinction that the latter moves only in a recurring cycle, while the former certainly also makes progress. Thus the truth of the good is laid down as the unity of the theoretical and practical idea in the doctrine that the good is radically and really achieved, and the objective world is in itself and for itself the idea, just as it at the same time eternally lays itself down as end, and by action brings about its actuality this life which has returned to itself from the bias and finitude of cognition and which by the activity of the notion has become identical with it is the speculative or absolute idea the absolute idea the idea as unity of the subjective and objective idea is the notion of the idea a notion whose object gegenstand is the idea as such and for which the objective object is idea an object which embraces all characteristics in its unity this unity is consequently the absolute and all truth the idea which thinks itself and here at least as a thinking or logical idea the absolute idea is in the first place the unity of the theoretical and practical idea and thus at the same time the unity of the idea of life with the idea of cognition in cognition we have the idea in a biased one-sided shape the process of cognition has issued into the overthrow of this bias and the restoration of that unity which is as unity and in its immediacy is in the first instance the idea of life the defect of life lies in its being only the idea implicit or natural whereas cognition is in an equally one-sided way the merely conscious idea or the idea for itself the unity and truth of these two is the absolute idea which is both in itself and for itself hitherto we have had the idea in the development through its various grades as our object but now the idea comes to be its own object this means the greek which aristotle long ago termed the supreme form of the idea seeing that there is in it no transition or presupposition and in general no specific character other than what is fluid and transparent the absolute idea is for itself the pure form of the notion which contemplates its content as its own self it is its own content in so far as it ideally distinguishes itself from itself and the one of the two things distinguished is a self-identity in which however is contained the totality of form as the system of terms describing its content this content is the system of logic and that is at this stage left as a form of the idea all that is at this stage left as form for the idea is the method of this content the specific consciousness of the value and currency of the moments in its development to speak of the absolute idea may suggest the conception that we are at length reaching the right thing and the sum of the whole matter it is certainly possible to indulge in a vast amount of senseless declamation about the idea absolute but its true content is only the whole system of which we have been hitherto studying the development it may also be said in this strain that the absolute idea is the universal but the universal not merely as an abstract form to which the particular content is a stranger but as the absolute form into which all the categories the whole fullness of the content it has given being to have retired the absolute idea may in this respect be compared to the old man who utters the same creed as the child before whom it is pregnant and with the significance of a lifetime even if the child understands the truths of religion he cannot but imagine them to be something outside of which lies the whole of life and the whole of the world the same may be said to be the case with human life as a whole and the occurrences with which it is fraught all work is directed only to the aim or end and when it is attend people are surprised to find nothing else but just the very thing which they had wished for the interest lies in the whole movement when a man traces up the steps of his life the end may appear to him very restricted but in it the whole decursus vitae is comprehended so too the content of the absolute idea is the whole breadth of the ground which has passed under our view up to this point last of all comes the discovery that the whole evolution is what constitutes the content and the interest it is indeed the prerogative of the philosopher to see that everything which taken apart is narrow and restricted receives its value by its connection with the whole and by forming an organic element of the idea 
Thus it is that we have had the content already, and what we have now is the knowledge that the content is the living development of the idea. The simple retrospect is contained in the form of the idea. Each of the stages hitherto reviewed is an image of the absolute, but at first in limited mode, and thus it is forced onward to the whole, the evolution of which is what we termed method. The several steps or stages of the speculative method are, first of all, a the beginning which is being or immediacy self-subsistent for the simple reason that it is the beginning but looked at from the speculative idea being is the self-specialising act which as the absolute negativity or movement of the notion makes a judgment and puts itself as its own negative being which to the beginning as beginning seems mere abstract affirmation is thus rather negation dependency derivation and presupposition but it is the notion of which being is the negation and the notion is completely self-identical in its otherness and is certainly of itself being therefore is the notion implicit before it has been explicitly put as a notion this being therefore as its still unspecified notion a notion that is only implicitly or immediately specified is equally describable as the universal when it means immediate being the beginning is taken from sensation and perception the initial stage in the analytical method of finite cognition when it means universality it is the beginning of the synthetic method but since the logical idea is as much universal as it is in being since it is presupposed by the notion as much as it is itself immediately is its beginning is a synthetical as well as an analytical beginning philosophical method is analytical as well as synthetical not indeed in the sense of a bare juxtaposition or mere altering employment of the two methods of finite cognition but rather in such a way that it holds them merged in itself in every one of its movements therefore it displays an attitude at once analytical and synthetical philosophical thought proceeds analytically in so far as it only accepts its object the idea while allowing its own way is only as it were an onlooker at its movement and development to this extent philosophizing is wholly passive philosophic thought however is equally synthetic and evinces itself to be the action of the notion itself to that end however there is required an effort to keep back the incessant impertinence of our own fancies and private opinions b the advance renders the explicit the judgment implicit in the idea the immediate universal as the notion implicit is the dialectical force which on its own part deposes its immediacy and universality to the level of a mere stage or moment thus is put the negative of the beginning its specific character it supposes a correlative a relation of different terms the stage of reflection seeing the immanent dialectic only states explicitly what was involved in the immediate notion this advance is analytical but seeing that this notion this distinction is not yet stated is equally synthetical in the advance of the idea the beginning exhibits itself as what it is implicitly is seen to be mediated and derivative and neither to have proper being nor improper immediacy it is only for the consciousness which is itself immediate that nature forms the commencement or immediacy and that spirit appears as what it is mediated by nature the truth is that nature is the creation of spirit and it is spirit itself which gives its presupposition in nature the abstract form of the advance is in being an other and transition into other in essence showing or reflection in the opposite in notion the distinction of the individual from the universality which constitutes itself as such into and is an identity with what is distinguished from it in the second sphere the primarily implicit notion has come as far as shining and thus is already the idea in germ the development of this sphere becomes a regress into the first just as the development of the first is a transition into the second it is only by means of this double movement that the difference first gets its due when each of the two members distinguished observed on its own part completes itself to the totality and in this way works out its unity with the other it is only by both merging their one-sidedness on their own part that their unity is kept from becoming one-sided the second sphere develops the relation of the differences to what it primarily is to the contradiction in its own nature a contradiction which is seen in the infinite progress is resolved c into the end or terminus which the difference is explicitly stated as what is in the notion the end is the negative of the first and as the identity with that is the negativity of itself it is consequently the unity in which both of these firsts the immediate and the real first are made constituent stages in thought merged and at the same time preserved in the unity the notion which from its implicitness thus comes by means of its differentiation as the merging of that differentiation to close with itself is the realised notion the notion which contains the relativity or dependence of its special features in its own independence it is the idea which has absolutely first in the method regards this terminus as merely the disappearance or the show or semblance which made the beginning appear immediate and made itself seem a result it is the knowledge that the idea is the one systematic whole 
It thus appears that the method is not extraneous form, but the soul and notion of the content, from which it is only distinguished so far as the dynamic elements of the notion, even on their own part, come to their own specific character to appear as the totality of the notion. The specific character of the content leads itself with the form back to the idea, and thus the idea is presented as a systematic totality, which is only one idea, of which several elements are each implicitly the idea, whilst the equally by the dialectic of the notion produce the simple independence of the idea. The science in this manner concludes by apprehending the notion of itself as of the pure idea for which the idea is. The idea which is independent or for itself, when viewed on the point of this its unity with itself, is perception or intuition, and the percipient idea is nature. But as intuition the idea is, through an external reflection invested with the one-sided characteristic of immediacy or of negation, enjoying however an absolute liberty, the idea does not merely pass over into life, or as finite cognition allow life to show in it, in its own absolute truth it resolves to let the moment of its particularity, or of the first characterization and other being, the immediate idea as its reflected image, go forth freely as nature. We now return to the notion of the idea with which we began. This return to the beginning is also an advance. We began with being, abstract being, where we now have also the idea as being. But this idea which has being is nature. End of part four of chapter nine and end of the logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel.